ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. Somewhere in the tangled web of your city, there's a killer on the loose. A young woman has been brutally murdered. The weapon, a steel bludgeon. Your job is to get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 19th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 9.14 p.m. when I got to the old central jail building, third floor, the crime lab. Hi, Joe. Hi, coming, Lee. Just ran a spectrograph. What'd you find? The paint flake from the victim's head matches that paint on the hunk of pipe. Any prints? No, the pipe was clean, no latent prints. Well, that figured. Anything else? Got those blood test reports. A couple of slides for you to look at under the comparison mic. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Lee. Oh, hi, Joe. Didn't hear you come in. What's it look like, Ben? Now, here's the blood test reports. This one is blood found on a piece of pipe. Mm, type A. This one's blood from the victim. Type A. They match. That's right, boys. Doesn't mean too much, though. Did you look at these slides under the microscope? No, not yet. Well, this is your clincher. Wait till I get the light. Okay, take a look. Mm-hmm. Got a make? Yeah, go ahead. Well, this slide here on the right... Mm-hmm. That's a slice of hair from the victim's head. On the other slide is hair found on the steel pipe. Yeah. She had wavy hair. Both specimens are flat. Same hair, Joe. You got anything on that piece of pipe, Lee? Mm, nothing. Just ordinary steel pipe, 14 inches long. What else you got? The plaster impressions of those footprints we found by the body. Here they are. Mm, crepe soles? Tennis shoes, new ones, size nine, good impressions. Ground was soft. Man about 150 pounds, according to the length of stride, roughly about 5 feet 10 inches tall. Yeah, new shoes, all right. You can still read the manufacturer's label. That's right. Made by the Sport King Company. Well, that's something to follow up. Yeah, sure. You could start with the tennis court. Only about 1,000 or so in L.A. Maybe you'd rather track down the brand. These particular tennis shoes are the biggest sellers in the country. Yeah. Where'd you like to start, Minneapolis or Pullman, Washington? What about that glove? Yeah, you might look for a missing glove. Yeah. They go well with the shoes, just about as common. White cotton work gloves with a blue top. Here's the right glove. You find the left one. Blood on a glove? Type A. Well, that's good evidence, Jones, but where's the lead? Now, look, I don't ask you to pay my parking ticket. You want to see blow-ups? Yeah, okay. Right over here. Oh, yeah. This is the vacant lot where they found the body. Yeah, that's right. Here's a close-up of her showing the location of the murder weapon, the glove, and the footprints relative to the position of the body. Looks as bad as yesterday. Sure did work her over, didn't it? The rest of these are morgue shots. Interested? Yeah, I checked them this morning. Once is enough, Lee. Yeah, that winds it, boy. You want to go over the stuff in her purse again? You find anything more? No, nothing you haven't seen already. The usual. Makeup, comb, barrette, with a hair clip. Mm -hmm. A few cheap stones in it. Loose change, a quarter, nickel, a few pennies. Her ID card. Helen Corday. 33 Naomi Place. Age 21. 21. That's not very old, is it, Lee? Not to die. No. Helen Corday. Who could kill Helen Corday? Why? Why do you say that, Mr. Meyer? But, but people kill for money. They, they kill for love. Helen Corday had none of these. No boyfriend? Not in here. No, she was a good worker. Five different waiters says the union sends me one month. Five! Did the union send Helen to you? Oh, sure, sure. All the girls come from the union, but none like Helen. Oh, she was sweet. Honest and courteous. Mr. Meyer, did you know anything about her personal life? Only that she was a good worker. Everything else she took home with her from this place. Did she ever mention any men to you? Anyone at all? No gentleman, not one. No. How much money did she make here? I paid her $26.50 a week, every Tuesday. And not much salary for so much work, but the tips are very good here. Nice customer. Mm -hmm. nice this is her home address? 33 Naomi Place? 33 Naomi, that's right, yeah. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Marr, for your time. I wonder what kind of a person does things like this. Who could kill Helen Cordy? Everybody liked Helen. Helen Cordy? I never liked her. Come on in the office, boys, where we can talk. Never liked her because I never knew her. You the head of the union? Not just a steward. I know most of the girls. This Corday girl, what was she what she look like? Small brunette, about five three. Uh, here's a picture. Yeah. Pretty girl, wasn't she? Oh, sure, sure. Place Dorado's place. Nice little Dutch fella. Out of Maya. That's right. He seemed to think quite a lot of her. Yeah, she was a fine worker. Oh, sure. Always right up on her dues. Paid all the assessments right on time. Thought you said you didn't know her. Well, not right off, I didn't. But when you showed me that picture there, placed her right away. You know anything about her personal life? Now, wait a minute. Why all these questions? Helen Corday was murdered last night. Oh. Who did it? You know anything about her personal life? You can see my position, Sergeant. 1,200 girls. Check them in, check them out. Oh, just names to me till I see a picture of them. You wouldn't know if she had any boyfriends here in the Union. Waiters, butt boys? That I wouldn't know. Like I tell you, Sergeant, I never knew Helen Corday. Sure, I knew Helen Corday. Scott plays a nice piano, huh, Sergeant? Yeah. I read about it in the paper this morning. How long have you been selling pianos here at this place? About as long as I knew Helen. Three years. How'd you find me? Helen's landlady. We talked to her yesterday. She told us you worked here at this piano store. Oh. Funny, isn't it? What's funny? See, Scott's over there. That fellow demonstrating the piano. A few weeks ago, I made a deal with him to give Helen piano lessons. I figured it would help her with a singing lesson. Wanted to be a singer, you know. Did Helen know that fellow, Gus? No, she never met him. Who gave her the singing lessons, Miss Olsen? She took from Ostrander. Paul Ostrander out on Melrose. A lot of movie people used to take from him. What do you know about her personal life? How do you mean? Does she have any boyfriends? Well, yes. You don't seem sure, Miss Olsen. Well, it's just that I don't know. I never asked Helen. But she did have a few dates with Paul Ostrander. I don't think she was serious. How about Ostrander? Gee, I, I don't know, Sergeant. I don't want to involve anybody. You want to help us find the killer, don't you? Yes, but if you're thinking Paul Ostrander did it, no, I'm sure he didn't kill her. That's all for today, Victoria. No, gentlemen. I did not kill Helen Corday. You gave her singing lessons, Mr. Ostrander. You knew her pretty well? Yes, I gave her voice coaching for about a year and a half. Helen showed a little promise. Not a great voice, a bad vibrato. You knew her pretty well. Why do you say that? Mr. Ostrander, didn't you used to take her out once in a while? No. No, I didn't know Helen socially at all. We know you had dates with her. That's not true. The only time I saw her was when she came here to the studio for lessons. You better tell the truth, Mr. Ostrander. We can prove that you've been out with her. Afraid of the publicity, is that it? Certainly, that's it. I have a successful business here. I've spent years building it. Anything like this would ruin me. Then you have been out with her. Only a few times. Nothing serious. I had nothing to do with her murder. Now, that's the truth. Don't you know that withholding information about a thing like this can go kind of hard for you? Yes, I know that. What else could I do? Mr. Ostrander, somewhere in this city right now, there's a guy who beat a young girl to death. He crushed her skull with a piece of steel pipe. We need every bit of information we can get to track him down. I know that, sir. You could have come to us. We wouldn't run to the newspapers with it. If the information's confidential, that's the way we treat it. Most of the time, it's the people who run to the newspapers first. Then they come to us. That's right, Mr. Ostrander. People are their own press agents. Sergeant, I'd like to know what right you have to invade my privacy and lecture me on my civic duty. All right, I'll tell you what right, Ostrander. We want the man who murdered Helen Corday. I got as much right as he had at 1214 this morning. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Thanks, Mr. Ostrander. Sorry if I invaded your privacy. Chief of Detectives, orders. Hannon. No, I'm sorry, ma'am. You got the wrong extension. Try 2511. You're welcome. Hi, Friday, Romero. Chief's been looking for you. Thank you, Mike. Come on, Joe. Yeah. Hello, Joe. Ben, sit down. What'd you get? A notebook full of notes. A crime lab full of evidence. Nothing to tie them together. Uh, these some of the people you interviewed? Yeah, those and about a dozen more we didn't even take notes on. It's hard to figure, Skipper. Everybody seemed to like this girl. Helen Corday, no known relative. Single, unattached girl, living all alone in the city. Few friends and no enemies, none we can find anyway. Are you uh, satisfied that all the people you interviewed are in the clear? Well, if we're going to stick to the simple robbery motive, we are. 
kind of money Helen Corday made wouldn't interest those people. How are you doing on the outside leads? Nothing. If we could just find one hole someplace, anything. All right, now look. You've got a lab full of evidence across the street. You've got a book full of names here. You've got the pieces. Now fit them together. They just don't add. Well, go over them and keep going over them until they do add. Anything from the informant? No, nothing so far. No tips on anybody that's been dough hit lately. Nobody shooting off their mouth. Uh, the guy we want won't advertise. Figures himself a pretty smooth operator. But he probably made a mistake somewhere along the line. We'll find it. Got a hot shot, Ed? Yeah? 3220 Casino. Woman, probable attack. All right, Friday. You and Ben run it down. We ran down the hot shot call for 3220 Casino. Turned out to be a typical dead end lead. Her name was Mrs. Lillian Horn. For the past five years, Mr. Horn had been paid regularly on Wednesdays. He spent all day Thursday drinking up his paycheck and beating his wife. The call had no connection with the Corday murder. We made the usual call into communication. Unit 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Control 1 to 80K. Go ahead. On that probable attack, 3220 Casino. Code 4. 80K, Roger. 80K to Control 1. KMA 367. That was the beginning. For the next three days, we followed up every lead and every call. But they were all blind. All units were alerted, and they had as much information on the killer of Helen Corday as we did. Ben and I cruised throughout the entire Central Division. We covered every probable call that might have some connection with the murder. Attention, Unit 41R. 1654, Swanson Terrace. A woman, victim of probable attack. Code 3. Unit 41R. It didn't make any difference what the call was. But with a possibility of my tie-in with the Corday murder, we ran it down. We made it a 24-hour job. So far, if the killer made a mistake, we hadn't been able to find it. The Corday funeral was on Monday. They were all there. The girl's landlady, the boy's teacher, Ostrander, the girl's friend, Marie Olson, the man from the union, and her boss, Otto Meyer. But nobody else we hadn't checked. That was Monday afternoon. Monday night, we went back to the old routine, tracking calls during the night in the squad car, picking up small threads that led nowhere. Three more days of the same thing. Thursday morning, one week after we found Helen Corday's body, we got an anonymous phone tip. I know who killed Helen Corday. His name is George Barlow. He lives at 418 White Oak Avenue. He used to date her up all the time. Get him and you've got the murderer. We checked George Barlow and about ten others just like him. None of them knew Helen Corday. Saturday night, Ben and I were back in the squad car cruising the Central Division. Saturday night's a good night for robbery. By 10 p.m., we'd run down four various calls. 123, code 1. 123, Roger. 12G, call your station. Unit 13R, 1264 Tower Road. The woman's screaming. Let's get in trouble. Oh, 2. Let's handle that one, Ben. Yeah, okay. I'll notify communications. Unit 80K to Control 1. 80K to Control 1. Control 1 to Unit 80K. Go ahead. On your 1254 Tower Road call, we are in the vicinity. We will handle 80K, Roger. 80K to Control 1, KMA 367. Let's go, Ben. Control 1 to 13R. Disregard your last call. Handled by 80K. It should be right about here. Oh, now. Here it is. 1254. <laughs> that man, he tried to kill me. He's running down the street. Where? He's getting the next door. He tried to kill me. Come on. Where'd he go, Joe? Turn right at the next corner. That's him up ahead. Got a good lead on it. Hit the siren. He's gaining, Joe. Took a left at the next corner. Oh, he isn't going to stop. Close in as tight as you can, Ben. Down to the floor now. Swing out to the left a little. I'm going for his tires. All right. All right. That'll slow him down. Pull up on him. Yeah. All right, Joe. Keep both hands on that wheel and get over to the curb. Over me, Joe. Right. Out of that car, mister. Take him down. Hey, take it easy, will you? I haven't got a gun. Put the cuffs on him. Hey, you boys work fast. What am I to put the gas chamber? Just save that, Messy. That's pretty rough treatment for speeding. All man. right, come on, you. Look, I, I got a right to know where you're taking me. What's the charge? We'll let the girl tell you. What girl? You can sit there and be quiet, huh? Oh, I know where you're going. This place back on Tar Road. Well, I asked to use the phone. The girl slammed the door in my face. I don't know what you cops are trying to prove. I just wanted to use the phone, that's all. 
I even tried to scare her a little. I, I told her I'd hit her over the head if she didn't let me use the phone. It's a laugh, huh? All right, you get out. Yeah, I suppose so. Get out. Hey. I got nothing to hide. That little girl's gonna lie. You know that, don't you? Who's there? Police officers. Ah! It's the man. That's him. He tried to kill me. His full name's Frank Philip Larkin. They had no previous record. This the uh, girl's report? Yeah, that's it, Skipper. Uh, Judy Scott. How old is she? He's 19. He's a babysitter. Real tough boy, isn't he? Forced his way into the house. Beat her about the neck and arms. A tire iron. He found it in his car. Jones is running it through the crime lab. Asked her if she had any money. She told him no. Struck her again. Where's this Larkin live? Hotel out near Santa Monica. The clothing salesman. He had worked for a big men's store, Burns and Company. According to the house book sales record, he bought a pair of tennis shoes two weeks ago. Weighs 158 pounds, 5 foot 11 inches. Tennis shoes are missing. They're not in his hotel room. He's not wearing. What else did you find? A rhinestone. You mean a pin? No, just a small loose stone recovered from the rug in Larkin's room. Crime lab got it? Working on it now. Ed, I think we got the man who killed Helen Corday. <laughs> few scraps of circumstantial evidence and a hunch. That's not much to go on. Larson had gone after the little Scott girl with a tire iron. Wasn't much of a tie-in, but we had to be sure. All that day, we checked Frank Larson's alibi for the night of Helen Corday's murder. We interviewed the personnel manager at Burns and Company where he worked. We talked to all the clerks who knew him, the manager of the hotel where he lived. We found out everything we could about Frank Larson. And that night at 10 o'clock, we had the prisoner brought to the interrogation room. How are you, Larson? Fine. Just fine. I like jail. Sit down. Lousy weather, been foggy all over town. I wouldn't know. I've been inside all day. How old are you, Larson? 31, same as the last time you asked me. Where'd you go to school? I didn't. I was born smart. You sell clothes, don't you, Larson? We know you work for Burns and Company. Remember, you told us. What is all this? What are you guys trying to build? We just want to know if you like selling clothes. That's all. Well, you coppers know about clothes. One blue surge a year is your speed. You know quite a bit about clothes, don't you? I've been selling them for five years. Can you tell me something I've been wondering about? What's that? Are your socks and tie always supposed to match? Style books, see? Eh? Bet you always know the right things to wear, don't you? You wouldn't wear black shoes with a brown suit, would you? Is that what you're keeping me here for? Style, isn't it? No, would you? Would you wear black shoes with a brown suit? Most people wouldn't. Bet you wouldn't wear brown shoes with a tuxedo, either. I've been smoking too much. You got a glass of water? Oh, yeah, sure. There you are, Larkin. Didn't call. How about it? Would you ever wear brown shoes with a tux? Nobody would. That's a navy blue flannel you got on there, isn't it? Yeah. Good looking suit. Stop around sometime. Get you a good deal. Suit like that flannel there you're wearing? You'd never wear tennis shoes with an outfit like that, would you? What do you think? I think you did. I think you wore them the night you killed Helen Corday. Who? Maybe you didn't have the blue suit on, but you were wearing tennis shoes, Sport King, size nine. Sell for five ninety five. You picked them up at a discount, cost you three and a quarter. Where'd you get that? Out of the house book, Burns and Company. You wouldn't have those shoes around now, would you? We couldn't find them in your hotel room. Your boss, Mr. Craig, used to think a lot of you, Larson. Before you started drinking on the job, your commissions used to run pretty high up the last couple of months. What happened? That cheap ride get to you? Well, you two really nosed around, didn't you? When are you going to tell me what I eat for breakfast? Cornflakes, cup of coffee, donut, sometimes two donuts when you're hungry. Elsie waits on you at the Royal Cafe. She gets a dime tip. And have some more of that water. Help yourself, there's a cooler. Very good and cold. How about it, Larson? Where are the tennis shoes? They wore out. In three weeks? Can't be very good tennis shoes. Oh, they didn't wear out. What'd you do with them? You know all the answers. You figure it out. We know you bought the tennis shoes. We don't know where they are now. We know you had them. Size nine. Three feet from the body of Helen Corday, we found two size nine footprints made by a pair of Sport King tennis shoes. We figured the man weighed about 150 pounds. You weigh 158. Figured he's about five foot ten. You're 5'11". You come awful close to being the same build as the man who killed Helen Corday, don't you, Larson? And you wear the same size tennis shoes, same brand name. A lot of people wear nines. It's the average size. You sell a lot of Sport Kings, too. Everybody wears them. We could find your pair. Might make a difference. Doesn't mean your tennis shoes made the prints with a body. Doesn't prove it. it didn't, neither. What'd you do with them, Larson? I threw them away. That's too bad. Might make a difference. Oh, what difference could it make? I threw them away, that's all. Now, how about the mate to this glove? I never saw it before. Found this right-hand glove by the body of Helen Corday. Just an ordinary cotton work glove. Everybody wears them. If we could find the missing left glove, well, it might make a difference. 
Size medium. That's average, too, isn't it, Larson? I never saw work gloves. I wouldn't know. No, but you bought work gloves, haven't you? Not a pair of those. I mean like this, don't you? We only got one. What kind of work gloves did you buy? I didn't buy any. You just said you did. I never said I bought any work gloves. You bought tennis shoes, though, didn't you? I bought... told you I bought the tennis shoes. Didn't I tell you I bought them? No, you didn't tell us. We told you. Found out from Burns and Company where you were. All right, you told me. I bought them. You know that. Same kind of tennis shoes that made footprints by Helen Corday's butt. It wasn't me. Then why won't you tell us what you did with them? I've shoes? already told you. I threw them away. They were only three weeks old. They were worn out awful fast. I didn't say they wore out. They got too dirty. No, you told us they wore out. Remember, Larson? I don't remember what I told you, but I don't have them now. We know you don't have them now. Where are they? He told us. They got too dirty. Right, Larson? Yes. Yes, yes, that's what I said. Anyhow, you haven't got them now. No, I haven't got them now. All right, now, just for the record, Larson, which was it? Did they get too dirty or did they wear out? Whatever I said before. You said both before, Larson. All right, I said both. You haven't got anything on me. We got that little Scott girl statement from last night. She said you tried to kill her. She's lying. I told you she'd lie, didn't I? I only wanted to use the phone. She said you hit her with a tire iron. Did you hit her with that iron? No, I only tried to scare her. I didn't hit her with anything. Then how'd you get those marks around her neck and arm? Police doctor says they were made by that tire iron. I don't care what your doctor says. I didn't hurt her. Now, what do you mean, Larson? You didn't hurt her or you didn't hit her with that tire Neither iron? Neither one. I just wanted to use her phone. How'd you know she had a phone? I didn't know if she had a phone. I just wanted to find out. To find out what? To find out if I could use her phone. But you said you didn't know if she had a phone. I don't know anything the way you twist everything around. Sorry, Larson. You only want the truth. How about a cigarette? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I could use it. Here's light. Larson, where were you Wednesday night, March 18th? How many times are you going to ask me that same question? Just want to make sure we got it right. I told you this morning. I went to a show. I got out about 11, had a beer, and I went home. What time did you get home? About 11.30. Did you stay home? I went to bed. What did you see at the show? I never remember the names. You ought to try to remember this, and it's pretty important. Well, it was the Deluxe Theater. It was Spencer Tracy and something. What was on when you walked in? The news. I never go in in the middle of a picture. Neither do I. Spoilers them for me. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The girl in the box office doesn't remember seeing you go in. She know. It was keen all night. There was a big crowd. Did you win anything? I never do. Anybody hit the jackpot? I don't remember. They give away a lot of money at those neighborhood theaters. I always remember who hits the jackpot. Well, all right, you do. I don't. You remember if anybody won the jackpot? I told you, no. Do they have a jackpot at that show? I guess they do. I don't know. You know, it was keen all night. You should know if they had a jackpot. Maybe they had a jackpot. I don't know. I went out for a smoke. You said the cartoon was on when you walked in. Why do you always twist what I say? I told you the news was on when I went in. You remember anything about the newsreel? It was ten days ago. How do I know it was in it? I only know it was a newsreel. That's all. You're lying, Larson. We checked your alibi. The manager of the theater had to cut the newsreel Wednesday night because the show was running long with Keno night. You didn't go to the show Wednesday night, did you? All right, maybe I didn't. I don't remember. What's the difference? The difference is you could have been in that vacant lot the same night, the night Helen Corday was murdered. I didn't kill her. You can't prove I did. Interrogation room, Friday. Hi, Jones. It did, huh? You're positive. Uh -huh. Yeah, okay. Thanks, Lee. Sure you don't want to tell us what you did with those tennis shoes? I'm not going to go back over all that. I've told you guys all I'm going to tell you. You know how the Corday girl was murdered? How would I know? I don't know anything about it. She was on her way home from work, as usual, about midnight. Of course, you were home in bed about that time. But you didn't go to the show that night, Larson. On her way home, Helen Corday always took a shortcut across a vacant lot. She was about halfway through the lot when the murderer tried to grab her purse. She screamed and he struck her. Hit her several times with a piece of steel pipe 14 inches long. He beat her to death with that piece of steel pipe. Then he dropped the pipe in the right-hand cotton work glove. He left two footprints, size nine, 14 tennis shoes. I know all that. Well, here's something you don't know. When the killer scooped the paper money out of that girl's purse, he accidentally took along a loose rhinestone, a stone that fell out of a cheap barrette in the bottom of her bag. He carried that stone home with him. When he reached in his pocket to pull out the money he stole from her, the rhinestone fell on the floor. So? We found that rhinestone on the rug in your hotel room. Well, I haven't lived in that hotel room all my life. Maybe the tenant before me dropped it there. No, not this one. We checked the cement that held it in that barrette. It matches the glue on the stone. No, Larson, that rhinestone came from the hair clip that Helen Corday wore before she was murdered. That's enough to take you to the district attorney with. What am I supposed to say? We want you to tell us the truth. Why did you kill Helen Corday? Yeah. Got the sandwiches and coffee now, Sergeant? Bring them in, Mike. Looks like we're going to be here a long time. Yeah, I brought you ham, cheese, and liverwurst. And some fruit. Coffee's black. Cream and sugar on the side. Mm, thanks, Mike. Yeah, it looks good. What kind do you want, Larson? Ham, cheese, or liverwurst? Oh, you're not hungry? Okay. That with you? No, thanks. I think I'll have an apple. Huh? Yeah. I fixed you a plate there, Larson. Coffee's right here. A fine apple. Mm. Nice and fresh. This is the Washington apple? Yeah. Uh -huh. Is that coffee hot enough? That's fine. Where'd Mike pick these up? Well, <clears throat> across the street. At least? No, hmm. Huh? Oh, take good. Well, drink your coffee anyway, Larson. It's getting cold. All right! All right! I didn't want to kill her. She screamed and I hit her. All I wanted was the first. That's all I wanted. She, she didn't give to me. 
She had to fight back, so I hit her. I, I didn't want to kill her. All she had to do was give me the first. I wouldn't know what I, 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 was, I was drinking, and I didn't know what I was doing. I, I, I was drunk. I was drunk. I didn't, I didn't mean to kill her. I, I, I didn't mean to kill her. Mike, there you go. Stay with him. We'll call the stenographer. See you tomorrow, Joe. Good night. Yeah. Sour racket, huh? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Frank Philip Larson was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the fifth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to police officer Charles A. Brady of the Chicago, Illinois Police Department who on the night of September 2nd, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. A ruthless fiend roams the streets of your city masquerading as a police officer. For months, helpless citizens have been robbed, beaten senseless, and kidnapped. The criminal is a twisted genius, vicious, cunning. Your job is to get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment. Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, June 4th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, the chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from communications, and it was 11.13 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Oh, hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. You got that message to call home? Yeah, bad news. What's the matter? That doggone kid of mine chicken pox. Oh, again? Last year it was a month. The year before that, the measles. Every time I get set for a vacation, he decides to catch something. Well, forget it, Ben. Think what a comfort he's going to be in your old age. Go ahead, laugh. You'll find out. Yeah. How are you, Friday? Romero? Fine. What can we do for you? You don't look like you remember me. Oh, no, wait a minute. The name's Savage, isn't it? George? Johnny, Sergeant. Johnny Savage. Remember that? Oh, sure. Those liquor store robbers out in the Wilshire District. About six, seven years ago, wasn't it? Ten years, Romero. You ought to remember that. You were the trial. We testify in court every week. Ten years is a long time. It's longer in the state pen. It's a lot longer. Now, you cried a little at that trial, didn't you, Savage? You said we beat that confession out of you. Yeah, that's why I figured I'd drop in for a little visit. I kind of apologize to you fellas. You gave me a square deal, I... Yes, I kind of lost my head. I figured I'd apologize. Oh, that's all right, Savage. When did you get out? A couple of weeks ago. I did it the hard way. Served ten flats. I don't know my day. Did you find a job yet? Yeah, Friday. I'm working nights. What kind of a job? Laborer in a warehouse, south end of town. Good. You decided to level? Ten years in prison's a long time. You learn a lot of things. Nights are long. You think a lot. You get things straightened out. I hope you mean that. Sure I mean it, Friday. I've got everything straightened out. I know who my friends are, and I know who to watch out for. You sound like maybe you're on the right track. I got it figured, Romero. I like you two fellas. You caught me red-handed, and you sent me up for ten years. Well, you did all right, Savage. Five armed robberies. You got off pretty easy. You got a break, Savage. 
Make the best of it. Sure, I'm not kicking. Ten years is a real break. That's right. Well, <laughs> I just dropped in for a little visit. Maybe I'll see you fellas sometime. All right, Savvy. Keep your nose clean? Sure. No hard feelings. No. You just took ten years of my life. That's all. There's no such thing as a man going through prison without changing. Ben and I have seen him switch in both directions. Some men learn their lesson after they land behind bars, and when they're released, they turn into good citizens. Johnny Savage was sour. We made a mental note to check him out later on, and we went down to the record bureau and pulled his coming out mug. That's about all we had time for, because about an hour later, we started to get busy. Hot shot, Joe. Grab it. On the corner of Selma and Naples, the drugstore, 211, and probable attack. On the corner of Selma and Naples, 211, and... What you got, Joe? Selma and Naples, 211 and attack. Come on. Here we are, Joe. Don't fight on the far corner. Yeah. All right. Come on. We got the story from the victim, the store owner, Mr. Thomas. For the most part, it was the usual rundown of an early morning holdup. There was only one exception. Oh, I've had young Boudin try to hold me up before, but there was nothing like this one. How do you mean, Mr. Thomas? Well, he came in here just before closing, and ordinarily I'd have kept an eye out because that's the time to look for him. But this fellow came to the door and said he was a policeman, so I let him in. He looked like a cop. Boyd's right up to me and the wife behind the counter and pointed a gun. And she screamed, and he hit her in the face with the butt of the gun. Sergeant, it, it was horrible, nervous. That's the way it started, and that's the way it kept going. Because most of the victims and most people don't realize that as a citizen, they have the right to check on police officers' identification when in doubt. After we got the story from Mr. Thomas and we checked the store in the neighborhood, Ben and I headed back to the office. Attention, all units. At the end of North Baxter Road near Hillcrest, victim of 211 and slugging. Car 7172, take the call. Go 3. Attention, all That's four units. blocks away from the last one. Let's roll on it, huh, Ben? Right, I'll hit the siren. You get the light. By the time Ben and I got up to the end of North Baxter, the men from car 71 were already there. The victim was telling his story. His face looked like it had been through a meat grinder. I was just getting in the car in a second to make the hill when I hear the siren behind me, and I, I see this red light flashing in the side view mirror. Well, naturally, I pulled over to the curb, and I was just reaching for my driver's license when the cop runs up, yanks me out of the car, and starts... Clubbing me in the face with the butt of his gun. Did you get a look at him? Think you can describe it? No, I'm afraid not. He swung me around and kept me staring at that red light on his car all the time he was beating me. After a while, everything just went black. When I woke up, my wallet was gone, all my money. Forty-five minutes later, Ben and I were interviewing the third victim, a young housewife out in the Wilshire district. Same trademark. <laughs> trying to tell him money. I tried to tell him I didn't have any money, but he wouldn't listen. He kept holding me by the throat, beating me with his fist like he enjoyed it. Beating me. Beating me. Yeah, all right. All right, Mrs. Jamerson. Could you tell us how he got in the house? He just came to the front door and rang the bell. I opened the door, but I left the burglar chain on. He said he was a policeman. So when he demanded I open the door all the way, I did. And he grabbed me. And you, can't describe the men for us, Mrs. Jamerson? He was tall, and he had dark hair and big hands. It's all, it was like a nightmare. <laughs> tall, dark hair, big hands. Your guess the same as mine, Joe? Maybe. Let's wait and see. Come on, let's check with the boss. Hi, Mike. Hi. He's waiting for you. In there. Come on, Ben. Keep the detectives of it. Hand him. Sit down. Yeah, Skipper. All right, you two, let's have it. The guy with the red light? Yes, the guy with the red light posing as a policeman. Why hasn't he been picked up? You know as much about it as we do, Ed. We got our first call around midnight. He knocked over a drugstore out on Selma. He hasn't stopped working since. Didn't you get any definite lead on him? No description, no license number? Nothing. He's tall, big hands, dark hair, that's all. Fine. Either of you got any ideas? Could be anybody, Skipper, with that description. You're sure it wasn't anybody on the force? We sent all the victims down to personnel. Lowry showed him the mug book of all police officers. Wasn't one of our men. Works fast. Drugstore, motorist, a pedestrian, a housewife out in the Wilshire district. Went right in the house after her. Four of them, right in a row. Five. Huh? There's a 20-year-old kid in the next room. Came in just before you got here. A couple of hours ago, he was sitting in the car with his girl up in Mall and Drive. This red light bandit comes along, slugs him, and kidnaps the girl. Kidnapped? She still missed? Not a trace. When did this happen? A couple of hours ago, they brought the kid over from Georgia Street Hospital. We can talk to him now. He's had a bad time. Right in here. Okay. 
Pete, we're going to have to ask you a few more questions. Oh, yeah. Okay. It feels a little better now. This is Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Hi, Pete. Hi. Can you tell us what time the trouble started? Oh, about 10, 15, 10, 30. Sally and I were sitting in the car talking about where we were going on our honeymoon. We're going to be married next month. And then this car pulls up behind us and starts flashing a red spotlight on us, and a guy runs over and pulls open the door. He said he was a cop. Did you get a good look at his car, Pete? I think it was a black sedan. Did you get a look at the man, Pete? No. No, I didn't. It was pretty dark, and he kept me staring into that red spotlight. It all happened so fast. Then he started slugging me, and I went down. What happened then? Well, the next thing I knew, Sally was screaming. He had one hand on her throat, and he had her backed up against the side of the car. He was beating her with the other hand. Some kind of a short billy club. I got up, and I started for him, and he slugged me again. When I came to, Sally was gone. Anybody check the area up there, Ed? Yeah, Davis and Griffin didn't find a thing. Oh, Sergeant, you've got to find it. you got to. I wouldn't know what to tell her, folks. I wouldn't know what to say. That's all right, Pete. We'll find her. You take it easy. Got a hot shot, Ed, up in Summit Road near Westmore. A woman, unconscious, ambulance follow-up, possible dead body. Uh, all right, Hannon. Look after Pete here. Friday, Romero, let's go. Up ahead, Romero, to the right. Okay, Skip. Yeah, there's the ambulance and the cruiser car. They're a lonely-looking spot. All right, come on. Hiya, Doc. What'd you find? Hiya, fellas. Right over here. Just gonna take her in. Uh, where'd you find her? Over there, to the side of the road. Somebody driving by us saw her. They called us. Any identification? This bracelet on her wrist. Mm. To my dearest Sally, from Pete. December 25th, 1947. That's a girl, all right. What are the chances, Doc? I wouldn't bet on them. Pretty bad shape. Well, have you seen enough? Yeah. Friday, Romero, call the crime lab and check the area for footprints and tire tracks. I'll ride back in the ambulance with the girl. If she regains consciousness, I want to talk to her. All right? Okay, Ed. I'll meet you in the office by 8.30. We're working straight through till we get this guy. See you at the office, Gilbert. Hello, Gilbert. What time you got, Ben? Seven minutes to four. Long night. Hey, that car up there ahead. Let's take a look at it, huh? Mm, black sedan. Hey, look, he's flashing a red spot on that convertible. Come on. He sees us, Joe. Pulling away. Get that gas pedal down to the floor. It's already there. He's turning off right. Get the fire and I'll get the light. We're gaining a little, Ben. Next corner to the left. Joe, where'd he go? The fancy driver. Try the alley up ahead to the left. Yeah. Must have turned up that cross street. Get through the alley and double back on him. Right. Ben, look out. Watch it. Watch it. We got hit just in front of the rear bumper. Our car was forced into the curbing and it turned over. He was real lucky. He kept right on going. But this time, Ben and I were sharing the luck. All we got out of it was a couple of nasty cracks in the head and a few bruises, but it was enough to keep us in a hospital under observation for a day. By this time, Ed Backstrand was fuming. So were the newspapers. During the day we spent in the hospital, a red light bandit went on a real blip. He pulled six more jobs, one liquor store, two residential holdups, and three car robberies. Five of the six victims were slugged and beaten. Davis and Griffin had taken over for Ben and me, and by the time we head back on the job, they'd build up a lead for us. We've been working with Wilkerson up in auto theft, Joe. He's used four stolen cars already. We got the makes and numbers on each one of them. How about the dark sedan he was driving when he rammed us? The boys picked it up this morning out on Sepulveda. We're checking it for prints now. Oh, that's fine, Dave. You got any description on the guy yet? No luck there, Joe. He works too fast. Nothing at all? The same as you had. Tall, black hair, big hands. Loves to use them. Friday, Romero, got a minute? Okay, Skipper. Check you later, honey. Sure thing, boys. Sit down. How do you feel? Pretty fair, Ed. A little stay up here and there. All right, did Davis fill you in? Up to date. Okay, I just called the doctor who was handling Sally Wilder, Pete's girlfriend. Do you remember? Oh, yeah. She's been in pretty bad shape since we found her up there on Summit Road. This morning she took a turn for the better. She's conscious, and her doctor thinks she might be able to talk to us a little bit. Good. When? About an hour. I cleared it with the doctor and with her family. You'll only be able to stay a couple of minutes to make the most of them. That's all. All right, Ed. We'll check with you later. Hey, Joe. Ben, sure. here's some mail came for you fellas while you were gone. Oh, thank you, Mike. We're going over to the county hospital. We ought to be back in a couple hours. Okay. Say, there's been a couple of phone calls, too. Yeah, anything important? I don't think so. The guy just called to say hello. Said his name was Johnny Savage. He just called to say hello. 
I presume you men are aware of the girl's critical condition. Yeah, that's right, Dr. Froman. We saw her before she was taken here to the hospital. Ah, yes. Uh, you understand, of course, that you'll be able to see her for only a few minutes, and please try your best not to excite her, huh? Right, Doctor. Sally isn't able to talk. Bad mouth and face injuries. So your questions will have to be answered simply yes or no and nod of the head. Okay, we got you. We only have a few questions, then we want to know if she can identify the man who beat her from these pictures we've got here. All right, Sergeant. This way, please. Thank you. Sally, these gentlemen are from the police department. They'd like to ask you a few questions. Uh, uh, now, there's no need to be nervous or afraid. Simply nod your head, yes or no. Now, that's fine. All right, Sally. Uh, Sally, did you see the man who attacked you? Yes. She says yes. Did you get a good look at his face? You did. All right, Sally, now you can answer these three together, just yes or no. Was he tall? Did he have dark hair? Did he have large hands? He did. Ben. Oh, yeah, Jim. Hand me the folder. Yeah, yeah. Here you go. Thanks. Uh, just one more thing, Sally. I'm going to show you some pictures now. Take all the time you want before you make up your mind about each one. If you recognize any one of these men as the person who attacked you, just nod your head, all right? All right, fine. Very good. Here's the first one. No? All right. Here's the next one. No. Uh, how about this one? No? All right. Here's another. You recognize him? This was the man? Are you sure, Sally? Thank you. That's all. Let's go. Did you uh, find what you wanted, Sergeant? Yes, Doctor, we did. Here, this one. Hmm. Nice looking chap. Who is he, Sergeant? His name's Savage, Dr. Froman. Johnny Savage. When we got back to the office, we checked in with Ed Backstrom. In five minutes, an all-points bulletin and a full description of the suspect was broadcast to every radio car, every motorcycle officer, to every sheriff and law enforcement agency in Los Angeles and Southern California. By nightfall, our manhunt was on. More than a dozen extra patrol units were called in for duty that night. And when they pulled out of the police garage, the name, the picture, and the full description of Johnny Savage was in the possession of every officer. The same for the patrolmen, whether they walked a beat downtown or out in the residential area. The picture of Johnny Savage went with them. Everything was done that could be done. On the second night of the manhunt, far out in the edge of town, Johnny Savage, the red light bandit, got his 12th victim, a 63-year-old storekeeper. Attention, all units. 939 Markham Street, near Clark, 211 and slugging, post 3, ambulance dispatched. All units. Here it is, Skipper. Tie in. What'd you get? Wilkerson lifted the prints off that black sedan at Ramsey and me. Yeah? They belong to Johnny Savage. Yeah, good. That storekeeper last night. Is a Savage, all right. Victim identified him from his mug. All right. We got enough of this Savage guy to put him a knife for life. All we have to do now is to get him. Now look, the way we figure it, Ed, this red light bandit is using stolen cars with cold plates, so there's no way of tracking down the cars at regular commercial garages. He's got to be running private garages someplace around town. All right, let's get the neighborhood patrolman on the job. Advertise it. All over town. It's a city ordinance, isn't it? People who rent private garages are bound by law to register the car and license number with the police. Start a campaign if you want, but find those cars. Right. And wait a minute. Hello, Backstrand. Yeah? When? I see. Yeah, thanks. Well, what is it, Ed? It was the hospital. About the girl, Sally. Sally Wilder? What about? She died five minutes ago. That night, everybody went back on the job as usual. The cruiser cars, the patrolmen, the motorcycle officers, and about a dozen decoy cars. Armed police women riding alone in cars or parked in lonely spots with a police officer escort. Our car, 80K, was still in the garage for repairs, so they assigned us another one. And we started to make the round. Everything was usual. Except one thing. We weren't tracking down just a thief anymore or a sadist who liked to put people's faces in. We were out to get a murderer. It was a perfect night for the suspect. Dark, no moon. I gave Ben two to one odds and I put up five dollars that we'd get Savage that night. I lost the five dollars. We cruised until seven the next morning, but there wasn't even a nibble. We had breakfast at the Federal Cafe, a little restaurant down the street from the city hall, and it was about 8.15 when we got back to the office. We were pretty tired. Robert Detail, Romero. I would like to speak to Sergeant Friday. Just a minute. For you, Jim. Okay, thanks. Friday talking. Sergeant Friday, I want to talk to you. Well, I'm listening. Go ahead. I mean, I want to talk to you in person as soon as possible. Yes, tell me over the phone. What is it? I cannot tell you over the phone. It is very important. Can you come now? Well, now, look, mister, I'm awful sorry, but we're very busy down here. 554 Ramona Avenue. Can you come now? Well, what's this all about? Who is this speaking? My name is Carl Savage. My son's name is John. <laughs> Here it is, Joe. Neat looking little place. Yeah. Yeah. 
I'm Sergeant Friday. You Mr. Savage? Yeah, come in. Okay. This is my partner, Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I will be brief, gentlemen. I am the father of John Savage. I wish for you to catch him. I, I will help you. I noticed the name on the mailbox outside, Mr. Savage. You changed your name lately? I changed my name ten years ago when John first got into trouble. My own name I had to change. The shame. Always from him, my son. Shame. Mr. Savage, has your son been home since he got out of prison? Yeah, many times to ask for money. I would not give him any, so he struck me. Last night, I read in the newspaper, the little girl he beat up. She is dead. Then I make up my mind. Do you know where your son is now, Mr. Savage? Not now, no. But our garage has a car in there. It is not his, I know. Also in the garage, I find many license plates. I find spotlights with red glass lens. But you don't have any idea where we could find him. No, but he will come back. He always comes back for money. We're going to station an officer here in the house, Mr. Savage. Anything you want, if it will catch him. He's bad, Sergeant. Like something poison. Or all, all true, he's bad. See a sewing basket over him, Mr. Savvy. The wife live here with you? Ten days ago, before this starts, I bury Gertrude, my wife, his mother. Sergeant, for ten years she's sick, but for ten years she stays alive to see him from prison. Ten days ago, she died. He did not even come to the funeral. <clears throat> Did your son have any idea that you might call us? No. No, I don't think so. But when you catch him, give me a gun. With my own two hands, I will kill him. Johnny Savage. Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand and we brought him up to date. He sent three detectives out to relieve us. Davis, Griffin, and Marsh. We told them to keep an eye on the house and the stolen car in the garage. That night after dinner, Ed Backstrand, Ben and I went out and relieved them. We parked the cruiser car in the garage next door, and then we took up our post. Carl Savage had a light supper, and then he went to bed about nine. The three of us sat at the front windows in the darkened house, and we waited. Ben kept his eye on the garage. Outside and across the city, the manhunt continued as usual. Three hours went by. The waiting got monotonous. Brandy, Ru Romero, look alive, will you? Oh, yes, Skipper, I'm sorry. That clock's enough to put anybody to sleep. Yeah, what time you got? 12.23 a.m. Thanks. The clock kept ticking. We were tired. We took turns keeping each other awake. At ten minutes past two, I looked at my watch, and then I settled back and tried to find some kind of a comfortable position. They started so faintly, it was just like the ticking of the clock. Same rhythm. And then they came closer, and the sounds got out of rhythm. Backstrand's head came up with a snap. Ready. Romero, you hear that? Yeah, Ed. Get to the window, watch the curtains. You see anything? Yeah. Yeah, somebody's coming. Savage? Can't tell. Wait a minute, it's going down. It's going up the driveway to the garage. It's going inside. I think. Come on. Watch it, he spotted us. Went over that fence into the yard. There he is, Friday. You hit him, Joe. Maybe. He's going for the street. He's headed for that car, Ed. That sedan up on the corner there. Yeah, Romero, go back and get the car. Uh, right, Skipper. Up the block before he came around. Where's Romero? I don't know. Oh, here he comes now. All right, let's go. Get that video on, Joe. Turn me on, Ed. All right, give him a call. Any sign yet? No, nothing so far. Our next court is the light, Ben. Unit 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Control four to unit 80K. Go ahead. Clear and keep frequency four open. This is an emergency. 80K, Roger. Frequency four, open and clear. Attention, all units on frequency four. Stand by. Yeah, there he is, Friday, up ahead. Dark blue sedan. Control four. We are in the pursuit of the possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the seven column. 61 Robert, 784. Use caution. Suspect is armed. Code three. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Unit 80K now pursuing possible red light bandit. Suspect is driving a dark blue 1949 sedan. License number in the seven column. 61 Robert, 784. Use caution. Suspect is on. Code 3. Your location, 80K. Control 4. We are headed east on Wilshire Boulevard, crossing La Brea. Attention, all units. Suspect is headed east on Wilshire Boulevard, crossing La Brea. Watch it, Romero. Don't lose him. I see him, Skipper. Control 4. Still pursuing red light bandit. Headed east on Wilshire, now crossing Rossmore. Attention, all units. Suspect is still headed east on Wilshire, now crossing Rossmore. Suspect is on. Use caution. Code 3. That truck pulling out of the head. Hit the siren, will you, Skipper? Yeah. Hold on, it's a tight squeeze. Anything on the 
On a tramp, we got ahead. He's got to slow down. Control four. Suspect headed east on Wilshire, crossing Western Avenue, closing in. There he goes. To go right down Sherman Alley. The dead end. Yeah. Control four. Suspect turns south into Sherman Alley, closing in on suspect. Attention, all units. Suspect has turned south into Sherman Alley. There he is, Skipper. Pulling up ahead. He's jumping out. All right, take the mic, will you? Here. Come on, Ben. I'll direct the other cars in. If you need help, I'll All right, Skipper. All right, which way to go, Ben? Down the front of the building. Come on. We're starting up the back fire escape. All right, keep him busy. All right, Savage, come on down. He wants to go the rough way. One more chance, Savage. Come on down. No use, Joe. He's heading up for the roof. Come on. Well, he climbs like a monkey. Come on, let's get him here. Here, I'll give you a hand. Here, here's the rough part. Where'd he go? I don't know. Let's spread out. All right, Savage, you're through. Throw your gun out. Come out with your hands up. Watch it, Joe. He's running for the edge. He's going to jump. I'll get him. All right, this guy back here. You lousy copper, you dirty lousy copper. I'll kill you out. You're through, Savage. You're through. <laughs> Good, you know. Throw the cuffs on, will you? Yeah, you just bet you. Yeah. You want to smoke? Yeah, it's your usual. Thanks. Hmm. Quiet up here. Yeah. I was just thinking. Well, Carl Savage, this guy's father. Mm-hmm. What about him? Nothing. What would you do, Ben, if your son was a murderer? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. John Savage was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the sixth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Patrol Officer Robert Steele of the Montana State Highway Patrol, who on the morning of November 2nd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You've been off duty two hours. You receive an emergency call from the chief detective. An entire block in the heart of your city is threatened with complete destruction. Your job... Report at once. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, November 15th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were off duty reporting in on an emergency call. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 8.32 a.m. when I walked in the Spring Street entrance of the city hall. You, Sergeant Friday? Yeah, that's right. Now take my elevator, Sergeant. It's the only one in service. All right. I'll run you up to 16. The chief's waiting for you up there. What's the pitch? Only one elevator in service out of ten? The place looks deserted. What's going on? Nobody in the building. All the office people have been sent home. Lots of trouble. 
Somebody declare a holiday? No joke, Sergeant. Big trouble. All right, you convinced me. What is it? Here we are. 16th floor. Over here, Penny. Hi, right, Joe. Hello, Ben. You made good time. Came as soon as I got the call. Sorry to have to bring you back in. You worked last night, didn't you? Yeah, midnight to eight this morning. Sorry. Come on. Okay. What is it? Here for a while, huh? Sure. Wait till we get inside. In here. Okay. Number one, let's keep our voices down. All right. I'll make it as brief as I can. Every minute counts. What time you got, Friday? 8.33. All right, here it is. 55 minutes ago, a man walked into this building with a homemade bomb under his arm. If we don't release his brother from the county jail by 9 o'clock this morning, he says he'll pull the trigger on the bomb and blow up the whole building. He's kidding, Skipper. Who is the guy? Name's Vernon Carney. Here's his package. He and his brother have been in and out of jail since 1937. Small-time thieves. Yeah. There's the FBI kickback. We had him once before, both of them. Brother's name is Elwood, serving a year for a car stripping. And this two-bit thief is sitting here in the city hall with a bomb on his lap? That's right. In the next room. What kind of a bomb is it, Ed? You think he's bluffing? Could be bluffing, but the crime lab says no. Lee Jones from the lab get a look at? Been in there twice. One end of the box is glass. Says you can't see much without a closer look, but you can't get near the guy. What do you want us to do? It's a volunteer job. You can take it or leave it. I won't order you to do it. How you want to handle it? You sure you want a piece of this one, Romero? No, he doesn't, Ed. He's got a family. Get me another single man. We'll give it a try. Wait a minute, Joe. What makes this, uh, this job so different? Anytime we kick a door in, we never know what's on the other side. That's what makes it different. This time we do. No, you're not going to cut me out. Not the only time I know what I'm getting into. All right. Chandler's tried. Hannon, Davis, Watson, they've all tried. This guy, Connie, knows what he's doing. He's no pushover. But somebody's got to get that bomb away from him. Friday, Romero, it's your baby now. I looked at my watch. It was 8.36. We left Backstrand and started down the hall. If Carney was going to make good his threat to blow up the building by 9 o'clock, we had exactly 24 minutes to talk him out of it. Ben and I figured we'd better look him over first and then work out some kind of a plan. Maybe just talking to him would do it. Vernon Carney was sitting in a straight back chair against the far wall facing the door. He was seated between two windows that looked out over the city. Along the left wall was a row of six wooden chairs. In the center of the right wall was a connecting door leading to the office where Backstrand had briefed us. The door was locked on both sides. Just off center and favoring the left of the room was a small filing table. The other furniture in the office was a desk just forward of the connecting door on the right. There was a dictaphone on the desk. In the near left corner, shielded by a white screen, was a small wash basin. The faucet leaked. Vernon Carney was middle-aged. He sat erect, holding a black box on his lap. He held his right hand inside one end of the box. Ben and I stood there for a minute and looked at him. Then we walked in the room. What do you say to a man with a bomb? That boat or not? Cigarette, Carney? I'm not smoking right now. What are you trying to prove? You know what I want. We're not going to let your brother out of jail. You've got until 9 o'clock to change your mind. According to that clock on the wall, you've got 24 minutes. If we go, you're going with us, Carney. Don't take much of a brain to figure that, copper. What made you think you could get away with this? Haven't yet. It ain't nine o'clock. Unless that clock's slow. Haven't checked it against my pocket watch lately. That's the one that's running this show. Have you given any thought to all the innocent people that are going to go off with that thing of yours there? My brother's innocent. I want him out of jail. The court says he's guilty. He'll get out when he serves his time. That's where you're wrong, copper. He gets out at nine o'clock this morning. All right, come on, Carney. Get your hand out of that box. Put the box on the table. You think I'm bluffing, don't you? I'm going to let you get within five feet before I make a liar out of you. Okay, Kearney. I guess you mean business. You can take three more steps and find out for sure. Well, we did let your brother out. We'd just come out and pick him up again, you along with him. If you could find it. Let's get this straight. If we let your brother Elwood out, how do we know you're going to keep your promise? What promise? I ain't made any promises. You just get Elwood down here first, and then we'll talk about it. There's only one thing I can't figure, Carney. Yeah, what's that? If we don't let your brother out, you say you'll pull the trigger on that bomb. You're going to kill a lot of innocent people. What are you going to prove by that? It's 8.37. You've got 23 minutes left. Now, I wish you'd answer that one for me. Why do you want to kill a lot of innocent people? Don't try to con me, copper. I know they cleared everybody out of this building 45 minutes ago. I know they cleaned out the whole block. They got it roped off. Where'd you get your information? I got a couple of windows here to look out of. Don't you think it's about time to send somebody over to get Elwood? You know, Carney, we've got a way out of this. We don't have to let your brother out, neither. I've heard that before. What's to stop us from leaving the building along with the other few officers and let you sit here and touch off that bomb? Go ahead. It won't be a long wait without you. 
Who are you trying to kid? You'd let me blow up $10 million worth of taxpayers' money? <laughs> oh, no. You're going to let Elwood out. You'll wait till the last minute to do it. But you'll let him out. Ed, I'm still not convinced Trenny can back up what he says. Then why didn't you take the box away from him? Yeah. We're in a spot. Let's face it. How about an eye for an eye, Skipper? What do you mean? If he pulls the trigger on that machine, he kills us. How about us getting him first? All right, Romero. How are you going to handle it? I'm not top man on the pistol range, but I could wing him. And then he hands the box to you? Or maybe he falls and his reflex action pulls the trigger. Okay, I don't wing him. I stop him for keeps. You just can't walk in there and shoot him down. Why not? You do the same thing with armed criminals. Yeah, but you warn him first. I'll warn him. Yeah, and after you shoot him, you find out it's a harmless gadget. Couldn't have gone off in a million years. Oh, no, a gun's not the answer. We can't shoot him until we're positive. It'll be positive by 9 o'clock, and there might not be anybody around to shoot him. We've located Carney's apartment. There's a detail out there checking it now. But Shelley and Morris. Ed, have you got any ideas at all? Anything we could try? That's why I called you in. None of us have gotten any further than you did just now. There's just one thing I want to know for sure. Yeah, Friday. Is it or isn't it? We all want to know. Either way, we've got to get that box away from him. Thanks, friend. Yeah. You did? Yeah. No, stay out there till I call you. All right, here's half the answer. That was Pacelli. They found 28 sticks of dynamite in Carney's apartment. We knew Carney wasn't kidding now. We could see into the bomb through that glass window in one end. It looked like dynamite inside, and there was dynamite in Carney's room. We didn't know if he had the nerve to pull the trigger. We didn't know if it would go off when he did. But with only minutes remaining, nobody wanted to take the chance. From here on in, all of us agreed that Vernon Carney sat in the next room, holding in his two hands a force powerful enough to destroy us all. We had to get that box away from him, and to get that box, we had to have a plan. I looked at my watch. It was 8.40. 20 minutes till 9 o'clock. How do we get it away from him? I got an idea. It might work. Let's have it. Carney's sitting against the far wall between two windows. They're both open. Yeah, that's right. All right, if we could get a man through one of those windows, we might get Carney from behind. How are you going to get him? Whoever gets through the window could slug him. What do you do then? Somebody grabs the box. The crime lab can tell us what to do with it. How do we get a man through one of those windows? We're on the 16th floor. Well, there's some kind of a ledge that runs around the building on each story. Wide enough for a man to walk on? Now, let's take a look. All right. Looks pretty narrow, Joe. That's a good 18 inches. Could be done. No, too risky. It's raining out. That ledge is slippery. Strong wind out there, Joe. Tear a man right off the building. Yeah, I guess you're right. Well, there's still a way. How about a ladder? Sixteen floors, Skipper. There might be a way. The fire department would know that. I'll get Battalion Chief Erickson. Is Lee Jones in the building? No, he's over in the crime lab. I'll get him up here, too. I don't know, Friday. Maybe it'll work. It's got to, Ed. All right, now look. It's going to take a couple of minutes to set this up. We've got to know what Carney's doing every second of that time. Well, how about the dictaphone in there on there? Good. Get it on without him seeing you. We'll try. The dictaphone in there is connected to this one in here. This room is 1614. You got that? Yeah. All right, push down key 1614 on that machine in there and leave it down. Get the receiver off the hook and leave it off. Leave the receiver off. That's right. You know, if it isn't off the hook, we won't be able to hear a thing in here. All right, come on, Ben. This is back, friend. Give me Chief Erickson. Where's my brother? Still in his cell. You coppers are long on talk, but short on time. Yeah, we know. I'm telling you, for your own good, you'd better get Elwood over here. Honey... I'll bet if we get your brother on the phone here, he'll tell you he doesn't want any part of this. You mean Elwood don't want out? In point. Sure he wants out, but not your way. He's only got a year to serve. Why don't you leave him alone? I told Elwood. I told him I'd get him out. He didn't think I could do it. But I'm doing it. I'll make you a bet, Carney. Let us get your brother on the phone. He won't walk out of here with you. Get him on the pipe. Where are you going? The phone's over here. I have to use the dictaphone. If they get an okay from the chief, Elwood's still a prisoner. What's the matter with the phone? No operators. You know the building's been cleared. Oh, yeah. That's right. Almost forgot. Okay, you can use the dictaphone. This Friday, Ed. Arnie wants to talk to his brother. Yeah, I know you'll have to send somebody over. Have them put the call on extension. Wait a minute. What's that extension number, Ben? 2351. 2351, Ed. Right. It'll take a minute. Yeah. I'd kind of like to talk to El. Been a couple of months since I've seen him. We've always been together, me and El, most of the time. Yo, let's go and see if we can hurry that call. Good idea, boy. Sixteen minutes to nine. Hey, cop. Yeah. Forgot to hang up the dictaphone, didn't you? I put the receiver back on the dictaphone. Ben and I had failed to make good on the first step of the plan. When we got outside the door... We briefed Davis and Watson. They went in to sit with Carney. It would be their job to keep us posted on Carney's movements. The dictaphone was out. 
We went back into the office next door. Chief Sam Erickson of the fire department and Lieutenant Lee Jones from the crime lab were already there. We told Backstrand what happened. It would have been a help. We haven't got time to cry over it. Barney's is wide awake, Skipper. He doesn't miss a thing. Backstrand told us the plan, Friday. We can't run a ladder up from the street. Too high, Chief? Best we got us a hundred foot area. We figure twelve foot to the story. That will take you up ninety six feet, eight floors. And we've got the latest equipment. What's the idea you had, Jones? Sam, can you get hold of a pump here in a hurry? Sure, we got a lot of scaling ladders, but you got nothing up there to hook them on. You figure on dropping down from the floor above? That's right, and I figure a pump here would do it. Sure it would. You can make it past to the windowsill up there, but you got a foot and a half ledge in the way. No, what you want is a lifeline. You mean lower a man on a rope, Chief? Yeah, Romero. That's the quickest and the quietest. Could you rig it so one of my boys could do it? Sure. What's the risk? None, if you work it right. We'll strap on a life belt, give the man heavy leather gloves. Two of my men will lower him down. Pick the lightest man. What do you think, Lee? That's it. What do we do with the bomb when we get it? I figure that box Connie's holding is about a foot square. Here's what I'll do. I'll get you a bucket with a foot and a half mouth. It'll be full of water. Yeah. I'll have it right outside the door of that office. When you get that box, place it in the water. We'll get the bucket out of the building as fast as we can. And once we get the bomb under water, we're in the clear. And I can't promise you that, but it's the safest way to handle it under the circumstances. All right, that's the procedure. Sam, you take care of your end right away. I'll get a detail to give me a hand down on the street. We'll have a car ready to take the bomb to a safe area to decommission it. Work as fast as you can. Come on, Sam. Our baby, Joe. That's right. Which part of it you want, the rope or the bomb? You call it. Fire Chief Erickson says the lightest man on the rope. That's me, Joe. All right, I'll get the bomb out of the building. Okay, that's the routine. But carry this with you. The man that comes down on that rope has one chance to make good. You slug him and make it count because there's no second try. Yeah. And Joe, when you grab that box, you've got to get it away from Carney before he can squeeze the trigger. Then you've got to get it down into the street. The elevator. You know how to operate it? That's well, pretty simple, but I'll double check with the operator. Better do it right now. Okay. Ed, we better get Carney's brother on the phone for him. He seemed anxious. Might be a pretty good stall. All right, Romero. That's the outside phone. Get the city jail. Let's right, Get going, Friday. Okay. Hey, you. Elevator man. Uh, yeah, Sergeant. Let me see if I know how to work that thing. You taking over the elevator? Well, in a couple of minutes. You want to check me out? Nothing to it, Sergeant. All right. Now, here's the control, see? Mm-hmm. You push this lever right to go up, left to go down. You see this little trigger on the underside of the handle? Yeah. That's the safety lock. Be sure you squeeze it or you can't move the lever. Let me try it. That's it. Right to go up, Mm -hmm. left to go down. Right to go up, left to go down. How do you operate the doors? Automatic. They work off the control lever. When the control lever is locked in the up or down position, the doors will close. I get it. Now, in case they jam, this red emergency button up here? Yeah. We push it. If that doesn't close them, we call the repairman. Okay, I think I got it. You sure now? I've had my orders to get out of the building. I'll just leave the elevator right here and take the stairs down. All right. Thanks a lot. Uh, Sergeant, Hmm? uh, just curious. You going to take the bomb down in this car? We're going to try. You won't have any trouble. We haven't had an elevator failure in 18 months. The elevator man turned and went down the stairs. Outside of a handful of volunteers and a man with a bomb, the city hall was now cleared. I started down the corridor and met Ben outside the office. He told me that Lee Jones and Chief Erickson were on their way up in the freight elevator at the rear of the building with the necessary equipment. The two fire department volunteers were with him. The phone call had been put through to the city jail, and in a moment, Elwood Carney would be ready at the other end of the line. We went in to tell Carney. I told him over at the jail to put the call through on extension 2351. Yeah. When's it coming through? Right now. You got Elwood with you? No. Look, Carney. We told you we'd get him on the phone for you. The call will be through in a minute. Minutes a long time, cop. You only got 12 of them left. Elwood's going to talk you out of this. Oh, sure. Sure, everybody's going to talk me out of this. First, it was them other two cops, the little porky guy and that other monkey. Then you and this Dixie Doughhead here. Now it's Elwood. Come off it, will you, and get my brother over here. That's him. It's your brother, Connie. I'll get him. They put you... Just going to get the phone. You want to talk to your brother, don't you? I'll take care of the phone. We'll just connect it for a while. Now get it straight, copper. I'm through with your stinking rotten lying. I want Elwood here. And I want him now. Bring him here before I blow you all to pieces. What's going on? Who threw that phone out in the hall? I did. You want me to go out and pick it up? Connie, that's not going to get you any place. You the big boss around here? Maybe. Why are you, aren't you? I answered you. All right, big boy. I've got a piece of advice for you. Take your rookie cops here and get it through their heads. I mean what I say. I want my brother over here in this room. And you've got just 11 minutes to get it done. Tell him that, will you, boy? All right, Connie. It's your show. All right, we've got to work fast now. Jones, everything set for you? Get the bucket with the water right here. Car's waiting down the street. Right. Erickson, your boy's ready? Upstairs, waiting. And we all know what to do. Ed, i got to have somebody to give me a hand with Carney when he falls. I'll be in there with you, Friday. Let's go upstairs, T. Anytime. Oh, one thing you ought to know. What's that? 
strong wind coming up. About 20 miles an hour out there right now. That's going to louse us up? No, but it's going to increase the sway. Got to allow for it. How you mean? Wind's coming from the south. We'll lower you just to the right of the window. If I figure it correctly, the wind will do the rest. Bigger risk, but we don't control the weather. How you going to do it, Ben? As soon as I get in position, I'll reach in through the window on his right. I'll use the belly. Try to catch him on the right side of his head. One good hit should put him away. Let's just make it two and be sure, huh? Right. You ready, Chief? Well, let's go. Ben. Yeah? Nothing. I'll be careful. You too, huh? What's the time, Friday? 8.50. Shouldn't take more than a couple of minutes for Romero to get down to that window. Unless the wind gives him trouble. Jones, no use you sticking around. I'll give Friday a hand. That's my job. We've got to keep you alive to decommission the bomb. Bomb joke. See you downstairs. You ready, Ed? Yeah. Scared, Friday? Yeah. That makes us even. Come on. Ed Backstrand and I went into the next room with Vernon Carney. Our job was to keep him occupied until Ben was lowered to the windowsill from the floor above. Ben was going to make a try from the window on Carney's right. Somehow, we had to keep Carney's attention on us and away from that window. If anything went wrong and Carney got out of position, the plan would fail. If Ben was spotted, the plan would fail. If Chief Erickson didn't estimate the force of the wind correctly, the plan would fail. After Ben slugged Carney, my timing had to be perfect. If it wasn't, the plan would fail. I looked at my watch. It was eight minutes to nine. Carney, anything we can say that'll make you change your mind? I've asked you a hundred times. Now I'm ordering you. You're going to get to a phone and have somebody send Elwood over here right now. I'm through waiting. Now move. You ripped out the phone, Carney. Well, find another one. I told you I'm sick of your two bits stalling. We've got until nine o'clock to make up our mind about this. You had until nine. But you wouldn't do what I told you. Now I'm cutting you short. You guys have got exactly one minute to get a phone in this room where I can hear you call the jail and have them send Elwood over here. You said nine, Carney. All right, Joe. We'll give him what he wants. Davis, unlock the connecting door to this office. I'll get the phone, Ed. Will the cord reach? Yeah. Your brother's a prisoner. He's in our custody and he's under our protection. We can't place his life in jeopardy. Why not leave it up to Al? Here's the phone, Ed. Yeah. Kenworthy, this is Backstrand. We want Elwood Carney over here at City Hall. His brother wants to see him. Explain the situation. If he wants to come, get him over here. Leave it up to him. Room 1614. You'll have to use the freight elevator. And tell him to hurry. Yeah. Tell him to hurry. That's the only smart thing you've done today. Now, why don't you go next door and figure out another angle? We'll wait for Elwood, too. You don't think I'd let you get out now, do you? We're all going to wait right here for my brother. In case he don't show up, you're going to see me pull the plug. Just sit down. Not the close. Right where you are, sit down. Loud clock, ain't it? Windy. Getting cold in here. Sure, a loud clock. Real windy. Maybe I ought to close the windows. Don't want to catch any of cold. I turn on the heat. Stay put, cop. Hey, what's that? What's going on? Just the wind. Shut up. Hey. There's somebody out there. I can see his feet. You stupid cops. Pull him up. Get back there. You pull him up. Ready, told him to pull him up. Right. All right, Johnny. You win. You bet I win, you dumb copper. You didn't think I'd miss a trick like that. We'll just close these windows, boys. Here's one. And lock it. Here's, the... Here's your brother, Connie. Yeah. I am. Hi, Vern. You did it. I told you. I told you I'd do it, didn't I? That's far enough for the rest of you. Hell, come on over here. You're crazy, Vern. You're crazy. Yeah, that's what they've been trying to tell me. We're going home, Al. How are you going to do it? There's a million cops outside. People all over town heard about this. They're holding the crowd back. They ain't going to stop us now, Al. They'll never make it. Either one of you. I got him this far, didn't I? We'll make it. Burn, you think we could do it? Hey, you. Yeah? You're going to get a car ready for us, a fast one. Have it in front of the building. Move! All right, Fanny, do what he tells you. Right. Hold it. 
And if you ain't back by nine o'clock, the deal still holds. And I told them I'd pull the pin at nine, now, if they didn't let you out. You ain't fooling, are you, Vern? Will that desert really blow? Four miles high. You know what that means, then? Yeah. But they won't let you pull it. We're getting out. All right, copper. Get the car. You got four minutes. What happened? He spot me? Yeah, there's no time to explain now. Listen, we gotta work fast. Yeah. We had to bring Connie's brother over from the jail. I don't think he cares if they get out or not. He just wants to use that bomb, and for some crazy reason, he's waiting until nine. How much time we got? Yeah. Less than four minutes. How about the lead? You think you can do it? Strong wind. You'll have to hang on like a fly. I don't know. I can give it a try. Okay. Same plan. Every second counts. Now, I can't brief Ed. He's in the room with the guy. It's up to you and me. I'll get on the ledge from one of these offices. I hope we make it. If you don't, we'll know you tried. Hurry. Hey, man, wait a minute. Yeah, I forgot. The windows. The one on his right. He locked it. He'll have to crawl around to the one on the left. You got it? Right. Okay. Carl will be ready in two minutes. Up front. Fine. Ellen and I will just sit here and wait. It's going to be good being back together, huh, El? We always were real good together, Vern. Yeah, that's the way brothers ought to be together all the time. Together. Uh... Burn, I'd feel better with a gun. We don't need no gun, Al. <laughs> we got the bomb. We'll need a gun when we get out, when we get on the road. Okay. Take your pick. They all got them. Hey, you, give him yours. I'm not carrying a gun. I left it in the other room. A cop without a gun? Who's kidding who? I left it in the other room. Risk the big boy, Al. He's got one. About time for the car, ain't it? Two minutes to nine. Yeah, this feels like it. Right on his hip. Burn, hey, look out! Grab him, Joe, I got him. Get the box. Leave that gun alone. I got him, Ben. Get his hand out of it. Run, Joe, get it in the water. Run! In a fast elevator, 16 floors isn't very much. But I've never shared an elevator with a live bomb. Seemed like minutes between floors. I kept watching the bucket. The bomb was completely underwater. A small stream of bubbles was hissing to the surface. I waited. Main floor. I picked up the bucket and ran for the street. I missed the first step. I fell forward. The bucket spun out of my hand. I sprawled flat on the sidewalk. I waited for the explosion. It didn't go off Friday. Yeah. I gave it a good chance, Lee. It was all there. Look, at least a dozen sticks of dynamite. Snyder, bring that over here. Here you are, Lieutenant. Thanks. Here's why it didn't go off. Had it rigged for a hard trigger pull. Would have taken a good yank to set this one off. Yeah. Hi, Joe. Hi, man. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Vernon Carney was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be incompetent. He is now confined in the State Mental Institution for the Criminally Insane. Elwood Carney is now serving the balance of his sentence with no time off for good behavior. You have just heard the seventh in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Town Marshal Lon T. Larson of the Mount Pleasant, Utah Force, who, on the night of October 15, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
ladies and gentlemen. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to missing persons detail. You've never heard of Fountain Green, Utah. You've never heard of Juanita Lasky. Los Angeles is a big city, 452 square miles, 3,356,969 people. Your job, find her. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law to an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 12th. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch on missing persons detail. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Frank. I was on my way back from lunch, and it was 12.47 p.m. when I got to room 67A. Missing persons detail. Four G. Federal Cafe. Good soup today. What kind? Uh, corn chowder. It was real good. The place is jammed with Christmas chowder. I had to wait. Mm. Haven't even started my shopping yet. You? Mm -hmm. i got to pick up something for my mother. Prices are high. I'll send a lot of cards. When you get married, Joe? Ever try to sell a Christmas card to a kid? They got to have something with wheels on it. Mm, I guess you're right. Missing persons, Friday. Fountain Green, Utah, calling the Los Angeles Police Department. Bureau of Missing Persons. My party will speak with anyone in charge. This is Missing Persons, Sergeant Friday. That's wrong, please. Mrs. Lasky, ready with your call to Los Angeles. Hello. 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 This is your party. Go ahead, please. Uh, operator. Yes, ma'am. Uh, could you please give me the charges for this call? I'm using my neighbor's phone. All right, ma'am. Please signal when your call is completed. Oh, yes, yes. I I'll do that. Hello. Uh, hello. Are you missing persons? Yes, ma'am. Sergeant Friday. This is Mrs. Hannah Lasky. I'm calling you from Fountain Green, Utah. Yes, ma'am. This is Cindy Carson. My daughter, Juanita Lasky. I, I haven't heard from her in well over a month, and I I'm terribly worried. Where was she staying in Los Angeles, Miss Lasky? At the Chelsea Hotel for Women. I, I, I have the address. Uh, 941 South Melrose Street. I can't understand it. Ever since Juanita's been away from home, she's Written twice a week regularly. When's the last time you heard from her? The last letter I have is used last November 2nd. You know how it is, Sergeant. We have no relatives in Los Angeles, and, and she's trying to find work down there, living all alone. I, I just don't know what to do. All right, Ms. Lasky, I'll take her description over the phone and make out a preliminary report. You'll have to send us a photograph of your daughter and a letter to the effect that you want us to trace her. I'll get the letter and the snapshot off today. Now, what's your daughter look like? What's her full name? K-E-Y. No, 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 no. All right. Her age, weight, and height. She was 26 last July 10th, 128 pounds, and about my height. How tall are you, Ms. Lasky? Oh, okay. Uh, 5 feet 7 inches. She has auburn hair. It's quite long, and her eyes are green. Okay, I got it. Any outstanding scars, birthmarks, anything that might help identify her? Uh, what's that? I say any outstanding scars, birthmarks, anything <laughs> that might help us identify her. Where can we contact you, Ms. Lasky? 122 Brigham Young Street, Fountain Green, Utah. When you find me, Juanita, someone should have her call me right away. Uh, I'll pay for the call. We'll do that, Ms. Lasky. What's your number up there? This is the neighbor's phone, but for the mail, call me. It's Fountain Green 14R2. Yeah. You will try to find her as fast as you can. We'll go to work on it. Well, Juanita, all of them told her the Christmas holidays. You think she's all right? I wouldn't worry about it, Ms. Lasky. We'll call you just as soon as we get any kind of a list on her. No charge. If your daughter's in Los Angeles, I think we can find it. Oh, if there's anything wrong, you'll let me know right away? Yes, ma'am. You're very kind. Goodbye. Bye. What you got, Joe? Some girl owes her mother a letter. Come on, Ben. Just a routine call. We made the usual check, the morgue, all the hospitals, the county jail. And then we went through the repeater file. We found a Juanita Lasky in the file, but the agent description didn't match. We put that lead in the discard. After the usual paperwork, 
the next step was to check her last known residence, the Chelsea Hotel for Women. There it is, Joe. Chelsea Hotel. Yeah. 55 rooms all outside. You're home away from home. Now let's go in. Chelsea Hotel. Thank you. Here's the bell. Yes, sir. May I help you? We're looking for a Miss Juanita last week. I'll ring her room. Whom do I say is calling? Is she in? I believe so. I just saw her about an hour ago. Okay. Would you ring her room, please? Uh, yes, sir. And whom shall I say is calling? My name's Friday. All right, Mr. Friday. Just a moment. Do you wish to speak with her on the phone, or shall I have her come down? Ask her to come down if she doesn't mind. She doesn't need to answer. That's funny. I'll ring again. No, sir. She doesn't seem to be in. Would you like to leave a message? Didn't you say you saw her about an hour ago? Yes, I did. She must have gone out again. I wonder if we could check her room. Oh, no. Gentlemen are not allowed about the main lobby. I'm sorry, ma'am. We're from the police department. Missing persons. I'm Sergeant Friday. This is Sergeant Romero. Oh, yes. You men are from missing persons, did you say? Yes, ma'am. Well, I'm sure Wani just, just stepped out for a moment if you'd care to wait here in the lobby. We haven't got much time, ma'am. We'd appreciate it if you'd show us a room. Certainly. I'll get you to talk to you. That's good. 215. The elevator's right this way. Thank you. What seems to be the trouble? Some friend of Juanita's missing? No, ma'am. Juanita. Juanita? I don't understand. Her mother's a little worried about her. Down this way. Here we are. No wonder she didn't hear the phone. She's in the shower. Yes, ma'am. Um, would you wrap on the bathroom door until we'd like to talk to her as soon as she throws? We'll wait out here in the hall. Thank you. Juanita? Juanita? Darling, there are two gentlemen here to see you. Juanita? Juanita? I'm coming in. It's Miss Waters. Sergeant? Yeah? There's no one in the shower. It's running, isn't it? Yes, I see a rose and towel all laid out. We better take a look around. Turn off the shower, will you? Yeah. She must have left in a hurry. Hey, there's a fresh change of clothing on the bed. Where's the closet, ma'am, this door? Yes, that's right. Closet full of clothes. There's a couple of pieces of luggage in there. It isn't like one, either. Funny, isn't it? You say you saw about an hour ago. Yes, I did. Coming in or going out? Oh, coming in, I thought. You have room service here? Yes, we have a coffee shop downstairs. The tray of food here on the table hasn't been touched. Coffee's still warm. Cut that radio off, will you, Ben? Yeah. Could she have gotten out of the building without you seeing her? No, we don't have a rear entrance. I'm sure you didn't see her go out the front door just before we got here? No. No, I did not. How about her mail? Has she been picking it up lately? I think so. We can check that down at the desk. Yeah, here's some letters. Postmark Utah. Return address. Mrs. H. Lask. Mark, this is one of your telephone message forms. Well, let me see. Yes, yes, that's right. And as long as this call operator two five is in your call. According to this clip, this call was received at one twenty five today. May I see that, sir? Yes, that's said, Mrs. Riding. Mrs. Collison took that call. She relieved me for lunch. Well, do you know whether she returned this call? Well, if she did, there'll be a record down at the desk. Uh -huh. Now you're positive that you saw Winnie last year an hour ago. Yes, wow, I'm sure. Just about an hour ago. Five feet, seven hundred twenty eight pounds, three eyes, red hair. Really? Her mother told us that Juanita Lasky had red hair. Now, we weren't too surprised. A lot of women change the color of their hair. It would make identification a little more difficult, but not impossible. We checked down at the desk. Juanita Lasky had picked up all her mail, but she had not answered that long-distance phone call to Fountain Green. The next step was to question some of the people in the Chelsea Hotel who knew Juanita. We tried room 217. Yeah, oh, Gloria. These men are police officers. They want to ask you some questions. Well, yes. Is it all right for them to... Yes, yes, of course. This is an exception. Won't you come in? Thank you. What's your name, miss? Gloria Edgerton. You know Wendy Golaski? Yes, I know her. She has a room right next door to me. Have you seen her today? No, I haven't. I've been out doing my Christmas shopping. Why? We were trying to locate her, Miss Edgerton. Wasn't well, she in her room? I thought I heard a shower going. Yes, she did, but she wasn't in there. When was the last time you saw her? Last night at dinner. We always eat dinner together. Did she say anything that might lead you to believe that she was going in one day? No. She said she might do some Christmas shopping today. So I suggested she go with me. She agreed. She said she'd email this morning. Did she? No, she didn't. I just assumed that maybe she was sleeping in, so I went on alone. 
Are you sure he hasn't just stepped out? We don't know. You're just going down to the corner. It's a little unusual to leave the shower running, the radio on, and let your lunch get cold. Did she do that? How long has Juanita had Juan here? Well, ever since I've known her, about six months. We moved in here together. We work at the same place. Where's that, Jackson? At the Cracky Building. We're elevator operators. I see. Who's your immediate superior down there? Darlene Camp. She cheap started. Mm -hmm. Got that, Ben? Mm -hmm. She have many dates? No, not too many. Juanita likes to go steady. Who was her steady boyfriend? Paul Matthews. He works in the Cracky Building, too. He's in the dental lab for Dr. Welty. It's for... Well, is there anything else that you'd like to add that might help us find her? Well, are you sure she's lost? The Claggett Building is in the heart of downtown Los Angeles. It's a business and professional building. Cornerstone says erected 1924 and it stands 12 stories high. The main entrance is on Hill Street. Are you Darlene Camp? Yes, just a moment. Going out. All right, Dora. I hope I'm Sergeant Friday, Police Department, this is Sergeant Romero. Yes, sir. Do I need a last few work for you? Yes, she does. She's one of my operators. When's the last time you saw her? Mm -hmm. Anything wrong? No, no, we're just trying to locate her. <laughs> you just missed her about 45 minutes. All right, Sylvia. She was in to pick up a check. Do you know where she cashes it yet? Most of the girls cash them out at the bank on the corner. There's only one around here over on 8. You say about 45 minutes ago? Yes, that's right. Thanks very much, Miss Camp. Come on, Ben. Going up. All right, Marion. Well, the bank's not far from here. That is kind of funny, isn't it? What's that? Her room, the shower, the radio, that one. They were pulled out in a hurry. What do you think? I don't know what to figure. It's a new one on me. She's alive. We know that. She was 45 minutes ago, anyway. Hmm. Christmas is here. Santa Claus is in. Yeah. Uh -oh. I beg your pardon, sir. Yeah, that's all right. Merry Christmas. Same to you. Here we are, Jim. You better check with the manager, huh? You the manager? I'm the assistant manager. Can I help you? Police department. Yes, sir. I'd like to find out if a check has been cashed here within the hour. Yes, sir. And what's the party's name? Lasky, Juanita, payroll check, Pocket building. Yes, sir. I know Miss Lasky. If you'll uh, step behind the counter, I'll get the check. Thank you. If you'll uh, just wait right here. Okay, thanks. Wonder why she stopped writing to her mother. That's a good question. When we find her, we'll ask her. Wonder if anything was wrong where she worked. No, it didn't seem to be. We'll check back there when we finish here. Yeah. That boyfriend, Paul Matthews, too. Yeah, well, here's our man. Yes, sir. Here's the cancel check. I okay it. You sure it's the same girl? Long girl, elevator operator in the Claggett building. Was she alone? So. Did she appear normal? No. no. She didn't seem to be as friendly as she usually is. Now, does she have an account here? She did have a small savings account here, but she closed it out about a month ago. I see. Well, here's our card. If you have to see her again, give us a call. I'll do that. Thank you very much. Entirely welcome. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. We went back to the Claggett building, then called the Chelsea Hotel from the phone booth in the lobby of the building. Miss Waters, the manager, was keeping a sharp lookout, but Juanita Lasky had not been heard from. Paul Matthews worked in a dental lab for a Dr. Welling. His office was number 637. Yes, I'm help We'd like to see Paul Matthews. I'm Paul Matthews. We're from Missing Persons Police Department, Sergeant Friday. I'm Sergeant Merrill. Yes, sir. Do you know a Juanita Lasky? Yes, sir. When's the last time you saw her? Saturday night. We went to a show. Is there something wrong? We're trying to locate her. Do you see a lot of each other? Yes, we do. I don't understand. Yes. Lasky disappeared from the hotel a couple hours ago. Thought maybe you might know where she is. No, I don't. Today's a day off. Maybe she's out shopping. Has Juanita done anything wrong? No, it's just that her mother hasn't heard from her for quite some time. I can explain that. Juanita's an elevator operator here in the building. That's how I met her. They don't make much money, you know. Yeah. She was having a hard time making ends meet. She sends money home to her mother every month or so, and besides that, she's got to pay rent and buy clothes and eat. It's pretty rough. She seemed despondent over all this? No, I wouldn't say that, but she was kind of unhappy about not getting a raise. Did she have any outside job? No, sir, she didn't. What kind of a girl is she? What do you mean? Cheerful, good-natured. Oh, sure. Fine girl. We get along swell. I, I, I still don't get it. Well, maybe there's nothing to it. Just routine chair. I hope she's all right. When did all this come up? A couple of hours ago. We might have to check back with you. If I can help. Okay. Thanks for the information. Here's our card. If you hear from her, we'll give us a ring. You don't suppose anything's happened to her? That's what we're trying to find out. Goodbye, Miss Matthews. When we got back to Central Division, we had a full description of Juanita Lasky teletype to all outlying stations in the metropolitan area of Los Angeles. We also put out an APB. 
We double-checked the repeater file and the wanderer file. We made out a full report on our findings to date. During the next eight days, we located a missing husband for a wife in Memphis, Tennessee. We picked up a runaway boy missing from his home in Reno, Nevada, and a 79-year-old veteran of the Spanish-American War who left his home in Bakersfield, California because he didn't like his daughter-in-law's cooking. But Juanita Lassie was still a mystery. For eight days, we checked and rechecked all our known friends and habits. We went back over the course a dozen times, but no trace. It was almost as if she had ceased to exist that day in the Chelsea Hotel. The letter and photograph from her mother had arrived, and we circulated it to cities all over the country. Her mother wrote that during the war, Juanita was a whack corporal. We put a tracer through to the War Department. That way, we'd have another photo and a full set of fingerprints. Well, where do you want to start today? I'll get it. Missing persons, Friday. Joe, this is Spencer over in the morgue. Yeah, Archie. You still looking for that girl? Uh, what's her name? Ramona Lasky? Juanita, yeah. Just had one brought in. Looks like your girl to me. <laughs> The city morgue is located in the basement of the Hall of Justice on West Temple Street, across the street from the city hall. A lot of missing persons cases end right here. Archie Spencer met us at the door. Hi, right, Joe. How's the wife been? No, oh, fine, Archie. Over here, Joe. Cooler 23. Give me a hand, huh? You bet. That's her, isn't it? When's she going to be posted? As soon as your fingerprint man gets here. Mm -hmm. That's Ramona Lasky, isn't it? Juanita. Juanita, I mean. No. No, that's not her, Archie. You sure? Yeah. No, I was almost positive. Sure looks like this picture you're both. Yeah, yeah, she looks a lot like the picture, but it's not one of the last ones. Five foot seven, green eyes, blonde hair, about 130. How close can you get? Look at the face. You sure that's not her? Yeah, I'm sure. Look at her hair, the roots. Yeah. They're blonde all the way down. They ought to be dark. Our girl's a bleached blonde. Yeah, I see what you mean. Look at her right hand, index and middle fingers. Heavy nicotine stain. Our girl didn't smoke, Archie. Yeah, I see what you mean. Yeah, guess I was wrong. That's not Ramona. Juanita. Come on, Ben. That afternoon, we got another phone call from Fountain Green, Utah. Juanita Lasky's mother. We told her we hadn't found any trace of her daughter. It was a hard job. We had answered calls like this before, but maybe it was just the season of the year. Somehow, we felt that we had to find Juanita Lasky by Christmas. We covered every angle we could think of. We kept close watch on all incoming reports. We stayed in close contact with her friends and Miss Waters at the Chelsea Hotel. Regardless of the name on the incoming reports, we checked every set of fingerprints against those we had received on Juanita Lasky from the War Department. Still, no trace. December 23rd, we checked in for work at 8.30 a.m. Chief Ed Baxter wanted to see us. A little something on the Lasky girl might help you. What is it, Kevin? A man by the name of Willard Harris owns a bar out in Pomona. Phoned in this morning. Yeah? Found a woman's handbag left in the bar. Driver's license made out to Juanita Lasky. Why do you think to call us? He's got a television set in his bar. Saw the Lasky girl's picture on Sergeant Rosenquist's broadcast last night. How about the girl? Says he can't place her. You uh, better hop out and pick up that purse. Willard Harris owns a Mission Trail bar. It was in the bus terminal in the heart of Pomona. The Christmas traffic was heavy all the way out Garvey Boulevard. It was 10.45 when we pulled up in front of the bar. Willard Harris was inside taking a liquor inventory when we walked in. How'd you do? You, Mr. Harris? Yeah, that's right. You fellas with General Liquor? Los Angeles Police Department. My name's Friday. He's the sergeant right now. Oh, hey. Okay. Never knew you, boys. Yeah, I called Los Angeles this morning. We came right out. You say, uh, how about a little eye opener? Got some fine Irish whiskey? No, thanks, Mr. Harris. How about your partner there? No, thank you. All right, boys. Guess you want that purse, huh? Yes, please. Yeah. Here you are. Just as I found it. I opened it up to get the owner's name, but that's all. Didn't touch a thing. Okay. Thanks, Mr. Harris. You said that you didn't remember seeing the woman who left this. No, I don't. But Herb works with me here, and he might have seen her, but he didn't. I asked him the night we found it. How long ago did you find it for? Oh, about two weeks. No, a little closer to a week. Yeah. Yeah, about eight days ago. I usually hold something like this for 30 days. That's the law, you know. Yeah. But I saw that fellow on the television on that missing persons program. That's how come I called you, boy. Well, thanks very much, Mr. Harris. And all, boy. It's cold out this morning. So you don't want to leave me? No, thanks, Mr. Harris. Goodbye. We checked the personnel at the bus terminal, but none of them seemed to recognize one of the photographs. We checked the contents of her purse, but we found nothing unusual. Four $1 bills and some change and the normal things women carry. 
Since there was money in the bag, we felt sure that Juanita Lasky had lost the purse herself. That meant that she was alive eight days ago, two days after she walked out of the Chelsea Hotel. We check out the 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 hotel. Here's license number. That's the only print carried on a California driver's license. It matched the same print on the War Department record. It didn't prove anything except that all the evidence tied in and belonged to the girl we were looking for, Juanita Lasky. The next morning, December 24th, we checked in for work at 8.30. Morning, Ben. All right, Joe, here's the data report. You want to check them? There's a mess of them. Let's get at them. You look through any of them yet? No, not yet. I figured it would be. All right, I'll check them. Mm. Got any shopping done? No, a few. Not yet, I'm okay. Mm -hmm. Found some nice cards. You sure to send me one? Yeah, I'll hand it to you in the morning. Let's try shaving lotions like we did last year. I get any. You can get some. My kid's got a bottle all picked out for it. It's called South Pole for that cool. Yeah. Hello? 
Yeah. Oh, Mother. Come on, Betty. Yeah. Say it more, Joe. Merry Christmas. Yeah, it is, isn't it? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Upon further examination by competent medical authorities, Juanita Lasky was found to be suffering from periodic spells of amnesia. She was given treatment, and a complete cure was effected. You have just heard the eighth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Corporal Brady A. Beecham of the 9th Precinct Metropolitan Police Force, Washington, D.C., who, on the night of December 2nd, 1948, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the National Broadcasting Company. Turn NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to narcotics detail. For more than two months, doctors' offices have been burglarized, hospital pharmacies pillaged, drug stores robbed, medical supply firms ransacked, with one purpose in mind, the theft of narcotics. The criminals are expert, cunning, vicious. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 23rd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of narcotics. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the record bureau, and it was 10.35 p.m. when I got to room 24. The narcotics detail. Yeah, yeah, okay. Well, we'll be right over. Thank you. Get anything, Joe? Nothing we don't know already. How about you? That was the county hospital on the phone. Doc Welch. Pretty fair lead. I told him we'd be right over. What's he got? One of our informants. Benny Trounge. Ready? Let's go. What's with Benny? Bad shape. Somebody worked him over. They found him in an alley off the South Main. Yeah? Doc says Trounge will talk before he passed out. Anything good? He claimed he knows who's running the new dope racket in town. Says they got him. No, let's take the stairs here. Why should they bother with small fry like Benny? That's what I'm wondering. Blackmail, maybe. Benny still on the needle? Maybe that accounts for his story. Doc says his skull is fractured. Morphine doesn't do that to him. Yeah. Benny mention any names? I don't know. Doc didn't say. Here's the garage. Come on. When did they pick up Benny? About an hour ago. He had a pocket full of bentles on him. Yeah, one. Sounds a little small fry. He never had that much dope on him in his life. That's what makes it interesting. Let's go. County Hospital? Yes, sir. The line is busy when you wait. Thank you. Can I help you, gentlemen? We'd like to see Dr. Welsh. He's expecting us. Your name, please? This is Sergeant Romero. My name is Friday, police officer. Oh, yes. Around the corner to your left, room 127. The doctor's waiting for you. Thank you. Come on, Betty. I hope Benny's still talking. We could sure use a lead. Yeah. Here it is. 127. Hiya, Ben. Joe? How are you, Doc? 
Anything new? Just left Trownville up there. You think we can talk to him now? Won't do much good. He died about six minutes ago. For almost two years, Benny Trownville, an addict himself, had been one of the most valuable informants Ben and I had in the narcotic games. More than once, he had helped us solve a case, but this time, if Benny Trownville had any direct leads to the nerve center of the newest narcotic ring, he took them with him. Besides his dying accusation that the ring had gotten to him, he left behind only two small scraps of information. First, when he arrived at the county hospital, Dr. Welch reported that Trounsel repeatedly muttered the name Patterson. Secondly, among the few personal effects found in his pockets was a good amount of heroin and a small piece of white paper with two words scrawled on it, Tucker Building. Benny Trounsel's body was taken to the county morgue and the next morning it was posted. At the coroner's inquest, the cause of death was listed as a brain hemorrhage induced by severe blows by a blunt instrument on the sides and base of the skull inflicted by a person or persons unknown. Besides Ben and myself, the only identification witness at the inquest was a woman who managed a rooming house in Benedict Alley, where Trounsel used to stay periodically. After the inquest, we questioned her briefly in our office. Miss Strutt, you say you can't remember any friends Trounsel had while he stayed at your rooming house? No, I can't. Besides, if I knew that man used dope, I never would have rented him a room. How long did he rent from you, Miss Strutt? Oh, about six months. I run a respectable house. I don't mind if my people drink a little now and then, but those dope users, no, sir. Did you know anything about Trounsel, Miss Strite, where he spent his time, where he had his meals? No, don't serve at my place. Too much trouble. Most of the people eat at the Ace Lunchroom. Down the corner. Where's that, Miss Strite? Um, Grant and South Main. Right on the corner. And you think Trounsel might have spent some time there? He might have, I don't know. Miss Strite, did Trounsel ever mention anyone by the name of Patterson? No. Patterson? No. And you can't recall any friends he might have had? He had any friends. He never set foot in my house. That's all I know. All right, Miss Strike. Thank you. Here's a card, ma'am. If you come across any information about Trounsel, we'd appreciate it if you'd call her. All right. That all? That's all, ma'am. Thank you. Well, bye. Goodbye, ma'am. Big help. Yeah. Not even a good identification with me. You got those listings we made on the Tucker building? Yeah. Now, let's see. Here it is. Let me have it. Tucker Building, 7310 South Wilshire. I wonder what Benny Trounsel could have been doing out there. Couldn't be too hard to check. It's a small building. Yeah. Six listings for the whole place. A couple of law officers, real estate guy, dentist, architect, and a doctor. One dentist, one doctor. Could be a lead. Maybe. Pretty thin. Friday, Romero. Got a minute? Yes, Gipper. Come on. Yeah. What do you got, Ed? Letters. Here's a sample. Now, listen to this. Chief of Detectives, Ed Backstrand, City Hall, Los Angeles. Mm-hmm. In view of mounting wave of narcotic robberies, strongly recommend that your efforts to curb this lawlessness be redoubled. They all like that? All of them. They're mad. Can you blame them? Not a bit. We haven't got much to go on, Chief. The gang's pretty smart. All right, then let's be smarter. There's no law against it. Doing our best, Giver. Then make it better. I'm sick of that bunch, and I'm tired of these letters. And look at that record. In two months, 15 drugstores robbed, eight medical offices, two supply houses, two hospital pharmacies. Narcotics missing every time. Now, who's behind it? None of the old-timers. We've checked them out. Gone over every hyphen mainliner we know of. All right, then get on the transient. New faces. Climb on every one of them that shoots the stuff. Until you get to that gang and break it. If you need help, holler. But get to that gang and break it. You understand? Okay, Skipper, we'll try. You dig up anything on that transfer case yet? Still checking out one, Lee. What? Swept a paper we found in Trounsel's pocket, Ed. That Tucker building on it, that's all. Just going to check it out when you call. All right, hop on it. Fast. You got a lot of pressure on us. Keep in touch with the office. It was almost noon when Ben and I got out to the Tucker building. It was a two-story affair, comparatively small, very modest. We checked with the dentist in the building first, but he'd never heard of anyone by the name of Benny Trounsel. His records and appointment books proved it out. Well, that's one down, Joe. Yeah. Let's try that doctor's office now. What's his name? Let me see. Uh, oh, Springer. Dr. Fred Springer. He's on the second floor. Okay. There's a stairway down there. Come on. Pretty close to lunchtime. Might not be in. Maybe. Somebody should be there. We haven't got much time to play with. Yeah. Chief sure was up in there this morning. Here's the office. Fred Springer, M.D. Good morning. May I help you, gentlemen? We'd like to see Dr. Springer, please. Do you have an appointment? No, we don't. Well, the doctor's not in at present. Would you like to make an appointment for later in the day? No, ma'am. We're police officers. This is Sergeant Friday. I'm Sergeant Romero. How do you do? I'm uh, Miss Turner. I'm the doctor's nurse. Then you must take care of the appointment and record books for the doctor. Yes, I do. 
Well, maybe you can give us the information we're looking for, Miss Turner. Did the doctor ever have a patient by the name of Trounsel? Benny Trounsel? Trounsel? Mm-hmm. No, I don't think so. Just a moment, don't you? Thank you. No. C-R-O-U-N-S-E-L, is that the research? Yes, ma'am. No. The name's not listed here. Let me check the account book. No. Wait. Funny. What's that, Miss Turner? Here in the back of the book in the doctor's handwriting. Look. Mm. Transel, the black parrot. Certainly funny. I can't remember seeing that notation before. It must be fairly recent. Miss Turner, what kind of a clientele would you say Dr. Springer has? Oh, it's quite exclusive. Beverly Hills, Bel Air. That's where most of the bills are mailed. Can you recall seeing Trounsel in the office here, Miss Turner? Small man, thin, walked with a kind of a limp, not very well dressed? No, I don't think so. It doesn't sound like any of our patients. Would you show us the doctor's prescription list for the last two months? We'd like to check them. Well, I'm afraid I can't. Dr. Springer keeps them in the safe. He's the only one who has the combination. How long have you been with Dr. Springer? About ten months. Ever since he started his practice out here. Where was he before that? Philadelphia. I don't understand all these questions. Is there anything the matter? Just a routine check, Miss Turner. When do you expect the doctor back? About four this afternoon. He's out making home calls. All right. Here's our card. Would you ask him to call us as soon as he comes in? I'll do that. Thanks, Miss Turner. Bye. Goodbye. Bye. Oh, say, Miss Turner, one more question. Yes? Does Dr. Springer have a patient by the name of Patterson? Oh, yes. One of the doctor's first patients, John Patterson. He lives out on East Beverly Drive. When we left Dr. Springer's office, we called R&I. There was no make on John Patterson. Ben and I drove over to see him just on a hunch. It didn't pay off right then, but it showed a little promise. When the maid came to the door of the Swank apartment, she told us Patterson was out for the day. We asked her about Patterson's occupation. She didn't know. We asked her about his friends, his business acquaintances. She could remember only two people visiting the apartment. One of them was Dr. Springer, apparently a constant visitor. The other, a tall, dark man who spoke bad English. We asked the maid how long she had worked for Patterson. She said ever since he moved to Los Angeles, about six months before. A few things started to fall into place, but it was strictly a guesswork operation. Ben and I got in the car and headed to the south end of the city to check out some of the places Benny Trounsel was supposed to have frequented. We met a stone wall. From the Ace lunchroom near Benny's former rooming house to the Black Parrot, no one was willing to talk. Threats didn't work and neither did promises. Ben and I gave up for the moment and headed back to the office. Pacific Ambulance. One call to Alhambra is now code three. Seems like Skid Row doesn't want any part of this one. Yeah, there's a bad feeling. Something's got him scared. Sure would like to know what it is. Or who it is. Yeah, I'd like to know. Go one, unit 80K. Go one, unit 80K. First, Joe, get it, will you? I got it. 80K to control one. 80K to control one. Go ahead. 80K. Call station 2511, code three. 80K to control one. Roger. KMA 367. I wonder what that's all about. Well, let's find out. There's a drugstore. They ought to have a phone. Pull over. Got a nickel? Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, sure. Thanks. I'll be back in a minute. high-grade morphine. We went back to the office and double-checked the serial numbers on the vials with a crime report on the St. Agnes Hospital robbery. They matched. There's a good break. These vials were in the loot when the gang knocked over the hospital 28 days ago. I stay on the trail and we'll crack that gang wide open. This the arrest report on the guy yet? Yeah. Picked him up in a bar off South Main. Who is the guy? Trying you? Yeah, here it is, Ben. James Steiner, Phoenix, Arizona, age 37, transient laborer. Anybody talk to this guy yet, Ed? Not yet. He couldn't be too hard. You better get on it. Right, Skipper. Come on, Joe. Check you later, Ed. What time you got, Ben? 
Let me see here. 25 past four. Phone call for you, Ben. Yeah, who was it? Your wife. Wants you to pick up some aspirin and a bottle of nose drop for your kid on your way home. Oh, yeah, almost forgot. That's the only call we had, Mike? That's right. Thanks. Well, you got that Dr. Springer's number, Ben? Yeah. Um, yeah. Here it is. Uh, Crestview 55284. Five, Thanks. Nurse said he'd call us around four, didn't he? Yeah. Dr. Springer's office. This is Sergeant Friday down at the police department. Dr. Springer there? Well, no, he isn't, Sergeant. He called in about 20 minutes ago and I gave him your message. He said he'd call you. All right, Miss Turner. When he comes in, tell him to call her. Impress on him. It's urgent. All right, Sergeant. I'll do that. Goodbye. Goodbye. No, no. I don't know. Just a hunch. He may be ducking us. Who are you calling now? State Medical Board. Maybe they can check us out on Dr. Springer. I put the call through to the State Medical Board and asked for a check on Dr. Fred Springer. They said they'd call back within the hour. In the meantime, we had James Steiner brought to one of the interrogation rooms for questioning. It was all talk. Like I told the sergeant when they booked me, I, I don't know anything about this hospital job. Sit down, Steiner. Oh, right. How long have you been in the city, Steiner? L.A.? Oh, about a month. I came from Phoenix looking for work. Things are pretty slow in Phoenix. Where'd you get the morphine? I said, where'd you get the morphine? The stuff? Uh, I bought it. Just for a pop now and then. I just play around with it. Just for kicks. Who'd you buy the vials from? Who? I don't know. Kind of bar. Gave me a price. Which bar was that? Which bar? Uh, Black Perry. I, I'm not hooked. I, I just play around with it. Just for kicks. What'd the guy look like, Stoner? What did he look like? I don't know. Tall, I guess. Would you remember him if you saw him again? Remember? Sure. Talked to him a couple of nights at the bar. Was he on the stuff? Was he a hype? Hype? Yeah. Maybe. Tall fellow, Doc. You shooting the stuff? Shooting the stuff? No. No, I, I'm no mainliner. I never took in the veins of my life. I, I told you. I do it just for kicks. Just a pop now and then. Take off your shirt. Let's see your arm. Huh? My arm? Come on. Take it off. Right. Who are you kidding, Stanley? Your arm looks like a pin cushion. I, I, I told you. Just once in a while. Just... The kicks, I'm not hooked on it. They found two vials of stolen morphine on you, Steiner. You can go two ways, hard or easy. Hard or easy? I, I told you I ain't done nothing. I, I bought this stuff. I, I use a cap or a bindle once in a while for kicks, but I'm not hooked. I bought the stuff, I tell you. Who was he, Steiner? Who sold it to you? Who? I told you I met him in a bar, the Black Ferret. Who was he? He was tall. Dark, he gave me good price. Come on, let's have it, Steiner. His name. Feeling sick. You got something for me? I'm sick. All right. Mike. Yeah, Joe. Get some milk. A couple of quarts right away. Okay. You ready to tell us, Steiner? Who was him? Sick. Sick. We're getting some milk for you now. Come on, you better talk. Max. The coffee said name was Max. He gave me a good price. I only take a pop now and then just for kicks. You think you could point him out for us? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe. Sick. Sick. Narcotics from Merrill. Hello. This is Dr. Springer calling. You wanted to talk to me. Yes, we did, Doctor. And we've got a few questions we'd like to ask you. Oh, hold on just a minute, will you? Dr. Springer, Joe. I'd right, like tell him we got to see him tonight. We'll call him back later. Dr. Springer? Yes? Sorry, Doctor. We'll have to see you later on tonight. You be at home? Well, I have an appointment this evening. Would you mind telling me what this is all about? Sure, Doctor. It's about a man named Benny Trowney. Oh, I see. And if you don't mind, we'd like to check over your prescription list, will you? Yes. I'll cancel my appointment. You can contact me here at home. 1538 South Road. I'll be here all night. All right, Doctor. Thank you. We'll see you later, then. Uh, yes. Goodbye. Goodbye. What do you say? All right? Yeah, it's all right. I'll buy that hunch of yours now, Joe. Hmm? Dr. Springer, he knows who killed Benny Tronzel. I bet he knows why. When Mike Hannon came back with the milk, we fed it to Steiner, and then we put him back in his cell. We put in another call to John Patterson out on East Beverly Drive, but there was no answer. We left word with Hannon where we were going, and then Ben and I headed out for Dr. Springer's home. It was 7.35 when we pulled up into the driveway at 1538 South Road, a low, rambling, ranch-type home. We got out of the car and made our way down the path to the front door. The gray Persian cat followed us. 
The door was half open. We knocked, but there was no answer. Through the window, we could see the living room was dimly lighted. We went in. We found Dr. Springer sitting in a large carved mahogany chair in the dining room. The room was hung with draperies. He was slumped forward, face down on the dining table. There was a bullet hole in his right temple. On the floor near his right hand was a 32 automatic pistol. In the center of the dining table was a piece of white paper. Looks like the beta. Yeah. Any names on that confession? One. Says he killed some. No, wait a minute. It says, uh, John Patterson, he forced me to this. What? I don't know what you look like to you. Here's another one, Norberg. That's all it says. And then he signed his name, Dr. Fred Springer. Ben, come over here, look at these. Mm, hypodermic needle. It works. This morphine? White powder, could be. And he was on it himself. Looks like it. We'll find out when they post him. I'll get it. Yeah. Sergeant Friday there, please. This is Joe, Mike. What do you got? Can you talk all right there? Yeah, go ahead. Just got a kickback on your call to the state medical board. I'm this Dr. Fred Springer. Mm -hmm. He's not a registered physician in the state of California. Besides that, his license was revoked in Pennsylvania two years ago. Illegal operation. That explains it. Notify homicide. Get the crime lab in the corner out here, will you? Looks like Springer shot himself. Okay, Joe, right away. We'll wait for him, but hurry him up, Mike. We got a couple more places to check out tonight. Okay, Joe, see you later. Right. What's next? Patterson Blake? I don't know. Maybe we ought to try Steiner first. Sounds good to me. Feels like we're getting close. Yeah, man. Real close. Twelve minutes later, Homicide and the crime lab men checked in at the Springer house and Ben and I checked out. We went back to the office and found Ed Backstrand waiting for us. We told him our story and he sent two men out to keep an eye on the Patterson place. Two other men went to work to try and track down the other name in Springer's confession note, Norberg. Ben and I went up to the county jail and picked up Steiner. The three of us started out to look for the man who sold Steiner the two vials of morphine stolen from a hospital pharmacy a month before. The man's name was Max. He was tall and dark. That was all we knew. The rest of it was up to Steiner. Two other men from the detail, Davis and Emerson, came along with us to take care of Steiner if anything went wrong. Our first stop was the Black Parrot Tavern. Davis parked the car in an alley down the street. Steiner, Ben, and I got out and walked the rest of the way. You understand what you're supposed to do, Steiner? Me? Yeah. I go in first and sit at the bar. You two will follow me. I sit at the bar, and if I see Max, I give you the sign. That's okay, huh? That's right. Now, you don't try to break for it. Break for it? Me? I, I told you, I'm squaring with you guys. All right, Steiner. Go ahead. Let's hope it works, Jill. Yeah. There he goes inside. Come on. Now, look, try to grab one of the boots along the wall if you can, huh? Right. Here we are. First boot, Ben. It's empty. Yeah. Oh, it's about to order at the bar. Wait, has got a night off. Make it a couple of beers, will you? A couple of beers? Okay. Joe. So look at Steiner. Yeah, he's signaling. Must mean the guy putting on his coat over there. Don't hold it, Ben. Wait till he gets past it. All right, get Steiner back to the car. I'll tail the guy. You come after me. I didn't know how right Steiner was or how much we could trust him. All I knew was that the man I was following was tall and he was in a hurry. I followed him three quarters of a block before he turned in at a motel. He went to a cottage at the rear of the lot, let himself in, and closed the door quickly behind him. A minute later, Ben and the others pulled up in the car. Got him safe, Joe. Steiner says that was Max. Let's make sure. Come on. Which one's the end? The one down at the end here. I'll be careful. You too. All right, here we are. Wait a minute, right there. Look, there's no rear door. He's got to come out the front. Keep the door clear. You ready? All set. Cover me. Police officers, open up. Just a minute. All right, Ben, give it back to him. Don't, don't shoot, we'll come out. All right, throw your guns out first and come out with your hands behind your head and make it fast. Watch it, Ben, he's making a break. All right, mister, that's far enough. Get out of my way. Get out of Get him, Ben. That's good, Ben, you all right? Yeah. He didn't mean it, Gopher, he didn't mean it. He didn't know what he was doing. That must be a good excuse, lady. A lot of people use it. Come on, Ben. Let's take him in. It was ten minutes past midnight when we got back to headquarters. Both the man and the woman were booked for violation of the State Narcotics Act, a felony. He gave his name as Max Jansen. In his luggage, we found 13 vials of morphine, 
large quantities of heroin, and a small amount of panopin. He gave us the names and addresses of six active members of the narcotics gang. He identified Dr. Springer as second in command. Just a few more questions, Jansen. Yeah, all right. Why did Springer kill Trounsel? He had it coming. Trounsel knew the score, and he was blackmailing them, bleeding them white. Why didn't the gang take care of him? The boss said no rough stuff. Things were going too good. He warned Springer, but he wouldn't listen. All right, Jansen, just one more question. Who's the boss? Can I get off white? State's witness? It might help. We can't promise you anything. Who's the boss, Patterson? Yeah. 138 East Beverly Drive? That's right. What about Norberg? How does he figure? The same guy. Patterson and Norberg, both the same. And what's his real name? Norberg. Tony Norberg. What's his front? He's a legitter. He used to be. Importing business. Where? Here. Got an office downtown. Do I get protection? Where's Norberg now? Oh, Mountain Laurel Canyon. Do I get protection? I thought you said he lived out in East Beverly. His apartment. His home's out in the canyon. Where? What's the address? Do I get protection? You'll get protection. Wind and way. 860 Wind and Way. All right, Friday. Romero, take some men with you. All right, Davis. Cover the back of the house. Levine, you cover the front. Come on, Ben. Yes? Mr. Norberg in? Who's calling? Police officer. Oh, come in, won't you? Thank you. Now get your hands up. Face the wall. You'll never make it, lady. The house is around. Tony, get the stuff. It's our only chance. I'll cut you down, Norberg. All right, Jeannie, give him the gun. Don't be a fool. They're going to march out the door in front of us, right to the car. I'm not going, Jeannie. Right, if you want to. I'm not going. All right, Tony, stay. Come on, coppers. You'll never make it, lady. I said move. Fast. All right, Ben, hit the dirt. Okay. He's going for the car. See if he can get those tires. John Patterson was tried and convicted for possession of narcotics, robbery, and conspiracy, and was sentenced to the maximum term prescribed by law, each count to run consecutively. He died three years and 11 days after his arrival at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the ninth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Chief Erskine Ert Fish of the North Sacramento Police Department, who on the night of August 11th, 1935, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. There's a mad killer at large in your city. A woman has been brutally slain. The body mutilated. The picture is clear. The killer has a thirst for blood. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, transcribed in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, 
Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, January 12th. It was raining in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the morgue, and it was 11.23 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Chief wants to see you. He's in there with Romero. Thanks, Chandler. How's the wife? Fine. How about your mother? Better, thanks. Hi, Joe. Hi. Hi, Nan. Sit down. Did they post the body in? In the morning. Pretty messy. Strangled and mutilated. The guy's a maniac, Skipper. The body shows it. A murder like this? Anybody's a suspect. The coroner looks at the body. He says the weapon was a long, sharp instrument. Found her in a hotel down on East 3rd Street. Manager's son discovered her about 7.30. You talked to him? It's too much for him. He passed out. Manager wasn't home. We'll check with him before midnight. Close to it now, Joe. We better get going. All right. The boys from the crime lab check the room? They're still down there. The place is a mess. Get back as soon as you can. We're working straight through on this thing. At the hot shot. I'll get it. At the Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. Dead body. Possible homicide. The Lux Hotel, room 219, corner of South Grand and Cordova. Dead body. What is it, Friday? Lux Hotel, possible homicide. Busy night. Yeah. You coming, Ed? Right. Let's go. Six minutes later, Ed Backstrand, Ben, and I pulled up in front of the Lux Hotel. The manager met us at the door and led the way up a narrow stairway to the second floor. The room number was 219. We were prepared for the worst. We got it. You're right, Romero. The guy must be a maniac. Two hotels, two murders. The same M.O. Three of us made a brief inspection of the room at the Lux Hotel. We took a few notes on the appearance of the girl's body and a brief description. Apparently, she'd been strangled to death first, and then her body brutally mangled. Ben and I went back down to the lobby. The manager of Mr. Ford showed us the house book. The girl was registered together with a man. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant. We took the hotel register to have it checked for fingerprints and to photostat the handwriting. Ben notified the crime lab. Then we went back to the room and questioned the manager. Mr. and Mrs. Philip Grant, that's all I know. I never saw either one of them before tonight. When did they check in, Mr. Ford? About three hours ago. That's right, about nine. Maybe a little before. Did they register together? Yeah, a little before nine. They came in together. Did you let them in the room? Yes, sir, like I always do. It's a small place here, maybe not first class, but I treat people right. What did the man look like? Do you remember? I think so. Kind of tall. Young, maybe 30 or so. Husky fellow. Had a mustache. How tall would you say, Mr. Ford? Oh, about your height, Wade. Must have been at least 180. Seemed like a nice fellow. Would you know him if you saw him again? I think so. People sure don't act like they look. You think it was him? Can you think of anybody else? Well, no. I never saw him before tonight, either one of them. I don't know anything about it. Did you notice anything in particular about them when they came in? Well... He didn't show it, but it looked like she'd been drinking a little. Giggling, you know. And you didn't see this man Grant leave the hotel? No, I didn't. I must have been checking the account books back of the desk. Guess he got by me. Is there a back entrance to the hotel, Mr. Ford? No, he had to come out this way, all right. How about the fire escape? I never thought of that. Say, I bet you cops think I'm trying to hide something. How did you happen to find the body? I don't know anything about it, honest. I've been running the hotel for ten years now. Everybody knows me around here. You can ask at the bank. All right, Mr. Ford. Now, would you mind telling us how you happened to find the body? I don't want a lot of lousy newspaper publicity. Give the place a bad name. Can you blame me? The newspapers won't get your name from us. All we want to know is how you happened to find the body. Well, I told you. It's a small place here, but I like to treat people right. A couple hours after they checked in, I remembered I forgot to fill the ice water pitcher in the room. So I got some and took it up. The door was opened a little ways. It's got a bad catch on it. And the lights were on. I peeked in, and there she was. She was... Well, the guy must have been crazy. You remember what time it was when you found her? Well, just before I called the cops, about half past 11, I guess. All right, Ford, that's all for now. When the other officers get here, show them up, will you? Yes, sir, I sure will. Romero? Yes, Giver? Get on the phone downstairs and call the Metropolitan Division. Have them send us every available man from the reserve unit. We're going to patrol the area for the rest of the night. Right, Chief. least we can do is make it hard for them. Two murders in seven hours. Both of them in a three-block radius. Same pattern. It's got to be the same guy. 
All right, we got a description. What do you think? When the reserve unit shows up, have them cover this whole section of town. Pick up everybody who even comes close to that guy's description. All right, Ed. It's got to go fast. We can't lose a minute. One hour either way, it, it might mean another body. Like this one. Nine minutes later, at four minutes past midnight, the men from the crime lab showed up. It started to drizzle. They went over the room in detail. They dusted everything in the room for fingerprints, the walls, the doors, the pictures in the bathroom, the lamps, chairs, everything. They took samples of the girl's blood and her lipstick. Small pieces of flesh and human hair were found under the girl's fingernails. The nails were scraped carefully and the contents put in an envelope, marked and sealed. Ed Backstrand ordered pictures taken of the room and the girl's body from different angles. Every object in the room that could have any possible tie-in with a murder was photographed. It was raining. The rear of the hotel where the fire escape was overlooked a vacant lot. Ben had a hunch. While the lab men were at work, we left the hotel and circled around into the lot for a look at the ground directly underneath the fire escape ladder. It was raining hard now. Must be an easier way to make a living. Mud's almost up to my knee. Mine too. Watch your step. You see any prints? No. Wait till my wife sees these new shoes. Put it on your expense account. Oh, real fun. Ben, get that light over here. Look. Yeah. Good set of prints. Lucky that rain didn't start turning to wash them out by now. Yeah. Hand me that cover from the trash can over there. I'll cover them. Wait a minute. What? Here, on the edge of the fire escape ladder. Small hunk of cloth. Man suit? Well, looks like it. Might have caught himself in that sharp corner. I got it. All right, come on. Let's get back. Yeah. Out of this mud bath. Joe, huh? let me have a light. You catch anything? Hunk of wrapping paper in that trash can. Stains on it. Open it up. Look. Oh. Yeah. Butcher knife. <laughs> We went back to the Lux Hotel, room 219. The lab men were tearing the room apart. It was ten minutes to one. We gave the bloodstained knife and the piece of cloth we found on the fire escape to Lieutenant Lee Jones, head of the crime lab. We told him about the footprints just below the fire escape ladder. The knife will help us, so will the cloth. I don't know about the footprints. You say you covered them? That's right, Lee. They still look in pretty good shape. Maybe we can do something if the rain hasn't broken them down too bad. Bracken! Yeah, Lieutenant? You and Sloan get downstairs and take a look at those prints. They're good enough. Get a torch, dry them out, make a cast, right? Okay, Lieutenant. Come on. That's about all I can do for you now, Ed. I think we got everything there is to get. All right, Jones. I'll follow you back to the lab in a couple of minutes. Okay, Ed. Good luck, fellas. Thanks, Lee. We're going to need it. All right, Friday. Romero, it's your baby for the rest of the night. Did he get anything? A few prints, a woman's purse under the bed. Don't know if it's hers or not. No identification. You going to be at the crime lab, Ed? All night. As soon as we find anything, I'll let you know. Yeah? Gang of cops just came in the lobby. They asked for you. Must be the reserve men from Metropolitan. Tell them we'll be right down, Ford. Okay. You want us to handle that? That's right. Do just as I told you. Spread them out over the whole area. Cover the streets, the alleys, the flop houses, restaurants, bars, everything. You got a description to go on. Find the man that fits it. All right, Skipper. Don't forget. The guy's a killer twice over. I don't think he'd hesitate on you. Be careful. <laughs> We went down to the lobby, and Ed Backstrand gave the reserve men their orders. Then Backstrand left, and Ben and I took over. We picked up another half-dozen men in addition to the men in the reserve unit. They were deployed over an area of a dozen square blocks. It was one of the toughest sections of the city. With a general description of the suspect, some of them were to travel on foot, some in cruiser cars. A few minutes before 1 a.m., there was a steady downpour. Visibility was bad. At three minutes past one, the manhunt was on. For the first 30 minutes, Ben and I cruised the general area between East 3rd and College Streets and Alameda and Figueroa. No sign. The rain kept on. We sat and listened to the calls coming. Call A, call your station. Call A, KMA 367. Attention, all units. Recovered license plates in the sixth column. Four young, 7690. 41R, 788 Standard Avenue, or 373. 41R, KMA 367. Unit 71 at 2816 West Las Vienega, a 507 party. What do you think, Joe? Any hunches? I think he's still around, somewhere inside these 12 blocks. That's it on it. Five? All right, you're on. Want to check out a couple of these bars along here? Getting on to closing time. Good idea. Pull over. All right, let's check him for the next couple of blocks, huh? Right. 
the next six blocks until closing time, Ben and I checked every bar and every informant we met along the way. The questions had to be automatic. Have you seen a man answering this description? Tall, dark, about 5 feet 11, 180 pounds, well-built, mustache, about 30 years old. The answer's got to be automatic, too. Sorry, officer, I haven't seen him. No, can't remember him. Try the place down the street. We kept on checking the bars until they closed for the night. Then we started on the all-night restaurants and coffee parties. We did plenty of legwork for the next hour. Not a trace. About 2.30, the rain let up a little. Then it started in heavy all over again. That finishes that, Blah. Yeah, I better get the radio on. Yeah. Beautiful weather. By the bucket full. You want to smoke? Mm, thank you. Control 4, unit 80K. Your location? Yeah. 80K, your location. KMA 367. That's us, Joe. You want to take it? Yeah, I got it. 80K to Control 4. 80K to Control 4. Our location, corner of Alameda and Commercial, KMA 367. 80K, stand by. Something doing. Maybe. No, hold on a minute. Control 4 to 80K. Go to the crime lab, code 2. 80K to Control 4, KMA 367. Crime lab? Maybe those prints paid off. Well, I hope so. Let's go. That killer sure picked fine weather to work in. Feels like I've just been swimming in these clothes. Yeah. I hope those guys in the crime lab have the heater on. A hot bath and a warm bed lead me on. Attention, all units. Oh, Attention, all units. At 420 St. John's Place, a woman screaming. Oh, St. John's place. Oh, All right, double around, Ben. Hit the siren. I'll get the light. Right, hold on. Left turn on the mark, you said, right? Yeah, watch out for those tracks. They're wet. Hold on again. The alley up ahead to your right, huh? All right, pull up, Ben. Street light over there. There you are. All right, come on. Let's go. All right, what happened? Let's have it. Uh, Rita, she was coming home up the street. A man, he tried to grab her. He slashed her coat. Look at her. I saw him as he ran under the street light. Where'd he go? Uh, down that way, down the alley, over that fence. A big man. Davis, Davis, you there? Yeah, Joe. All right, Ben, go with Davis. Circle behind the alley. See what you can find. I'll call in. All right, come on, Dave. Yeah. Look at her face. What's wrong with her? Severe state of shock, it looks like. Get her in the house, huh? I'll call an ambulance. 80K to control four. 80K to control four. Control four, go ahead. Direct all units in the vicinity to converge on area around St. John's Place from Jackson to Banning Street. A woman attacked by a large man with knife. Suspect left seen on foot. Possibly still in area. Request ambulance. AMA 367. 80K, Roger, stand by. Attention, all units. Attention, all units. Converge on area around St. John's Place, Jackson to Banning Street. 80K reports woman attacked by a large man with knife. Suspect left seen on... In three minutes, the area around St. John's place was surrounded. For the next hour, the men combed the neighborhood back and forth. Every building, every storehouse in the two square blocks was searched from basement to attic. No trace. The girl, Rita, was hysterical. She could give us only a bare description of her attacker. At 3.45 a.m., a detail was assigned to patrol the area, and the rest of the cars and men were deployed again in the general area from Figueroa to Alameda Street and East 3rd to College Street. The manhunt went on. So did the rain. At 3.54, Ben and I checked in at the Old City Jail Building, second floor, the crime lab. Chief Ed Backstrand and Lee Jones were waiting for us. Heard about the call. How'd he get away? I'm not sure it was him, Skipper. How do you mean? Well, the girl wasn't hurt bad for one thing, no attempted strangling. For another thing, the guy stole her purse. That doesn't sound like a man we're after. Did you get a description from the girl? Didn't jibe too well what she gave us. She was pretty hysterical. And you raked the neighborhood good? Every corner, not a sign. You find anything? Yeah. Jones? Yeah, Ed. Fill them in, will you? Not one print on that knife you found, boys. Blood, but not a print. Your killer's crazy like a fox. And how about the scraping from the girl's fingernails, Lee? Didn't help too much. Really do. Not enough to go on. Gonna have a fair-sized bit of flesh to run with the papal ridges. All we found under the girl's fingernails are small bits of skin. Yeah. He probably scratched the guy up some. Might have drawn blood. He had more luck with the footprints. You get an impression? Right out the ground with torches and cast them. Outside 10B. That's fine, Lee. But how about the prints? Only good one was a thumb. Real good. Got it off the wall near the light switch in the bathroom. You classified yet? Yep. Found it in our single fingerprint file. The print belongs to a man by the name of Long. Robert Long. You got a record, Ed? Yeah. Misdemeanor. Two arrests for drunkenness last October. Petty theft in December. Mama sheet shows a dishonorable discharge from the United States Coast Guard in 1946. Age 29, 192 pounds, 5 feet 10 inches, dark hair, dark eyes. That's close enough. We got even closer, Joe. 
Long works as a counterman at the Cottage Cafe down in South Flower. Started there last week on the early morning shift, but he didn't show up for work last night. Good. Where'd you get the tip? The knife you boys found. It didn't have any prints, but it had a brand on it. He ran it down. It was taken from the Cottage Cafe. Mm-hmm. Any address on this Robert Long yet? Yeah, got it from his boss. Rooming house on East First. Landlady says he hasn't been home in two nights. Yeah, now we wait. Rooming house is staked out, and so is the cottage cafe, just in case Long decides to show up for work this morning. What time you got, Romero? Mm, six minutes past four. All right. We've got every indication that Robert Long's the man we're after. His description, fingerprints, the knife, footprint, his size. Maybe we're wrong. I don't think so. How about a motive, Ed? I think Robert Long likes to kill. He's thirsty for it. None of the victims were criminally attacked. They were strangled. Bodies mutilated. How about robbery? No. Two of the women he killed had money in their purses. He didn't touch it. Well, what's next, Skipper? Back on the street? Figueroa, to Alameda. He's third to College Street. Keep an head around that area and work it back and forth until we're positive he's not inside. I think he is. At ten minutes past four a.m., Ed Baxter and Ben and I left the crime lab and drove to the surrounded area. It was still raining. We passed several patrolmen from the reserve unit making the rounds. They didn't look any more comfortable than we felt. At Broadway and Alpine Street, Ben and I got out and started patrolling on foot again. Baxter followed in the car to maintain a radio check. We must have covered two dozen blocks and a half a dozen coffee counters before we got to the Criterion Restaurant and Donut Shop, a few blocks up the street from the Cottage Cafe. Hey, Skipper. You want to take a minute for some hot coffee? I'll keep an ear on the radio. You two go ahead. You look drenched. Well, we are. Can we bring you some back in a paper carton? Fine, thanks. Cream. No sugar. All right, Ed. Come on, Ben. Place is empty. Yeah. Yes, sir, gentlemen. What'll it be? Hot coffee? Yeah, there's two of us here. Can you fix up one to go? Sure thing. Ben, that one to go, cream, no sugar. Right. Say, you fellas cops? Yeah, why? No offense, just wondering. Here you are. Thank you. Cop in uniform was around a couple hours ago. Wanted to know if I'd seen some guy he was looking for. Tall, about 190 pounds, mustache, about 30 years old. Yeah, that's the description he gave me. He, he was looking for the guy. So are we. Say, that's good. That other cop came in right at my busiest time, a little after two when the bars closed. You know, it gets pretty rushed, and I didn't have much time to think, so I just said no. Then after the cop left, I remembered. You saw a man answering that description tonight? Yeah. I would have told the cop, but I was rushed. You know how it is. No time to think, and then I remembered. Are you sure? Oh, I'm sure, all right. Whoever he is, he's a lady killer. What do you mean? No offense. Uh, there was a sharp-looking dame down the end of the counter, and this guy breezes in and picks her up. Talks to her about 20 minutes, buys her a cup of coffee, and they walk out together. You remember what she looked like? Oh, nice-looking dame. Not beautiful, you know. More on the on the cute side. Ben, you got that morgue shot? Oh, yeah. Here, here it is. Thanks. Here's a picture. This the girl? Let's see. Yeah, that's her. Who is she? I don't know, mister. Down at the morgue, they call her Jane Doe, number seven. Just by accident, we'd come across a concrete lead on the killer's method of operation. The picture we showed the man in the donut shop was a shot of the strangler's first victim the night before. Evidently, the killer would enter a bar, coffee shop, or restaurant, strike up a conversation with a woman, have friends with her, either buy her drinks or invite her to a bar in the neighborhood, and then the rest of the puzzle was still unsolved. We went back to the cottage cafe and checked with the men on stakeout. Not a sign of them, Chief. How are you men covering the place? Baxter up in front in the booth across from the cash register. Lyman's back with the dishwashers. I'm at the counter. When's Long due to report for work, Dave? At five. About mm, 20 minutes to go. You're lucky you're inside. It's wet out there. You look at... All right, Davis. We'll be around about five. Right, Chief. Let's get back in the car. Where to, Skipper? Cruise the next two blocks, but don't go too far. If Long shows up for work this morning, we want to be around. The next ten minutes dragged by. The rain kept on. Max Van chewed nervously on a cigar. At South Flower and First Street, the sewers were clogged with street refuse. The rain backed up and filled the intersection. A group of aircraft workers huddled together in a doorway on one corner, waiting for the bus. It was cold and damp. I opened one of the back windows in the car to get some fresh air in. Off in the distance and close by, we could hear the sounds of a big city waking up slow to a rainy January morning. 
It was eight minutes to five. Attention all units. Attention all units. At 780 East Main, a restaurant. Man answering description of murder suspect. All right, Romero, step on it. All right, Jim. About ten blocks away, Ed. Who's going to cover the men at the cottage cafe? If this is a blind lead, it won't take us long to find out. They can handle it alone if they have to. Hang on. Look out. We're skidding. That was a close one, Ben. Yeah. This is the guy. I owe you five bucks, right? Yeah. Attention all units. Additional information on your call to 780 East Main. Officers in pursuit of suspects. Suspect is on foot. Step on it, Romero. Two more on. blocks, Skipper. Watch it, man. Next one to the left. Got it. That's the joint up ahead there. All right, watch your step and don't take chances. Don't play with him. Right. Here we go. He went out the back. Ran down that alley. Come on, man. Behind you. You men, hustle. I go around the block and choke out the alley. Man. Come on, Come on, right? Right over the fence, man. Man, look out, look out. All right. Not that good. Come on, Jim. All right. There he goes. Let's bring the building. Stop or I'll shoot. The next house. He ducked into the basement. All right, cover me. All right. Come on, he broke through the garage doors. There's Davis. Dave, Dave, he slipped through. Get down to the next corner and ring the block. Yeah. Ben, Ben, did you follow him? Yeah, right on his tail. That warehouse, a couple of lots over. He went through the back. There it is, Joe. All right, don't go in blind. Watch out. Got a chance. Come out with your hands up. Not stopping, Joe. All right, let's fan out. All right, Ben, cover me. I'm going for the door. All right, Ben, come on. You're clear. You spot him? There he is. Let's get him. Close. He's in a good spot. Let's move. He's up in the lot. Come on, let's head for the stairs. Will you? Easy. You spot him, Ben. Not a sign. Ben, look out, that packing tape. Kind of close, don't you? Yeah. Let's get that poke now. Look out, Joe, there's another one. All right, you. We got the warehouse surrounded. Come on down. All right, then we'll flash you out. Joe, let's go up and down the ladder. It's one for the front door. They're waiting for you with Tommy guns out there. They'll cut you down. Stop. Joe. He's got the door open. He's making a break for it. Crazy. He's trying to shoot his way out. Well, he asked for it. Yeah. Let's take a look. Messed up. Well, like his girlfriends. Yeah. Maybe he just didn't like women. Maybe. Hi, Ed. You all right? Sorry. This is him, huh? Even the scratches that girl made on his face. Hm. Description match? Five feet ten, 192 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, age 29. Robert Long, killer. <laughs> story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. You have just heard the tenth in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Lewis A. Abbott of the Chicago Police Department who on the afternoon of March 3rd, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll probably want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy's star of Dangerous Assignment. Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, Private Detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company.
is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A sudden wave of jewel thefts is sweeping the city. In 16 days, 16 burglaries have been committed, one each night. They bear the same trademark. Thousands of dollars of jewels are missing. The thief is a master at his trade. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 17th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of burglary. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work that morning, and it was 7.53 a.m. when I got to room 45. Burglary detail. Hi, Joe. How are you, Walker? Going to be a scorcher out today. Yeah, just like yesterday. Ben in yet? I think he's over in communications picking up the mail. Oh, thanks. You guys been busy? Oh, well, kind of. Jewel thefts. Anything big? No, no big hauls, but he's consistent. Sixteen nights in a row. Hmm. Same guy? Think so. Same M.O. And everybody's got troubles. Got to check some records. See you later, Joe. Okay, Willie. Burglary Friday. Yeah. Okay, Mike. As soon as Ben gets back. He's picking up the mail. Right. Bye. Hi, Joe. Hi, Ben. Hannon just called. Chief wants to see us. Take a look at these first. What do you got? Overnight reports? Yeah, here these two. Mm. Yeah. Two of them. Three diamond rings, one sapphire, one necklace, jade. Big haul. Look at that other one. Ladies' watch, diamond band, emerald bracelet, tourmaline brooch. What's tourmaline, Ben? I don't know. It must be valuable. It's gone. Uh-huh. Let's see. Owner left house about 9 p.m., returned about 1.30 a.m., found property gone, scratches on the door. Probably using the cellophane method. Hasn't missed yet. Two in one night. Now it's picking up his pace. Must have a bag full of loot somewhere, whoever it is. You get the description sheet from pawn shop detail? Yeah, I got them right here. You take half of them. Let's see what luck we got this morning. Yeah, thanks. Mm. Nothing so far. Mm-mm. Me neither. Okay. I get it, Joe. Burglar Romero. Hi, Ben. Chief still wants to talk to you, boys. He's got an appointment at 8.30. He wants to see you before he leaves. Okay, Mike. Just checking some buy sheets. Be right in. Better make it fast. He's in a bad mood this morning. Okay, Mike. Thank you. Back strand again? Yeah, he's in a bad mood. Come on. Wonder what's bothering him. Something's bad. He doesn't blow very often. Chief of Detectives Office, Hannon. Go ahead in, boys. He's waiting. Thank you, Mike. All right, ma'am. I'll connect you. Friday, Romero, sit down. Wait till I get the phone. Back, Strand. Oh, yes, Mrs. Winthrop. Yes, ma'am. We're doing all we can. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yes, I'll do that. Yes, ma'am. Goodbye. Got trouble, Ed? Taxpayer, Mrs. Winthrop. You two ought to remember the name. We do, Skip. Ten days ago, somebody lifted $2,000 worth of diamonds from her bedroom while she was at the symphony. Last night, she was hit again. A diamond watch, an emerald bracelet, and some kind of a brooch. Tourmaline. I don't care what kind it was. It's gone. What's the pitch? We just read a report a couple of minutes ago, Skipper. Could be a time with those other 16 jobs. 16 jobs in 16 days. You haven't got a lead on the thief yet? Nothing shows up. No prints, nothing. Uh, what about the pawn shops? Nobody's tried to soak any hot stuff as far as we know. We double-checked the detail. We got every hawk shop in town on the alert. Whoever it is, they've got to try to pawn the stuff sometime. Unless they're going to give diamond rings for Christmas presents. And they haven't tried the pawn shops yet, Skipper. We're sure they Look, 16 burglaries in 16 days. Jewels and watches. Good ones. Well, it's got to stop. It's got to stop soon, you understand? We'll stay right on top of it, Ed. We're doing all we can. For two weeks, I've had half a dozen women calling me every day. Society women. Some of them figure they should get extra treatment. They're only DR numbers to us, Skipper. They all get the same attention. I'll try and explain that to some of them. They think you're in on the racket. Maybe you boys would like to take these calls some morning. No, thanks, Ed. All right, then let's get some action. Keep the pawn shop operators on their toes and get after every known fence in town. That's all. I've got an appointment. All right, Ed. Check you later. Hold it a call. 
All for you, Ben. Oh, thank you. Hello. Oh, hi, Max. What? What? Well, hold it. Be right down. First break, Joe. What do you got? Necklace and a watch. Both of them on the stolen property list. Where? Henry's Pawn Shop, 5th and Main. Six minutes later at 8.25 a.m., Ben and I drove up in front of Henry's Square Deal Pawn Shop. Quick cash, no red tape, watches bought and sold. The proprietor was Max Murphy, an old friend of Ben's. Well, pal, of all days, it had to happen yesterday. Took the day off and went fishing up at Big Bear. I left my nephew in charge, Harry, a real knothead, that kid. How do you mean, Max? Joe, if I told him once, I told him a hundred and once. Whatever you do, whatever they come in with, the hawk, check it with the list. Check it with the stolen property list. What does he do? He forgot. He forgot. Oh, a real knothead, that boy. How old is he, Max? Thirty-two. A real knothead. I checked the slips from yesterday. Then I checked the stolen property list. There it is. Hot stuff. When did the stuff come in, Max, do you know? About four o'clock yesterday afternoon. Can we look at it? Oh, sure. Uh, back here behind the car. There it is. Did you check out the serial numbers on the watch yet, Max? When I found out, yes. They match to a T. All right, let's see. Yeah. Description on this necklace matches, too. Let's have a look at your Bible, huh, Max? Yes, sir, Joe. Here you are. There's a deal right there. Here? Yeah, that's him. That's how he gave his name. Mm. Walter Tracy, 132 and a half Blackstone Court, Los Angeles. Let me check the book for the description, man. Oh, sure. Yeah, here. Mm -hmm. Okay, Max, thanks. We'll be checking with you later. Sure, Joe. Anytime. Sorry. All right, Max. See you later. Uh, you fellas take it easy. Right. I want to check and see if we're clear, Joe? Yeah, I will. 80K to control one. 80K to control one. Are we clear? Control one to 80K. Stand by. Good lead, Joe. Got a description in here. Yeah. It's too bad Max's nephew had to slip up. Control one to 80K. Call your office immediately. Call your office immediately. Okay, Major. Success. I wonder what that's about. No, no. I'll call in. You got some change? I'll use Max's phone. Ding. Use your phone a minute, Max. You, Ben? Sure. Help yourself. Thank you. City Hall. 2524. 2524. Burglary. Levine. This is Ben, George. You got something? Hot one. Universal loan shop. Sixth and Barton Place. Guy just took in a couple of rings. He checked too late. What you mean? He checked the form after the guy left. Signed, Walter Tracy. There they are, Sergeant. Both rings. Fine quality diamonds. Don't you usually check your stolen goods list before you take in stuff like this? Usually, yes. Last night, no. I don't know what I was thinking about. Can we have a look at your buy book? Right here. There it is. Walter Tracy. 699 Olive Street, 145 pounds, 5 foot 9, dark hair, build, thin. We'll have to slap a hold on these rings. I know, I should have thought. Can you think of anything else that might help us to identify the man? Well, no. Had a light suit on. Nice cut. Very well dressed. Thank you, that's all for now. Here's a card. If the guy happens to drop back, give us a call, will you? Sure will, Sergeant. Say, yeah. I've got some nice watch pens. Yours look gold. Can I interest you? No, thanks. Some other time. Come on, Ben. That afternoon and the following morning, despite our alert and our warnings, two more pawn shops called in with reports of stolen watches taken in. We checked them out. The serial numbers on the watches matched those on the stolen property list. On the pawn shop account books, the loan was listed under the name Walter Tracy. The addresses were given as number 12 St. Vincent Place and 700 East Flower. The descriptions of the man were the same. Slight build, well-dressed, about 145 pounds, 5 feet 9 inches tall, dark wavy hair. We had the name and description distributed to every pawn shop in Los Angeles and surrounding communities. Through our informants, we checked up on every known fence in the city. For the next two nights, we received no reports of stolen jewels. That made up for the double burglary the night before. On June 19th, the box score read 18 successive nights, 18 successive jewel burglaries. At 3.25 in the afternoon, Ben and I sat down to check over the late incoming reports. Got anything, Joe? Oh, not yet, no. Mm, nothing here. Maybe the guy's left town. Nope. No such luck. Take a look. That's it, number 19. He may set a record. Oh, he's making monkeys out of us, isn't he? Look, 
Man's watch, lady's watch, Chinese amber necklace, diamond shirt studs, and a bracelet with two large rubies. He's getting ambitious. How's the value listing? Let me see. Eighteen hundred dollars. One haul. I'll get it. Burglary Friday. Yeah. What? Yeah. Be right down. Stall him. Let's go, Ben. Where? Kaplan's down on East Second. Walter Tracy's in there now, trying to hock a gold watch. <laughs> Ben, cover the door. I'll just look like I'm shopping around. Right, but watch your step. We don't know this guy. Yeah, stay close to the door, huh? I'm sorry. That's the best we can do on the watch. Look, Mac, this is gold. 21 jewels. Well, that's the best I can do. Ah, drop dead. Well, it's the best I can do. Don't get sore. Yeah, sure. See you later. That's him, Sergeant. Wallet Tracy. I stole him as long as I could. All right, I'll check back with you later. Did you spot the guy that just came out? Yeah, I went up straight. Let's follow him. Hustle it. Spot him, Ben. Straight ahead, about 15 yards. He's crossing the street. Yeah, let's get up a little closer. We'll lose him, sure, if the light changes. Come on, run for it. What's the traffic like? Yeah. That was close. You might have spotted us. It's going faster. Come on, Joe, run. Yeah. Don't lose him. This crowd's not helping. Hey, hey, wait a minute. I thought you were a cop. You're chasing somebody. I'm going to go on my arm, mister. Let go. Well, you don't have to get tough. Run as he comes. Take the only street. I'm going to write the mayor's off. Come on, Joe. He's running for it. Yeah, I see him. Watch the signal up ahead. Hurry, Joe. Almost up, Joe. Into the parking lot. Hey, you! Stop! Look out, Joe. A gun! Yeah, I see. Right. Get away. Get away, smart guy. It's a nice job. Yeah. He's too fast for an honest man. Let's take him in. When we got back to headquarters, Walter Tracy was under technical arrest. We took him directly to the interrogation room. We searched him thoroughly. We had him take everything out of his pockets and put it on the table. Then we had him take all the money he had in his wallet, count it out, and hold it in his hand. What is all this routine? That's all the money you have on you? $47.17, right? Yeah. Okay, keep it in your hand. Ben, shake him down. All right, Tracy, take off your coat, shirt, tie, and shoes and stuff. What kind of a pitch is this? I'm no hood. Take them off. Two-bit cops. You're not pinning anything on me. I don't care what you do. Sleeves, pockets, lining. Nothing in the coat, Joe. Get his shirt. Take it light with the threads, huh? Costs money. How about the trousers, Ben? Let's see. Cuffs, pockets. No. Let me get the belt. Zipper on the inside of the belt? No, it's clean. Shoes are okay. All right, Tracy, let's see the soles of your feet. I hope you don't mind. Uh, they're dirty. Why don't you take a shower? Let's see. All right, Joe, nothing. Put your toes back on. Yeah, thanks. All right, you. What's your name? Huh? I said, what's your name? You telling jokes? Walter Tracy, you know that. Your real name. How old are you, Tracy? 27. Where do you live? No place. Just got in town a couple of days ago. Where are you from? Salina, Kansas. Where you been sleeping the last two nights? The park, Pershing Square. Clothes don't chill it. Pretty natty. I had them pressed. Where? Down by the square. I don't remember. You ever been arrested before? No. Where'd you get this gun, Tracy, the one you pulled on us? I didn't know who you were. Could have been a couple of hoods. You kind of look like it. Where'd you get the gun? I won it in a crap game coming out on the train. Where'd you get the watch? Graduation present. You want to run a make on him, Joe? The gun and the watch? Yeah, I'll call him. Go on, check. You can't prove a thing. Pawn shop records, Gilmore. Gil, this is Friday. Can you give me a make on a watch? Sure, Joe. Go ahead. Time master, yellow gold, man's wristwatch. Okay. Case number 716F23. Right. Movement number B351708. Got it. Okay. Now give me a make on this gun, huh? 32 S and W automatic. Serial number 579461. Okay. Call me back. Right. What's your station number? 2572. I'll ring you, Joe. Thanks. Having fun? What'd you do with all those jewels you stole? When do I get out of here? I don't think you're going to get out. You got nothing on me. How tall are you, Tracy? Get your tape measure. Five, nine. How much you weigh? 140. I'm 27. My name's Walter Tracy. I come from Salina. I've been in town two days, and I don't know what you guys are talking about. You sound smart. You don't act it. And you're flying Brian Copper. What'd you do with those jewels you stole? I don't know what you're talking about. What color are your eyes? I don't know. I'm colorblind. What color would you say your hair is? 
You colorblind, too? You ever been arrested before? Straighten out. He asked me that. I'm asking you. No. You ever done any big time? No. All right, I don't care if you're level with us or not. We're going to make you on those prowl jobs, all 19 of them. Sure, sure. You guys are smart. You got in Los Angeles two days ago, is that right? Yeah. You don't know anything about any jewel thefts? That's what I said. Then how come your name and your handwriting's on the account books in four pawn shops in Los Angeles? It's not mine. You can't prove it. We can, Tracy. Come clean. What'd you do with the stuff you stole from 1250 Moraga Drive, June 5th? I didn't steal any stuff. What'd you do with the rings and watches you took from 1400 Placerville Road, June 9th? I wasn't in town. What'd you do with the diamond dress pins you stole June 13th, 123 South Van Ness? Did I do that? You're not only kinky, you're a bad liar. You prove it. Border gets you a saw buck, your prints bounce, Tracy. Our handwriting man's gone to work on those signatures of yours. You haven't got a chance. Now, come on. Where'd you hide this stuff? You can't prove a thing. Where'd you say you've been sleeping the last two nights? In the park, Pershing Square. You want a map? Clothes sure look nice. I said I had them pressed. But you can't remember where. No, I can't remember where. That a crime? Friday, something. Joe, this is Gilmore. Here's the stuff you asked for. Let's have it, Joe. No make on the watch, no make on the gun. Okay, Gil, thanks a lot. Yeah. You're in up your neck. You said that, didn't you? You're gonna talk, Tracy. Kind of tired. All right, we'll let you sleep on it. Come on, Ben, let's book him. Right. I'll get your jobs, coppers. Sure. Come on. We took Walter Tracy to the county jail and had him booked on suspicion of burglary. He was still sullen. We knew we had the guilty man. Now we had to prove it. As it often happens, the victims never see the burglar. They only know he's been there. They can't identify him, but they can identify their property. Our job was to find the property. When we did, we'd have Walter Tracy. And the 19 victims would have their property returned. But Tracy wasn't talking. And we knew he'd never talk unless he thought it might help him. We took the problem to Ed Backstrand. Smart punk, Skipper, but he's done time before. How do you know? Tried him out last night when we brought him in. He talks like it and he acts like it. But he won't cop out. Are you sure? He won't talk in a hundred years. He knows he's got us in the spot. And one thing's sure. We're not going to send him up without finding the loot first. He's planted this stuff somewhere in this city. We've got to find it. Ben and I have got an idea, Ed. It's not going to be easy, but it might work. What is it? Tracy tried to soak some of the stolen property at four separate pawn shops in the downtown area. Yeah. At each one of those four pawn shops, he gave a local address. Now, we're sure he must have a room or an apartment someplace in town. All right. Where? That's where our guesswork comes in, Skipper. Every one of those addresses he gave falls within a certain area. How big an area? Oh, uh, you got that street diagram, Joe? Yeah. Here it is, Ed. From uh, Figueroa here to San Pedro, and from uh, Pico down to First Street. The area's about 12 blocks wide, 14 blocks long. Mm. That's a lot of territory. How are you going to cover it? On foot, we'll take Tracy with us. Plenty of legwork. You sure it's the answer? We've got to find the stuff, and it's the only way we can figure it. Hotels, apartments, rooming houses. There must be hundreds of places he could stay in that territory. It'll take a couple of weeks. Yeah, on foot it will. All right. It's tough, but it's your idea. Go to it. An hour after we left Chief Backstrand, we got Tracy out of his cell in the county jail and started our canvas of the appointed area. We took the usual precautions and handcuffed Tracy's wrists to our own. We started the search for his hideout at First Street and Figueroa. It was a warm day in Los Angeles. The temperature was 91. After the first three hours, I could tell Ben's feet were ready to give out, and so were mine. We couldn't even have the comfort of complaining. That had encouraged Tracy, and he was cocky enough already. He cursed and threatened every step of the way. My legs off. All right, quit pulling, will you? Come on, Tracy, up the stairs. Another one to check. Warm day, Joe. Yeah, a little. What do you mean, a little? Must be 110. Yes? What is it? You the manager? Yes. Could you tell me which apartment this man has in your house, ma'am? Who, him? Yes, ma'am, this one. Never saw him before. He don't live here. All right, ma'am, thank you. Yeah. Hot, ain't it? When are you going to get wise? Come on, Tracy. Well, that finishes this side of the street. You want to cross over, Joe? Yeah. Let's go. I'm hungry. I want to eat. After we cover the other side of the street. You can't do this to me. I'm going to get a lawyer out of your jobs, both of you. Yeah, mm -hmm. come on. We only got a couple of hundred places to go. Hi, gents. What can I do for you? You the manager? I run the place, yeah. Which room does this man have in your place? Him? You made a mistake. He doesn't live here. All right, thanks. My feet are killing me. Wait till I get a lawyer. I'll burn both of you dumb cops. What do you think you're doing anyway? Making a All that day and the day after that and the day after that, Ben and I, with Tracy handcuffed to our wrist, canvassed the designated areas from hotel to hotel, from rooming house to rooming house, and the apartments, too. 
Every day our feet ached a little more, our pace slowed down, Tracy got more irritable, and the weather got hotter. The second day it reached a high of 92, the third day 94, the fourth day 94. Police regulations say plainclothes officers must wear a coat and necktie on the street at all times. We wore our coats and neckties. The search continued into the fifth day. Our pace got even slower. Ben and I started to lose heart. After a while, we forgot our object was to recover the stolen jewels. All we wanted was to find Tracy's hideout. We knew we were right. We knew Tracy was our man. It was a point of pride. Whether your feet hurt or not, you don't give in to a thief. Yes? What do you want? You the landlady here? I am. Which apartment does this man have in the building? Well, none of them. He's not one of my tenants. Thank you, ma'am. Come on, Tracy. By the sixth day, all three of us had special pads in our shoes. Our feet ached worse than ever. Tracy let us know about his every three minutes. By late afternoon of the sixth day, we'd covered more than half of the designated area. The temperature was 95. You guys gonna go on forever? I'm sweating like a horse. I'm getting tired of your moaning. That looks like the manager behind the desk. Yes, sir? You the manager? Yes, sir. What can I do for you? Can you tell us which room this man has in the hotel? Him? Mm -hmm. He doesn't live here. Hey, uh, you fellas look awfully warm. Like to cool off in the lobby? We're air-conditioned. No, thanks. I'm hungry. When do we eat? You're always hungry. You got the biggest mouth on a cop I ever saw. Oh, All yeah. right, then. Uh, yeah. I'm hungry. I want to eat. Now. Wait till I give this story to the papers. Mistreating innocent guys. They'll break you. All right. Come on, up the stairs. I'm going to get a lawyer tonight. I'll show you. Yes? Why, Mr. Baker, where have you been? We questioned the landlady, a Miss Elizabeth Hutter. She told us that Baker, alias Tracy, had rented an apartment from her about two months before. That's all the information she could give us. Tracy clammed up. He would admit nothing. We asked Miss Hunter to accompany us as a witness. We took the elevator up to Tracy's apartment on the sixth floor. Miss Hunter, Tracy, Ben, and I. Down this way. Here. Do you want me to open it? Please, Miss Hunter. What? There's a girl. Walter? What is Walter? I told you to get out of town if I didn't come back. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave without you. I thought you slept in the park. Uh, take a jump. Where is the stuff hidden? All right, Ben, handcuff him to a chair. The girl behind him. We'll find the stuff ourselves. All right, Tracy. All right, you're next. I haven't done anything either. See, you can't prove it. Billy, shut up. That's better. No talking between you two. If there is, we'll separate you. All right, Ben, you take the living room here. I'll try the kitchen. And get a window open. It's hot in here. All right. Sergeant, you will be careful of the furniture. Yes, ma'am. I had no idea. You, Mr. Baker, of all people. Don't talk to him, please, ma'am. Oh, yes. Tin cop. Why don't you spell? Ben, look. It's only the beginning. He's got the stuff scattered seven ways for Sunday. We're going to need help. In the milk bottle? Yeah, two rings, three loose diamonds, and this bottle of mayonnaise. We found some kind of a brooch in it. A couple of watches taped to the underside of the kitchen sink. All right, you. Convinced? Okay, Ben. Call Backstrand. <laughs> There was a definite possibility that Walter Baker, alias Tracy, had stored some of his stolen loot outside his apartment. We stood little chance of ever recovering it unless we got him to break. Ben called Chief Backstrand, and in ten minutes he arrived at the apartment with another man from burglary detail, George Levine. Together we went over the four-room apartment foot by foot. We found jewelry, watches, loose stones in every conceivable place. In cartons of cottage cheese, in jars of cold cream, in the garbage can, everywhere. Who's your girlfriend? All right, I'll ask her. What's your name? I said, what is your name? Billy. Billy Crawford. He didn't do anything. He didn't. All right, Billy. Maybe you can tell us. Where's the rest of the stuff he stole? He didn't steal. He didn't steal anything. Billy, shut up. Keep quiet, you. Ed, wait a minute. What? Just a minute. I want to look over here. Papers. Taped to the underside of that top drawer. What is it, Frank? No, no, you can't. You can't. Look at these. All right. You found them. I'll talk. No, Walter, don't. It's parole papers. He's an ex-con. Yeah, I'll cop out. Don't do it, Walter. Billy, shut up. The rest of the stuff, where is it? On the roof. Inside the ventilator, the one near the front, you'll find a couple of paper bags. That's it. Levine? Got it, Chief. I'll check it. Your papers say you did time in Oregon. What for? Fell for robbery. Did five. I owe him seven. What about the girl? Walter, I'm going with you. Her? I don't know. You figure it. <laughs> 
All right, Friday. Romero, take the girl to Lincoln Heights and book her. We'll take him. Right, Ed. Come on, Ben. No. No, Walter, I want to go with you. I'm sorry, ma'am. This way out. All right, easy, lady. No, wait a minute. Just a minute. Walter. You're a dumb dame, Billy. So long. Walter. All right, come on. Let's go. What's the matter? You feel all right? He lied. He said he loved me. He lied to me. Don't feel hurt, lady. He lied to everybody. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Walter Baker, alias Walter Tracy, was tried and convicted on three counts of first-degree burglary and received the maximum sentence prescribed by law. He is now serving out his term in the state penitentiary. A hold has been placed on him by the state of Oregon, where he will serve out seven years for violation of parole. Billy Crawford, Baker's accomplice, was tried and convicted of receiving stolen property and is now serving time in the state penitentiary for women. You have just heard the 11th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official police files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Warden Clarence A. Larkin of Folsom Prison, Sacramento, who, on the evening of September 24th, 1937, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen this Saturday evening to a pair of adventure shows featuring two well-known Hollywood personalities. You'll enjoy Brian Donlevy, star of Dangerous Assignment. Also on Saturday's schedule is Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. Listen to both of these exciting programs this Saturday over most of these same NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. An armed gang of blitz bandits has started to work in your city. Their pace is fast. Four and five robberies each night. The criminals are not amateurs. They're well-armed, dangerous. Your job, get them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step-by-step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end... From crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, October 23rd. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of robbery. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on my way back from the statistician's office, and it was 11.42 a.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. How'd it work out, Joe? Any good prospect? No, I don't know how good they are, but I got a handful. How many did you get? Well, let me see. Fifteen, eighteen, twenty-two. Ethel down in the stats office ran them on the IBM for me. There they are. Mm, let's see. It's a gang of three men working on foot. Blitz robberies. They only take cash. Ammo is tie-ups. Work from eight to ten at night. One of the gang's tall, the other two short. And these are the men the machine throwed it out? Under that heading, yeah. If our information's wrong, then so's the machine. Got a good bunch of candidates here. Descriptions match up with what we got. They seem to. Check the names on that list, Ben. Some of the smartest thieves in the country. Yeah. Tommy Willis, Ray Grappa, Kemp Satelli, Manny Roberts, George Cross, Mario Kosky. Reads like June graduation at San Quentin. Yeah. George Cross and Tommy Willis are in town. We know that. And Kosky, he's around a couple weeks ago. And what about the rest? It's a big field. Have to check them out, I guess. Might as well start at the beginning. Did you go through the overnight reports yet? Yeah, no restaurants, no liquor stores. That makes five days the gang's laid off. Well, they can afford to, can't they? Eighteen robberies in 24 days, that's a pretty good haul. This stop-and-go strategy of theirs, Joe, it's got me. Yeah. 
They work hard for a week in one area, and then they lay low. If they just keep going, we might have a better try on them. Hey, Joe. Yeah, Chandler. Fell out here to see you, Joe. Name's Decker. Decker. Henry Decker? Didn't say. Want to see him? Yeah, send him in. Right. All right, Mr. Decker. This way. How are you, Joe? You're looking good. Oh, Hank Decker. How are you? I'm fine. Well, what are you waiting for? Applause? Come on in and shut the door. <laughs> Hank, this is my partner, Ben Romero. Ben, Hank Decker. Hi, Hank. How are you, Ben? Hank and I are in service together. Yeah, I just dropped in for a visit, Joe. Are you busy? No more than usual. Sir. Sure. Yeah, thanks. I remembered you telling me you were on the PD, so I figured I'd drop around and get an inside track. How do you mean? I just filed with civil service to take the exam next month. Figure I'd like to work at being a cop. He shells you out, Joe. <laughs> Great pep talk you boys hand out. You sure you want to be a cop? Oh, look, I'm 30 years old, Joe. I'm married, high school education, about a year of junior college. What's your wife think? She's not sold. Well, that's why I dropped in. How about coming out to the house for dinner tonight? You want me to sell her? Just talk to her. Seven okay? Yeah, seven's okay. I'm glad to have met you, Ben. Hey, man, Decker. See you again. All right. Bye, Joe. See you tonight, Hank. Well, what do you think, Ben? Ought to make a good cop. We had a list of 22 possible suspects. By 5 o'clock, Ben and I had checked out two of them who might possibly have had a hand in the blitz robberies of the 18 liquor stores and restaurants in the past 24 days. Number one man was Thomas Willis, Caucasian, age 29, 5 feet 11 inches, 175 pounds, dark hair, blue eyes. Number two man was Mario Kosky, Caucasian, 5 feet 6 inches, 170 pounds, dark hair, dark eyes, large scar under his chin, running across his throat up to and behind his left ear. According to our informants, and after questioning some of their associates, either Willis or Kosky or both could have taken part in the Blitz holdups. We showed their mugs to the victims, but none of them could give us definite assurance that either Willis or Kosky were in the holdup gang. At seven that night, I went out to Hank Decker's house for supper, met his wife, Linda, his four-year-old twin boys. We talked about the Army, played with the kids for a while. Before we sat out to eat, we put the boys in bed. Hank was in the kitchen carving a roast. His wife closed the door to the kids' room, and we started downstairs for the kitchen. What do you think of our two atom bombs? Well, they're fine kids, Miss Decker. Hank told me that you were worried about him wanting to join the force. I was 12 years old when my father was shot down. He was a policeman in Des Moines. He was only 37 when he died. I wouldn't know what to do if anything like that happened to Hank. What do you want me to say? But does Hank really want it? Can't you talk him out of it? You're his wife, can you? No, I think it's his choice, Miss Decker. He's going to have to make up his own mind. I'm sorry. It's what Hank wants. I guess I worry too much. A lot of women marry cops. They have, and they will, and they all worry. Hank will be all right. Will you guarantee it, Joe? During the next month, I heard from Hank Decker only once. He was studying hard. During the same month, Ben and I were working hard trying to find some kind of a concrete lead to break the Blitz gang. There had been no subsequent holdups which seemed to tie in directly with the gang or its operation. From the list of possible suspects which Ben and I made up, 18 names had been eliminated for one reason or another. Either they were in jail at the time of the robberies, out of the Los Angeles area, or out of the state. But four names remained. George Cross, Tommy Willis, Mario Kosky, Julian Brock. During the latter part of the month, George Cross was booked on a minor charge, and we questioned him at that time. He showed no knowledge of the holdups. Nearly two months after the robberies were committed, Ben and I were still without a solution as to the whereabouts of the gang. Never known a Blitz gang back like this way before, Joe. Once they get wound up, they usually go until they're caught. Yeah. Did you get out those telegram checks to the East yet? Last night, four went home. Sent out all three. Willis, Kosky, and Brock. I'd like to find just one of them. Chicago might have something. That's Kosky's old hangout. Willis, too. Mm. What about Brock? He's from Kansas City, isn't he? Yeah. I got a wife, too. Might have an answer from one of them tomorrow. Slow job. We'll have to wait it out. Yes, so. No follow up from the victims we talked to. I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Oh, hi, Joe. Hank Decker, congratulate me. What for? I just passed my written exam. Got the letter this morning. How about that? That's fine. When do you take your physical? Oh, not till the end of the month. Next week, I take the oral and agility test, then the physical. If I get by them, I'm in. Well, you're going to have a full month at the police academy after the test. It's a lot of work, Hank. Oh, it can't be any worse than these tests. It's a tough 30 days out there on the hill. Law, court procedure, evidence. Combat fighting target practice. You'll have to wade through all of them. Are you ever going to have anything encouraging to say? Yeah, when you graduate. I won't count on it. How's your job going? Slow. How's your wife feel now? About taking the job? Mm-hmm. A little better. She said to say hello. 
Okay. Keep us posted, huh? I'll do that, Joe. Right. Bye. Hank passed his written test. Hmm. Sure anxious. Brandy, Romero, got a minute? Yes, Gipper. Come on, Joe. You got something, Ed? Yeah, those bitch robberies you're handling. Not having much luck. We were. Gangs disappeared. Not a trace of them so far. They leave town? Oh, we're not sure, Ed. We don't even have a good description. We're guessing most of the way. What are your guesses? You've had a couple of months to make them. Twelve of the holdup victims we talked to told us definitely that there were three men in the gang. Two of them short, one of them tall. We've just been working from there. All three of them have dark complexion. Started with 22 possibilities and got it weeded down to four. No, wait a minute, three. Yeah. Tommy Willis, Mario Kosky, Julian Brock. Willis and Kosky are eastern hoods. Brock's from the Middle West. And where are they now? Haven't showed their faces around town. Checking some of the cities in the east. That's about all we got, Skipper. Uh, not much for two months' work. Thieves can't be that smart. Right now they are. We've sounded out every lead we had, Ed. We're doing our best. Either of you ever hear of a man by the name of Al Mishikov? No, I don't think so. Chicago gunman in the old days, wasn't he, Ed? That's right. I thought he was doing time in Joliet. Paroled last year. Got a tip he was spotted on East Broadway night before last. You figured it might tie in with our job? I don't know. Find out. If I remember right, Mishikov's brother used to be pretty friendly with Mary Olkowski. I helped send both of them up 13 years ago. Same rap. Robbery. Was that all you heard, Ed? Somebody spotted Mishikov? That's all. If you can track him down, you might get some kind of a lead. That's more than you got now. That night and for the next two nights following, Ben and I had dinner downtown instead of going home, and then we spent the rest of the night covering the lower end of the city in search of Al Mishikoff. We got more than a dozen leads on where to find him from some of our informants, but none of the leads paid off. We kept missing him. No one knew where he was staying. No one knew or no one would tell us. Worst thing about this job, Joe, leg work. You must be averaging 10 miles a night. My feet say 20. Yeah, almost midnight. Here's McCarthy's place. Let's try it. Right. Let's go down to the end of the bar, Ben. Yeah. Hiya, Ben. Good to see you. Come in. What's new? Oh, not much, Bert. Meet my partner, Joe Friday. Hiya, Friday. What do you fellas have? Looking for a guy, Bert. His name's Al Mishikoff, Chicago. You heard anything? He was in here earlier tonight. A couple of guys with him. Are you sure? What do you look like? Six feet, about 45, I guess. Big Bill. Sounds like him, all right, Joe. Is he staying in the neighborhood, Bert? He's down here? I don't think so. Most of those big timers stay uptown someplace. You looking for Mitchell? I'd like to talk to him. How long ago was he in? Oh, about 8 o'clock. A couple of guys with him. They were talking about driving out to the airport. Something about Las Vegas. Uh huh. There's an 8.40 plane for Vegas, isn't there, Ben? Mm, thanks, so. 8.40, 8.50. I can't recall which. Bert, do you remember the exact time they left? Exactly. No. The same. There's one of the fellows that was with Mishikov down there in the middle of the bar. Which one, Bert? There's one with the sandy hair, big chin. See him? Yeah. Want to talk to him? Come on. And Josh, you know what he said? He said when he was in Vegas last week. Yeah, pardon me. Killing you. That's where... Pardon me. I'd like to talk to you a minute. Yeah, who are you? Police, Sergeant Friday. Oh, have a drink, Sergeant. No, thanks. I said I wanted to talk to you. Hmm, Square John. Huh? Wait a minute, George. Square John wants to talk to me. Come on outside. We can talk better out there. I ain't done nothing. What's the pitch? I got a right to know. Let's go outside. Maybe I don't want to go outside. I think you better. Come on. All right, all right. Quit shoving, you dumb cop shoving people around. What are you trying to do? All right, down this way. Car's parked up the next alley, Joe. Hey, look, what's this all about? Huh? I got a right to know. You were seen with Al Mishikoff tonight. Where is he? Who? Al Mishikoff. You want us to spell it? I don't think you can spell your own name. Nobody's asking you to play smart. Where's Mishikoff? Out of town. What do you care? Here's the car. All right, inside, you. Well, look, you got me wrong. I ain't done nothing. Where's Mishikoff? You and some other guy drove to the airport with him tonight. Let's have it. I'm clear, I tell you. I just drove out with him, that's all. Where'd Mishikoff go? Vegas. Took the plane for Vegas. When? About 8, 30, quarter to 9. What's up, anyway? Who's the guy traveling with Mishikoff? Nobody. Who's the guy traveling with Mishikoff? Kosky. I, I just met him tonight. Mario Kosky, is that the guy? Yeah, I'm leveling. I ain't done it. Ben, get to a phone call the office. Contact Las Vegas police. Ask them to pick up Kosky and Mishikov. When we got back to the office, we questioned the man we had picked up for almost two hours. His name was John Delmar, an ex-convict. He'd been paroled from Folsom Prison two months before after serving three and a half years for burglary. He said Mishikov was looking for a man to work with him and Kosky. He didn't specify the work. Delmar said he refused the offer, but they parted on friendly terms. He said Kosky and Mishikoff told him that they were going to Las Vegas for a few days and returned to Los Angeles. But when Ben and I checked back with the Las Vegas police the next morning, they reported that nobody answering the description of either Kosky or Mishikoff was seen arriving or leaving the airport. We checked with the airlines and sent inquiries to law enforcement agencies throughout the entire area. 
No sign. Three weeks went by. Still no sign. Nothing in the overnight, Joe. Mm, no, not a thing. Oh, yeah, same here. Reno, Sacramento, San Francisco. Nobody's seen him. Ain't got to come out sometime. We can wait. Yeah, we can wait. Gets on your nerves. Let's check with Backstrand. Maybe he's got a job for us in the meantime. You getting as eager as your friend Hank Decker, Joe. Incidentally, how'd things turn out for him? They passed all his exams, putting in his month's training at the academy, huh? He should do all right. Oh, yeah. Hi, Mike. Skipper busy? Not in his office. Won't be until afternoon. What's the matter? He's got a lecture at the police academy this morning. Thanks, Mike. Come on, Ben. Ben and I drove out to the police academy near Elysian Park. We went out to check with Ed Backstrand on the Blitz robberies, not to listen to his lecture. When we walked into the classroom, he was just finishing up, so we sat in the back of the room and listened. It was a pretty good speech. Because of the alertness of the arresting officer, his talent for memorizing detail, and his knowledge of how a criminal acts under a given set of circumstances, the arrest was made. Well, that's about it, gentlemen. Thank you for your attention. Now, uh, when I ran this speech over at home, my wife said it wasn't a very good talk, but at least it came out on time. Now it seems I'm two minutes short, so I guess I failed on both counts. But if I may, I'd, I'd like to use the few minutes that are left to tell you what I think of being a cop after 24 years. For one reason or other, you men have chosen the career of a police officer. Well, let me tell you right now, without any qualifications, it's a thankless job. Maybe you can't see it now. Maybe you think I'm exaggerating. But when you graduate next week and get that uniform on, your whole lives are going to change. You're uh, going to lose friends, a lot of them. They'll want parking tickets fixed, some other favors. You'll have to turn them down, so you'll be a heel, a fathead. When you're on the beach, you're going to meet the cream of society and the scum, the lowest. Sometimes you won't be able to tell the difference. Some of you will have to work with thugs, stupid gangsters, dope addicts, cheap women. All the human garbage you can find in a big city. You'll come home at night and take a shower to wash off the dirt, but you still won't feel clean. That's the job. When you buy a box of candy and bring it home for your anniversary, the neighbors will tell you chiseled it. When you save up a few dollars and buy a new car or some furniture for the house, that's graft. People are going to want favors. They'll offer you things, a free beer or a new dress for your wife. If you take it, you're a chiseler. If you don't, you're a tough cop. Well... Here's a piece of advice. Take nothing from anyone, no matter how good a friend he is. Pay for everything you get and don't ask favors. Treat everybody alike, no matter what they look like or what they believe in. You don't play favorites. There are going to be times when a few men in the department get out of line. The newspapers will play it up because it makes good reading and the average John public will love it. Because that's the only way he can pay you back for that traffic ticket you gave him. Being a good cop is a hard job. But it's a good one. Let me warn you just once more. It's one of the most thankless jobs on earth. That's all, gentlemen. The following week, Hank Decker graduated from the police academy and hit the transfer list for a regular assignment. He drew a job of teaching combat firing and boxing at the academy. He didn't like it, so he put in a request for a transfer and waited. For the next six weeks, Ben and I waited, too, for some sign of the Blitz bandits. There wasn't any. The only possible suspects, Mario Kosky and Al Mishikoff, had disappeared completely. We kept a close check on every possible avenue of information. Still, no sign. Ben and I were transferred to the night watch on robbery for a few weeks, and that gave Hank Decker a chance to drop in and visit with us a couple of hours when he went off duty at the academy. He was still as eager as ever. Hi, Brad. Joe, anything new? Hi, Hank. Nothing here. What about the academy? Oh, big news. Mm, what's up? Getting a transfer starting next Monday. Going to start on a beat. Thought you were all tied up with that boys' club you started out there. Oh, I was, but Hanson's going to take over when I leave. The kids sure love it. Free swimming in the pool, boxing lessons. We teach them everything. Where's your beat going to be, huh? Central, right in the downtown district. Might learn something, huh? You'll learn a lot. You don't want to forget most of it. Look, it's a quarter after seven. Don't you ever go home for dinner, Hank? No, getting a wife used to it. This new ship's going to be night work, you know. Wait till you're on it for a year, and then you tell us how you like it. A year? I want to be in the detective bureau after a year. Well, you're not even going to last a year if you don't get home to dinner. Your wife's called twice this week already. She calls me. Okay, when did she call tonight? She hasn't, Jen. Well, I guess I better head her off. Let me know if anything breaks, huh, Joe? I'd like to tag along. Okay, Hank. Well, on your way. Okay, good night. So long. Good night. Yeah. How eager can you get? Were we like that when we started? Not me. I never had that much energy at one time in my whole life. Fuck shot, Joe. I'll get it. At 767 East Broadway, a liquor store, 211 and Sluggy. At 767 East Broadway, 
a liquor store, 211 and... 767 East Broadway, 211 Liquor Store. Let's go. Seven six seven East Broadway, King's Liquor Store. We pushed our way through the small crowd outside the door and into the shop. Two patrolmen in uniform were already interviewing the proprietor. He had two large gashes on his head just above the right temple. He was trembling and badly shaken, but he managed to give us a good description of the holdup men. Yeah, I can tell you what they look like. Three of them. One short, one tall, husky, another short, fat. You remember what they were wearing? Uh, coats. All three, dark coats. One of the short men, he had a big scar... Here, on the throat, like this. After the three men robbed the store, they slugged me and tied me up. Turner, this man's hurt. You call an ambulance? On the way, Sergeant. That's fine. We have just one more question, Mr. King. Here's a handful of pictures. We'd like you to tell us if any one of these men were in the gang that held you up tonight. Let me look. There you are. Take your time. No. No, not him. No. No. No, oh, this one. Here. He, he took the money from the register. Would you look through the rest, please? Are there any more? Uh, let me see again. No. No. Oh, here. Another one. There's a fat one with the scar. This is him. I think he's the one that slugged me. Thanks, Mr. King. Here's our card. We'll be contacting you later. Turner, will you and your partner take the crime report? We've got some checking to do. All right, Sergeant. Thanks. Come on, then. Yeah. Koski and Mishikov. He picked out both of them, Joe. Yeah. Certainly did, didn't he? Attention all units. Attention all units. Wait a minute. The southeast corner of Broadway and East 3rd, a liquor store and restaurant, 211, pull 3. All units. The southeast corner of... Come on, Ben, let's roll. When we got to the liquor store and restaurant at Broadway and East 3rd, Ben and I knew for certain that Koski and Mishikov were back in the city and working hard. Their M.O. matched down to almost the smallest detail. We put a call through to communications, and the entire Central Division was alerted. Then we called Chief Backstrand and told him the news. He assigned a special detail from the Metropolitan Unit to patrol the area until further notice. But at 9.23 p.m., before they pulled out of the police garage, the Blitz Bandits added two more liquor stores and one more restaurant to their list of victims. Early the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. You got a make on that third man yet? We ran his description through R&I early this morning, Ed. Closest candidate's a guy by the name of Julian Brock. He's done time here in New York. Any tie-up with Kosky or Michigan? Mama, she says he knows Kosky pretty well. And that's good enough. Now, how do you think you're going to get these thieves? We've got the alert out, Chief. Special detail from Metropolitan Division's been brief. Communication's all set. All right, here's a tip for you. Tell the men if there's a hold-up call that only the car in the area of the hold-up will handle it. These thieves are no amateurs. Let me try some decoy trick. Tell the men to stay in the area they're assigned to until they receive a call. Jake? We'll take care of it, Ed. You going to be on hand tonight? And when do you figure on starting? We'll have the full detail out by 6.30. Play it safe and start at 4. Why chance missing him? At 3.30 that afternoon, we left the police garage with a special detail from Metropolitan Division and we started to cruise the central area. We weren't looking for any action the first few hours and we didn't get any. The 5 o'clock traffic in the downtown area was heavy as usual. Hope that gang holds off till after six. We couldn't get out of this traffic if our lives depended on it. Well, we'd probably do better on foot if it wasn't for radio content. Patrol 4 to E.K. Patrol 4 to E.K., your location. Get it, will you, Joe? Yeah, wait till I get the mic. 80K to Control 4. 80K to Control 4. Our location on Spring Street between 2nd and 3rd. 80K, stand by. 80K, call your office, code 2. Call your office, code 2. Can you make this? 80K to control four, Roger. Cam A367. Yeah. Now what do I do for a parking space? You know, you're lucky. That guy up ahead there, he's pulling out. Good. That hasn't happened to me in six months. Okay, hold on, Ben. I'll be back in a minute. Yeah. Two five one one. Robbery, Chandler. This is Friday, Bill. You want us? Yeah, I just met a Joe. Chief wants to talk to you. Hello, Friday. Yeah, Ed. Cruiser car just brought in a guy answering the description of Mario Kosky. Yeah. Get over here right away and question the guy. If it is Kosky, we can all go home early. Ben and I went back to the office and questioned the man who gave his name as Conrad Larkin. He was Kosky's approximate height and weight, same color hair, same color eyes. 
The resemblance to Kosky's picture was evident. We questioned him thoroughly about the Blitz robberies, and then we checked out his fingerprints. The coincidence was hard to overlook, but we were satisfied. The man was not Mario Kosky. There was a phone message on my desk to call Hank's wife. I called her, and then we checked with Chief Backstrand again and started for the police garage. It was ten minutes past six. Hey, Ben. No, wait a minute, will you? Oh, hi, Hank. What's all excitement? I heard about those jobs last night, the Blitz gang. How about tagging along tonight? Well, sister, well, you suit yourself, Hank. Plenty I do home for dinner. I told the wife I'd eat out tonight. You sure you're not due home for dinner? No, not tonight, Joe. Uh, did you have any luck yet? Not so far, Hank. Maybe later on tonight. Come on, here's the garage. How close did you come to the gang last night? Not close enough. Two steps ahead of us, all the way. They sure must work fast. Five jobs in a row. All right, Hank, let's don't rub it in, huh? Hey, Ben, watch it, will you? Yeah. Woman driver. How about it, Joe? You think I can make the outfit? You talk to Ed Backstrand. He might get you a transfer after a while. Yeah, I might try it. Joe, look across the street. There's a guy coming out of the bar. Where? In front of the bar. He's standing there. Guy in the dark oh. coat, you see? Yeah. Two other guys behind him. Who is it? I can't be sure. Ben, you better pull up. That's, that's just like his picture. All right. Come on. All right, hold it, mister. We want to talk to you. Run for it, Al. Cover. Watch it, Joe. Hey, get out. Get down. Two of them down, Ben. Other than one up there. Let's go. Did they get Hank? Yeah. All right, hold it right here. All right, Tusky. Throw out your gun and mop your hands up. All right, let's return the fire. Come on. All right. He had his chance. Yeah. Grab his gun. Let's get back to Hank. Hmm. Did you get the guns from the other two? Yeah, they're dead. Hank got them both. All right, one side, please. Officer, did you call an ambulance? Yeah, they're on their way. Get Come on, Ben. There. One side, please. Will you let us through? Hank, how you doing? Ben, will you get the crowd black? Give him some air. Would you just move back? And get right on. Get back. Joe. All right, All right, easy, Hank. They'll be here in a minute. Hank? How's it going, Joe? Gone? Yeah. Come on. What have you got, Joe? Phone message from Hank's wife. For you? Yeah. You returned the call? Before we left the office. Who was it? She wanted me to remind Hank. He was due home for dinner at 7 o'clock. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. You have just heard the twelfth in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet is furnished by the Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Patrolman James Frank Goggin of the Cleveland Police Department, who on the morning of January 13th, 1939, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, you'll want to listen to Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell, heard Saturday on most of these NBC stations. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here is another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to auto theft detail. In three months, more than 250 cars have been broken into. Property mounting well into thousands of dollars has been stolen. Two youthful members of the gang have been apprehended. The all-important brains of the criminal ring, the leaders, are still at large. Your job, get them. Dragnet, 
the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, March 2nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night shift out of auto theft. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the interrogation room, and it was 10.58 p.m. when I got to room 26, chief of detectives' office. Real tough kids, aren't they? Yeah, they won't admit a thing. Now, sit down. Thanks. When did you pick him up? About 8.30 tonight in the parking lot behind the Star Theater out on Sunset. He was lifting the radio out of a 48 convertible. He's had lots of experience. The report says you picked up a 19-year-old girl with him. She was waiting for the guy in a parked car across the street from the theater. The car was full of loot. Uh, the first real break we've had on those auto burglaries in three months, and it's no good to us. Neither one of them will talk. They won't even admit they know each other. You run makes on them? Just did. We've been questioning the boy for an hour, getting nowhere. Uh, what's his name again? Freeman. Stanley Freeman. Ah, uh, yeah. Age 20. Address? Butte, Montana. Down here for a vacation. Uh, he doesn't lie very well, Ed. He's never been to Butte, Montana in his life. Knows less about the town than I do. Well, get to him. Right, Ed. Where'd you put the girl? We had a policewoman take her to our office. We can talk to her when we finish with the boy. Well, what's her story? Hasn't any. She won't even open her mouth. Nineteen years old. Probably needs a good spanking. Now, get him to talk. Right. Did you run a mag, Joe? Yeah, he's clean. Get wise, huh, Flatfoot? Look, you're in a bad spot, son. That kind of talk isn't going to help. Says you. We caught you red-handed trying to steal a radio that didn't belong to you from a car it didn't belong to you. Is that right? That's enough to send you to San Quentin, boy. You better give us the story. Shut up. We've got all the evidence we need for him. Maybe you don't realize how serious this is. We've had more than 250 car burglaries in this city in the past three months. Over $200,000 worth of the property has been stolen. That's a lot of money. So what? So you're the number one suspect, young fellow. Your method of operation in breaking into that car tonight is the same used in most of the other burglaries. That means you're not going to be tried just for this job tonight. What are you getting at, Flatfoot? Listen, son. In the state of California, breaking into a locked car is a felony. You can go to state penitentiary for that. And we're going to file a complaint of burglary with the district attorney in the morning. You say you're from Butte, Montana. All right, I don't believe you. But we'll make sure. Ben, go down to our office and call the news photographers. Stanley here is going to have his picture on the front page of every newspaper in Los Angeles tomorrow. Right, Joe. No. You can't. I won't let you. I got my rights. What's the matter, youngster? Everybody wants his picture in the paper. Yeah, well, I don't. I won't let him. We got your picture already for him, remember? I took it when they fingerprinted you. You can't use it. You can't. I'll get a lawyer. Reporters will be over in a couple of minutes. We have to give me a story. And your picture, too. Uh, this one. You won't. You won't. Give it all to right, me. All right, all right. All right, Freeman, get your hands off him. Now, sit down. All right. Now, let's have it straight. Oh, don't let him use the picture. Don't let him. You can't. You can't. We've got to have the truth, sir. Now, look, you're 20 years old. You know right from wrong. You'll have to take your medicine. If you cooperate, we'll do all we can to help. I live out in the Wilshire district. All I wanted was a little extra money. We didn't take much. We didn't think it was so wrong. It was stealing, Freeman. You know that's wrong. Where do you live out there? Piper Avenue. 821 Piper. You won't give him my picture. You live there with your family? Yeah, my mother. Father's dead. Promise me you won't give him the picture. My mother, she'd see it. Oh, promise me. You're working with a gang on those auto burglaries. We know that now. Who are they? Where are they? And what's the setup? I can't. They get me for it. Who'd get you? I can't tell you. I can't. Who's your girlfriend, Stanley? The one you're with tonight. Joanne. Joanne Miller. Where does she live? Piper Avenue, same as me. Lives on the same block, 866. Is that her home? She live there with her folks? Yeah. Mother and father. They work. And you got her into this? Isn't that the story she gave us, Ben? I did not. I didn't. It was her. She said a bunch of kids were doing it. It was quick money, something to do at night. She started it. 
All right, Romero. I'll go see the girl. You stay here with Freeman. All right, Joe. Just stay put in that chair for him. Hi, Marge. Hello, Joe. You and Romero handling this case? Yeah. I'd like to talk to the girl a few minutes, Marge. Will you stand by? Right. I'll sit over here. Thanks. All right, miss. What's your name, age, and address? I told this lady cop 15 minutes ago I'm not saying anything. All right, then we'll tell you. Your name's Joanne Miller. You live at 866 Piper Avenue. You live with your father and mother. Both of them work. You're a liar. That's not me. You're 19 years old. You live on the same block as your boyfriend, Stanley Freeman, and you're the one who got him mixed up in this gang. Isn't that right? No, it's not right. It's not. I didn't do anything. Well, that's only half the story. Freeman told us everything. You want to hear the rest? No. Stan wouldn't tell you. He wouldn't. He told us how you got him mixed up in it. Quick money. That's what you told him, didn't you? No, it was him. I can prove it. The rest of the kids will tell you. He got me in this. Ask them, they'll tell you. It was Stanley and Fred Milford and George Jansen. They started it, all three of them. All right. Will you tell the story to a police stenographer? I'll tell him everything. He's not blaming this on me. Marge, you go get the stenographer. Right. Now, how many persons in this gang of yours? Oh, about 10 or 12. And it's not my gang either. He got me into this, and now he's trying to lie his way out, blaming me. How long have you been doing this, burglarizing cars? Me? Oh, only about two weeks. It was supposed to be fun, something to do at night. The rest of them have been at it a couple of months. Who's the head of the gang? I told you, it's him, Stanley, and Fred Milford and Jansen, all three. I only started going out with them two weeks ago, maybe less. All right, Joanne. Tell it to the stenographer the same way. The stenographer will be in a minute, Joe. Okay, Marge, thanks. Stay with her. Right, Joe. Just about a closed case, Ben. The girl gave us a full confession. She didn't. Oh, you're not tricking me again. She didn't. She told us you're one of the leaders of the gang, Stanley. Said you got her into all this. The other two are George Jansen and Fred Milford. About a dozen kids in the gang, all of them about your age. Isn't that right? She's lying, can't you tell? She's lying. She got me into the gang. Well, she did. She's Milford's girlfriend. Ask her. Oh, she can't lie out of that one. She got me into it. I can prove it. Who's the real leader of the gang? Milford. He, he started it. He organized the whole thing. He collects the stuff we get, and he delivers it. Jansen helps him do it. What do you mean, he delivers the stuff? Where does he deliver it? Well, somewhere in Dogtown, I think. Down around South Main, near the railroad yards. Who's it delivered to? Well, I don't know exactly. I heard Jansen mention the name once. Myra, he said, it's supposed to be a big secret. Myra, that's, that's all I remember. Where does Jansen and Milford live? Jansen rooms down on East Flower. 1042, I think, it's a rooming house. And Milford lives two blocks over from me on Quincy. 234 Quincy. He lives with his grandmother. You got that, Ben? Right. All right, let's pick up Milford and Jansen. It was ten minutes past one when Ben and I returned to headquarters with George Jansen and Fred Milford in our custody. In Jansen's room at 1042 East Flower Street, we found two fur coats, a box full of new car accessories, an S&W 38 revolver, and a 45 automatic. When we picked up Fred Milford at his home, we discovered five deluxe car radios hidden in the garage, plus a valuable assortment of cameras, cigarette lighters, and clothing. Both Jansen and Milford refused to talk. But when we got them to headquarters and showed them the signed statements of Stanley Freeman and the girl, Joanne Miller, they broke. Milford, um... Where else did you and your gang operate besides the Wilshire district? No place. Only out there. That's all. Same type of car burglars have been committed all over the city. You're telling us your gang didn't have a hand in them? It's the truth. Our territory was Wilshire district. We didn't go outside. You mean some other gang's responsible? I don't know. All I know is we didn't have any part of them. Is there another gang, Milford? Maybe. I don't know. You find out. It's none of my business. It is your business, Milford. You admit you and your gang committed 55 jobs in the past three and a half months. That leaves about 200 jobs to be accounted for. That's right. You figure it out. We have figured it out. I think you and your gang of young thieves pulled every one of those 250 jobs. There isn't any other gang. That's the story the district attorney's going to get. You're crazy. There is. I know there is. Then give us the information and save yourself a lot of trouble. Well, we're not the only ones. That's all I know. Milford, do you know how many years you get for auto burglary? I told you, we're not the only ones. There must be a couple of others besides us. Vince Mahoney, he's got a gang. Where does Mahoney operate? West Hollywood and Beverly. Where does he live? I don't know. Honest, I, I only met him a couple of times. Where'd you meet him? I don't remember. Where'd you meet him, Milford? Delivery. I met him down at the delivery place a couple of nights. When you delivered the property you stole from cars, is that right? Yeah. Where was it? Down by the railroad yard. Where? Shavis Street. It's a little alley off East Main. Who'd you deliver the stuff to? He told you. Her name's Myra. That's all I know. We meet her and some guy on Tuesday nights. We give him the stuff and they pay us off. Mahoney delivers the same night I do. 
Do you meet her every Tuesday night? Yeah. You're going to meet her this Tuesday, tomorrow night? I don't know. I guess so. Same place? Yeah. Are you the only one she deals with? Sometimes Joanne. Me or Joanne. I know what you're thinking. You want to use me to trap Myra. Well, what's it worth? You know better than that. How about it, Milford? Oh, what else can I do? Give me another cigarette. By 3.30 that morning, the signed statements and confessions were piling up fast. Milford gave us a list of the names and addresses of each member in his gang, and within an hour, they were all under questioning at headquarters. Most of the suspects, about one-third of them girls, ranged in age from 18 to 21. As they told their individual stories, the scope of the case grew until it covered most of the city. By late afternoon of the next day, Tuesday, March 3rd, three more gangs operating in Venice, Bel Air, and North Hollywood have been apprehended. They confessed to more than 175 burglaries from locked cars during the past three and a half months. At 5 o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I met with Chief Backstrand in his office. How uh, many admissions do you have now? Over 50, Ed. Here are the gang leader's statements. Mm-hmm. What's their story? Well, it's pretty much the same. They all say this woman, Myra, set up the operation. You mean she got the kids and put them to work burglarizing cars? Well, not exactly. She picked the leaders, contacted them in bars or on the street, asked them if they wanted to pick up some spare money getting auto parts for it. Then she didn't tell them to go out and burglarize cars? Well, not in so many words, Ed, no. After they brought in auto parts for a couple of weeks, she told them to bring her everything they could find, outside the car or inside. Those are the words she used. Five of the kids dictated those words into the signed confession. Oh, well, that should hold in court. What else did you get on this woman? Oh, she taught them how to work, told them to wear gloves, all angles. Uh, well, we got most of the small fry. Now, uh, where do we find this Myra woman? Any description on her? Yeah. Kids say she's about 33, 34. Good-looking redhead. Five feet five, about 120. Well dressed. No description on the guy she runs with. You run a make on her yet? Yeah, no previous record. We set up a stakeout for her tonight. Two of the gang leaders have volunteered to go along, this Milford and Vince Mahoney. Uh, good. Down on uh, Chavez, where she usually meets them? Yeah, that's right. When? 11.15. That's the regular time for the meet, according to the kid. All right, I'll be at home. Call me. I don't want to miss out on this one. When Ben and I left Ed Backstrand's office, we went home for dinner and a few hours sleep. At 9.30 p.m., we were back at the office. We met the men in the special detail, which Backstrand had assigned for the stakeout that night. We briefed them on their duties, and then we got Fred Milford and Vince Mahoney out of their cells. To avoid any possible suspicion of the presence of a trap, we had Milford's permission to use his car in the stakeout. The car, which he had said he had driven to the delivery meetings with the woman, Myra, at least a dozen times before. We arrived at the stakeout area, Chavez Alley in East Main, at 9.58. The meeting was scheduled for 11.15. The moon was out, but the sky was overcast, and there was a cold wind blowing from the east. Hey, what time you got, Sergeant? Mm, about ten. Why, Milford? You getting nervous? No, I'm just wondering. How are you cops going to rig this thing? In just a couple of minutes, we're going to plant you two in Milford's car parked up there in the alley. Now, you stay there until Myra shows up. We'll do the rest. Yeah, I know, but what'll we say? Suppose she asks for some stuff. We ain't got any. You won't need any. You won't have much time for talking. Hey, suppose she wises up. Maybe she'll pull a gun. Maybe. Does she carry one? No. Never saw her with one. Well, don't worry, Milford. We'll make sure you're not in danger. She's got an awful temper, that redhead. Got mad at me once when I squawked at the prices she was paying us for radios. What was she paying you, Mahoney? Oh, an eight-tube radio, good shape, seven bucks. She got all the gravy and you got all the grief. You're not kidding. Joe, hmm? are you? Yeah, Steve. What do you got? Well, the men are all staked out, Joe. Got the area covered from every angle. All right. You got an extra man to stay in Milford's car? I'll handle that myself. Fine, thanks. Okay. All set, Joe? Yeah. Now, Milford Mahoney, we're going to put you two in your car now. There's going to be an officer with you, so there's no need to be nervous or afraid. You just sit in the car and act natural. When this Myra drives up, don't leave the car. Have her come to you. You got it? Sure. Okay. All right, Joe, let's go. Sure is cold out. I don't even have a heater in my car. You stole enough of them. Okay, Steve, here they are. All right, boys. Milford, get in first behind the wheel. Okay. Mahoney in the middle. Now sit in the back. We'll be parked in that garage across the street, Steve. Got a perfect view of the alley. Okay, Ben. Check with you later. All right. Mean night, Joe. Yeah. Come on. It's cold here in the garage, isn't it? Yeah. It might be a long wait. 
What time you got? Six minutes past ten. Thank you. Hey, Joe, what is it? No, it's nothing. Thought that passing car was turning in the alley. Relax, it's early. Lonely place. Dark. Gets on your nerves. That's it, Ben. Half past 11. Nothing yet. Somebody might have tipped her off. Yeah, that's what I was afraid of. Now, let's wait it out anyway. Joe, that blue coupe Ben just turned in the alley. Let's go. Come on, run, Ben. Bye. you. What'd you get, Steve? Uh, here he is. Just drove up in the coupe. Got out and called Milford Mahoney by the first names. He's in on it. What about the girl? No sign. Kid was the only one in the car. All right. Tell them in the stakeout's offered and I'd have him report back in. We'll take the kid with us. Okay. All right, young fellow, this way. What do you cops think you're doing? I ain't done nothing. Look, sport, we heard that from 54 different kids yesterday. We're tired of that line. Come on. When we got back to the office, we took the boy to the interrogation room and questioned him. He gave his name as Matthew Leiter age 21. He wouldn't break until Vince Mahoney definitely identified him as a member of his car burglary gang and a special favorite of the red-headed woman they called Myra. Then Leiter copped out and told Ben and I that he had talked with Myra as late as 10 o'clock tonight. He told us that she had heard that the police had picked up some of the gang members and she asked Leiter to drive down to the Chavez Alley meeting place. He was supposed to tell Milford and Mahoney that the weekly delivery date was off until further notice. We questioned Matthew Leiter for an hour and a half. Uh, you told us a little while ago that you talked with this woman, Myra, late tonight. Yeah. Where'd you talk to her? At her home? Her home? Don't be stupid. Nobody knows where she lives. I met her at a bar. Which bar? Julia's. Out of Santa Monica. How did she contact you? Called me at home. She's not such a bad dame. She treats you right. Sure, that's why you're in jail. Did you ever call her on the phone? I don't know her number. None of the kids do. She's smart. She taught me all I know about the racket. You'll have a rough time getting her. Maybe, but we'll get her. Ben and I left the office at 2 a.m. and went home to bed. We reported in at 8 that morning to head back, Strand. The three of us went down the street to Koken's restaurant for a cup of coffee. Nobody was in a good mood. We had most or all the small fry in the citywide burglary ring, but it seemed we were still a long way from cracking the inner circle. The latter kid said that none of them knows where she lives, what her phone number is, nothing. Pass the sugar in. Mm. I think we still have a few angles to study on that score. Right now, I've got some more bad news for you. What's that? You been through your mail this morning? No, not yet. We haven't had a chance. I saw the overnight reports. There were 32 car burglaries last night. 32. All the way from Wilmington to North Hollywood. How you figure it? I can't. This girl Myra must have an army of kids working for her. How much did they get, Ed? Any idea? Uh, rough estimate, about $3,000. Usual stuff people are foolish enough to leave in their cars. Watches, cameras, furs. Expensive clothes. M.O. is the same. And like the others. If the car happens to have a rigid handle lock, they slip a piece of pipe over the handle for a lever and break it. If that doesn't work, they pry open the wing window. Some of the windows were smashed out. Sounds like you're in an awful hurry, Joe. Yeah, maybe this Myra wants a few big nights before she pedals the stuff and gets out. And if we're going to get her, we can't waste time. Any suspects picked up last night, Skipper? None. Well, where did they hit most of the cars? Outside the Pan Pacific. The parking lot. Hockey game going on. Must have been 4,000 cars for them to pick over. They picked the best. As usual. Well, you better get on it. That's one way to handle it. What's that? She works fast. You work a little faster. We got back to the office and we went over the reports one by one. Then we called the young gang members to the interrogation room and questioned them separately and requested them. We got nowhere. Many of them had met Myra on the street, in the bar, but not one of them had any idea where she lived. At least that's what they told us. Ben had a hunch that Matthew Leiter knew more than he was telling. We had him brought to the interrogation room, and all that afternoon, until 10 o'clock that night, with interruptions for his meal periods, we talked with Leiter. He would admit nothing more than what he'd already told us. Yeah, it's got me beat, Joe. Yeah. Now, let's check with Ed. Good morning, Joe. Ben? Hi, Mike. Skip her in. Just went down the hall for a minute. Be right back. Hold a minute, will you? Chief of Detectives, I was handing. Yeah. Well, you, Joe. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yeah. He does? We'll be right over. We're Sergeant Hopkins over at the jail. Oh, yeah? Matthew Leiter's got something to tell us. Says it's important. Hey, 
Have a chair here, Ladder. Yeah, thanks. All right, you want to see us? I'm getting even with that Dame Myra. I'm squaring with you. Yeah? She told me if I was picked up, she'd have me out in a couple of hours. She promised me a lawyer if anything happened. Said she'd get me bail. All right, where can we find her? I don't know if she's there now, but you can find out at Francisco Motors. Big used car lot. Garage, too. It's out on Melrose past La Cienega. What's the time? That's where she fenced most of the stuff we stole. Some old guy she buddies with runs the place. Big shop in the back. Store a lot of hot stuff there. Barney. Yes, yeah, Sergeant. We're through with him. Take him back. We checked with Chief Backstrand, and then we drove out to the Francisco Motor Company. We located it on the corner of Melrose and Geneva Avenue. It was a big layout. It consisted of a large used car lot sign bannering the slogan, Deluxe Auto Accessories, Lowest Prices in Town. Along the back end of the lot, there was a large L-shaped garage. We found the man in charge, and he gave his name as Paul Hackett, the owner of the car lot. In the garage, we found the entrance to a large back storeroom. It was loaded with thousands of dollars worth of auto radios, spotlights, cratefuls of assorted car accessories. Special closets built into the walls of the garage contained racks of fur coats, suits, dresses. Below that, smaller boxes containing watches and cameras, all wrapped in tissue paper. You can save all of us a lot of time and trouble by talking to us now, Mr. Hackett. Where is Myra? I don't know who you're talking about. I don't know what you're talking about. Can you explain what we just found in your garage? I didn't know it was there. I didn't know it was stolen. Well, which is it, Mr. Hackett? Make up your mind. I bought it. But I didn't know it was stolen. You can't prove I did know. I think we can prove it, Mr. Hackett. Some of those stolen car radios stored back there, serial numbers are filed off, and this workbench here is full of filings. I... I didn't know. You'll have to do better than that. How does Myra figure in? I don't know. I don't know what you're talking about. It's all right with us, Hackett. We found the stuff and we got you. If we don't find Myra, you'll be doing time for two people. Stand still. You, you, you can't. You can't do this to me. I, I don't know anything about it. Come on, Hackett. We're taking you in. All right, get in the car. Come on, in the car. Am I going to jail? You're going to jail. All right. I'll take you to Myra. Hackett told us that Myra lived at 1345 Munich Drive in Beverly Hills. He said that he was Myra's husband. He told us that he'd been in a legitimate garage business for 10 years before he married Myra. She talked him into the racket. He identified 1345 Munich Drive as their home. When we got there, we found stores of stolen property similar to those found in the garage. Myra was not there. Hackett had no idea where she might be. We sat down in the living room and waited. One hour, two hours, three hours. After five hours of waiting, the monotony started to wear on everybody's nerves, especially Hackett's. The whole thing, it was her idea. I should have known, all hers. She did this to me. I won't take it alone. Where is she? You tell us, Hackett. I told you, I don't know. She couldn't have gone, she didn't know. I'm not going to take right, quiet down, quiet down. That you, Paul? Thought I heard you talking to some. Who's he? The police, Myra. The police. Your smart kids told them the whole story. What are you talking about, my smart kids? What are these cops doing here in the living room? Oh, get your dirty hands off me. Get away. The kids are right, Joe. She got to tell you. Who do you think you're... There, that ought to hold you for a while. All right, come on, you two. Let's go. All right, copper. You win. Stupid husband. How many times did I tell you? Don't trust those kids. Don't store the stuff in the garage. Don't open it for anybody. Get a lawyer. No, you knew better. Dumb jerk. The idea of having those cops camping in the living room waiting for me. Why didn't you warn me? I'm going to divorce you. That's what I'm going to do. I'll stick you for plenty. Jerk. All right, inside, you two. You got a smoke, Ben? Hmm. Yeah. Uh-huh. Thanks. I was just thinking. What? Those kids were right. She's a pretty nice looking woman. Yeah. Nice face. Beautiful figure. Mm hmm. Sure talks a lot, though, doesn't she? Yeah. Hey, Joe, remind me to take home some flowers to my wife tonight, will you? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Paul and Myra Hackett were tried and convicted on seven separate counts of receiving stolen property. They are now serving out their sentences in the state penitentiary. 
realizing that most of the young persons involved in the case were influenced by the strong personality of Paul and Myra Hackett, a separate investigation was made into the backgrounds and home life of the young offenders. In most cases, they were found to be basically good, and they were placed on probation and returned to their homes. You have just heard the 13th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Detective Harry William Vosper of the Seattle, Washington Police Department, who on the night of July 21st, 1949, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. And now, an important announcement. Starting this Saturday, September 3rd, Dragnet will be heard at a new time over your NBC station. Consult your local newspaper for the new listening time. And now, speaking in behalf of the producers and the entire cast of Dragnet, we would like to take this opportunity to thank you for your many kind letters of encouragement and approval. Remember, next Saturday for Dragnet, this is NBC, the national broadcasting company. show usually heard at this time has moved to a new time period on Sunday night. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Arman on the new Pet Milk Show tomorrow night on NBC. And now, here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to a homicide detail. A man's life has suddenly dropped from sight. On the surface, it appears only as a routine missing persons case. You start to investigate. Suspicion grows. There is evidence of possible foul play. Your job... Find the woman or find her murderer. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Wednesday, September 15th. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from lunch, and it was 12.56 when I got to room 42. Homicide. All right, Joe. I'm waiting for you. Hiya, Ben. Al. Hi. I hear you got something for us. Uh, here's a report right here. A gardener by the name of Eric Kelby called in the day before yesterday. Said his wife disappeared from their home out in the valley Sunday night. Says he thinks she left him. It happens every day, Bargetti. No, not this way, it doesn't. Uh, Walsh and I went out yesterday to interview the guy. Story doesn't add. Why not? Well, none of her clothes are missing. None of her luggage. She even left her pocketbook behind, full of money. Found out from the neighbors a missing woman is a 17-year-old boy by a former marriage. For what? An only child. Mother dotes on the kid. She didn't even say goodbye to him. How did this Harry Kelby impress you? Pretty grouchy with Walsh and me. No cooperation. Wants to find his wife, doesn't he? I don't know if he does or not. No help, I'll tell you that. I see that report a minute now. Yeah. Magnus Trumbull Kelby, age 39. Kelby's her second husband. The first one died a little after the boy was born. Mm -hmm. She disappeared Sunday night from her home, 546 Belasco Road, between 7 and 8 o'clock. When did Kelby call in? Monday afternoon. Said he thought his wife might be spending the night with his sister. When he found out she wasn't, he called us. Did you meet the boy while you were out there, Borgay? Yeah, that's another thing. Kid came riding in on a bike while we were talking to one of the neighbors. Trying to talk to him, but the old man came out hustling him inside the house. Then he starts eating us out. Mm. What did he say? He told us it was our job to find his wife, not to go prying into his stepson's affairs. Mm, that's a new slam. How about her friends and relatives around here, Al? Any besides her sister? Mm, Walsh located a couple of her aunts. I don't think he's checked them yet, though. I'll tell you, boys, this is one I'll bet on. Maybe. You got the names of Mrs. Kelby's relatives? Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, right over here. Sure, wish you had a chance to talk to that boy. Yeah. How's it feel to you, Ben? Mm, I don't know. Notice anything else funny about the guy, Al? 
Uh, I don't know. I hear those names, Joe. Thanks. Kelby was upset, all right. But some reason, it didn't strike me as reacting the way a normal guy reacts when his wife disappears. All right, Al. How would you react? Mm-hmm. Our get is worrying again. Oh, now listen, boys. It's no fooling matter. This is one I'll bet on. It's a homicide. All right. How about a copy of this report? Yeah, uh, where do I get the phone? Missing persons, Bargetti. Who's that? Oh, uh, yes. Yes. About what? Oh, sure. All right, sir. Four o'clock. Yeah. Goodbye. That was Kelby's stepson. What do you want? Think something's happened to his mother. In police work, missing persons detail is not a department separate in itself. It is organized as a part of the Homicide Bureau. According to Bargetti, who took the call, the boy said he suspected his stepfather, and he didn't want him to know of any meeting between him and police officers. He would meet the officers that afternoon at 4 p.m. in a restaurant on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Fairfax Avenue. At 3.15, Ben and I left the office and drove out to the meeting place, the Dairyland Fountain and Coffee Shop. We arrived there at 3.45. At 8 minutes to 5, the Kelby boy still had not arrived. Youngster's not very prompt. Let's wait a little while longer. Um, well? Yeah, thanks. Want more coffee? No, thanks. I guess the boy isn't going to show. Think something's happened? Fifteen minutes after we left the coffee shop, we drove up in front of the gate of the Kelby Nursery on Belasco Road. The house itself was set well back on the property which covered about four acres. The entire nursery was surrounded by a six-foot steel wire fence. It looked like almost every available foot of ground inside was planted with some kind of a flower or shrub. Kelby met us at the gate. Yes? What do you men want? Police officers. Are you Mr. Kelby? Yes. What do you want? Well, if you'll shut those dogs up for a minute, we'd like to ask you a few questions. I'm busy now. Can't you come back tomorrow? Pretty important, Mr. Kelby. I think we'd better talk right now. You have to. Ready? Go ahead. Down. You two hiding. Quiet. All right. Now, what do you want? Mind if we come inside? These watchdogs of mine are pretty vicious. We can talk here at the gate. All right, Mr. Kelby. This is Sergeant Romero. My name's Friday. We've been assigned to look into your wife's disappearance. Oh. Did you find anything yet? Nothing definite. Maybe you can help us. Would you tell us exactly what happened the night your wife disappeared? What do you mean? What happened? Well, when did you last see her? When did you first notice she was gone? We finished up Sunday night dinner about 7 o'clock, and I laid down for a nap. Agnes went out on the front porch for some air. Woke up a little before 8 and went outside to look for her. She was gone. Nobody saw her leave, Mr. Kelby? Not that I know of. Maybe some of our nosy neighbors, I don't know. How about your stepson? Wasn't he around Sunday night? Bruce? No. Went out to a show. Some other kid. When did he get back from the show? About 10, I think. Why? Where's your stepson now? Who are you looking for, my wife or my stepson? Both, Mr. Kelby. Where's your stepson? Gone. I took him over to my sister's, now Hamba. Been feeling bad since his mother disappeared. Figured the change would do him good. Why did you take him over to your sister's, Kelby? This afternoon. What's that got to do with it? We'd like to talk to Bruce. No, no, I can't allow it. The boy's too upset. I can't allow it. I'm afraid you're going to have to allow it. Listen, mister, you can get off this property right now. No cops giving me sass. Nobody's giving you sass, Kelby. We want to talk to your stepson, that's all. He might give us a clue to the whereabouts of your wife. And I say you can't see the boy. If more you cops couldn't find thorns in a rose patch. You get somebody else to look for Agnes. It's my business anyway. Nobody else is. It's our business, too, if anything's happened to her. What are you talking about? You better get your coat, Mr. Kelby. We're taking in for questioning. You come through that gate, and I'm going to let these dogs go accidentally. I hate to shoot the dogs. Now go on in the house and get your coat. Eric Kelby turned and made his way up the path and into the house. Five minutes later, he came out. Without a word to either of us, he came down the path, closed the gate behind him, and got into our car. On the way back to headquarters, he chatted pleasantly about the weather, the nursery business, and his dog. When we pulled up in front of the city hall, we met the reason for his sudden change in temperament. His lawyer was waiting for us at the door. We took Kelby to one of the interrogation rooms. His lawyer tagged along. We tried to question him, but the lawyer objected to two out of every three questions we asked. It was hopeless, and he knew it. So did the lawyer. We released Kelby, but we did get the name and address of his sister where the stepson Bruce was staying. After they left, Ben and I got back in the car and drove out to Alhambra to check on the boy. Well, Giddy had this in peg right, Joe. A real sleeper. Yeah. I'd like to know how the stepson missed that date with us this afternoon. Well, if the kid called us from the house, his stepfather could have overheard him. Possible. Sister's house ought to be along this block, shouldn't it? Yeah. Let's see. 1408, 1406. Howdy, Joe. A great cottage. 1402. Right. That's a nice looking little place, isn't it? Well kept. Yeah, it's a nice neighborhood. I wonder how the lot prices run out here. Some 
somebody come? Yes, what is it? Police officers, ma'am. Are you Miss Kelby? First, Miss Kelby. Yes, that's my name. Why? We talked to your brother earlier today, Miss Kelby. He said that you brought his stepson, Bruce, here to stay for a while. We'd like to see him. Bruce? Yes, he was here till about, oh, an hour and a half ago. I went to the store, and when I came back, he was gone. Have you any idea where he might be, Miss Kelby? Well, I telephoned my brother Eric's place just before you came to the door. He's not there. I don't know where he might be. I'm worried about him. He seems so upset. It's business about his mother's disappearance, you know. Do you mind if we came in and looked around, Miss Kelby? Well, no, not at all. We went in and looked the house over from one end to the other. There wasn't a trace of the boy. We drove back to Kelby's nursery and satisfied ourselves the boy wasn't there. Then we came back to Alhambra and we kept an eye on Miss Bertha Kelby's home until midnight. No one came or went. At five minutes past midnight, the lights went off in the living room and a few minutes later in the back of the house. The next morning, when Ben and I checked in for work as usual at 8 o'clock, we met with Captain of Homicide, Frank Kearney. What makes you two so positive there has been any foul play in this Kelby thing? Not just it, Cap. We're not positive. It's a whole setup. It smells bad. For instance? That lawyer. A man's innocent. He doesn't need a lawyer to sit with him in the interrogation room and tell him not to answer questions. Number two, that kid's telephone call. Maybe he doesn't get along with his stepfather. It happens, you know. Maybe he's trying to get back at him for something or other. Maybe. Then why is Kelby hiding him out? You sure he's hiding him out? No other way to take it, Cap. The Kelby woman walked away from her home Sunday night. Nobody saw her. She took nothing with her. No clothes, no luggage, no money. You checked with the family doctor. Yesterday. He told us Mrs. Kelby was in perfect health. We double-checked the wanderer's file and the repeater's file and missing persons. Couldn't find a name in either one. How about her relatives in town? I haven't had a chance to talk to them yet, Cap. We'll check them this morning. Well, one thing's certain. The woman couldn't have gone very far. We checked the sheriff's office, the jail, the hospital. Sent out a chalk type and an APB. Every cop in the city has her description. She's been gone almost four days, but nobody's seen her. How does that add up to you? It doesn't. You better move on it. Check every one of Mrs. Calby's friends and relatives. Right, Frank. Then try the neighbors. As long as I've been a cop, neighbors have been able to tell everything about anyone. All that day, Ben and I made the round. First stop was the Western National Bank, where Mrs. Kelby maintained her account. Her savings statement showed a total balance of $31,564.17. Her separate checking account had a balance of $842.71. At the Farmer's Mutual, we found a record of an insurance policy issued to Agnes Trumbull Kelby. It was a 20-pay life policy covering the insured in the amount of $30,000. The beneficiary was listed as the insured son, Bruce Trumbull Kelby, if living upon the receipt of such due proof. If not, the insured's husband, Eric J. Kelby. By the time we finished checking her financial status, the odds were piling up fast. From only casual reports, we knew that Eric Kelby was a frugal man. If he was greedy as well... If he wanted and needed money badly enough to kill, then he had all the motives necessary to murder his wife. Maybe his stepson, too. Ben and I started to make rounds with Mrs. Kelby's friends and relatives. Our first stop was at the apartment of Agnes Kelby's sister, a talkative maiden lady in her early 60s. Agnes just isn't that kind. Oh, I'm worried sick about this. I really am. And Bruce, the poor lad, he must be heart sick. And Eric, what does Eric say about all this? He says he thinks his wife left him. Yes. Why, that's ridiculous. How strange. Can you think of any good reason why your sister would leave Mr. Kelby? I, I know. They had kids, of course, small ones. But, of course, there was that argument about Bruce. The two of them always seemed to be arguing about Bruce. How do you mean, ma'am? Oh, well, raising the boy and all, you know. Last time I talked to them, they were kicking about whether or not Bruce should be paid for working in the nursery for Eric. And the strangest thing, Eric seemed to be so upset about it all. Imagine. All on account of paying the boy a few dollars for good, honest work in that silly nursery. Well, you know, I'm the outspoken kind, and I just told Eric. Eric, I said, don't be an old meanie. Pay the boy. That was the extent of the information which Mrs. Kelby's sister had to offer. Next, we called on an aunt, Mrs. James D. Trumbull, 83 years old. She could hardly understand our questions, let alone answer them. She hadn't seen her niece, Agnes, in a year. After that, we paid a visit to one of Mrs. Kelby's friends, a Mrs. Lillian Humboldt. Well, I'm sorry, Sergeant, but I can't think of any good reason why she would leave him. That silly business about Bruce got out of hand. You know, maybe Eric is something a little jealous of him. Next, we called on Daisy McLeod, who worked as a day maid for Mrs. Kelby. Officer, what Mr. and Mrs. Kelby thought, what they said, what they did, it's none of my business. I come in the morning, I do my work, I do it well. I'm not the nosy type, and I don't try. I take half an hour for lunch, and when I'm through, I take my pay, and I don't expect tips, and I take the bus home. I'm not the peeking through the keyhole kind, sneaking around corners listening. What I couldn't tell you about that man. Exactly what do you mean, Mrs. Clow? Oh, he's a hard man. They're always arguing about the boy. Bruce this, Bruce that. He's a nice boy, I think. He's never done anything to me. 
Oh, let me ask him and her all the time. Should the boy be paid for working? Why? Why not? When Ben and I finished with a list of Mrs. Kelby's friends, relatives, and employees, we started out on the neighbors. None of them saw Mrs. Kelby after 6 p.m. the night she disappeared. Two of the neighbors said they saw the porch light burning after 7 p.m., but both said the porch was yes. empty. Mrs. Kelby was not sitting in her chair at the usual time after dinner. According to them, that was one of her habits. It was 10 minutes to 6 by the time Ben and I got back to the office. The light was still burning in Captain Kearney's office. Full day, Joe. Not a money. Yeah. I don't know what the captain's hanging around for. Let's find out. Get anything? Pretty good luck, Cap. Yeah. Good. I've got some more for you. Just walked in five minutes ago. What do you mean, Frank? Who walked in? Bruce Kelby. He's waiting in the next room. We went in the next room and met Bruce Kelby. He was small for a 17-year-old, dark-haired and a little on the sickly side. He told us that he couldn't keep the date he made with us on the phone because his stepfather apparently did overhear the conversation and drove him directly to his sister's home in Alhambra. We asked him why he was so sure that his stepfather was responsible for his mother's sudden disappearance. For one thing, all three of us usually go to the early show on Sunday night. Eric, Mom, and me. But last Sunday, Eric said he wasn't feeling good and he wanted Mom to stay home and take care of him. Then he told me to go on ahead to the show, so I did. What time did you get home, son? About 9.30, quarter to ten. Mm-hmm. What was your stepfather doing when you got home? Sitting in the living room reading the paper. You notice anything unusual about the way he acted? He was nervous and jumpy, more than usual, I think. Anything else? Yes, sir. When I came in through the front yard, I noticed the dogs had mud all over their paws. They'd been out somewhere in the nursery plots. And they won't go out in the plots unless Eric's with them. He doesn't want them to trample the seedlings. What would your stepfather be doing out in the nursery at night? Does he usually do some work at night? No, sir. None of the plots are even lighted. Only the greenhouses. And the paths in the greenhouses are usually graveled, aren't they? No mud around. It's my job to see that the greenhouse paths are kept graveled. I know they're not muddy. I I fixed them the day before, Saturday. What do you think it means, son? What? I, I don't know. I, I, I don't want to think about it. I, I just know he's done something. He's done something to her. Did your stepfather give me any reason for keeping you away from the police officers the other day? No, sir. He said people were getting nosy, and he said it might be better for me over at Aunt Bertha's. She's his sister. Do you think your Aunt Bertha might know where your mother is? No, we hardly ever see her. We don't know her well at all. We've heard your mother and your stepfather argued about whether you should be paid for your work in the nursery. When I started to work for him, he promised he'd pay me. I was saving up to buy a 31 Model A. And then after a couple of months, when he didn't pay me, I asked him. He told me I ought to be glad to work for him for nothing. And your mother argued with him over that? Sure. It was her money that bought the nursery anyway. How'd you get away from your aunt's place last night? Well, Bertha had some shopping to do, and she left me alone. She locked the door to my room. Even the screen over the window in my room was nailed down, but I kicked it out and got away. I uh, stayed at a friend's house last night. Thought about where you're going to stay tonight? I don't know. But I'm not going home, and I'm not going back to Bertha's place either. I'll get a room. How'd you like to stay at my house a few days? Sure nice of you, sir. Maybe I'd better not. Mom might not like it. Oh, I'll take care of that. Now, let's hop out and get some dinner. Sure darn nice of you, sir. All right, son. Come with me. What do you think, Joe? Think it'd be lying? Yeah. Now what, Cap? Shall we bring Kelby in again? No, not yet. He's found out by now from his sister that the boy's gone. He probably figures the police station is the first place he'd come. Wouldn't do much good pulling him in now, Ben. We couldn't even question him. Ten to one, his lawyer would be waiting for us when we got back. That's the problem. How do we get to this, Kelby, without his lawyer finding out? Well, what about the early morning, Cap? Say tomorrow, about 5 or 6 a.m. Think you'd be looking for us then? Yeah, that might do it. If you can just get by that pack of hounds he owns without waking the whole neighborhood, might work. If we could just question him alone. I've got an idea it wouldn't take much to make him cop out. All right, give it a try. Get out there in the early morning and bring him in for questioning as quietly as possible. I'll be in at 6 a.m. If you want me before then, call me at home. All right, Frank. Kelby's got a smart lawyer. It's going to be plenty hard to convict him without a body and corroborating evidence. He's got four acres out there, Cap. You can hide a lot of bodies in four acres. Well, that's what I mean. This case isn't ending. It's just beginning. <laughs> The next morning, Ben and I met at the office about a few minutes past 4 a.m. We had a cup of coffee and a donut and an all-night restaurant, and then we started for the Kelby place out on Belasco Road. We took four pounds of fresh horse meat with us to keep the dogs quiet if they raised a fuss. It was 28 minutes past 4 when Ben pulled the car to a stop a few hundred feet from the gate to the Kelby nursery. We got 
out of the car and made our way down the road to the gate. I reached in inside the lab. It was padlocked. The dog started in. Okay, Ben, looks like I'll have to jump the fence. Talk some of that horse meat over to him. Yeah, yeah, here. That's it. Come on, let's climb. Keep an eye on those hounds. Looks like they could chew your legs off. Yeah. Here comes the third one, Ben. Toss some more meat. Yeah. There you are, boy. Go get it. Go get it. Yes, ben, light's going on in the house. Come on, let's make it fast. Who is it? Who's there? I'll set the dogs on you. Police officers, Mr. Kelby. What? What are you doing out here this time of night? You're under arrest, Kelby. Get your coat. You cops are asking for a peck of trouble. Get your coat. Where's my stepson? What have you done with him? What have you done with your wife? You're going to pay for this. I'll have your job. That's not the first time we heard that, Kelby. Let's go. Lights burning in the captain's office. Yeah. Now I shall be in here. You safe for this. Mark my words. Ben, take him in the office here and stay with him. I'll see if Frank's in yet. All right, Jim. Come on, Kelby. Be inside. Yeah. Friday? You bring in Kelby? He's down in the interrogation room. Ben's with him. Somebody saw you. Don't think so. They must have. Kelby's lawyer is sitting in the next room. Kelby again refused to answer any questions without the advice of his attorney. We released him. That day, Captain Kearney sent out two men to keep an eye on the nursery and report on all of Kelby's movements. Shortly after 7 o'clock that night, just after nightfall, we tried once again to bring in Kelby for questioning without his lawyer's knowledge. It didn't work. A little after we booked him, his lawyer obtained a writ of habeas corpus. We had to release him again. The two men assigned to stake out the Kelby place reported definitely that somebody was tipping the lawyer whenever unknown visitors showed up at the nursery and drove off with Kelby. There was nothing we could do about it. The next morning, Kearney came up with a lead. I had a long talk with the boy last night. Accidentally, I think he's given us a pretty good lead. Yeah? There's only one way we'll ever get a conviction. That's by finding the body and evidence to tie Kelby in. Yeah, that'll do it. Where do we start looking? In a new rose bed next to one of the greenhouses in Kelby's nursery. Hmm? The kid came up with it last night. How come? First, Kelby's crazy about saving a dollar and making one. Yeah. In the nursery trade, especially where you have a limited area to work in, like Kelby... You cultivate every foot of ground. Every bit of soil you've got is planted with something. Mm -hmm. Kelby's not the type to waste anything. Especially he's not the kind that would let ground life fallow when he could plant something that might bring in a few dollars next season. Bruce tells me his stepfather has every inch of those four acres planted. Every inch. Except a six-by-nine-foot plot of ground in that rose garden. Mm, sounds like a long shot to me, Frank. The boy said he prepared that piece of ground for planting late Saturday afternoon. His stepfather wanted it ready for Sunday morning. The plot of ground's still vacant. Might have planned it yesterday, Cap. When's the last time you checked? Mm, before I came to work this morning. I called the men on stake out next to the nursery. They told me the plot's still empty. Mm -hmm. Worth a chance, Frank. When do we look it over? Tonight. I don't want Kelby or his lawyer to know a thing until we find that body. Well, how are we going to work it? We'll order up a crew from the crime lab. They can take probings through that plot and all around it. They can tell us without any guesswork how deep that ground's been worked over lately. When do you want to start? Be here in the office at 8.30 tonight. If my hunches are any good, we'll find a body. It was ten minutes past nine that night when we got to the Kelby place. Lieutenant Lee Jones and his assistants, Kearney, Ben, and two other men from Homicide. The men on stake, I told us that Kelby had left about 20 minutes before in a dark blue coop. Ben brought along the usual supply of horse meat for the dogs so they didn't have any trouble there. We found the empty plot of ground in the rose bed next to the greenhouse, exactly as Bruce described it to Kearney. Ground's been worked over all right, boys. At least four to five feet down. All right, Lee, let's start digging. Romero, take care of the dogs. Watch and grab one of these shovels. Right, Captain. Hey, you ever said these dogs were vicious, didn't you? Yeah, why? Look at these hounds. They're no more vicious than a lively cold, huh? Higgins, get that light over here, will you? Thanks. What is it, Lee? Let me see. Teeth. Set of false teeth. Been in the ground long? Don't think so, judging from the shape they're in. How far now would you say, A Couple of feet. Ground's real soft. Lee? Come here a minute. What is it? Body. Here's the shoulder. All right, you men over here with Watson. Get the dirt off the face. Romero, you got a picture of the Kelby woman? Yeah, I've kept it. Let's see. I hear you. Thanks. Get the light down here. When she paid off, Frank. That's her. Ben and I went back to the car and notified communications to broadcast a want for murder on Eric Kelby. His description, together with the description of the car and license number of the car he was driving, was rebroadcast every 15 minutes. Then we went back to check the house. We found the front door unlocked. 
We went inside and looked around. In one bedroom, we found clothes scattered over the bed and the floor. There was only one old suit remaining in the closet. On the table next to the bed, we found an airline's timetable. We got to the phone and notified communications to alert all police details at railroad stations, bus terminals, and airlines, and then to send out an APB on the teletype. After that, we checked with the airline. One of them told us that a man answering Kelby's description had booked passage for Mexico City. The plane was scheduled to take off at 10.40 that night from Burbank Airport. Ben's watch said four minutes past 10. We called the detail at the airport and alerted them. Then we drove over to check in person. It was 10.35 p.m. when Ben and I took up our positions just inside gate three, where passengers were boarding flight 72 from Mexico City. He's cutting it close, Joe. Got about four minutes more than must plane. We waited. The crowd got thicker as departure time came closer. At 10.39, Eric Kelby came through the main entrance across the terminal through gate three into a pair of hands. I don't understand. What does this mean? We found your wife's body, Kelby. What? I don't know what you're talking about. In the rose pack next to the greenhouse. Your lawyer can't help this time. Mexico City. It would have been a nice trip. Expensive. I'm pleading sympathy. I didn't know what I was doing. Be a nice vacation next year, Joe, Mexico City. I'm going to talk to my wife about it. I didn't mean it. She slapped me. We were arguing about the boy. I didn't mean it. I don't know if you did or not, Kelby, but you killed her. Come on. You missed your plane. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Eric Kelby was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He is now awaiting execution in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 14th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to William J. Weston, Jr. of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of March 4th, 1945, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. If you enjoyed tonight's production of Dragnet, You'll want to listen to Richard Diamond, private detective, as played by the screen's romantic tough guy, Dick Powell. A pet milk show usually heard at this time has moved to a new time period on Sunday nights. Be sure to hear Larry Douglas and Kay Armin on the new pet milk show tomorrow night on NBC. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Here's another in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A 22-year-old girl has disappeared. A letter has been received. It demands $30,000 for the girl's return. The letter is signed, The Wolf. Your job, get him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case transcribed from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, October 18th. It was cloudy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner is Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief detective. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the staff's office, and it was 3.26 a.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Got those mug ads for you up here. They are. Thanks, Harris. Backstand leave yet? In a minute. I'm going out with him. What's the address out there? The Sullivan's what? 814 Castro Boulevard. You go straight out Santa Monica, take a left at Castro. I don't know. You ready, Chief? Yeah, man. Friday, you call Romero yet? Right now. Get on it. This one we don't fool with. Yeah. Come on, Harris. Hello. 
Sorry to wake you, Ben. This is Joe. How are you feeling? Oh, hi, Joe. What time is it? 3.30 a.m. How do you feel? Oh, a lot better. Be back to work tomorrow. If you're ready in 20 minutes, I'll pick you up. 20 minutes? Okay, what's up? You remember Martin Sullivan, vice president of the Third National Bank? Sullivan? Yeah, yeah, what about him? Got a 22-year-old daughter. Or he had one. She's gone. <laughs> Good time, Joe. Where are we heading? Sullivan home out on Castro Boulevard. Heads out there now with Harris. Any leads to work on? No, nothing so far. The girl disappeared a little before 1 o'clock yesterday afternoon. At 11 last night, he got a letter. They want $30,000. Sullivan hasn't got that kind of money. Yeah, I know it. Poor guy's almost out of his mind. Tell me, and how it happened? Well, the guy took the girl out of a business school. He had her called out of class. Told her her father was sick, said he was a friend of the family. Well, how about the teachers? What was their story? Said the girl didn't want to go with the man at first, but he finally talked her into it. Kept telling her her father was dying. That's about as low as it comes. Yeah. Did he use a car? Witnesses said it was a blue sedan. They didn't get the license number or the make. Did they remember what the guy looked like? About 5'9", 160, brown suit, dark hair. Hmm. Nothing else? No. Here's a copy of the letter. The usual. Read it. Yeah. Yeah. I have your daughter, Judy. Get, uh, what was that? 30000 $30,000 quick if you want her back alive. Don't call police or I'll kill her. Contact you later. Signed it. Uh, what was it? A wolf. A oh, wolf. Huh? I can think of a better name. Come on, here we are. You've got the original note, Joe. You know? Lee Jones down at the crime lab. He's checking it for prints and handwriting. Well, do it. Oh, hi, Dave. Yeah. Right on the house, boys. Be quick, boys. Thanks, Dave. Hi, Joe. Ben. In the living room. Mm, thank you. That's the way I see it, Mr. Sullivan. Now, you understand exactly what you have to do? Yes, sir. Uh, I'll do as you say. All right. Here are the two men who will help you. Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero. Homicide. Yes, sir. Uh, How do you do? I do. Mr. Backstrand, I, I... Are you sure about all this? He, he might get frightened. He, he might do something to Judy. Believe me, Mr. Sullivan. The only way. I know how you must feel, but we can't do anything else. No, all right, I go on to see Mrs. Sullivan first. I'll be ready in a moment. Any developments? Yeah. Come on back in the dining room. There it is on the table. Second note from the guy. Telegram. When did this come? About half an hour ago. Guy phoned it into Western Union from a public booth. Couldn't trace it. I think so. Yeah. Yeah. Be at Legion Park, 5 o'clock this morning, near Balkan Drive. Come alone. Bring 30,000. We'll return girl. Don't tell cops. Tell her if you do, you won't. 4 a.m. now, Kevin. Not much time. I know it. We'll have to do as he says. No other way. Then Sullivan's going out there alone? You're going with him, you and Romero. You'll be hidden out in the trunk of the car. Any plan? Get him. That's all. <laughs> Ben and I went out the back door and into the Sullivan garage. We jammed ourselves into the trunk compartment, and Harris closed the door on us. The latch was fixed so that the door could be pushed open from the inside. A few minutes later, Mr. Sullivan came out, got in the car, and we drove off. At three minutes to five, we pulled up at the meeting place in the Legion Park. We waited. Nothing happened. At five minutes past five, it started to thunder. That's where we knew, Joe. Feet, maybe. Let's wait it out. Joe. Yeah. What time you got now? Move over a little bit. I watch it. Yeah. A little past five thirty. Sergeant. Sergeant. Mr. Sullivan. Yes. Do you think he's coming? He's late. 
getting daylight. Well, we better wait it out, Mr. Sullivan. Now, look, don't come back here again. If he's watching, you might tip him off. Oh, oh all right. All right. Coming up the road toward it. Stop. Yeah. Swing over to our car. You ready? All right. Stop, Lois Sullivan. Yeah. They're coming back here, and I'll watch it. Sandy, don't know. That's your end. Yeah. The meeting's off. Come on out. All right. Got a cramp in my leg. Cramped all over. Mr. Sullivan, drive back home. We'll contact you then. Oh, all right. Well, all right, Chief. Ben, Joe, come on over to the car. What's the story, Ed? The guy had no intention of following through with this meeting tonight. Well, how come? He told us. Going at five o'clock. Tried to trace the call. He wouldn't stay on the line long enough. What do you have to say? He wanted more money. Bragged about how smart he was. How we'd never get him. Well, he knows Sullivan's called in the police. Sure. Said he didn't care. We'd never get him anyway. Pretty cocky. Pretty smart. Take my word for it. He's no dummy. Control one to 80K. Control one. I'll get it. 80 k to control one. 80 k to control one. Go ahead. 80K, go to your office. Close the street. Go to your office. Close the street. All right, Romero. Let's roll. More than 12 hours have passed since word of Judy Sullivan's disappearance has been phoned in the house. During that time, at all points bulletin containing the descriptions of the suspect, his car, and the girl have been sent out on the teletype to law enforcement agencies throughout the area. The same descriptions were broadcast over the police radio every hour. The Sullivan home has been placed under strict surveillance, and Mr. Sullivan instructed not to contact the suspect without knowledge of the police. He'd raised almost $10,000 in cash to buy him off. The serial number on each one of the bills has been copied by a police stenographer and then rechecked by a homicide officer. So far, the wolf, as he called himself, had made three separate contacts, but he covered his tracks well. We knew that he was somewhere in the city, 500 square miles of it. And we knew we had to find it fast. It was 18 minutes past six when we got back to homicide. Hi, Chief. Hello. You got something for us, Mac? Yeah, this letter. Special delivery. Came in about 25 minutes. Can I see that, Mike? Yeah, that's him. Yeah, according to the postmark, he must have mailed it right after he grabbed the girl. Yeah, listen to this. Stay away from Sullivan. If the kid's found dead, it's your fault. Stay away, the wolf. All right, Mike. Get it over to the crime lab and have Lee check it for prints. Right, Chief. Will you find any prints on the second note, Mike? Two. Running through R&I now. Friday, Romero. Get down there and see if they got a mix. I'll call out the Sullivans and check with Harris. Right, Ed. Let's go, Ben. Who's watching Sullivan now? It's not Harris. Uh, Carpenter and Davis. The back fans afraid the girl father will try to make a deal with the guy. Has he tried it yet? Yeah, he has it yet. You couldn't blame him if he did. Worried sick. Mm -hmm. Go, Harris. Hi, fellas. Just coming down to see you. Is that something, Larry? Those two prints Lee Jones listed off that letter. Got a make on them from the single print file. Good, Larry. Let's see. There it is. Pull the whole package on them. Donald Alfred Keeper. Looks like a real bad one, doesn't he? Donald Alfred Keeper, male, Caucasian, age 29, 5 feet 8 inches, 170 pounds, brown eyes, dark brown hair. He had one previous arrest for forgery in Los Angeles 10 months before. Keeper's occupation at the time of his arrest was listed as bank clerk at the Third National Bank. Ben went back into the files and pulled the crime report. Then we called Ed Baxter. There's the answer, Skipper. At the time Keeper pulled that forgery job at the bank, Mr. Sullivan was one of the vice presidents. Mm -hmm, go on. Sullivan was the one who preferred charges against Keeper and thought that he was prosecuted. Where is this Keeper now? Well, let me see. He was placed on probation, and on May 16th this year, he returned to his home in Omaha, Nebraska, at 1380 Mackinac Island. All right, Romero. Get Omaha on the phone and have him check out Keeper. All right, Skipper. Right in. Take Keeper's package and this note down to Don Myers. Have him check the handwriting. And get over to the crime lab and see what Jones lifted off that last letter we got. All right, Ed. The faster we work, the faster we'll put this guy behind bars. Now move. How's the writing prepared, Don? What'd you find? Yeah, it's good. See you. Lance's crosses. Double loops of L. Open A's. Pressure on the downstroke. Donald Keeper, wool. Same handwriting. <laughs> Left the three prints off this last note, Joe. Brought them out to the iodine fume gun. They match with the first. Thanks, Lee. Did you find anything else? I don't know. It'll help you much. We examined the paper for watermarks and texture. Both notes are written on the same kind of paper. Impressions show both pieces of paper from the same tablet. Check the density of the carbon and the pencil they used. Both specimens match. Same pencil. <laughs> By mid-afternoon, Donald Keeper's description had been broadcast throughout the area. Bulletins were dispatched to all departments, and an APB was teletyped to the entire state. Men were stationed at every post office in the city to watch for notes that might come through the mail. The bus depots, railroad terminals, the airports, and all the main roads leading out of the city were under strict surveillance. 
The entire Los Angeles area was broken down into single square mile districts and a house to house canvas was started. A squad of men were assigned to cover each square mile. Outlying towns and cities were requested to do the same. By five o'clock that afternoon, the greatest dragnet operation in the history of the city was underway. We were sure Donald Keeper was somewhere inside. At 12 minutes past five, Ben got the call back from the Omaha police. Yeah. Yeah, I got it. 6X Ray 419. Nebraska plate, right. Well, thank you a lot. Yeah, bye. They had to make up the car. Lots more. The Omaha cops looking for Keeper, too. Want him for a robbery there two months ago. Yeah. And that robbery used a stolen 1939 blue sedan. Nebraska license plate, 6X Ray 419. How about his family? His friends back here. They all been checked? Yeah, they said Keeper left Omaha about six weeks ago. Didn't know where it was headed. Well, get that car description of communications, huh? ATV, teletype, and broadcast. I'll tell you. Yeah, right. Right in, Romero. Yeah. What are you tied up with? We just got a call from Omaha. Make on Keeper in the car. Give it to me. You two get out of the Sullivan house as fast as you can. See Harris. What's happened, Kevin? Martin Sullivan's disappeared. All right, Harris. How'd it happen? About three this afternoon, Mr. Sullivan got a phone call. Said he had to go down to the bank. I went with him. He had me wait in the reception room, and he went in his office. After waiting ten minutes, I got suspicious and went in. He was gone. That's it. Did he get any more money? This morning. Five thousand dollars. You get the serial numbers off the bills? Yeah. Didn't let him get out of my sight. Forget it. Right now we've got to find out where he's gone to meet Kiefer. You talked to Mrs. Sullivan about it, Harris? She says she doesn't know anything about it. Let's try her again. Come on, let's go inside. All right, fellas. All right. Where's Mrs. Sullivan, Dave? Back in the sitting room, lying down. Doctor's with her. Come on. What time is that, Ben? Six thirty five. I'll get it. Hello? Where are you? Where are you now? Where are you now? We'll be right out. It was Martin Sullivan. He met with Kiefer on Laurel Canyon. Did he get his daughter back? Yeah. Wrapped in newspapers. All cars in the area were notified that a contact had been made with Kiefer. We got in the car and drove out to Laurel Canyon. The entire area had been blocked off. We found Martin Sullivan standing in the middle of the road at the end of each winding way. 500 feet down the hill was a private residence where Sullivan had telephoned him. It was the only building in the immediate vicinity. A few yards beyond the point where each winding way ended, back in a clump of tall grass, we found the body of Martin Sullivan's daughter. We notified the crime lab, which was back stand in the corner. Despite a severe state of emotional shock, Martin Sullivan tried to tell us the story. He said, Judy, it's all right. I believed it. What is it back? Judy. I tricked the officer, the one watching me, said, Come along, no police. Did you see his car, Mr. Sullivan? What is it back? I wanted to be back. I I did as he said. I drove here at six o'clock and he waited it. I put the money in the front seat. I think. Like he said. Did he get the money, Mr. Sullivan? And I... I got out of the... left parking lights on. I stood up there by the end of the road. And waited. Mr. Sullivan? And he... And he drove up. He... He took his money. And then he came up to me. He had a gun. I wanted to his back. Yes, with a gun. Did you see his car? He said she was up there, beyond the road, tied to a tree. <laughs> Mr. Sullivan, did you see his car? I went to look for him. <laughs> he drove away. He wasn't there. I a tree. Couldn't find him. Before he went into a state of complete collapse, we showed Martin Sullivan a picture of Donald Alfred Keeper. He definitely identified him. The information was immediately relayed back to Central Division, rebroadcast to the entire police radio system. 
A teletype was dispatched to sheriff's offices, and communications were sent to police stations throughout the country. The house-to-house search throughout the entire city intensified. The dragnet in which we hoped to trap Donald Keeper was drawing slowly inward. It was 12 midnight. Friday, did the papers get a list of the numbers in that ransom money? Yeah, got them in the final net edition. Two and a half pages of serial numbers. Gave it a big spread. Look at these pictures of Kiefer here. All over the front page. The more the better, Romero. I hope this town never forgets that face. Good reminder. You don't make deals with killers. Hi, fellas. Come on over. Find anything yet, Lee? I'm checking over these towels here. Found them wrapped around the girl's body. Inside the papers. Funny thing about those papers. What's that, Lee? They're all yesterday's. Every story about the girl's disappearance has been clipped out. Maybe the guy's making up a scrapbook. How about the towels, Jones? Any laundry marks? Not a one so far, Ed. Every one of them was clipped off. Pretty smart. The all close to body end. They're doing it now. Yeah, nasty one. Yeah. Did you get any footprints or tire marks out where they found the body? Lots of them. All cast. Bossy and Taylor are checking them now. One, thing. What is it, Jones? I don't know. On the scene here. This towel. Wait a minute. Joe. Yeah. That pair of snippers there. Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Just back under the seat. There. That's one tag he missed. Any markings, Lee? Yeah. Greenway Apartments, Los Angeles. One look at the apartment was enough. In an adjoining garage, we found the car which Keith reviewed, a blue sedan. Nebraska license plate 6 x ray 419. When we got back to the office, Chief Baxter and immediately issued a cancellation of the warrant order for the blue sedan. Then he ordered a detail of men to stake out the car in the event Keeper decided to come back for it. Here's a coroner's report, Joe. Oh, let's see it. Hmm. Cause of death, strangulation. Time of death, Monday, October 18th, approximately 2 p.m. One hour after we grabbed it? Uh, that can't be right. Skipper in his office? No, he's out for a minute. Hey, Joe, Ben, take the call off 2503, will you? Thanks, Mike. Fine. Would you give me the call on 2503, please? Thanks. Hello? Yeah. Yeah, when? We'll be right over. Some of the ransom money, Ben, just showed up. Beverly and Highland. Come on. The man's name was Ralph Donahue. He operated a used car lot on the corner of Beverly and Highland. He told us that early that morning he sold a dark blue late model coupe to a man who gave his name as Fred Sims. The man paid for the car in cash. Donahue told us that he checked the serial numbers on the bills after the man had driven away. Serial numbers check out, Joe, every one of them. If I only thought to look, officer, and you know, I generally do. I'm the suspicious kind anyway, but, oh, this morning I must have been asleep. You got the full description on the car, Ben? Yeah, Joe. All right, let's get it on the air right away. I saw his mug in the paper while I was waiting for you. Too late. Sorry. Yeah, thanks. At ten minutes past three that afternoon, another piece of the ransom money turned up at a busy downtown department store. The clerk was unable to remember who gave her the bill. The detail throughout the general downtown area was strengthened. The house-to-house search of the entire city for Judy Sullivan's murderer went on. The afternoon dragged into the early evening. At 20 minutes to 7, Ben and I had a hamburger and a cup of coffee in the drugstore at East Broadway and 3rd. And then we got back in the car, checked with communications, and started cruising the neighborhood again. At 9 minutes to 8, a man answering the description of Donald Keeper was seen crossing Sunset Boulevard just below Highland. Seven minutes later, the same man was reported near the intersection of Hollywood Boulevard and Las Palmas. Communications relayed the information. At 21 minutes past 8, our car, 80K, along with a dozen others, were concentrated in the Hollywood Boulevard area from Gower Street to La Brea, Franklin Avenue to Santa Monica Boulevard. At 24 minutes past 8, another piece of the ransom money was passed at a cigar store on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard and Hawthorne Street. The number of men and radio cars in the area was redoubled. Plain clothes officers were stationed at every intersection to keep an eye on pedestrian traffic. At 18 minutes to 9, the dark blue coupe which Keeper had bought that morning was spotted parked in an alley just below Hollywood Boulevard in Coalinga. We called Ed Backstrand. City Hall. 2503. 2503. Chief of Detectives, all this hand. This is Friday, Mike. Chief there? Yeah, wait a minute. He's just going out the door. Ed, it's for you. Backstrand. Friday, Ed. Just spotted Keeper's car, the one he bought this morning, parked in an alley off Coalinga. Harris and I are on our way up there now. We'll take care of the car. You take care of this call. Just came in. What do you got? The theater on the corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. Girl in the box office just took in a ten dollar ransom bill. Yeah. She got a good look at the man who passed the bill. She says it's keeper. All right, Ben, come on. Yeah. You got the list of serial numbers? Right here. Let's check at the window. 
Yes, sir. How many, please? Police officer. Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Oh, yes, sir. Mr. Rayburn, the police are here. Would you step around to the side door, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am. Margie, relieve Francis for a minute. Francis, come here. Bring that $10 bill with you. Sharp girl, officer, that Francis. Sharp. Here it is, Mr. Rayburn. Um, all right, Sergeant. There you are. $10 bill and a list of serial numbers. Check out all right, then. That's it, Joe. Good work, miss. You reported the man came in about a half hour ago. You're sure it was Kiefer? Yes, sir. I had his picture in the box office just behind the change machine. I recognized him right away. And as far as you know, he hasn't left the theater. That's right, sir. All right, Mr. Rayburn. I'm sorry. I'm afraid we'll have to interrupt the show. Anything you say, Sergeant. Anything. Ben, you keep an eye on the front exit. I'll call communications. All right, Joe. 80K to control 4. 80K to control 4. 80K, go ahead. Control 4, clear all frequencies. The Sullivan murder suspect, Donald Kiefer, has been located in the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. Have all units surround the area. ADK, Roger. Attention all units. Attention all units. This ADK is the theater on the southeast corner of Hollywood Boulevard in Fairview. Sullivan murder suspect has been located in the theater. Go ahead, ADK. Control 4, have all units converge in the general area, Hollywood Boulevard and Fairview. Unit 62R to block off the intersection at Hollywood Boulevard in North Cherokee. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 61A to block the intersection of Hollywood Boulevard and Hudson Street. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic. Unit 71 and 72R to block the alley behind the theater. Unit 66 and 67R to assist the main entrance to the theater. Within a few minutes, the one-half-mile area around the theater was completely blockaded. Every exit and entrance to the theater was covered. At 9.23, we met Harris and Ed Backstrand in the theater manager's office. Backstrand outlined our plan of operation. At 9.28, a detail of 14 men walked down the side aisles on the main floor of the theater and took up their post on either side of the orchestra pit. The picture was stopped and every light in the theater was turned on. Ed Backstrand, Harris, Ben and I went down the aisle and up onto the stage. Backstrand made the announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we're sorry to interrupt the picture, but this is important. We're police officers. We've traced the murderer of Judy Sullivan to this theater. He is in this theater now. And we're going to search the theater row by row, and we'd like to ask your cooperation. There's no need to be panicky or afraid. Those who wish to leave now may do so. Leave by the main entrance. Each one of you will be checked as you go out the door. And for the benefit of the man we're looking for, don't try to escape. Every exit is covered and the entire area is blockaded. Don't place any more lives in jeopardy. Come on, Ben. Backstage, Joe. We can make it from there. All right, let's go. Come on, hustle it, Ben. Yeah. Next building. You'll probably try to jump for it. All right, watch it. I think this door leads out to the roof. There he goes. All right, keeper, hold it. Don't shoot. Don't shoot. I give up. Throw your gun down. Over here. Don't shoot. No. Let's get him. All right, coppers. I got it figured. They won't top me for this. Didn't know what I was doing. Put the cuffs on him, Ben. Get away from me, you crumb. You shouldn't have hit him, keeper. the cuffs now. Yeah. Come on, let's get him in out of the rain. What's the hurry? Why spoil a good rain? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Donald Alfred Keeper was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 15th in a new series of authentic cases transcribed from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Deputy United States Marshal John B. Glenn of Boise, Idaho, who on the morning of July 31st, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Theater Guild on the Air returns tomorrow night on NBC. Other in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. <laughs> Thank you.
You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to Homicide Bureau. A police officer has been shot, mortally wounded. One of the suspects has been apprehended. The other is still at large. Your job, find him. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. Investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, November 16th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working a day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, Sue the detective. My name's Slade. It was 11.58 a.m. when we got to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, second floor, room five. Treatment room. Very late. Good time. How's Ben, Mr. Doc? Got in the lungs, Ben, three times. It's going fast. His wife with him? They're bringing him down now. Can we talk to him? We'll make it fast. Come on, Joe. This way. John. John, it's Friday in Romero. <laughs> they want to talk to you a minute. Doc. Doc, it burns. My chest. Burning up. Nurse? Yes, Doctor. Are the hypodermic? Uh, yes, Doctor. <laughs> All right, folks. Don't take too long. John, it's Joe Friday. Can you tell us how it happened? Joe. Joe. How did it happen, boy? Can you tell me? Can't figure it, Joe. Why'd he do it? We gotta find out. Now, how did it happen? I don't know. I was directing traffic. East Broadway and First Street. Gray Cooper. Pulled up for the stop. Gray Cooper. How many men in the car? How many, John? Two. <laughs> Gray Cooper. Pulled up for the stop. And the pedestrian. Pedestrian lane. Went over. Gonna ask him to back up. Back up out of lane. Just gonna ask him. Yeah, John, and then what? Driver. Dark hair. Eyes. Dark. Went over. Gonna ask him. Back up. Pointed a gun. No reason. Pointed a gun at me. All right, easy, John. Take it easy. No reason, Joe. No reason he fired. Hurry up, Joe. Yeah. No. What about the other man in the car? Did you see him? Can you describe him? Joe. Joe, did you get him? Freight coop driver. Guy with him. We got the driver, John. He's upstairs. The other one got away. We got to find him. You got to help us. My wife. Somebody sent for Dora. She's on her way. She'll be here in a minute. Now, can you tell us the other man in the car? What did he look like? What did he look like? Don't press him, Joe. Great coop. The driver. Fired a gun. Dark hair. Yeah, Dark I know the other man, John. We got the driver. What did the other man look like? Send for Dora. Come on, Ben. Thanks, Doc. Okay. You going fast? Yeah. John got any kid? Two. Always pick up family man. This thing's got a phony ring to it, Ben. You don't just pull a gun and shoot a man. Not if you're sane, you don't. Here's the stairs. The guy we got is as sane as they come. And how do we explain it? All I know is that hood shot John Bemis, and I want to know why. Mm. Might be a lead in that car he was driving. Maybe. Come on, here we are. Phone message for you, Friday. Came in a few moments ago. Thanks, David. Tomorrow and I. They got to make it. Take a look. No make or warrants on James Vickers. Great. Let's talk to him. Come on. Yeah. Minor wound, Joe. Bullet penetrated the fleshy part of his hand. Didn't touch the bone. Thought this guy had an arm wound, too. Just a neck pain. That officer you shot, Vickers. He's dying. Is he? He's a family guy. Got a wife, two kids. Has he? Why did you shoot him, Vickers? Ask him. We did. Then you know the reason. Said there wasn't any reason. That's right. Look, we're going to make you on this, Vickers. You know that, don't you? I don't know anything. Why'd you shoot him? Shut up. Why'd you shoot him? Joe. Yeah. Davis? Yeah? Stay with him. Bye. Doc, get us an empty slip on this guy, will you? We'll be back in a minute. Come on, man. All right, Joe. Have it ready. Easy, Joe. Oh, easy, nothing. I've seen so many good cops like Bemis cut down by punks like that Vickers. Getting mad won't help. Come on, down the stairs. Yeah. Like to see Bemis? Why? For the record. I want to see if the doc thinks it's okay for us to bring Vickers down. I'd like to have Bemis definitely identify him as the guy who shot him. We've got three good witnesses. An identification for Bemis will clinch it. I want to see Vickers get everything he's earned when he goes to court. All right. Yeah. He went fast, Joe. Yeah. Is that his wife? Yeah. 
Did he make it in time? No. Did he say anything that it helped? No, mm, it might. He said a prayer. <laughs> Six two five. Auto records, Crowley. Joe Friday, Vince. What about a make on that car used in the Beamer shooting this morning? Yeah, Joe, I've been trying to get a hold of him. Where are you now? Georgia Street, second floor. What about the make? Car was reported stolen yesterday afternoon. Registered to Harold Simpers, seven one six Everett Street. Report said the car was taken from a parking lot at Grand and Wabash. Okay, Vince. Thanks. What about the guns they found in the car? Lee Jones still had them over at the crime lab. He's running them through. No word yet. No. You make out the M-Town report on the car, Joe? Yeah, recovery report. They're still dusting for prints. MT slip ready, Doc? Yeah, right here, Ben. Medical card, history, MT slip. You ready, Vickers? Yeah. All right, put up your wrist. Put the cuffs on them, Ben. Watch his hands. They saving me for the hot lights? All right, let's go. I'm not going to jail. You're in jail now. Looks like a hospital. Bars on the windows, aren't you? All right, come on. Give me a smoke. Here. Okay. Light. What do I get if I open up? No deal. You might talk, make it attractive. Who was the other guy in the car? Hitchhiker. I always give rides. Then why'd he run when we chased him? Maybe he was scared. You're part of a gang. Maybe. Who was the other guy? Not your worst. Oh, come on, Vickers, you're wasting our time. Where are we going? My hand hurts. I want to call my own doctor. You hear me? Yes. The cop pulled his gun first. I can prove it. Yeah, down the street. Easy, huh? Where are we going? I said, where are we going? All right, what's it worth if I talk? I can tell you all about it. Make a deal. You'll tell us anyhow. Think so? All right, you out the door. Uh, wait a minute. Cigarettes out. All right, Ben, light it. Mm. Nice of you guys. Thanks. Oh, oh, get up there. Wait, oh, stop. He's crossing the street. Fire over his head. Watch the crowd. Vicker! Joe, he's running for that car. Right, hold it, Vicker. Oh, stop it, Vicker. Please stop. Come on, Joe. All right, come on. Get back. Please. Let us through here. Let us through. Should I call a doctor, Joe? No, he wouldn't be interested. The guy's dead. James Vickers, murder suspect, address unknown, died almost instantly at 1.13 p.m., November 16th, while attempting to escape. His body was taken to the county morgue where it was posted. All the personal effects found on the body were listed by the coroner and a receipt for them given to our office. At 8.35 the next morning, Ben and I met with Chief Detective Zed Packstrand. Those four guns they found in the car Vickers was driving. They're all U.S. Army property. Where were they stolen from, Skipper? I don't know. Each one of the guns is stamped U.S. Army. That's all. Well, that makes it easy. The coroner find anything on the body? Nothing to tell us why Vickers decided to kill a traffic cop. What did Beamer say before he died? He was on traffic duty yesterday morning down at East Broadway and First. At 10.35, a gray coupe pulled up for a stop sign. Vickers was driving. Mm -hmm. Beamer started over to tell him to back up out of the pedestrian zone. Vickers pulled a gun and shot him. How'd they catch Vickers? Chased him three miles before he piled into a lumber truck. The guy with him got away. Fine. Sector and I, no make or warrants on Vickers. Kickback's not in on his fingerprint. All right. What's your guess, Friday? I don't have one, Ed. Vickers could have been hopped up. Doc Stanley over at Georgia Street said no. He checked him. Uh, wait a minute. Thanks, friend. Yeah, hold on. For you, Friday. Hey, thanks. Friday talking. Yeah. Yeah, good. Be right over, Lee. We're in business, Ed. Crime Lab just found Vickers' address. There it is, Joe. Thanks, Lee. Let's see. Huh? Silver Dollar Hotel. Received a Mr. James Vickers, six dollars and fifty cents, room three forty five. Where'd you find it, man? Under of the front seat, in with the tools. Anything else? Not a thing. How about prints? Two. Kind of smudged. Hope we can run a make with them. No prints on the four guns, Lee? Smeared. Not enough to classify. This is it, Ben. That's all we got. Come on, let's see if we can make it pay off. We located the Silver Dollar Hotel on East Grand between 16th Street and Pico. 
It was an old-type frame building with a brightly colored neon sign jutting out over the sidewalk just above the dark entrance. The manager's name was Luther Gage. We showed him a picture of James Pickard. He definitely identified him as one of his former tenants. He told us that Pickers had stayed at the hotel one week in room 345 and that he had checked out two days ago. Was Vickers staying here alone, Mr. Gay? Yes, alone, quiet man. Did he have any visitor? Maybe. Wouldn't know. Paid his bills, spent most of his time away from the hotel. Good tenant. Did Vickers have any friends here in the hotel? Mm, maybe. Fell in the room next to Mr. Vickers. He still lives here. Two of them used to be kind of thick. Can we look at that room Vickers stayed in, Mr. Gage? Mm, let's see. Yes, it's still vacant. All right, this way. This man Vickers was friendly with, what's his name, Gage? Mm, Knight. Raymond Knight. Room 343. In his room now? No. Went out about 8 this morning. Here's the elevator. How well would you say Knight and Vickers knew each other? Couldn't say. Good tenants, both of them. Pay their bills. Did they go out together? Do they know each other well? Wouldn't know. I don't try. Look, this case involves murder, Mr. Gage. We told you that. We'd appreciate your cooperation. Cooperation? Don't pay the rent, Sergeant. Third floor. This way. Here. Three, four, five. Open it up. Nothing. Looks pretty clean, Joe. All my rooms are clean. You didn't mean it that way, Mr. Gage. I wonder if you'd show us Knight's room now. That's next door, isn't it? Hmm, I don't know about this. Poking into other people's rooms, not regular. Neither's murder. Come on, let's go. Does Mr. Knight have this room to himself? Sure ask questions, don't you? No, Knight has a friend staying with him. About two weeks now. Not in much. He in now? Don't think so. Oh, I... Then watch it! Oh, rough, that you! Oh, oh, oh. Nice shot, Mr. Gates, look out! Oh, oh, oh. Come on, get up. Ben? He's out cold. Look what you've done to the room. I thought you said Knight wasn't in. He isn't. This is his friend. Great friend. 45 automatic in his hand. 38 snub nose in the bureau, another 45. Look in his bag. I don't pry. He pays his bills. Good tenant. Yeah. Can I get outside on this phone? Mm, yes. All outside calls are 10 cents. Yeah. Here. Have to keep the book straight. Sure you do. Who's going to pay for the damage? Ask Mr. Knight's friend here. Well, say... Why worry? He pays his bills. Good tenant. I called Ed Backstrand, and he sent out a special detail to take out the hotel and bring in Raymond Knight if and when he returned. Ben and I drove to the Georgia Street Receiving Hospital, where Doc Stanley patched up the cut on Ben's scalp and treated Raymond Knight's friend for simple cuts and bruises. From papers found in his wallet and in the hotel room, he was identified as Frank Gannon, 9896 Wasatch Street, Kansas City, Missouri. When we got to headquarters, we had Gannon taken to the interrogation room where we questioned him briefly. He told us that he was a self-employed watch salesman. He was in the city on a business trip. He admitted friendship with Knight, but not with Vickers. We booked him at the county jail for assault with intent to commit murder. The three guns found in the hotel room were turned over to the crime lab. We reported back to the office. Throw my head pounding like mad. That Gannon's a mean. Yeah, it's a nasty snack. I got some aspirin in my desk. Might help. Here on. All right, boys. Rough day. You don't get much rough already. Message for you in the desk. I'm going to eat. Darling. Right, Jason. What is it, Joe? Joe's got to make on those prints he lifted off the car. I see. Yeah, something else in there on James Baker. Mm -hmm. Wanted 101443, desertion, U.S. Army. That could account for those stolen army guns. Yeah. What about the make on those prints Lee found? Let's take a look. Vance Taylor, good solid wreck. Four burglaries, two armed robberies, two assault winnings. Here's a mama sheet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Born so and so, 36, hiking. Alias John Fields, Harold Grant, Tom Bissell, Joe. Hey. Yeah, alias Raymond Knight. The other man who rode in the car with James Vickers the morning he shot down traffic officer Bemis finally had been identified. Vance Taylor, alias Raymond Knight. Well, that still didn't explain the unprovoked murder. It didn't explain the four guns found in the car and the three guns found in the hotel room. An assortment of arms like that could mean something big, but we didn't know what. 
Gannon's sudden willingness to shoot it out in the hotel room meant something, too. We didn't know what. We had Gannon brought back to the interrogation room. Hi, Gannon. Have a seat. Everything all right? I'll bet you're worried. No, we're not worried, Gannon. You ought to be. Don't make me laugh. You're tied in with Raymond Knight. That's enough for us. You send me up for it. We're going to try. Big talk. How long did you know Vickers? I didn't. Oh, funny. His prints are all over one of those guns we found in your room. I'm not worrying. Well, then you better start, Gannon. Vickers and Knight killed hands. If you run with him, your hands are dirty, too. My room was Knight, that's all. Knight didn't come back to the hotel. Where is he? We're not that close. You share your guns and your friends. That's close enough for us. I don't know Vickers. You mean you didn't know him? I said I don't know him. We got Vickers, Gannon. He's dead. Good story. Okay. Come on, Gannon. Let's get on the board. Down this way, Joe. It's cold today, isn't it? Yeah, it's damp. Yeah, it's kind of sweaty. No. What is all this? Never seen a corpse before? No, I'm not in this. Take me back. I don't want to look. You can close your eyes. Take me back. I don't want to look. Here we are, fellas. Man 45. This way, Gannon. I get sick. I don't want to look. Go back to sheep, Fred. <sighs> Take a good no. look, Gannon. No, he's Knight's friend. I'm not in it. Who is in it? I don't know. I... Okay, bud. Interrogation room, Friday. Joe, on stakeout at the Silver Dollar Hotel. No sign of Raymond Knight. Keep you posted. Okay, Dave, thanks. How long does this go on? I can call a lawyer, you know. Well, you better call one right away, Gannon. They just picked up Knight at the hotel. He's incriminated you. You're a liar. Sure. Like we were about Vickers. We'll prove it to you, Gannon. The officers are on their way in now. They're going to put Knight in the next room. You can listen to him. Look, I came here to sell watches. I ain't in this. Gannon, you and Vickers and Knight were planning a job, a big one. We know that. If you want to wait to get on the witness stand to tell your story, it's all right with us. Well, didn't take too long to break this one. Smoke Yeah. Thanks. Yeah? Smoke? What are you going to do? Nothing. It's still a little time. They bring in Knight. You haven't got Knight. I haven't unwrapped them yet, Joe. You want to check me out? Okay, open them up. Mm-hmm. Give them a good shuffle, huh? You're going to have some time on your hands, Gannon. Want to learn a new card game? No. Nah. Suit yourself. Good game for two. Better with three. You want a lot of cards? Yeah. You got two decks there. Well, first off, this game is quite a bit like gin rummy. Yeah? There are eight of every suit. Four jokers. Jokers count 50 points. Mm-hmm. Red threes count 100 points each. If you get a black three, you can freeze the deck. Oh, I see. You shouldn't say deck. In this game, they call it the pack. The pack? What's a pack? It's a discard pile, same as in gym. You get a red three, you can freeze it. No, it's a black three. Well, what happens when you freeze it? Nobody can pick it up. Mm-hmm. All right. You see a lot of dummy hands here. Fine game, Gannon. Sure you won't change your mind? He don't want to play, Joe. All right, now I'm two-handed. You deal out 15 cards, see? How many can play? As many as six, I think. I've only played up to four. You play partners with four? Yeah, I see. Okay, that's your card. I catch 15. Mm-hmm. 15, right. Now, now what do I do? Well, I guess you better lay your hand open. That'll be the easiest way to show you. Okay. Let's spread them all out over there. Mm-hmm. Well, you don't have a great hand there. You got a couple of black threes, you can use those. Yeah, that's fine. They count 100 apiece. No, no, no. Those are red threes. Black threes don't count any. Oh, red threes. That's right. Do you remember what black threes are for? Yeah, you can use them to freeze a pile. Pack. That's right. The pack. Well, you know what I mean. All right, now, look. You see, I got a joker here. Jokers are wild. You remember how much they count? They're wild. 100 points. No, red threes are worth 100. Jokers count 50. You don't explain it very good. I don't understand. Well, how simple can it be? Gannon's not even playing. You get it, don't you, Gannon? Okay, red threes count a hundred. Jokers count fifty. Black threes you can you can freeze the pi- uh, the pack. Yeah, good. Now hold on to that, will you? Now black threes freeze the pack, but that's not the only card that can do it. No, no. Deuces can do the same thing. But you see, the only difference is if you use a deuce, which is also wild, you have to have a natural pair in order to pick up the pack. Now with a black three, it's only it. good. Until... I knew it wouldn't work. It was sour right from the start. Baker's killed a cop. I'm not in it. 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 I'm not in it
Johnny, the stenographer. Right, Ben. All right, Gannon. It's too late. You haven't got time. Twenty after one, they're going to do it. Do what? Payroll. Brazier Company. Messenger leaves at one twenty. He's got the payroll. Thirty grand. They're going to get him. Where does the messenger leave? One twenty. You're too late. I'm not in it. Where does he leave? One twenty. Leaves the bank, I think. No, maybe the company. Where's the company? Third and Spring. They're going to get him. Where's the bank the messenger goes to? Up the block, Second National, Third and Hill. Where are they going to get the messenger? By the alley, Clay Street. I'm not in. Ben, it. check it. Get out of communications. Have him put out a call to block off the area. Give him the details. All right. Johnny. Yes, yeah, sir. Stay with this guy. Okay. Davis. Davis. Frazier. Frazier. Manufacturing. Frazier Manufacturing Company. Give me your payroll division. This is a police department emergency. What's this, sir? Your payroll division. It's an emergency. One moment, sir. Hurry up. Payroll, Hopkins. Mr. Hopkins, this is Sergeant Friday, police department. We've had a tip your payroll messenger is going to be held up today. Has he left your building yet? The messenger? Yeah. Oh, my. He left early today. Went out the door about 10 minutes ago. Thanks. Second man. Friday, what's all the excitement? You break them guys? Explain in a minute, Ed. No time. Mm. Good afternoon, Second National. Give me the manager on duty, please. Emergency. One moment, please. One moment. Come on, come on. I'm sorry, sir. The line is busy. Would you get away? Give me the chief teller. Thank you. Chief teller, Waters. This is Sergeant Friday, Police Department. Emergency call. Has the payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? Well, uh, I wouldn't know, Sergeant. Uh, just a moment. I'll have your call switched. Yeah. Operator. Beatrice, would you give this call to Miss Chalmers? Uh, it's important. Thank you, Mr. Waters. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers, what's the matter, Freddie? Are you sick? Yeah, I'm sick. Miss Chalmers, good afternoon. Miss Chalmers is a sergeant, Friday, police department. Has a payroll messenger from the Brazier Company left the bank yet? In Brazier? Why, yes, not more than two or three minutes ago. And he had the payroll with him? Of course. Thanks. Got a tip on a payroll stick, baby. Coming? Yeah, let's go. Ben, down this way. Coming. Let's hustle it down the stairs. Communication, get the story. You got it on there now. Where's this brazier coming in? Third and Spring, about five blocks from here. Come on, here's the garage. All right, come on, hit it. Let's make time. Get the radio on. Just warming up. Cars are closing in fast. Four speed up ahead, Ben. Might meet him at this end of Clay Alley. Hold on. No, it's pretty quiet at this end. Not much you can do without. Hey, hey, look. He's coming out of the alley now. Guy with the police. Brown coat. Guy with the pop in. Let's go. All right, two hold it. They're running for it. Come on. Ben, what's your box? Let's go. I so hard, Jim. I don't know, Ben. Some people are like that. You can blow the whistle all you want. You never know when to stop. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Frank Gannon, the only surviving member of the holdup gang, was tried and convicted of the crime of assault with intent to commit murder. He is now serving out his sentence at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 16th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. 
Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Richard H. Taylor of the Washington, D.C. Police Department, who on the evening of December 13th, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Phil Harris likes a great deal about the South. We like a great deal about Phil Harris. For instance, we like his beautiful blonde wife, Alice Faye. In fact, we like the Phil Harris Alice Faye show, and it just happens that it returns to the NBC air tomorrow. Why don't you take our advice and listen to one of the funniest shows around anywhere? That's the Phil Harris Alice Faye show tomorrow on most of these same NBC stations. <laughs> Tune for the Stars on NBC. Here in NBC's great parade of new shows. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide. A mad killer is loose in the city. In every instance, he leaves the murder weapon behind. There are no fingerprints, no clues to the killer's identity. Your job, get him. Dragnet. The documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, June 3rd. It was warm in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was off duty reporting back in on an emergency call. It was 3.57 a.m. when I got to the basement of the city hall. The carpool. Let's go, Friday. Sorry to call you back in. Couldn't be helped. All right, Ben. Okay, Skipper. Bed. Double murder. When? I don't know. I found out about it 40 minutes ago. Got any ideas? Roughly same M.O. Was that 6413 Norwich Giver? No, 6430. What do you mean the same M.O.? The same guy. Brick that killer. How many does this make? Counting tonight, four. You got anything at all? Mm, smudged fingerprints we can't even classify. Sounds like a smart operator. We gotta get him. We have to shake down the city from one end to the other. Big job, Skipper. Big killer. At 4.26 a.m., we pulled up in front of 6430 Norwich Drive, a small group of bungalow apartments facing on an oval-shaped garden court. Two uniformed officers were stationed at the door to the apartment. Hiya, Chief. Hiya, fellas. We went inside. Welbert from Homicide was waiting for us. This way. In here. There they are. Yeah. Mother, daughter. Joe, on the floor beside the bed. Yeah, a red brick. <laughs> Miss Hafters, we know how you must feel about all this, but would you please try to answer a few more questions for us? Yes. All right. Oh, Margaret. <laughs> Miss Hafters, how long have you known Mrs. Diaz and her daughter? Nine years. This November, they moved next door. I remember it so well. We got along right from the start. And as far as you know, the only close friends the mother and daughter had live right here in the apartment court? Yes. Margaret was a pretty girl, but she was no chaser, no boyfriend. 
very close to her mother. The two of them very close. Did they keep any amount of valuables in the apartment? Money, jewelry, things like that? Oh, no. Mrs. Dears and Margaret didn't have much, you know. Very modest income. They both worked. And you can think of no good reason. Oh, no, no. Oh, oh Margaret. Poor oh, Mrs. Dears. Lying in bed. Oh, terrible. Well, Yes, Sergeant. Would you show Mrs. Hafner back to her apartment? Sure, Sergeant. Thank you, Mrs. Hafner. We appreciate it. Yes, thank you. Oh, Margaret. Oh, Mrs. Dears. Well, Joe, let's check with Ed. He's back in the bedroom. You got anything from the neighbors? Yeah, I... The usual, Ed. No jealous boyfriends, ex-husbands, nothing like that. Boys find any evidence yet, Skipper? No, still working on it. You got any theory? Yeah, we know the killings were all done by the same guy. Cut the same pattern out of the window screen. Cut the same pattern with a glass cutter out of the window. Reaches in and flips the lock. All right, where's that leaving? And before he gets inside, he makes sure there are only women in the house. That means he probably watches the house for a few days. Yeah. Once he gets inside, he wants only one thing, to kill. He's never taken any valuables. As far as we can tell, he's never searched for any. What kind of a man works like that? I think the guy's still crazy. Hey, fellas. Yes, Donner? Here's a break. Two fair friends. One thumb, one forefinger. What'd you get, Pete? Only got nine points. Not enough to go into court, but enough to make him. We'll know him when we get him. Yeah. Found the prints on the lens of the old lady's eyeglasses. Probably knocked him off the night table when he went after her. And when he was done, he put him back on the table. Yeah. Had blood on his hands, see? Yeah. That's funny, isn't it? Why would he go to the trouble of picking up the woman's glasses after he killed her? We'll ask him when we find him. Hi, Ben. Joe? Might have something for you. We can use it, Lee. Hold it just a minute. Yeah. Crime lab, Jones. Yeah. Yeah, all right. I'll tell him. Right, Ed. Backstand. If you're through checking the victim's clothes by 8 o'clock, you can knock off for sleep until noon. What if we're not through? Take it up with the chaplain. Here's what I wanted to show you. Over here. A couple of cash. Bare footprint. That's right. Those from the deer's place? Found them outside the dining room window in the flower bed. Take a look. Mm-hmm. Good cast. Size 9. 10. Mm. Missing toe there, huh? Left foot, first toe. That's lucky. Well, the guy took his shoes off before he went in that house. That's the way it looks. Leave any other prints, Lee? Three, with his shoes on. Here they are, here. Yeah. How would you say the guy is built, Lee? Moved from the impression, pretty heavy man. There's no full length of stride, or I might give you an idea of his height. How about the bricks, Lee? Here they are, all three of them. Used this one in the first murder, this one in the second, and this one last night. Leaves them around like calling cards, and there's no way to check them. You'll never get a fingerprint off a common red brick like this, Ben. The surface is too rough. Well, you got an idea of his weight. You know that the first toe is missing from his left foot. That's something. The one we had yesterday. We can check that missing toe in the amputation file, Joe. Yeah. Well, we better get back. Pete ought to have those prints ready, too. Thanks a lot, Lee. Okay, fellas. Say, they post the bodies yet? Yeah, they're doing it now. Same as the first two. The brain? Concussion hemorrhage. They didn't have a chance. Hold it a minute. Time lap, Jones. Sure, just a minute. Either one of you fellas. I'll get it, Joe. Okay. Here, yeah, Romero. Yeah. Good, we'll be right over. They got a make on those two fingerprints. Okay, Joe. Single print file. Made him on the index finger. Let me see, Pete. Take a look, Ben. Yeah. Doesn't look like a killer, does he, Joe? Kind of nice looking. That's right, Pete. They said the same thing about John Dillinger. The name at the top of the make sheet read, Carlos Richard Monterey, male, Caucasian, age 19, height 5 feet 11 inches, weight 165 pounds, dark brown hair, dark brown eyes. Last known address, 1663 Naples Street, Los Angeles. Previous arrest, one, auto theft, February 8, 1936. That was all. Ben and I had been expecting more. The information on the mama sheet for Monterey was 13 years old. So was the picture. So was the description. So was the address. In 13 years, a man can change in a thousand ways. So can his habits, his appearance, his address. In 13 years, everything can change except two things. A man's fingerprints and a physical deformity. Missing toe on left foot. Carlos Richard Monterey. Here it is, Joe. 
1633 Naples. Yes, come on. Somebody coming. Mm-hmm. Yes? What is it? Her police officer. We'd like to ask you a few questions. Oh, yes. Oh. Would you like to come in? Thank you, ma'am. Yes? Would you mind telling us your name? Monterey. Isabel Monterey. What is it you want? You're married? Yes. My husband is Francisco Monterey. Would you explain why you are here? We thought you might be able to help us. We're looking for a man named Carlos Monterey. I don't understand you. We're looking for a man. We'd like to talk to him. Do you know where he is? Yes. Carlos is dead seven years ago. He's dead. My husband told me. Does your husband know Carlos, or did he know him? He was his brother. What about your husband's parents, Miss Monterey? Where are they? They're both dead. I'm done now. Have you ever met Carlos? No, never. I have only heard of him. What have you heard of him, Miss Monterey? Do not ask me. This is important, very important. Francisco would not like it if I told you. It's important, Miss Monterey, believe it. Carlos is sick. His mind. For eight years, Francisco has not seen him, not heard from him. Since he's dead. But he only thinks so, Miss Monterey. No one has told him his brother's dead. He just thinks so. What else is there to think? Where's your husband now? At his work, his store, his high street near Maine. Grocery. Monterey can't write grocery. Here's your change. Thank you, Mrs. Mars. Now, look, officers, you know how it is. You don't like to let these things get out. That's why I trust you. You can trust us, Mr. Monterey. We just want to check on a few things. Oh, fine. Always glad to help out if I can. Well, can you tell us if your brother was ever in a mental institution in his life? Oh, I know. There was nothing wrong. 1923. Got a little bad, so Mom and Dad had to put him away for a while. Just till he calmed down. I remember the day. Sometimes. Dumb, stupid kid. What do you know? Standing there by himself in the train, crying. Public nurse, stupid way he cried. What do you do? I cried too. I was only 10, Sergeant. I, I saw him go. He was alone. Later on, Mr. Monterey, your brother was released from the state institution. Yeah, he was 16. Then he started running around, playing tough, carried a gun, lived by himself. He never came around. He dropped from sight about 1938. You haven't heard from him since then? Nothing. Never seen him. Do you know of anybody who might have seen him? There was a girl he had. Uh, Anita something. On Soteo Street. Uh, Anita Martin, yeah, that's it. Soteo Street. Maybe she's seen him. Ask her. Maybe she's seen him. Carlos? Carlos Monterey? And uh, not in a year. Miss March she was in. When I was working at the Peacock, down on South Main. He came in, we talked for a while. That was all. And you haven't seen Carlos for the past two months or so? I tell you, no. Has he written to you? Has he phoned you? No. Mm. One, three weeks ago, he phoned. Here. He left a message with my girlfriend. But he didn't call back again. Now, that's it. That's all I know. Thank you, Miss Martin. Here's our card. If he does call, he'll let us know. Yeah, I'll let you know. You like Carlos, is that it, Anita? Like him? No, I didn't like him. He was funny. But he was nice. You know, I pitied him. Why did you pity him, Miss Martin? Well, he was a good fellow who was strange. He could smile, you know. He had a nice smile, but you could tell he was never laughing. There was something in his mind. Something. Oh, I don't know. At least a year, closer to two, I haven't seen Carlos. No letters, not a card, nothing. He was in the East the last time I heard. When was that? A year ago, January. I was in here. Sent me a calendar. Sometimes he could get along fine, very well. Other times, terrible. Couldn't keep him down. How'd he manage to stay out of jail that way, the any? I don't know. Sometimes he should have been in jail five times over. And you say you don't know of anybody who might have a recent picture of Carlos, a snapshot? No. No, no one I can think of. Okay, Vincente, here's our card. If you do think of somebody, let us know, will you? It'll help. Sure, glad to. If I hear of anybody. What kind of a day is it outside? Hot? Hot. By five o'clock that afternoon, Ben and I were certain of one thing. Carlos Monterey was in the city of Los Angeles, somewhere. We drove back to the office and told Ed Backstrand about our interviews with Monterey's relatives and his friends. Inquiries and requests for further identification and information on him were immediately relayed to the state mental institution. 
A 13-year-old picture of Monterey taken from the files was copied and distributed with a note of caution as to the age of the photograph. An APB was sent out. Stakeouts were placed at the home of Monterey's brother, at the brother's store, and at the apartment of Anita Martin. A special detail of 300 men was ordered to join the dragnet already in operation. The details at the airport and the bus terminals were alerted, as well as the details at the Union Depot and the main post office. By 6 o'clock that night, almost 1,000 men were actively working at the job of tracking down Carlos Monterey. At 6.30 p.m., Ben and I drew a four-hour relief period. We drove out to Ben's place, and his wife fixed us some dinner. At 10.30 that night, we reported into the office, picked up Ed Backstrand, and we drove out to join the manhunt. Unit 32 on the corner of South Flower and Loomis. 390 W, AMA 367. Unit 12A, code 1. 66A and 86 Floor Wall Street. Hold them out about a 507. AMA 367. Unit 42, 5430 East Grand, Apartment 10, 311. AMA 367. We cruised with the dragnet operation until 5 o'clock that morning. Ben and I took turns driving. Actually, the tremendous job of scouring 500 square miles of city for one man. It was an unexpected break. The search for Carlos Monterey could wear on for weeks. It did. Night after night, the manhunt went on. Day after day. There was no break. Sixteen days later, on a Sunday night, I went to bed early. I read a while, and then I turned off the lamp and went to sleep. Hello? Righty talking. Sorry, Joe. Get in here as fast as you can. Hmm? What's the matter? That girl Monterey knew. The one you talked to? Yeah. She left her apartment, went to her girlfriend. Yeah? She's dead. There it is. Ordinary red brick. Found it by the body. How long has she been dead, Skipper? Well, she was seen alive about an hour and a half ago. Got three bare footprints, good length of stride. Found them down in the lot beside the house. What do they look like? Same guy. First toe missing from the left foot. The same weight impression. Should be about five foot eleven. That checks out with what you got, doesn't it? All right, so it's the same guy. What about those shoes we found, Lee? Yeah, they correspond. They were impregnated with foreign matter. What'd you find? Particles of lettuce leaf, dry onion skin, traces of red cabbage. Maybe a vegetable counter. Maybe. What about the city wholesale market down on Front Street? What about any market in Los Angeles? No, Lee, that wholesale market is big enough to hide anybody. Hundreds of transients work in there. Some of them even sleep there. A guy like Monterey, it'd be perfect. That's a fair guess. Check it when it opens. They open at 2 a.m. 2.30 now. All right, get back to the office and pick up as many extra men as you need. Get down there right away. Okay, Ed. You know he's a rough one, so watch it. On Monday, June 23rd, at two minutes past 3 a.m., we pulled up at the city wholesale produce market. With the exception of 54 police officers in plain clothes who mingled with the buyers and sellers, business went along as usual. The market itself covered almost three square blocks in the lower part of the downtown area was divided off into hundreds of individual stalls by flimsy wooden partitions. To make the search even tougher, the place was crowded. For the first 45 minutes, we had the men circulate at random through the crowd on the chance that one of them might spot Carlos Monterey from the 13-year-old picture. It didn't happen. After that, we started a systematic canvas. We talked to the customers. We talked to the managers of the different booths. We gave them Monterey's description. We showed them his picture. Nobody recognized him. We checked the employment records one by one. Not a sign. Sorry, Sergeant. Like to help. I've never seen the guy. Okay, Mr. Snyder, thank you. We sure picked the sweet jobs, don't we? No, yeah, we could spend a year at this. Oh, Sergeant, Sergeant Friday. Yeah, Kamensky. Find something? The guy at the booth over there against the far wall. Thinks he might have hired Monterey a couple of days ago. Come on, Ben. Where? Over there, Sergeant. You showing Monterey's picture? Yeah, he thinks it might be hidden. <laughs> Mr. Fratinetti, this is Sergeant Romero, Sergeant Friday. Yes, I told you, boy, Sergeant, this fellow Carlos, I hired him to help uh, last Thursday. Big rush for me now, so I hire him. You sure he's a man? In the picture? Think so. A little older, maybe. Oh, but I know faces. He's the man. You, you looking for him? You say you hired this man last Thursday? That's right. It's a big rush for me now. In the morning, I, I hire him Thursday. He works uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. But he don't show up this morning, so I got to no know use. Too many men to pick up from him. He don't show up, I let him go. What kind of work did he do for you? Same as he did for Schiller down there. Heavy work. Moving the stores, to cleaning up. What kind of produce does Schiller handle, Mr. Frantinetti? Fancy, very fancy vegetables. Uh, choice. Uh, new potatoes, uh, expensive red onions. Schiller sells to the big hotel. Does Schiller handle brown onions, Mr. Frantinetti? Oh, only the best. Big dealer at the Schiller. Sells it to the big hotel. How long has this Carlos been working around the market? Oh, I don't know. Is it just like the rest? 
First he worked for me, then uh, Largo Mastini, then the Sheila. Hey, why are you looking so hard for him? He stole somebody? He murdered somebody. Him? My money, he murdered. Do you have any idea where Carlos lives? Well, me? No, no. And if he comes back here, I tell him to get out. I got nothing to do with this trouble. Well, you'll tell him nothing, Mr. Presidente. Here's our card. If you see Monterey again, call us. Say nothing to him. Well, sure, sure. Henry, uh, Joe, call us here at the office, will you? A message just came in. Thanks, Al. Come on, Ben. Yeah, there's a phone booth. See? No, I don't. Where? Straight ahead, a little left. Oh, yeah. You got a nickel? No, let's see. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there you are. Thanks. I'll see what Ed wants. Two five one one. Two five one one. Chief of detectives always had him. Hi, Mike. Ed there. Ed, take it on extension two, will you? Thanks, man. Talking. Righty, Ed. Move fast on this one, Joe. What's up? Main post office. Carlos Monterey picked up a letter left there less than five minutes ago. Come on, Ben. There's Ed over there with Wellberg. Yeah. Traffic short jammed up around here. Hi, Ed. Right in, Romero. You all set, Wilbur? All set, Chief. Spring Street to San Pedro. Sunset the first. Got it covered. Good. What's the story? Post office detail tipped us off. Five minutes after eight, a man answering Carlos Monterey's description picked up a letter at the general delivery window. That was 16 minutes ago. Who spotted him? Sam Lane. Got a look at him just as he was leaving the window. Called to him to stop, but Monterey ran. Lane called me, and we threw a net over the area for six blocks around. And Monterey's still somewhere inside this area? I don't know how I could have gotten out. What's next? Well, I'll give him an hour to break for it. After that, we start a house-to-house search of the whole area. Stop all pedestrian and vehicular traffic for identification. You're going to jam up the depot traffic. That's cheaper than murder, Romero. Get going. The first hour, we counted off in five-minute segments. Like Backstrand, we felt close enough to Monterey to touch him. But he still wasn't there. The north and south ends of the blockade started to move in, slowly. Searching every store, every house, every conceivable place where a man might hide out. In the meantime, Ben and I worked the Spring Street side of the blockade watching the faces of the pedestrians as they came through one by one, examining all vehicles and their drivers. The morning wore on, the sun came out, and it started to get warm. By 11 o'clock that morning, Monterey still had not been found. The temperature was 93 in Los Angeles. It was still climbing. The search went on. At 10 minutes past 2 p.m., Backstrand made the round. How's it look, Skipper? Not good. Going slow. How much longer do you figure? I don't know. It'll go to after dark, that's sure. District down here is like a rat's nest. Yeah. Nothing? Nothing. But he's someplace inside this blockade. He's got to be. Any chance of getting relief for the men in our squad? Some of them been working straight through since yesterday. Hmm. Okay. Check with me around five this afternoon. Thank you, Skipper. Keep a sharp lookout. One slip. That's all it takes. The search went on. At three o'clock that afternoon, the temperature was 95. We sweltered and we waited. At 345, Backstrand sent a squad of men into the Union Depot to search it from top to bottom. There was one false alarm when one of the men thought he saw him on a race slipping out a side door into a taxi. It turned out to be a train conductor. At 25 minutes past four, Backstrand passed along the order to our detail to start moving in, house by house. It was a tedious job, and it went slow. The men were tired. At 5.30, the relief squad showed up. Ben and I stayed on. After another two hours of house-to-house searching, the trap was narrowed down to a three-square-block area, a single block wide and three blocks long. It started to get dark. Backstrand ordered out batteries of floodlights. By 8 p.m., the cordon closed in around the last two square blocks. Mine's for all set, Skipper. Ready to move. Good. What do you think? I will know pretty soon, one way or the other. Frank, keep that traffic moving. All right, you two, get going. See you later, Skipper. Joe, let's take a look in here. Okay. Sure is an old building. Yeah. Where'd Kamansky go? I don't know. He's here a minute ago. Oh, wait. There's his flashlight. Down the end of the corridor there. He's signaling. Yeah, come on. Kamansky? Yeah. Down below, Sergeant, in the basement. Come on. Monterey? He's been there, I think. Yeah, this way. Where? Over here. Now, watch the step. The light's bad. There he is. Says he's a janitor. Oh, my head. He's been slugged. All right, come on. How'd it happen? Can you tell us? Yeah, a man, a big man hit me. I came down to empty the baskets. He hit me and ran. And over to the new building. The new building? Is that the one next door? Yeah, just a few minutes ago. Nobody's come out of this building for the past half hour. Every door in the place is guarded. No, no, not the doors. He went through the tunnel. I saw him. Over there's the tunnel. I'll take a look, Joe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, the tunnel. Next to two basements. Same company, old building, new building. The tunnel connects to the basement. Joe, come on. Yeah. Come on, get out the back strand. Tell him what's happened. Right, Sergeant. Call an ambulance. Right. 
All right, then. Through the tunnel. Watch where you're going. The light's burning. Yeah, it is. That a door up ahead there? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Let's go. Good. There's a stairway. Come on. Watch the doors. Joe, the elevator. They're both on the third floor. Let's head for the stairs. Ben, come on. One more floor. Yeah, right. Come on, hurry. Yeah. Look, top of the stairs. There you go. All right, hold it, you. Duck in the elevator. Joey's going down. Well, we'll never make it on the stairs. No, look. The other elevator. The control lever's been. Let's try it anyway. Yeah. All right, kick the control lever. Kick it, Ben. All right, Ben, knock the lever back. Come on, quick. Yeah, what's the matter? Joey's jammed. We're going fast. All right, let's kick it. Here. Now that doesn't matter. Can you reach the door control? Wait just a minute. I'll see. Yeah, okay. Well, he's still in the building. Both elevators are here now. Yeah. Down the hall, Ben. The office on the left, I think. Yeah. Hey, right, here we are. All right, keep clear the door. All right, Connor, right, put on that gun and come on out. Okay, Joe, let's take it. Watch it, Ben. He's throwing everything he can get his hands on. All right, Monterey. Come on, you. Okay, Ben, take him. Yeah, come on. Nice looking guy. Clean cut. Yeah. Doesn't figure, does it? What's that? My wife would say, he doesn't look like a killer, does he? What's a killer supposed to look like? The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Carlos Monterey was examined by five different psychiatrists appointed by the Superior Court and was found to be sane. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. He was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 17th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of W.A. Wharton, acting chief of police, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle patrolman John Kramer of the El Paso, Texas Sheriff's Department, who on the afternoon of April 26, 1940, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. NBC brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to burglary detail. A gang of hijackers has started to work in your city. Truckloads of valuable merchandise have vanished. The thieves are clever, seem to have a foolproof system... Your job, find them. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime, investigated and solved by the men who unrelentingly stand watch on the security of your home, your family, and your life. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, March 6th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of burglary detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 5.35 a.m. when I got to room 2A. Interrogation room. Read this to him, Ben. Yeah. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk. 58 cases imported perfume. Where are you dumping this stuff, LaValle? That's what we want to know. I told you the truth. I have nothing to do with it. I don't know anything about it. 
What was this stolen way bill doing in the cab of your truck? How many times do I have to tell you? I don't know. Your fingerprints are all over it. You must have carried it there. I didn't carry it there. Somebody's out to frame me. How many in the hijack gang, Lavelle? I'm not in a hijack game. I told you I don't know. When are you going to let me go? Who's the head of the gang? I don't know any head of the gang. I want to get out of here. You're covering for somebody. I'm not covering for anybody. You take the rap for all this, you're going to have a beard down to your knees by the time you get out. I'm not taking any rap. Then let's have it. I'm tired. $42,000 worth. You know who took it, you know where it is. They could have disappeared anywhere, on their way from the east to the, the thousand places. Nothing was missing from those shipments when they came in on the train. Everything was there when they were unloaded at the warehouse. I don't know, I don't know. Every dollar's worth was accounted for when it was loaded on the truck. Well, where is it now? I'm tired. We've been here all night. Let me... Well, let me read it for you again. Oh. 2,600 dozen nylon stockings, 45 bolts of silk, 58 cases imported perfume. And you're trying to tell us somebody hijacked all that from the trucks without you knowing it? The trucks were loaded at the warehouse. We went out to eat. We came back, got in the trucks, delivered the stuff, and that's all I know. And while you were out eating, the receipts for the load disappeared, too. Is that right, Lavelle? I don't know where the way bills are. The shipping truck, that's his job. We talked to him. He says one of you could have taken the way And then he's lying. I didn't take him. Then what was this way bill doing in the cab of your truck? I told you, I don't know. Somebody's trying to frame me. Why? I don't know. Somebody, I don't know why. Then you better come up with an answer, mister. Look, I'm tired. We've been here since 6 o'clock last night. We're all tired. Who are you covering for? What are you trying to build? I need that coffee left, Ben. It's cool. It's all right. You want some, Laval? No. All right, now, look, let's get one thing straight. We've been here all night. We can be here all day, tomorrow, the day after that, and the day after that. Yeah. we got enough to make you on this. You know that. We're going to stay with you to tell us the truth, everything. I've told you all I'm going to tell you. We stay here for six months. You got it all. This is your home phone, Hillside 8321. That's right, 8321. What time's your wife get up, Laval? What do you mean? Ben, get an outside line. Yeah. You're not going to call my home. That's Hillside 8321, Ben. Outside, please. Don't do that. Don't. Not my wife. Please. All right. Ask the questions again. This time I'll give you the answers. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well-respected man in his community. Sometimes it's like that. You can question a man for hours and he'll never give you any information. But somewhere in every man's makeup, there's a weak point. We were lucky enough to find Laval's. He told us that he would give us the locations where the hijacked goods were hidden. He told us the addresses were written on the ledge of a window cell on the seventh floor of the Teamsters Union Hall. It was 8.30 a.m. On the seventh floor, is that right? Yeah. Do me a favor. Don't make it too big. Look, we have to walk through the hiring hall before we get to the elevators in the back. Yeah? These handcuffs. They'll see them. All the guys in the hall. They know me. Can't you take them off my wrist till we get in the elevator? Sorry, Lavelle. Well, I won't try anything, but don't make me walk in front of them with these on. Sorry. Just till we get in the elevator. Can't you do that? I, I don't want the guys to see me. Well, here's my overcoat, Lavelle. I'll drape it over your hands here, and they won't see the cuffs. There you are. Come on. Hi, Tom. How are you? Hi. What's new, Tom? Not much. Let's take the elevator. Yeah. Cigarette? No, thanks. You? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. It's down this way. Let me show you. To the left. A window up ahead there. Yeah, this one. I don't see anything on the window sill. It's on the outside. Open the window and let me check. Yeah. Let me see you. Ben, grab him. He's trying to jump. Hey, Get hey, back hey. here. Get back. I told you, you hear? Hey, Joe. Get him, Joe. I can't hold him. He's pointing me out. Hold on, Ben. Grab me. Joe. Joe. He's slipping. Try, Joe. Hold on. He's kicking loose. I can't hold him. Hold him, Joe. Ben. Oh. Yeah. I couldn't hold him. 
You almost went with him. Let's get downstairs. What happened? Call an ambulance. There's been an accident. Thomas Laval was 38 years old. He was a well-respected man in his community. He died with the same reputation. We had a prisoner who'd met his death while in our custody. In cases like this, we had to have witnesses. By the time we got to the street, the usual accident crowd had gathered. Anybody here see the accident? What you want, witnesses? Yeah. Did you see it? Yeah, we saw it. Let's get their names, Ben. My name's Pete Garfield. This is Jack Morris. We'll be your witnesses. You'll probably be subpoenaed for the inquest tomorrow morning. Sure, we'll be there. We saw you push the guy out the window. We saw you kill him. The next morning at 10 a.m. in the basement of the Hall of Justice, Harold J. Lane, deputy coroner, city and county of Los Angeles, read the report of the findings of the autopsy on the body of the deceased Thomas Laval. As is customary at a coroner's inquest, the identification witness was called to testify first. Elizabeth Laval, please. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yes. Be seated. State your name. Elizabeth Laval. What is your address? 1216 East Camarillo Drive. What is your occupation? I'm a housewife. What is your relation to the deceased? His wife. Have you viewed the body of the deceased in this office? Yes. Who was the deceased? Husband. Thomas Laval. Is there anything further you wish to add? Thank you. Step down, please. Joseph Friday. Raise your right hand. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Joe Friday. What is your address? 4656 Collis Avenue. What is your occupation? I'm a police officer in and for the city of Los Angeles. Are you the investigating and arresting officer on this case? I am. Will you state briefly the facts relating to the death of the deceased? <clears throat> On the morning following the arrest by us of the deceased on suspicion of grand theft merchandise, he expressed a desire to assist us in the apprehension of suspects involved in these thefts and the recovery of property taken in them. Did he assist you? Well, he informed us that if we took him to the Teamsters Union Hall, that he'd be able to obtain addresses of the locations where the stolen property was cached. You then took him there? Yes, we did. What happened? When we arrived, he requested us to remove his handcuffs. We refused. The deceased then informed us that the addresses were written on a window ledge on the seventh floor. When we arrived at the window, under the pretense of searching for the addresses, he threw himself over the ledge. I grabbed his left leg to restrain him, but he kicked loose. Uh, did you at any time have any idea that the deceased planned such action? I did not. What did you do then? We immediately went to the location of the body and had an ambulance dispatched. Do you have anything further to state? No, I have not. Are there any questions from the jury? That's all, Officer Friday. Step down. Peter Garfield. Raise your right hand. Yeah. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? Yeah. Be seated. State your name. Pete Garfield. What is your address? 1654 North Pico. What is your occupation? Truck driver. Down at General Warehouse. Did you know the deceased? Yeah. How did you know him? I worked with him. And that cop's a liar, and so is his buddy sitting over there. Please confine the testimony of this inquest to facts. Were you present at the time the deceased met his death? I told you I was. And those two cops pushed Tom out of the window. Where were you at the time the deceased was pushed or jumped from the window? Jack and I just left the union hall. We were going out the front door when it happened. What attracted your attention? I heard him scream. When I looked up, Tom was falling. That cop was standing at the window watching him. Did you see the officer push him? Yes, I saw him. Did I understand you to say you were on the street outside the building at the time? Yeah. And you saw the officers push the deceased from the window on the seventh floor from your vantage point? Yeah. Isn't it true that that's a physical impossibility? What is? That you could have seen what you testified to from where you were standing. I know they pushed him. You know or you saw? I know, that's all. Tom wouldn't jump out of a window. Then it's true you didn't see the officers push the deceased out of the window. No, I didn't see him. Is there anything further you'd like to add? They must have pushed him. Any question from the jury? That's all, Garfield. Step down. 
Dorothy River. Raise your right hand. Yes. Do you solemnly swear that the testimony you're about to give to be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth will help you, God? I do. Be seated. State your name. Dorothy River. What is your address? 211 South Beverly Drive. And what is your occupation? I'm a stenographer at the Teamsters Union Hall. Were you present the morning the deceased met his death? I was. State where you were and what you were doing. I was in our office on the seventh floor doing some filing. Please state what you witnessed. The filing cabinet in our office is by the door. The office faces on the hallway and the door happened to be open. I heard a commotion and looked out. I saw those two officers struggling with the man. Did you hear any conversation? Yes. I heard that officer there say, get back here, get back. The man outside the window yelled, let me go, let me go. This officer here, officer side, he said, he's pulling me out, hold on, Ben, grab me. How far from the window were you? I'd say about 15 feet. Do you have anything else to add? Yes. As the two policemen started downstairs, Officer Friday said to me, call an ambulance, there's been an accident. Thank you, Miss River. Those officers didn't push that man out the window. They were trying to hold him. After hearing additional witnesses, the coroner's jury retired at 11.57 a.m. Eight minutes later, they returned with their decision. The deceased met his death voluntarily and by his own actions. The homicide detail continued the investigation of Laval's death. A week went by. With homicide working one side, we hoped that they might turn up additional leads in the hijacking case. Nothing turned up. It seemed that with the death of Thomas Laval, our leads came to an abrupt stop. On Tuesday morning, March 16th at 9 a.m., we got a call from Chief of Detectives Ed Backstrand. Now, once more, what about the whiskey bills on these shipments? You checked them? Everything we could. Talk to everybody and handle them. And talk to them some more. $42,000 in merchandise doesn't just disappear. Now, who's the last one to handle those wage bills? The warehouse shipment, sir. The bills were signed and stamped two hours after he filed them in his desk. They disappeared. What about the truck drivers? You checked them out? Talked to all of them. Nothing so far. Nothing was missing from those shipments until they left the warehouse. Is that right? Yeah. And somewhere in between the warehouse and the delivery points, $42,000 worth of goods disappeared. So he's got to be hijacking those loads. We know that. But how do we get to it? Maybe they're working alone. Maybe they're working with the truck drivers. It's one or the other. It's got to be. We just hadn't lost Laval. Well, you lost him. That doesn't close the case. You got a suggestion? Yeah, I got a suggestion. Crack it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories from official police files. And now, an important announcement. Ladies and gentlemen, we are pleased to announce that starting next Thursday, October 6th, Dragnet will be brought to you by Fatima Cigarettes. We'd like to take this opportunity to thank you, the listener, for your excellent response to our efforts in bringing you these weekly authentic presentations of actual cases from official files. Your letters are the only indications we have that Dragnet is a source of your listening pleasure. We'd like to hear from all of you. Starting next Thursday, October 6th, over most of these same NBC stations, Dragnet will be heard weekly at 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, immediately following the Supper Club. Check your newspaper for local release time. We stayed on the job. Another week went by. No leads. We spent so much time at the general warehouse where the merchandise disappeared that we almost got to be a part of the crew. We got to know everybody. We made frequent visits to the Teamsters Union Hall. It got us nothing. On Wednesday, March 26th, we reported in for work at 8 a.m. Friday, Romero. Yes, Skipper? You fooled around just long enough. They hijacked another load last night. $38,000. What outfit? Same. General Warehouse. Who's your contact down there? Ray Hobart, shipping clerk. Now hop down there right now and get the details. Right, Ed. There are two ways to solve this thing. Yeah? You can get those hijackers now or wait till General Warehouse goes out of business. Get on it. Hobart, who was the shipping clerk on duty last night? I was, uh, working for Siggy, Siegelmeister. He's out of the cold. And you saw the stuff was loaded on in trucks, and you checked the way bill. Yeah, as usual. Everything as usual. Uh, checked the trucks out at 2 a.m., went back to the office, filed the way bills. And you work a pretty heavy schedule, Hobart. You started at 2 a.m., and you're still on duty? Oh, it took the last four hours of Siggy's shift, at 2 a.m. to 6 a.m. He had a cold. I was back here at 10 this morning to start my own shift. When did you find out the way bills were missing on that shipment last night? Oh, uh, just before I went off. Maybe uh, half past five, quarter six. Well, how about the truck drivers who handle that load, Hobart? You got them? Uh, let's see. I got it right here. Okay. Uh, here you go, Sergeant. Uh, 
Jack Morris and Pete Garfield. Jack Morris and Pete Garfield were brought in for questioning. We double-checked with Homicide and found that their reports on Morris and Garfield tallied with ours. No previous records. Both men had been tailed for a reasonable length of time since their testimony at the Laval inquest. Their actions failed to implicate them. Four days after the second hijacking, we got a tip from one of our informants down in the warehouse district. He told us that a man in a gray suit had been hanging around the coffee shop next to the Teamsters Union Hall. He was peddling nylon stockings cheap. There had been other reports like this, which we had followed up, but none of them had paid off. Usually, such leads didn't pay off, but we couldn't be sure. They had to be checked. At a few minutes before five that afternoon, we found the nylon salesman in the gray suit in the back booth of the coffee shop adjoining the Union Hall. Look, man. Take a look. The finest. You can't do better. 51 gauge nylon. Look good, huh? Mm, sure do, don't you, Joe? Yeah, they do. We've been looking for you, Max. Some of the guys in the Union Hall said that you'd be around. Sure, I saw lots of these around the uh, hall. Truck drivers, just like you, buying them like crazy. Good deal. Sure looks like it, man. How many pairs can we have? Many as you want. Four bits a pair, you name it. You got a couple of dozen for us? A couple of dozen? No, not on me, but I can get them. Many as you want. Well, we're kind of in a hurry. Can you get them for us fast? A couple of dozen. Better make it three dozen, huh, Joe? Yeah, if you want. Three dozen. Can you get them now? A couple of hours I can get them. Same quality. Want to meet me here? Oh, I don't know. We wanted them for tonight. My wife's birthday, you know. Well, maybe an hour and a half. How's that? Three dozen, meet you here. Oh, uh, look, Mac, uh, maybe we're both heading in the same direction. Can we go with you and pick up the nylon? Save time for all of it. Uh, no, I don't think so. No. Why can't you wait? Hour and a half? How's that? Never find a better buy. I'm sorry, Mac. I wish we had the time. Well, where do you have to go to pick up these nylons? Oh, way out. Sunset Boulevard near Fairfax. Can't you wait? I'll make it fast. Can't we pay you and then go out and pick them up ourselves? Huh? No. Don't work that way. No. Can't you wait here? I'll make it fast. Well, we ought to be home now, Joe. Yeah, I'm sorry, mister. We'll have to skip it. Yeah, maybe we can pick up something on the way home, Ben. Candy or something. Wife likes candy. Now, uh, look, fellas, I I don't want to see you lose out on this deal. I'll meet you halfway. How do you mean? Uh, look, together we'll go out to Sunset and Fairfax, huh? Near the place. You wait there at the hamburger stand. And in five minutes, I'll bring you the stuff, Okay. Oh, I don't know. We're late already, but... All right, it's a deal. I'll call the wife and tell her we're going to be a little later. Three dozen, is that right? Three dozen are the best. You can't do better. All right, I'll be back in just a minute. Two, five, three. Two, five, two, three. Office, Chandler. Mike, Joe Friday, Backstrand there? All right now, Joe. Well, then do me a favor, Chandler. Make it fast. Get a couple of men out to Sunset and Fairfax as fast as you can. Tell them to watch for Ben and me. You got that? Yeah, what else? We'll drive up in our car with another man. Ben and I will get out of the car and go in the hamburger stand. The other man will walk off. Whoever you get, tell him to follow that man. You got it? Right. All right. Just tail him. See where he goes, see what he does. Okay, Joe, right away. All set, Joe? She got dinner ready? Yeah, just about. We better hustle. Sure. Best deal in the world. Let's go. At five minutes to six, we pulled up at the corner of Sunset Boulevard in Fairfax. It was almost dark. Ben and I got out of the car and started over for the hamburger stand on the corner. We caught a glimpse of Barcy and Kaplan in one of our detective cars parked in the gas station on the opposite corner. They had their eyes on our man. When the traffic signals changed, the man crossed the street and headed down Fairfax. Barcy and Kaplan waited a minute, and then they took off after him. He turned at the next corner and disappeared from sight. Ben and I ordered a cup of coffee, and we sat down to wait. At half past six, we were still waiting. At five minutes to seven, I went across the street to the drugstore and called the office. Barcy and Kaplan hadn't been heard from. Their car, 105K, was not acknowledging calls. I had my call switch from communications to Backstrand's office. Well, they lost him, Friday. I don't know how they lost him, but they lost him. Well, who's out there now? Sullivan and Whitney took a detail out there. They're combing the neighborhood right now. Well, how did it happen? A man just doesn't disappear into thin air. That's what I keep telling you about that stuff that's been hijacked. <laughs> The search for the nylon salesman went on all that night and most of the next day. From his description, we ran a make on him. No previous record. He had disappeared completely. We were right back where we'd started from. The only thing we could do was to start backtracking, re-questioning the people at General Warehouse, the truck drivers, the shipping clerks. We kept a close check on Garfield and Morris, and, and we went back to the only possible lead still remaining, Mrs. Laval. She could tell us nothing more than we already knew. When we left her, we started on the neighbors for the second time around. For the rest of the day, we canvassed the immediate neighborhood. We got as many opinions of the Lavals as they had neighbors. At 3.30 that afternoon, we visited with Miss Gertrude Langster, a 50-year-old maiden lady who lived almost directly across the street from the Laval house. She 
been out of town the first time we covered the neighborhood. The old saying goes, Sergeant, there's no fool like an old fool. Oh, say, if I told you the chances I had when I was a girl... Yeah, but we just... Not truck drivers like that. Laval man, God rest his soul. But fine, wealthy men, that's just lawyers... Templeton Grant, you remember him? No, ma'am. I was engaged to him once. Butterfly waist. That's what he used to call me. Well, Miss... well, I was slim in those days. Would you like to see some pictures of me as a girl? No, no, thank you, ma'am. We'd just like to ask you a few questions, that's all. Could you tell us if the Lavals had many visitors to their house in the past six months or so? Oh, my no funny thing. I am the nosy type, Sergeant. I like to know everything that goes on around my neighborhood. And you can take my word for it, the Lavals never had visitors. You know, Sergeant Friday, you remind me of a young man I used to be engaged to just a few years ago. He yes, Miss so... Langston. Now, would you tell us, please, uh, did you have any reason to think that there was something a little out of the ordinary about the Laval? Oh, little out of the ordinary, he says, but my dear man, yes. Here he was, a truck driver, and there she was with a home furnished like the Astors. Well, I even used to see him cart some of the things home in that car. He has beautiful things, rugs and glassware, bolts of fabric. Oh, gorgeous. And he'd bring these things home after work. Is that it, Miss Lynch? Oh, any time, any time. Day or night, weekends, any time. Mm-hmm. After four, Joe, we better call office. Yeah. Now, are you sure of all that you've told us, Miss Langston? Sure. Oh, my dear man, of course I'm sure. I watched him week after week. Well, thank well, you. Uh, won't you stay for a cup of tea? I'll have Josephine fix it. Josephine? Uh, no, thank you, ma'am. Well, then, uh, perhaps a glass of sherry? Thank you, no. But there is something. Yes? I wonder if we could use your phone, please. Oh, uh, Yes. In the hall, next to the umbrella stand. Thank you, ma'am. City Hall. 2523. 2523. Baxter, Ed. Right, Ed. Nothing much here. Well, there's something here. The Barcy and Kaplan just called. Pete Garfield left his house half an hour ago. Then he picked up Morris. What's so unusual about that? Nothing except the guy driving the car is the little man in the gray suit. The nylon salesman. Barcy and Kaplan are tailing them. Where are they now? Headed north out Riverside Drive. There's nothing out there but a golf course and a lot of riding stables. I don't care what they do for recreation. Go get them. With red light and siren, it took us 12 minutes to pick up Barcy and Kaplan on Riverside Drive. At 4.23 p.m., we pulled up in front of the Blue Pony riding stables. Barcy and Kaplan's car was overturned just beyond the driveway leading up to the riding academy. Kaplan's hurt. I called an ambulance. They rammed us. What kind of a car are they in? They switched. They're driving a 12-ton bulldog semi. Which way they head? Going north. Got a three-minute lead on you. Pneumatic commercial. Adam 653. Let's go, Ben. Can you see him, Joe? No, not yet. Watch that crossing. Up ahead, Joe. That's the semi. Can you read it? Wait a minute. Adam 653. That's them. Took a ride on Lancashire. Don't lose them. They're pushing that semi too hard. Look at that trailer sway. They'll have to stay on Lancashire. They're going too fast to turn now. Traffic's closing in up ahead of them. They better not turn. That's what they're doing. Look at that trailer whip. They're going over. Into that start front. Come on, Ben. All right. Wait a minute. Let me see. Yeah, they're banged up, but they're alive. Well, there they are, Joe. Yeah. Garfield, Morris, little man in the gray suit. It's funny, isn't it? What's that? Garfield's going to swear we pushed that truck through that window. The story you have just heard is true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. Peter Garfield, Jack Morris, and John Dolfo, the stocking salesman, were hospitalized and later brought to trial. They were convicted on charges of grand theft and received sentences as prescribed by law. They are now serving their terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard the 18th in a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to motorcycle officer Elmer Forsman of the Fresno, California Police Department, who on the afternoon of October 6, 1946, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Remember, starting next Thursday night, October 6th, Fatima Cigarettes invite you to listen to Dragnet immediately following the Supper Club. That's 10.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time over most of these same NBC stations. Check your newspaper for local release time. Dragnet came to you from Los Angeles. Judy Canova joins the star lineup of Saturday shows tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed 
to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A vicious killer has taken the life of a 62-year-old woman. Suspicion points in only one direction. The murderer was heartless, cold-blooded. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 5th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 3.35 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Long distance. This is Friday in Homicide. I'd like to place a call to Mr. Frank Renard in Murphy, Idaho, number 761. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, 761. Yeah, that's right. The call's been cleared with the business office. All right. Uh, Do you want me to call you back, Sergeant? No, I'll hang on. Okay, I'll place it for you. Long distance, Mr. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, Murphy, Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. I've got an urgent message for you. For me? Well, what's the matter? Your wife, Dolores, asked me to call you. Something's happened to your mother. What do you mean? What's happened? I better let your wife tell you. She wants you back in Los Angeles right away. Look, what's this all about? I can't leave my job now. You better come. Your mother's been murdered. Talk to the skipper, Joe. He's on his way in. That's good. Did you call my husband? Did you? He's flying down from Idaho tonight. Be here in the morning. You tell him about me? The trouble I'm in? I told him his mother was murdered. That's all I told him, Mrs. Renard. What am I going to say to Frank? He always sided in with his mother. He'll never believe me. What can I tell him? Jury can give you more trouble than your husband can. What you going to tell them? Are you stupid or something? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. It's a small room, Mrs. Renard. We can hear you. Sit down, please. I won't sit down. You're not pinning this on me because I didn't do it. Anybody could have killed the old hag, but I didn't. Will you sit down, please? I don't have to take this. I'm no tramp. 
keeping me in here asking me questions. I told you all I know. Look, you're in a bad spot. I hope you realize that. I didn't kill him. Ms. Renard, how long have you and your mother-in-law been living together in the house on Chavez Road? Since Frank took the job up in Idaho. About six months. He said it'd be better for me while he was away living with her. And the neighbors told us you didn't get along very well with your mother-in-law. That's right, I didn't. She hated me, I hated her. You used to fight with her, is that right? You hit her. Only a couple of times. She called me dirty names. I hit her. She pulled me by the hair. And I hated her like everything. And I didn't kill her. Once more, Ms. Renard, would you mind telling us how you spent your time since early this morning, where you went, what you did, everything? I told you already everything. Could you tell us again, please? I got up about quarter to nine. I had a cup of coffee and then I got dressed. The old lady was on the back porch doing the washing. What did your mother-in-law do for a living? I told you. She took in washing. After I got dressed, I left the house. About ten minutes after nine, I went downtown to the dentist. He filled a tooth for me. This one here, you can ask him. What time did you leave the dentist's office? About quarter after ten. Maybe twenty after. You can ask him. What'd you do after that? I walked around window shopping. Did you buy anything? Talk to anybody? I told you no. What time did you get home? Half past twelve. I went in the bedroom. The old lady was on the floor. Blood all over. I felt her heart. It wasn't beating. Is that when you got the blood in your dress? Yeah. Now that's all I'm going to say. Three times I told you the same story already. And you still can't account for your time between 10.20 this morning, the time you found the body, and called the police at 12.30. I told you. I left the dentist. I went window shopping. Then I walked home. And during that time, you didn't talk to anyone, and no one saw you. Lots of people saw me. People on the street downtown. I'm no tramp. I don't talk to everybody. None of your neighbors saw you come home, Ms. Renard? Of course they didn't see me. I cut across the back lot up from San Jose Avenue. I came in the back way. The lady who lives next door to you. She says she was in the backyard about noontime. She stayed there till after 1 o'clock. She didn't see you come in the back way. Then she's a liar. She's a dirty Life. You and your husband took out an insurance policy on your mother-in-law last year. Is that right, Ms. Renard? Sure it is. What of it? Five thousand dollars? Yes, for what? You know a man by the name of George Martino? No. You better tell the truth, Ms. Renard. All right, so I do. He's a friend of mine. You've been running around with him since your husband's been away. None of your business. I do what I want. Your mother-in-law found out about Martino. That's what you fought about most of the time. Oh, she was crazy. He's a friend of mine, that's all. Are you telling the truth, Ms. Renard? Martino's a boyfriend of mine. I told you, that's all. Your mother-in-law found out you were running around with him. She warned you if you didn't shake Martino, she'd write your husband. You said you'd kill her if she did. That's a lie. That's what your mother-in-law told one of the neighbor ladies. I said it just to scare her. One night I was drinking. We had a fight. She was yapping at me all night. I said it just to scare her. But she wrote the letter anyway. And that's what she said. But I didn't kill her. You had the time, the motive, and the opportunity. It wasn't me. I didn't kill her. Interrogation room, Friday. This is Brennan, Joe. Yeah, Bill. Where are you? Santa Monica. Picked up George Martino. Ben and I drove Mrs. Renard to Lincoln Heights Jail, fifth floor, and had her booked on suspicion of 187 PC. When we checked back in at the office, Brennan and Wiseman, the other two men on the case with Ben and I, were questioning George Martino in the interrogation room. Ben and I stood by. Martino admitted only two things. He had been running around with Mrs. Renard since her husband left town, and he had heard Mrs. Renard express a desire to do away with her mother-in-law. After the questioning of Martino, Sergeant Brennan, Ben and I met with Chief Ed Baxter. It was 5.15 p.m. You got everything but the murder weapon, huh? That and Mrs. Renard's confession. She ought to come through, huh, Joe? I don't know. She's scared, but she's still got a smart mouth. What about Martino, Brennan? You think he had a hand in it? I don't think so. We spent most of the afternoon talking to him. He hasn't got the guts. We took a statement. And does he have an alibi? Solid. What was the cause of death? Strangulation, multiple fractures of the skull. All motives are with Mrs. Renard, Chief. Pretty clear-cut job. No evidence of robbery or burglary, I guess. A couple of dresser drawers in her bedroom were emptied on the floor and clothes tossed all around. Pretty obvious plan to make it look like burglary. Maybe. We found three one-dollar bills in plain sight. They were on the floor near the body. If a burglar went through the stuff, he wouldn't have missed that money. And uh, it shouldn't be too much trouble tying it up. Shouldn't be, Skipper. And Friday and Romero, you follow the case through. Just a minute. Hello. Backstrand. Yeah? What? All right, I'll send him over. Lee Jones. Just finished checking the evidence at the crime lab. Yeah? He thinks Mrs. Renard's innocent. (laughs) 
There they are, fellas. Facts don't lie. But she had every reason in the world to kill old Lee. In my book, she couldn't have killed her. All right, let's have it, Lee. How does the evidence add up? It's just it, Joe. It doesn't. Let's take a look. The dress Mrs. Renard was wearing when she found the body. That's it. Blood smears near the hem. Two smears, that's all. Now, if she murdered her mother-in-law, there should be more blood on this dress. It shouldn't be smeared. I mean? First of all, the manner in which the old lady was killed. Head was battered in. Must have bled profusely. No question about that. All right, go ahead. Whoever murdered the old lady must have stains all over their clothes. Here's the important part. Because of the nature of the wound, it would have stained in drops, not smears. Well, how can you tell the difference? Maybe these are drop stains on her desk. They're not. I checked them with a the microscope. Only the higher ribs of the cloth are stained. The smears, nothing else. But a drop forms its own definite drop pattern and permeates the cloth, soaks in. Uh -huh. No signs of that on her dress. Not a one. Now, here's the silk scarf the old lady was strangled with. Yeah. Here's what I found in the knot tied in the scarf. A blonde hair, wavy. Old lady had dark hair. So does Miss Renard. So does her boyfriend. That's what I mean. This blonde hair is one of two things that didn't belong at that murder scene. What else you got? This hair. Where is it, Lee? Small piece of plastic. A gun butt, I'd say. See here? Uh -huh. Fish cross surface and a little smooth area. Yeah. The killer could have hit the old lady with the butt of a gun. And a piece of the stock could have chipped off like this, huh? Miss Renard doesn't own a gun. He did her mother in law. Where does that leave us? I don't know, Joe. There's the stuff. You can't disregard it. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. How? Well, first prove this dress isn't the one Mrs. Renard was wearing this morning. Then find the dress she did wear. We know she wore this one. The dentist identified it, and so did two of the neighbors. That's what I mean. The dress is too clean. Doesn't belong. Yeah. This blonde hair, this piece of gun butt, they don't belong either. When well, you think she's innocent. You're looking at the evidence. What do you think? 6 p.m. Saturday, November 5th. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Brennan, Wiseman, and Ed Backstrand. The open and shut case against Mrs. Renard was up in the air, but we still weren't sure that she was innocent of the murder of her mother-in-law. Ben and I drove to the Lincoln Heights jail and interviewed the suspect again. She agreed to submit to a lie detector test. We drove back to the office, contacted Sergeant Berger, the department's polygraph man, and set up a special test for the following day. The next morning, we met with Berger and formulated a list of key questions, and then we picked up Mrs. Renard and brought her to the third floor of the old city jail building, the polygraph room. At 10.33 a.m., the test got underway. As usual, Sergeant Berger conducted the interview alone. Backstrand, Ben, and I waited outside. Well, um, how about Mrs. Renard's husband? Getting down yet? He's doing around noon, Skipper. Um, hey, got a smoke? Yeah. Hey, yeah, thanks. What time is it now? 11.25. Mm, here's Berger now. Huh? That's it, Ed. Now, what'd you get? I can study the chart a little more. The results are pretty well defined, though. How's it look? No reaction to the key questions. What's your opinion? I don't think she did it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And in leading magazines this week, you'll see this authentic story. Headline. Fatima's sensational growth sets a record for long cigarettes. Then you'll read the actual reasons smokers give for changing to Fatima. Fatima is different. It's mild and has a wonderful flavor. Fatima's best. These are the words of Miss Pamela Bookman of New York, where Fatima has increased its smokers 132%. Fatima tastes much better than any other long cigarette. It's the best. Says Mr. James S. Winterhalter of Detroit, where Fatima smokers have increased... 348%. I like the flavor, and Fatima is mild. It's the best long cigarette. That's the statement of Mrs. Mary C. Werdeman of Los Angeles, where Fatima has increased its smokers 545%. Yes, more and more long cigarette smokers every day agree. A change to Fatima is a change to the best. Enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of long cigarettes. 8 a.m., Monday, November 7th. Mrs. Renard was released from custody. We questioned her husband, Frank Renard, briefly. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. Brennan and Wiseman were called back on the case, and together the four of us started over again from the beginning. We had a dead body, two pieces of physical evidence to work with, no idea how to fit them together, and no suspects. We went back to the Chavez Road neighborhood where the murdered woman lived and started pushing doorbells. We canvassed the neighborhood for three days, and we uncovered one slim lead. He was selling magazines, officer. Went door to door, right up the street here. Young fellow. Could you describe the main force, please? Nothing to talk about. Pasty face, pimply complexion, blonde hair. 5.30 p.m. Wednesday, November the 9th. Ben and I met with Brennan and Wiseman in Ed Backstrand's office to compare notes. Together, we had more than a dozen reports of the magazine salesman's presence in the neighborhood just prior to the murder of Mrs. Renard's mother-in-law. 
The various descriptions of the man which we obtained from the people in the neighborhood tallied closely. About six feet, 170 pounds, pimply complexion, blonde hair, fast talker. About 25 years old. As far as we know, Skipper, he was the only stranger in the neighborhood last Saturday morning. Only one that people remember, anyway. How close did you trace him to the Renard house? You got your list there, Brennan. Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Let's see. Well, he picked up his trash down on Floresta Street, sold a couple of descriptions there, then he headed up Landers Avenue onto Chavez Road. Yeah. The Renards live at 2280 Chavez Road. That salesman talked to the woman at 2274 Chavez. That's three doors away from the Renards. Uh, when was he seen there? Oh, let me see. Where is that, Brennan? Oh, on the 15-7 sheet, Joe. Didn't have enough room on the report. Oh. Yeah, here it is. This is John Rico, 2274 Chavez. The guy was there about 1145 Saturday morning. Yeah, that puts him in the running. First time he ever showed in that neighborhood? First time, Skipper. Fresh kid, not a very good salesman. Here's the name of the company he's working for, the Harrison News Distributors. You check with them? Well, they're closed for the night. We'll call them the first thing tomorrow. Good. Here's something else for you. I had a call from Frank Renard this afternoon. What he had to say? Seems in the excitement just after the murder, Mrs. Renard overlooked a couple of things. What's that? Well, they're missing a yellow table model radio. radio. It was in the bedroom where the old lady was killed. Huh? Well, that ties in with a robbery motive. And they're missing a ring, too. Belonged to Mrs. Renard. Topaz ring. Supposed to be worth a little money. But she didn't notice it was gone until today. That's right. You got the serial number on the radio? Yeah, right here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, Ben, here we are. Emerson model 511-180,000-277609. A lot of small radios in town. There's only one with that serial number on it. Track it down. A complete description of the topaz ring and the serial numbers and description of the yellow table model radio were sent to the pawn shop detail. The information was then placed on the stolen property list and relayed to every pawn shop operator in the city. The next morning, Ben and I interviewed the manager of the Harrison News Distributing Company. There, the suspect had given his name as Sam Bricker. We checked out his home address. It turned out to be a gas station in North Hollywood. We took the suspect's job application blank with a specimen of his handwriting, and then we drove back to the office. Sam Bricker. We were unable to get a make on the name from the record bureau. We checked the cards and every known criminal who was cataloged in the oddity file as having a pimply complexion. None of them matched. That night, we got out an APB and a radiogram. The suspect's trail led from one salesman's job to the next. On his last job, he gave his name as Albert Berry. His address is 1430 Palo Alto Drive. That was in the Echo Lake District. And then I drove out to check it. 1428. 1430. There it is, Joe. Yeah. At least it's not a gas station, huh? Come on. Tiresome, huh? Yeah, I could stand a change. Yes, what is it? We're looking for an Albert Berry, ma'am. Does he live here? Mr. Berry, I'm sorry. He and his wife moved four days ago. We identified ourselves as police officers and had the landlady, a Mrs. Catherine Hoffman, show us the apartment which Barry and his wife had occupied. It was still vacant. In one of the closets in the apartment, we found a cheap overnight bag. The lock on it was broken and one of the seams had ripped. I forgot about that old bag and Mr. Berry told me I could throw it away. Take a look. I'm in. Uh. How long has Barry been married? Do you know, Mrs. Hoffman? No, I don't. But the way they acted, lovey-dovey all the time, I don't think they've been together long. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look, some kind of an identification tag. Yeah, let me see. Put it up here. It's a tool disc, it looks like. Then. Jameson Larrabee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You're not after Mr. Barry, are you, officer? Yes, yes. ma'am, we are. Did he leave a forwarding address? I wish he did. I'm holding three letters for Mrs. Barry in my apartment right now. May we see them, please? Certainly. Would you step this way, please? My apartment's just across the hall. Yes, ma'am. Would you like a bottle of beer or something? No, ma'am, thanks. Let's see. I thought I put... Yes, here they are. Three of them, Sergeant. From her folks, I think. Mrs. Berry's from Fresno. Oh, that's good. You want to copy down this return address, ma'am? Uh, yeah, I'll go ahead. Okay. That's C.K. Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-K. Mm. 525 North Lamona, Fresno. Yeah, go ahead. There you are, Miss Hoffman. By the way, did the Berry say they'd call for their mail? Mrs. Berry did. That's why I'm holding on to it. All right. Just one more question. Do you remember if Mr. and Mrs. Berry had a radio? Yes, they did. A small one. Do you remember what brand it was? No, I don't. It had a yellow case. That's all I remember. Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand, and he had an immediate stakeout placed at the apartment house in case the Berries returned to pick up their mail. Ben and I went back to the office and placed a call to the Pittsburgh Police Department. We gave them the description and the number of the tool disc which we'd found in Barry's old suitcase. They said they'd check with the Jameson Larrabee Company in the morning and then they'd call us back. That night, Ben and I drove to Fresno and checked in at the police station up there. Two officers were assigned to stake out the Ulrich home. We interviewed Mr. Ulrich, who identified himself as Albert Barry's father-in-law. He told us his daughter had married the murder suspect eight months before and he gave us pictures of Barry taken at the wedding. 
Ulrich told us that he'd catch a Santa Fe train out of Fresno the next morning. He wanted to be in Los Angeles to take his daughter home when Barry was apprehended. It was almost 2 a.m. when Ben and I left Fresno and started back for Los Angeles. We checked in at the office at 10 minutes past 8 the next morning. At 8.35, the call came through from the Pittsburgh Police Department. What did they say, Joe? It was a tool disc, all right. Jameson Larrabee Company, issued 18 months ago to one of their workers. Can I give a name? Albert Barry. 11 a.m., Monday, December the 5th. One month to the day since the 62-year-old woman had been beaten to death. The pictures of Barry and his wife, which had been taken at their wedding, were printed up in wholesale lots and distributed to all points. Mr. Ulrich, Barry's father-in-law, arrived in town and got himself a hotel room. We waited. There was no report from the stakeout at the apartment house. We checked back in at the office at five minutes to one. I get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Ulrich, Sergeant. I just got a call from my wife in Fresno. I thought you'd want to know. What's that? The wife got a letter from Norma. They're living in South Pasadena, an apartment. You got the address there? Yes, sir. That's what the wife called about. It's 134 Norway Terrace. When was the letter mailed, do you know? Wife said it was postmarked December 3rd, day before yesterday. Get your coat on, Ulrich. We'll be right over. Ben and I picked up Mr. Ulrich at his hotel and drove to the South Pasadena address. Barry and his wife had the apartment on the top floor. Neither of them were at home. The landlord let us in with a pass key. In the bedroom, we found a small yellow radio. We checked the serial numbers. They matched. It was the same radio stolen from the Renard house. In the bedroom closet, we found two suitcases. We checked through them. Mm, nothing in this one, Joe. Here we are. Look at these. What are they, Sergeant? They're plastic gun butts. Let's see, Joe. One of them's been chipped, see? Sergeant, hmm? somebody coming up the stairs. All right, let's get in the living room. Be quiet. Men, what are you doing here? Who are these men? Police, Norma. They want Albert. He killed a woman. It's all right, Norma. It'll be all right. Did you know your husband killed a woman, Miss Barry? He just told me last Saturday. We've been running away for a month now. Moving all the time. I wanted to know why. So he told me. He said I was in it as much as you, but... And I'm tired of running. <laughs> Why did he kill her? Did he tell you that? He said it broke in the house. He didn't know anyone was home. The old woman was in the bedroom. She started to cry out. He had a gun. He hit her with it. Where's your husband now? I don't know. He said he'd come home for dinner. About five. About the groceries. What time you got, Ben? Uh, half past three. Um, that ring you're wearing, Miss Barry. Doesn't give you that? Yes, why? What kind of a stone is that? Topaz. Britt gave it to me. Why? Nothing. We'll wait. Five o'clock came and went. Barry failed to show. Five thirty. Ulrich started to get nervous. Six o'clock. Six thirty. No sign of Barry. I went to the window and kept an eye on the street below. 6.45, a light green Nash sedan pulled to a stop in front of the apartment house. A man got out and went into the main floor entrance. Bert, I'll let him in. All right. How long have you had the new car? A couple of days. Bert got it credit. What do you want me to do now? Does he have a key to the apartment here? He locked it. Okay, when he rings, let him in. Just act natural. Ben? Yeah, yeah. You cover me. I'll get the cuffs on him. Right. <laughs> Hi, Bert. Look out, Joe! All right, drop it, Barry. Okay, Ben. Yeah, he's fast with a gun. Nice looking, isn't he, Sergeant? You'd never think he'd kill anybody. Come on, let's take him in. I love him. I still love him. <laughs> but you're a cop, you wouldn't understand. That's right, I wouldn't understand. I'm a cop. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 16th, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. 
Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three. To millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Albert Ralph Berry was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His wife, Norma Berry, was found innocent of the charge that she harbored a criminal. She was returned home with her father. Berry was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Hubert W. Estes of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, who on the night of May 16, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A vicious killer has taken the life of a 62-year-old woman. Suspicion points in only one direction. The murderer was heartless, cold-blooded. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the Turkish symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, November 5th. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 3.35 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. This is Friday in Homicide. I'd like to place a call to Mr. Frank Renard in Murphy, Idaho, number 761. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, 761. Yeah, that's right. The call's been cleared with the business office. All right. Uh, you want me to call you back, Sergeant? No, I'll hang on. Okay, I'll place it for you. Long distance, Mr. Frank Renard, Murphy, Idaho, Murphy, 761. Charge the call to Madison, 
Sergeant Friday, Los Angeles Police Department. I've got an urgent message for you. For me? Well, what's the matter? Well, your wife, Dolores, asked me to call you. Something's happened to your mother. What do you mean? What's happened? I better let your wife tell you. She wants you back in Los Angeles right away. But what's this all about? I can't leave my job now. You better come. Your mother's been murdered. <laughs> Talk to the skipper, Joe. He's on his way in. That's good. Did you call my husband? Did you? He's flying down from Idaho tonight. Be here in the morning. You tell him about me? The trouble I'm in? I told him his mother was murdered. That's all I told him, Mrs. Renard. What am I going to say to Frank? He always sided in with his mother. He'll never believe me. What can I tell him? Jury can give you more trouble than your husband can. What you going to tell him? Are you stupid or something? How many times do I have to say it? I didn't kill her. I didn't kill her. It's a small room, Mrs. Renard. We can hear you. Sit down, please. I won't sit down. You're not pinning this on me because I didn't do it. Anybody could have killed the old hag, but I didn't. Will you sit down, please? I don't have to take this. I'm no tramp. Keeping me in here, asking me questions. I told you all I know. Look, you're in a bad spot. I hope you realize that. I didn't kill her. Ms. Renard, how long have you and your mother-in-law been living together in the house on Chavez Road? Since Frank took the job up in Idaho. About six months. He said it'd be better for me while he was away living with her. Your neighbors told us you didn't get along very well with your mother-in-law. That's right, I didn't. She hated me, I hated her. You used to fight with her, is that right? You hit her. Only a couple of times. She called me dirty names. I hit her. She pulled me by the hair. And I hated her like everything. And I didn't kill her. Once more, Ms. Renard, would you mind telling us how you spent your time since early this morning, where you went, what you did, everything? I told you already everything. Will you tell us again, please? I got up about quarter to nine. I had a cup of coffee and then I got dressed. The old lady was on the back porch doing the washing. What did your mother-in-law do for a living? I told you. She took in washing. After I got dressed, I left the house. About ten minutes after nine, I went downtown to the dentist. He filled a tooth for me. This one here, you can ask him. What time did you leave the dentist's office? About quarter after ten. Maybe twenty after. You can ask him. What'd you do after that? I walked around window shopping. Did you buy anything? Talk to anybody? I told you no. What time did you get home? Half past twelve. I went in the bedroom. The old lady was on the floor. Blood all over. I felt her heart. It wasn't beating. Is that when you got the blood on your dress? Yeah. Now that's all I'm going to say. Three times I told you the same story already. And you still can't account for your time between 10.20 this morning, the time you found the body and called the police at 12.30. I told you. I left the dentist. I went window shopping. Then I walked home. And during that time, you didn't talk to anyone and no one saw you. Lots of people saw me. People on the street downtown. I'm no tramp. I don't talk to everybody. None of your neighbors saw you come home, Ms. Renard? Of course they didn't see me. I cut across the back lot up from San Jose Avenue. I came in the back way. The lady who lives next door to you. She says she was in the backyard about noontime. She stayed there till after 1 o'clock. She didn't see you come in the back way. Then she's a liar. She's a dirty life. You and your husband took out an insurance policy on your mother-in-law last year. Is that right, Ms. Renard? Sure it is. What of it? Five thousand dollars? Yes, for what? Do you know a man by the name of George Martino? No. You better tell the truth, Ms. Renard. All right, so I do. He's a friend of mine. You've been running around with him since your husband's been away. None of your business. I do what I want. Your mother-in-law found out about Martino. That's what you fought about most of the time. Oh, she was crazy. He's a friend of mine, that's all. Are you telling the truth, Ms. Renard? Martino's a boyfriend of mine. I told you, that's all. Your mother-in-law found out you were running around with him. She warned you if you didn't shake Martino, she'd write your husband. You said you'd kill her if she did. That's a lie. That's what your mother-in-law told one of the neighbor ladies. I said it just to scare her. One night I was drinking. We had a fight. She was yapping at me all night. I said it just to scare her. But she wrote the letter anyway. And that's what she said. But I didn't kill her. You had the time, the motive, and the opportunity. It wasn't me. I didn't kill her. Interrogation room, Friday. This is Brennan, Joe. Yeah, Bill. Where are you? Santa Monica. Picked up George Martino. Mm -hmm. 
Ben and I drove Mrs. Renard to Lincoln Heights Jail, fifth floor, and had her booked on suspicion of 187 PC. When we checked back in at the office, Brennan and Wiseman, the other two men on the case with Ben and I, were questioning George Martino in the interrogation room. Ben and I stood by. Martino admitted only two things. He had been running around with Mrs. Renard since her husband left town, and he had heard Mrs. Renard express a desire to do away with her mother-in-law. After the questioning of Martino, Sergeant Brennan, Ben and I met with Chief Ed Backstrand. It was 5.15 p.m. You got everything but the murder weapon, huh? That and Mrs. Renard's confession. She ought to come through, huh, Joe? I don't know. She's scared, but she's still got a smart mouth. What about Martino, Brennan? You think he had a hand in it? I don't think so. We spent most of the afternoon talking to him. He hasn't got the guts. We took a statement. Mm, does he have an alibi? Solid. What was the cause of death? Strangulation, multiple fractures of the skull. All motives are with Mrs. Renard, Chief. Pretty clear-cut job. No evidence of robbery or burglary, I guess. A couple of dresser drawers in the bedroom were emptied on the floor and clothes tossed all around. Pretty obvious plan to make it look like burglary. Maybe. We found three $1 bills in plain sight. They were on the floor near the body. If a burglar went through the stuff, he wouldn't have missed that money. And uh, it shouldn't be too much trouble tying it up. Shouldn't be, Skipper. Uh, Friday and Romero, you follow the case through. Oh, just a minute. Hello. Backstrand. Yeah? What? All right, I'll send him over. Lee Jones. Just finished checking the evidence at the crime lab. Yeah. He thinks Mrs. Renard's innocent. There they are, fellas. Facts don't lie. But she had every reason in the world to kill the old lady. In my book, she couldn't have killed her. All right, let's have it, Lee. How does the evidence add up? That's just it, Joe. It doesn't. Take a look. Right. The dress Mrs. Renard was wearing when she found the body. That's it. Blood smears near the hem. Two smears, that's all. Now, if she murdered her mother-in-law, there should be more blood on this dress. It shouldn't be smeared. I mean? First of all, the manner in which the old lady was killed. Head was battered in. Must have bled profusely. No question about that. All right, go ahead. Whoever murdered the old lady must have stains all over their clothes. Here's the important part. Because of the nature of the wound, it would have stained in drops, not smears. Well, how can you tell the difference? Maybe these are drop stains on her desk. They're not. I checked them with a the microscope. Only the higher ribs of the cloth are stained. The smears, nothing else. But a drop forms its own definite drop pattern and permeates the cloth, soaks in. Mm -hmm. No signs of that on her dress. I don't want it. Now, here's the silk scarf the old lady was strangled with. Yeah. Here's what I found in the knot tied in the scarf. A blonde hair, wavy. Old lady had dark hair. So does Miss Renard. So does her boyfriend. That's what I mean. This blonde hair is one of two things that didn't belong at that murder scene. What else you got? This hair. What is it, Lee? Small piece of plastic. A gun butt, I'd say. See here? Mm -hmm. Crisscross surface and a little smooth area. Yeah. The killer could have hit the old lady with the butt of a gun. And a piece of the stock could have chipped off like this, huh? Miss Renard doesn't own a gun. Neither did her mother know. Well, where does that leave us? I don't know, Joe. There's a stuff. You can't disregard it. Maybe you can explain it. Yeah. How? Well, first prove this dress isn't the one Mrs. Renard was wearing this morning. Then find the dress she did wear. We know she wore this when the dentist identified it, and so did two of the neighbors. That's what I mean. The dress is too clean, doesn't belong. Yeah. And this blonde hair, this piece of gun butt, they don't belong either. Well, then you think she's innocent. You're looking at the evidence. What do you think? 6 p.m., Saturday, November 5th. Ben and I went back to the office and met with Brennan, Wiseman, and Ed Backstrand. The open and shut case against Mrs. Renard was up in the air but we still weren't sure that she was innocent of the murder of her mother-in-law. Ben and I drove to the Lincoln Heights jail and interviewed the suspect again. She agreed to submit to a lie detector test. We drove back to the office, contacted Sergeant Berger, the department's polygraph man, and set up a special test for the following day. The next morning, we met with Berger and formulated a list of key questions, and then we picked up Mrs. Renard and brought her to the third floor of the old city jail building, the polygraph room. At 10.33 a.m., the test got underway. As usual, Sergeant Berger conducted the interview alone. Backstrand, Ben, and I waited outside. Well, um, how about Mrs. Renard's husband? Getting down yet? He's due in around noon, Skipper. Uh, mm, got a smoke? Yeah. Here you are, Ben. Yeah, thanks. Time's it now? 11.25. Mm, here's Berger now. Huh? That's it, Ed. Well, what'd you get? I can study the chart a little more. The results are pretty well defined, though. How's it look? No reaction to the key questions. What's your opinion? I don't think she did it. You are listening to Dragnet, authentic stories of your police force in action. And in leading magazines this week, you'll see this authentic story. Headline. Fatima's sensational growth sets a record for long cigarettes. Then you'll read the actual reasons smokers give for changing to Fatima. Fatima is different. It's mild and has a wonderful flavor. Fatima's best. These are the words of Miss Pamela Bookman of New York, where Fatima has increased its smokers 132%. Fatima tastes much better than any other long cigarette. 
It's the best, says Mr. James S. Winterhalter of Detroit, where Fatima smokers have increased 348%. I like the flavor, and Fatima is mild. It's the best long cigarette. That's the statement of Mrs. Mary C. Werdeman of Los Angeles, where Fatima has increased its smokers 545%. Yes, more and more long cigarette smokers every day agree. A change to Fatima is a change to the best. Enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of long cigarettes. 8 a.m., Monday, November 7th. Mrs. Renard was released from custody. We questioned her husband, Frank Renard, briefly. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. Brennan and Wiseman were called back on the case, and together the four of us started over again from the beginning. We had a dead body, two pieces of physical evidence to work with, no idea how to fit them together, and no suspects. We went back to the Chavez Road neighborhood where the murdered woman lived and started pushing doorbells. We canvassed the neighborhood for three days, and we uncovered one slim lead. She was selling magazines, officer. Went door to door, right up the street here. Young fellow. Could you describe the man for us, please? Nothing to talk about. Pasty face, pimply complexion, blonde hair. 5.30 p.m. Wednesday, November the 9th. Ben and I met with Brennan and Wiseman and Ed Backstrand's office to compare notes. Together, we had more than a dozen reports of the magazine salesman's presence in the neighborhood just prior to the murder of Mrs. Renard's mother-in-law. The various descriptions of the man which we obtained from the people in the neighborhood tallied closely. About six feet, 170 pounds, pimply complexion, blonde hair, fast talking. About 25 years old. As far as we know, Skipper, he was the only stranger in the neighborhood last Saturday morning. Only one that people remember anyway. How close did you trace him to the Renard house? You got your list there, Brennan? Yeah. There you are. Thanks. Let's see. Well, he picked up his tracks down on Floresta Street, sold a couple of descriptions there. <laughs> then he headed up Landers Avenue onto Chavez Road. Yeah. The Renards live at 2280 Chavez Road. That salesman talked to the woman at 2274 Chavez. That's three doors away from the Renards. Uh, when was he seen then? Oh, let me see. Where is that, Brennan? Oh, on the 157 sheet, Joe. Didn't have enough room on the report. Oh, yeah. Here it is. Mrs. John Rico, 2274 Chavez. The guy was there about 1145 Saturday morning. Yeah, that puts him in the running. First time he ever showed in that neighborhood? First time, Skipper. Fresh kid, not a very good salesman. Here's the name of the company he's working for, the Harrison News Distributors. You check with them? Well, they're closed for the night. We'll call them the first thing tomorrow. Good. Here's something else for you. I had a call from Frank Renard this afternoon. What he had to say? Seems in the excitement just after the murder, Mrs. Renard overlooked a couple of things. What's that? Well, they're missing a yellow table model radio. Radio. It was in the bedroom where the old lady was killed. Uh, well, that ties in with a robbery motive. Huh? And they're missing a ring, too. Belonged to Mrs. Renard. Topaz ring. Supposed to be worth a little money. But she didn't notice it was gone until today. That's right. You got the serial number on the radio? Yeah, right here. Yeah, let's see. Yeah, Brennan, here we are. Emerson model 511-180,000, A lot of small radios in town. There's only one with that serial number on it. Track it down. The complete description of the topaz ring and the serial numbers and description of the yellow table model radio were sent to the pawn shop detail. The information was then placed on the stolen property list and relayed to every pawn shop operator in the city. The next morning, Ben and I interviewed the manager of the Harrison News Distributing Company. There, the suspect had given his name as Sam Bricker. We checked out his home address. Turned out to be a gas station in North Hollywood. We took the suspect's job application blank with a specimen of his handwriting, and then we drove back to the office. Sam Bricker. We were unable to get a make on the name from the record bureau. We checked the cards, and every known criminal was cataloged in the oddity file as having a pimply complexion. None of them matched. That night, we got out an APB and a radiogram. The suspect's trail led from one salesman's job to the next. On his last job, he gave his name as Albert Berry. His address is 1430 Palo Alto Drive. It was in the Echo Lake District. Ben and I drove out to check it. 1428. 1430. There it is, Joe. Yeah. At least it's not a gas station, huh? Come on. Tiresome, huh? Yeah, I could stand a change. Yes, what is it? We're looking for an Albert Barry, ma'am. Does he live here? Mr. Barry, I'm sorry. He and his wife moved four days ago. We identified ourselves as police officers and had the landlady, a Mrs. Catherine Hoffman, show us the apartment which Barry and his wife had occupied. It was still vacant. In one of the closets in the apartment, we found a cheap overnight bag. The lock on it was broken and one of the seams had ripped. I forgot about that old bag and Mr. Barry told me I could throw it away. Take a look. I'm in. Uh. How long has Barry been married? Do you know, Mrs. Hoffman? No, I don't. But the way they acted, lovey-dovey all the time, I don't think they've been together long. Hey, Joe. Hmm? Look, some kind of an identification tag. Yeah, let me see. Put it up here. It's a tool disc, it looks like. Then, Jameson Larrabee, Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. You're not after Mr. Barry, are you, officer? Yes, ma'am, we are. Did he leave a forward address? I wish he did. 
I'm holding three letters for Mrs. Berry in my apartment right now. May we see them, please? Certainly. Would you step this way, please? My apartment's just across the hall. Yes, ma'am. Would you like a bottle of beer or something? No, ma'am, thanks. Let's see. I thought I took... Yes, here they are. Three of them, Sergeant. From her folks, I think. Mrs. Berry's from Fresno. Oh, that's good. You want to copy down this return address, ma'am? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Okay. That's C.K. Ulrich, U-L-R-I-C-K. Mm. 525 North Lamona, Fresno. Yeah, go ahead. Where you are, Miss Hoffman. By the way, did the Berry say they'd call for their mail? Mrs. Berry did. That's why I'm holding on to it. All right. Just one more question. Do you remember if Mr. and Mrs. Berry had a radio? Yes, they did. A small one. Do you remember what brand it was? No, I don't. It had a yellow case. That's all I remember. Before we left, we called Ed Backstrand, and he had an immediate stakeout placed at the apartment house in case the Berries returned to pick up their mail. Ben and I went back to the office and placed a call to the Pittsburgh Police Department. We gave them the description and the number of the tool disc which we found in Berry's old suitcase. They said they'd check with the Jameson Larrabee Company in the morning, and then they'd call us back. That night, Ben and I drove to Fresno and checked in at the police station up there. Two officers were assigned to stake out the Ulrich home. We interviewed Mr. Ulrich, who identified himself as Albert Berry's father-in-law. He told us his daughter had married the murder suspect eight months before, and he gave us pictures of Barry taken at the wedding. Ulrich told us that he'd catch a Santa Fe train out of Fresno the next morning. He wanted to be in Los Angeles to take his daughter home when Barry was apprehended. It was almost 2 a.m. when Ben and I left Fresno and started back for Los Angeles. We checked in at the office at 10 minutes past 8 the next morning. At 8.35, the call came through from the Pittsburgh Police Department. What did they say, Joe? It was a tool disc, all right. Jameson Larrabee Company issued 18 months ago to one of their workers. Can I give a name? Albert Barry. 11 a.m. Monday, December the 5th, one month to the day since the 62-year-old woman had been beaten to death. The pictures of Barry and his wife, which had been taken at their wedding, were printed up in wholesale lots and distributed to all points. Mr. Ulrich, Barry's father-in-law, arrived in town and got himself a hotel room. We waited. There was no report from the stakeout at the apartment house. We checked back in at the office at five minutes to one. I'll get it. Homicide, Friday. This is Mr. Ulrich, Sergeant. I just got a call from my wife in Fresno. I thought you'd want to know. What's that? The wife got a letter from Norma. They're living in South Pasadena, an apartment. You got the address there? Yes, sir. That's what the wife called about. It's 134 Norway Terrace. When was the letter mailed, do you know? Wife said it was postmarked December 3rd, day before yesterday. Get your coat on, Ulrich. We'll be right over. Ben and I picked up Mr. Ulrich at his hotel and drove to the South Pasadena address. Barry and his wife had the apartment on the top floor. Neither of them were at home. The landlord let us in with a pass key. In the bedroom, we found a small yellow radio. We checked the serial numbers. They matched. It was the same radio stolen from the Renard house. In the bedroom closet, we found two suitcases. We checked through them. Well, nothing in this one, Joe. Here we are. Look at these. What are they, Sergeant? They're a plastic gun butts. Let's see, Joe. One of them's been chipped, see? Sergeant, hmm? somebody coming up the stairs. All right, let's get in the living room. Be quiet. Men. What are you doing here? Who are these men? Police, Norma. They want Albert. He killed a woman. I'm dead. I'm dead. It's all right, Norma. It'll be all right. Did you know your husband killed a woman, Miss Barry? They just told me last Saturday. We've been running away for a month now. Moving all the time. I wanted to know why. He told me. He said I was in it as much as you, but, and I'm tired of running. <laughs> Why did he kill her? Did he tell you that? He said it broke in the house. He didn't know anyone was home. The old woman was in the bedroom. She started to cry out. He had a gun. He hit her with it. Where's your husband now? I don't know. He said he'd come home for dinner. About five the groceries. What time you got, Ben? Uh, half past three. Um, that ring you're wearing, Miss Barry. Your husband give you that? Yes, why? What kind of a stone is that? Topaz. Brit gave it to me. Why? Nothing. We'll wait. Five o'clock came and went. Barry failed to show. Five thirty. Ulrich started to get nervous. Six o'clock. Six thirty. No sign of Barry. I went to the window and kept an eye on the street below. 
At 6.45, a light green Nash sedan pulled to a stop in front of the apartment house. A man got out and went into the main floor entrance. Bert, I'll let him in. All right. How long have you had the new car? A couple of days. Bert got it credit. What do you want me to do now? Does he have a key to the apartment here? He locked it. Okay, when he rings, let him in. Just act natural. Ben? Yeah, yeah. You cover me. I'll get the cuffs on him. Right. Hi, Bert. Look out, Joe! All right, drop it, Barry. Okay, Ben. Yeah. He's fast with a gun. Not looking at me, Sergeant. You'd never think he'd kill anybody. Come on, let's take him in. I love him. I still love him. <laughs> but you're a cop, you wouldn't understand. That's right, I wouldn't understand. I'm a cop. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On February 16th, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two, Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three, to millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Albert Ralph Berry was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His wife, Norma Berry, was found innocent of the charge that she harbored a criminal. She was returned home with her father. Berry was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Tonight's program is dedicated to Private Hubert W. Estes of the District of Columbia Metropolitan Police Department, who on the night of May 16, 1947, gave his life so that yours might be more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you're about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. <laughs> You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to juvenile bureau. A rash of crimes has broken out in your city. Suspicion points to an organized gang of juveniles. Your job, stop them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. It's the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. That's why you see the turkey symbols on the attractive golden yellow Fatima package. That's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima doubles and redoubles its smokers. Yes, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department... You will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Sunday, March 27th. It was windy in Los Angeles. We were working a night watch out of Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, Chief of Detectives. My name's Friday. 
I was on the way up from the juvenile bureau, and it was 11.25 p.m. when I got to the receiving hospital, room five, the treatment room. Everything happens on Sunday nights, huh, Jim? Yeah. How's the kid making out, Doc? The one arm is cut up badly. Nothing fatal, though. How'd it happen? That's what I'd like to find out. Can I talk to him? If you want, don't press him. No, he's had a bad shot. All right. <laughs> Officer here to talk to you, son. I can't. Tell him I can't talk, please. Just a few routine questions, Sam. You're going to have to answer them sooner or later. Please, can't you see what's happened already? I can't tell you anything. Jack Monroe, is that your real name? Yeah. How old are you? I'll be 16 next July. Where do you live? I can't tell you. You know that. Now, let me alone, will you? Let me alone. You've been running around with that gang of kids on Spring Street, haven't you? The big timers, isn't that what they call themselves? I don't know anything about it. Believe me, I can't talk. You tipped us off about the burglary they were going to pull tonight. Is that where they knifed you? Look, will you believe me? I can't tell you anything. Not anything. Please. <laughs> He's still shaky, Joe. All right, Doc. Well, Jack, we'll talk about it later when you feel better. You see what they've done to me already? They said next time they'd kill me. Juvenile Bureau, Friday. Yeah. Yeah, okay, friend. Goodbye. How'd you make out, Joe? Not very good, Ben. Captain Bowden, come in yet? You checked in while you were gone. Wants to see you. Okay. Did the kid tell you who knifed him? No, I scared him good. He wouldn't tell me a thing. Line on the boy's status, Friday? I got a hold of his father. He's on his way in. How's the boy? Bad knife wounds. Nothing fatal. You know the boy? Not till this afternoon, Captain. He tipped us off about a burglary a gang of young kids were supposed to pull tonight. You go through? No, but two hours ago, this Monroe kid was found in a vacant lot down on Olympic, cut up pretty bad. The gang must have paid him. How long is it going to take you to break that up? Well, we're just starting to get a line on him, Bob. Must be nearly 100 in that gang. Yeah, and everyone up working hard. Take a look at the pin map over here. This spot here, look. All the jobs pulled during the last month, huh? The last five weeks up to date. Red tabs for burglary, must be more than 100. The robberies, green pens, count them, at least 50. And there's five more orange ones added for the weekend, auto thefts. You bet those kids are working hard. We got a lead on them. That's more than we had last week. You have to push it harder. Here's the big reason. This uh, line of pins, brown and black. Purse snatchings. Purse snatching and rape, 26 of them in the past five weeks. They're pretty well concentrated in one area here. That's right. Now, what's the lead you're working on? Right there on the pen map, Captain. Huh? Well, these two blocks here, Bob, where Franco Alley intersects Spring Street. Well, what about it? Well, it's the only clear area for a dozen blocks around. There's not a colored pin on it, you see? Yeah. Now, all the rest of the pins, the robberies, burglaries, attacks, they all seem to branch out from this same spot right here in definite patterns, Franco Alley and Spring Street. I figure that's the focal point for the gang. Well, it's got all the marks. For instance? Oh, well, we've been checking that neighborhood for a week. We got it narrowed down to one place, right on the corner of Franco and Spring. What is it? It's a soda fountain. It's pretty typical. Only it stays open all night and it gets a pretty good play from kids. A regular hangout, Captain. Pretty tough youngsters. None of them over 18. Who runs the place? A guy named Eddie Ramsey, small-time con man. Had a run-in with him when we worked bunco detail. I remember the name. Smart mouth. Tried to give us trouble when we talked to some kids in there last night. He's got a place set up for him in the back of the store, kind of a club room. He sounds like a good lead. What are you doing about it? Well, just a minute. Captain Bowling. Yeah? Who? Yeah, we'll be right down. Monroe kid, his father's downstairs, cursing every one of us. What's his problem? Can't understand how his boy got in trouble. Come on, Ben, let's tell him. What kind of a city do we have when we can't allow our children out on the street without being stabbed or shot? What's our great police force doing when this is going on? I'd like an answer if you got one. I demand an answer. We got an answer for you, Mr. Monroe. Will you sit down? My boy's lying in there in that hospital bed cut to pieces. What did you do to prevent it? Tell me. You tell us, Mr. Monroe. What did you do to prevent it? I'm no cop. That's your job. I pay my taxes and I help pay your salary. We look out for your kids, but we don't raise them. That's what you're talking your... about. Just a minute, Mr. Monroe. Answer me this. How old is your son, Jack? He's 16, I think. Why? You know what he does with his spare time? Where he spends his night? Of course I do. He's at home. Some nights he goes to the library. Then you don't know much about your son, Mr. Monroe. For the past month, four nights out of five, he's been hanging around with a gang down on the soda fountain on Spring Street. He's down there as late as 2 a.m. He says he goes to the library. How do I know? I'm a busy man. Did you know that your son is mixed up with that gang? He's not mixed up with that gang. A bunch of small-time thieves, but they're growing. They started with purse snatching, breaking in parked cars, burglarizing candy stores. You don't know what you're talking about. Wait a minute, please. 
And then they took up robbery, stealing cars, beating up girls, women, attacking... You're them. crazy! Jack's not that kind! He's part of that gang, and right now we hold all of them responsible. My boy wouldn't do anything like that. He's a member of that gang, he told us. They're the ones that knifed him tonight. That's a lie! Jack's not mixed up with anything like that! You believe anything you want, Mr. Monroe. We're going to protect your boy as much as we can, but don't expect us to raise him for you. You better take a free piece of advice. You keep your advice. Jack's not in this. You can't prove he is. We're not out to prove anything right now. But you catch up with that boy of yours. Keep him off the streets before it's too late. Are you threatening me? No, sir, advising you. Next time we might meet at the morgue. 1 a.m. Monday, March 28th. A detail of 50 officers from Juvenile Bureau and Metropolitan Division were deployed for 16 blocks along Figueroa Street. At five minutes past one, they started to move south over an appointed area. In the space of half an hour, 18 young kids, none of them over 17 years old, were picked up off the streets and brought to the second floor at 1335 Georgia Street, the Juvenile Bureau. Four of the youngsters were girls. At 1.45 a.m., Ben and I checked the soda fountain on the corner of Franco Alley and Spring Street. Same bunch, Joe. Business as usual. Yeah, come on. Hey, Teddy! The folks! They're back again. Same guys. Go back and tell Eddie. Hey, look, why do you guys have to keep tracking us, huh? You'd think we were crooks or something. You were here the last time we checked in, Teddy. You ever go home? Sure, when I'm tired. I ain't tired. Uh, what's the matter? That's your money on the table there? Sure, it's my money. You want to borrow a buck? <laughs> Twenty-eight dollars. That's a lot of money for a gold door, eh? You keep pretty late hours, son. You have to go to school in the morning? Maybe. I can sit here, can't I? It's free country. I'm drinking coffee. You gonna make me on that? <laughs> You've been drinking more than coffee. Where's your driver's license? Uh, every time, the same thing. There. March 10th, 1933, 16 years old. Are they giving you trouble, Ted? Eddie's on his way out. What's your name? Jones. Clyde Jones. Huh, Ted? <laughs> sure. He's got money, too. Rich family. <laughs> you can save the smart talk, boys. Any of your pals in the back room? Uh, what's the trouble now, Sergeant? How many times a week do we get a checkup? Go ahead, Eddie. Read them off. We told you the last time, Ramsey. Clean up your place here, or we'll ride your back till you do. I told you the last time, Sergeant, there's nothing wrong with my place. It's almost 2 o'clock in the morning. you got a dozen underage kids hanging around here doing nothing. Some of them have been drinking. Schoolboys. Better to have them in here than hanging around outside in the street. I keep an eye on them. You're not the guardian, Ramsey. This time of night, they've got no business in here all on the street alone. That's your opinion, huh? That's the law, Ramsey. Now, either you shut down that back room and keep these kids out of here late at night, or we'll go after your license. You don't scare me, Sergeant. <laughs> you can't prove a thing. A couple of these kids have juvenile records. They're on probation. We can tag you for contributing. You still don't scare me. Now, why don't you leave the kids alone? That's right, Eddie. Read them off. Ben, get Benson and Bell. Roger. If you won't clean up your place, Ramsey, we'll do it for you. Yeah? What are you going to do? We're pulling these boys in, all of them. 2.25 a.m., Monday, March 28th. The dragnet operation had netted 30 juveniles, 26 boys, 4 girls. 24 of the children were between the ages of 16 and 17. They were lodged in the assembly room at the Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. The other half dozen were 13 and 15-year-olds. They were taken to the juvenile hall at 1369 Henry Street. At 2.43 a.m., we met with Captain Bowling. They're all checked in, 30 of them. All right, in the morning, we filed petitions to have every one of these cases brought to the attention of the juvenile court. Make a note of it. Okay, Bob. For the kids with records, ask for detention from the probation department. Right, we'll call their parents in the morning. Call them now. They've got some explaining to do. By 6 a.m., all but three of the children's parents had shown up. To most of them, it was nothing new. Their kids had been there before, they'd be there again. They took the lecture from the juvenile officer calmly. As long as it didn't mean trouble for them, they wouldn't worry. When they got their children home, they would reprimand them, not for running the streets, but for being picked up by the police. Ben and I had seen the cycle of the young criminals start before, a hundred times over. It had a lot of different endings, most of them sour. During the next week that followed, we booked an average of a dozen juvenile delinquents every night. The clampdown continued, so did the crime wave. Ten burglaries, four robberies, eight car thefts, six purse snatchings, three assaults on women. One week's work. Picked up a new angle on Ramsey today, Captain. He might be fencing for the game. Who gave you the tip off? One of our informants. Ramsey's brother lives out in the valley. He's supposed to be pushing his stuff. You check him out? Yeah, I couldn't get a thing on him. Well, it might explain what attracts the kids to that soda fountain. It explains those twenty dollar bills the kids are flashing. They steal and rob, and then they sell the loot to Ramsey for nothing. Another thing. Ramsey keeps his place open all night, and there's no reason to. He doesn't get that much trade. It's only from the young gang that hangs around there. Do you question the kids? How do they account for having all that money? Well, most of them say Ramsey lends it to them. They say they pay him back a little at a time. I think he's fencing for the kids. Did you try to get his license? No luck, Captain. We can't prove a thing against him. Then we'll do it the hard way. Sweat it out. 
That night, we drove out to Ramsey Soda Fountain and asked him again to clean up his place, to keep the young kids out after 10 o'clock at night, to stop lending them money. He refused. There was nothing we could do. His business was a public place. He could not be held responsible for any of his patrons. In the next 10 days that followed, Ben and I haunted the sidewalk outside the soda fountain. We questioned every youngster as they entered and left. We made more than a dozen arrests. Many of the kids had been drinking heavily. We found some of them under the influence of narcotics. But Ramsey was still in the clear. The crime wave continued sporadically. Ben and I waited for our chance. It was a long time coming. Thursday, April 14th. We had dinner at Johnny Coken's place, and it was 10.35 p.m. when we checked back in at the office. Hot shot. Grab it, Joe. Yeah. A terminal on Market Street. A 459 in shooting. A terminal on Market Street. A 459. Let's go. He was approximately 5 feet 4 inches tall, 125 pounds, brown hair, brown eyes, slight build, fair complexion. He was wearing blue jeans and a corduroy jacket. We found him between a row of packing cases at the rear of the warehouse at Terminal and Market Streets. There was a single bullet hole in his forehead just above the left eye. There was a 38 revolver near his right hand. The watchman told us how it happened. She broke in the back of the warehouse, Sergeant. She wanted to shoot it out with me. Here's his ID card. Fell out of his pocket. Teddy Cameron, age 15. Dear God, a kid. I didn't know, Sergeant. He didn't either. He thought he was grown up. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's the solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes. Give Fatima and all is well. Fatima. The long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Give Fatima and all is well. The cigarette that has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima and all is well. Fatima. The cigarette that has doubled and redoubled in popularity. Here are the authentic reports. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up. 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. Los Angeles Police Department, Form 311, dead body report. Type, gunshot. DR number, 437-695. Victim, Theodore Cameron. Residence address, 960 Charter Street. Date and time of death, Thursday, April 14th, 10.35 p.m. Place, Terminal and Market Streets. South State Warehouse. Cause of death, gunshot. Motive or reason, attempted burglary. Time discovered, 10.40 p.m. Removed to County Morgue. Discovered by Carl Hyber, night watchman. Identified by Barbara Cameron, sister. Description of victim, male, Caucasian, age 15, height, great, so on and so on. Occupation, student, descent, English, and so on. Witness, signed Joe Friday, serial number 2288, age 15. Ready, Joe? Hmm? And Cameron Boy's sister, she's waiting in oh. the next room. Yeah. Now, let's go. She taking it hard? Yeah. Morning, Miss Cameron. Good morning. We won't keep you long. Just a few routine questions. Yes, all right. Miss Cameron, how many are there in your family? 
There were three of us, Teddy, Mike, and me. Mother and father are dead. I work. Teddy and Mike go to school. I mean, Mike does. How old is your brother Mike, Miss Chandler? He's 14. You're the sole support of your two brothers? Yes. Do you have any idea who the boys were your brother Ted used to run around with? I don't know them by name. I remember seeing a couple of them once or twice. Mike would know, I think. He and Ted were pretty close, brothers. Do you know if Ted mixed with a gang of kids down on Spring Street? Maybe Mike would know that. Sergeant Teddy wasn't a bad boy. He wasn't a bum. None of us are. I tried to raise the boys like Mark told me. It was easy. We made out. Yes, I understand, Miss Cameron. My salary didn't have too much, but we got by. Yeah. I figured on getting married. I'm 31. It'd be good for the boys, especially Teddy. He's dead, isn't he? Yeah. I couldn't be in two places at once. Hold a job and watch the kids. That's why I thought maybe a husband. I'm sorry to press, Miss Cameron. Do you think your brother Mike can tell us about that Spring Street gang? No, Mike could know. Where can we find him? Staying at a friend's house. I got the address in my bag. Here. That's 2514. I don't write numbers too well. Thank you, Miss Cameron. You've been very helpful. I'll get somebody to drive you home. Well, do I have to go? Would it be all right if I just sit here for a while? It's all right. I'm tired. Real tired. 2514 West Serrano Street. That was the address Barbara Cameron had given us. It was the home of Mr. and Mrs. Jean Brewer, high school friends of the dead boy's sister. We talked to Mike Cameron. He told us that his brother Teddy had been running around with a gang down on Spring Street. He identified Ramsey Soda Fountain as the hangout. It was 2.25 p.m. when we got back to Georgia Street Juvenile Bureau. Hi, guy. Juvenile Bureau, Romero. Yeah, hold on, I'll call him. You, Joe. Thanks. Friday. Joe, this is Canfield in burglary. Yeah, Homer. You're working that Cameron case, aren't you? Yeah. I just got a report on one you might be interested in out of the same neighborhood. Distillery prowl. What do you got on it? Looks like a juvenile M.O. They got away with seven cases of scotch whiskey. Expensive stuff. Okay, we'll hop on it. Bubeck Warehouse, Crocker at 7th. <laughs> Miss Elizabeth Rice was the auditor in charge at the Bubeck Warehouse. We located her on the mezzanine office row. It was her job to keep a running inventory on all incoming and outgoing liquor stock. She knew her job well. As you know, Sergeant Friday, each and every bottle of distilled spirits carries a United States Internal Revenue stamp. Yes, ma'am. Each stamp carries a serial number together with the name of the firm to whom the stamps are issued. Well, Miss Rice, and the stuff is missing, the stamp on each bottle carries the case number. Is that right? That's right. Now, what did I tell you? Oh, yes, I have it right here. Seven cases of high-grade blended scotch whiskey. Now, I have a bottle identical to those in the missing cases. Yes, I see. Now, if you'll just look here... Yes, ma'am. The number on this stamp here, 36A227-9956, followed by the firm name. Uh, could you give us the numbers of the stolen cases? Yeah, I have them typed out for you right here. Seven cases, 12 bottles to the case, Canada Dry Incorporated, four of the red label and three of the black label, Johnny Walker. All right, thank you very much, Miss Rye. And you think that this might be a juvenile case, Sergeant? Yes, ma'am, we do. Seven cases, that's close to $600, isn't it? We've lost a great deal more than that, Sergeant. The insurance company makes up for the liquor loss. Yes, ma'am. Those youngsters, who makes up for them? Ben and I left the Bubeck warehouse with a list of serial numbers of the seven cases of stolen liquor. We headed back to the juvenile bureau. We figured that there was a strong possibility that the Spring Street gang was responsible for the warehouse liquor theft. How were they disposing of the stolen property? That was the key question we had to answer. Ben and I had a hunch and a tip from an informant that the young gang was operating under the guidance of a fence, a man or woman whose job it is to dispose of stolen property. The gang members were close to Ramsey at the soda fountain. Ramsey was the logical suspect. All right, now suppose they did steal the liquor. Suppose Ramsey's a fence. What's he done with the stuff? I don't think he's turned it this fast, if he's turned it at all. He wouldn't keep it at the soda fountain, no liquor license. And we've been around too much. He wouldn't keep it in his house. He lives in the rear of the fountain. That's too hot. Only leaves one other location that we know about. His brother's place in the valley. It was five minutes to ten when we turned left off Ventura Boulevard onto Sepulveda. Ramsey's brother had a small farm about a mile and a half off the highway. It was a modest white frame house planted squarely in the center of an acre of ground. An unpaved driveway led off to the left of the house to the garage. Pull up here, huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah, it looks kind of quiet, no light. Let's go. Let's go. 
Mud sticks to everything. Oh, where's the doorbell? Oh, here it is. You got your flashlight? Yeah, what? Here's a note somebody left. Oh, it's on the bum again. Here, I'll strike a match. Okay. Can you hold it a little closer? Can you read it? Yeah. Harry, wife and I have gone to the drive-in theater. Before you put the truck away, get three... Can you hold that match closer? Oh, no, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Get three cases out of the garage and take them into town. Ed is waiting. Please try to make it by 11.30 tonight. Let's see. It's signed George. The address is here. And there's a garage. Yeah, come on. Three cases. Could be eggs, Joe. If it is, we wasted a trip. Oh, I'm out of matches, Joe. All right. Here, use mine. What was that? Checking. Come on. See anything? No. There goes the light. Just a minute. I'll strike another one. You can save your matches. We found it. We found five cases of scotch whiskey on the floor of the garage. We checked the serial numbers against the warehouse list. They matched. We went back to the car and called communications. We had an immediate stakeout placed on George Ramsey's place, and then we headed back for the city. It was 11.20 p.m. when we got to the address we found on the note. It's about time, Harry. Hello, Ramsey. We can do without the music. What's your problem this time? You're almost out of scotch, Ramsey. Serial numbers check out, Joe. Sorry I can't offer you a drink. We're too old to drink here, aren't we, Ramsey? Where's your phone? You want to invite somebody? You can see we're out of booze. You got a phone? In the hall. Then call the office. Yeah. All right, what's it all about? We've been out to your brother's place. What happened to the other two cases? You drink them here? I gave it to the kids. What are you looking at me like that for, Sergeant? Anything wrong, Eddie? Party's over, kid. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On June 5th, 1949, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 74, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Earlier tonight, you heard the reports of amazing increases in Fatima smokers from New York to Los Angeles. Yes, all over the country, Fatima is doubling and redoubling its sales. And here's reason one. Fatima is the long cigarette that contains an essential ingredient of all the very popular cigarettes, Turkish tobacco. Reason two. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Reason three. To millions of smokers, the name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Smoke Fatima, the best of all long cigarettes. Edward and George Ramsey were tried and convicted in Superior Court of receiving stolen property. After serving their terms as prescribed by law in the state penitentiary... They will be returned to the county jail where they will serve a one-year term for contributing to the delinquency of minors. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the Office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Honoring the city of Greenwich, state of Connecticut, and the men who make up the Greenwich Police Department, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief John M. Gleason, FBI National Police Academy graduate, who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. This Christmas, give the gift that makes every pipe smoker happy, a Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Granger is made just for pipes by the tried-and-true Wellman method. Rough cut to smoke mild and cool, and humidor pack to stay ever fresh. Yes, make this Christmas a Merry Christmas for all the pipe smokers on your list. Give them each a Christmas humidor of Mellow Granger. Listen to Dragnet next week, and be sure to hear Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed.
to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to robbery detail. $8,000 worth of Chinese jade has been stolen. The criminal is vicious. His weapon, a handful of buckshot in a handkerchief. Your job, get him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Monday, December 1st. It was foggy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Ed Backstrand, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. It was 7.15 p.m. when we got to the police academy. The banquet room. Where do we sit, Joe? Lee Jones is holding a couple seats for us someplace. You see him? Oh, yeah, yeah. There he is at Burn. Look at him. Everybody's here. Yeah, ought to be. Hi, fellas. A couple of ringside seats. Thanks, Lee. Did you get it? Yeah. Right here. Mind if I take a look at it? No, oh, go ahead. How come you didn't get it left as a gift? No time. A gift box would have been nice. No cotton, even? Ah, beautiful watch. Radium dial? Yeah. Universal Geneva. Fine movement. He liked it. Look on the back. Let's see. For Chief Ed Backstrand, a good cop, detective bureau. Not very good engraving. No time. I didn't think the old man really meant it. In 26 years. You get tired after 26 years. Well, you've been at it 25, Lee. Don't look at me like that. I got a book to finish. 23 chapters. How many chapters you got, Fanny? Two. How long have you been writing it? Two years. Well, at that rate, we'll be stuck with you for another 21 years. If you're lucky. Excuse me, fellas. Got to make a speech. All right, Lee. Gentlemen. Get the proceedings underway here. And before we introduce the man of the hour, I'd like to pass along a little story you might get a kick out of. <laughs> I was driving down from Utah last year, stopped off at a hotel in Elko, Nevada. When I went up to register for my room, there was an Indian ahead of me. The clerk asked his Indian fella to sign his name, and the clerk handed him a pen. The Indian made a neck on the book. The clerk looked at him for a minute and said, Say, aren't you cheap, dear skin? Have I seen you in the movies? The Indian nodded his head and looked a little upset. Ugh, he said. Ugh, <laughs> we make a lot of movies in Hollywood. <laughs> the clerk smiled and said, a lot of people in Alcoa here like to get your autograph, Chief. Then the Indian grabbed the pen up again and he said, We no like a autograph, hunter. We no want to be bothered. Then he drew a circle around the axe he made. The clerk said, Why do you do that, Chief? The Indian said, We no use the right thing. Oh, hey, Jim. Yeah, there's Roger there for his motion to air. Oh, yeah, excuse me, Madam. Tonight. Uh, he's been using his right name for 26 years, and he's proud of it. And we're proud to have been associated. You want me, Rogers? A phone for you, Joe. You can take it on the extension. Thanks, Pete. He's retiring from the Los Angeles Police Department. We're going to miss it. Gentlemen, a fine officer, Chief Ed Backstrand. Where's the phone? What are you Thanks. Friday. Joe, this is Gonzalez. Yeah, Jeff. Sorry to bother you, but Power said I should call you. Yeah? I need some leg work. Something big? Pretty big, yeah. Come in your loose ends. Penny and I can't pull them all in. When do you want us? As soon as you can get out here. That important, huh? A man may die, Joe. Hi, Jess. 
Got here as soon as we could. Sorry to put you away. Hello, Romero. Gonzalez, what's up? Come on in here. Here's a report. Not complete yet. Well, Chinese fellow. Name's George Kwan. He's a jeweler, gem cutter. Yeah. Jade expert. Knows as much about jade as anybody on the coast. Uh-huh. Says it happened at 5.30 today on Alvarado near the park. Mm. They weren't kidding, were they? They almost killed him. Yeah. Any idea what the weapon was, Jeff? I'm not sure. Looks like some sort of blackjack, something homemade. Yeah. When they pick up Kwan, they found several buckshot pellets lying around and a man's handkerchief. Ray Pinker has the stuff over in the crime lab now. Where's Kwan? Have you talked to him? Cut in a couple questions down to Georgia Street while the doc was giving him sedatives. Little guy's a mess, Joe. It's going to be all right. 50-50 chance when I called you out of the academy. Well, why did they bait him? Do you resist? I don't have it all yet, but from what he said, he was jumped from behind. Didn't have a chance to fight. Whoever it was kept beating him long after he was unconscious. What would they take him for? A couple of pieces of jade. Large ones. Very rare. Mm-hmm. You got anything else? Yeah, we got a star witness, just one. Did you talk to him yet? Just did, for an hour and a half. You want to crack at it? You having trouble with him? Yeah, a little. All right, Pena. Send him in again. Yes, sir. You want to talk some more? Six years old, Joe. His name was Norman Eugene Fisher. He was six years of age last April. Like all young boys his age, his imagination ran away with him. What would be only a minor detail to an adult witness assumed tremendous proportions in Norman's young mind. He told us his story three times. Each time he elaborated a little more until what he claimed was the truth could only have been figments of a small child's imagination. Ben and I, together with Gonzalez and Pena, talked with the boy for another hour. We were getting tired, but Norman enjoyed his position as star witness. Once more, Norman, please, try to remember it as it really happened. It was just like I said. Let me try, Jeff. Go ahead, Romero. Um... You did see it happen this afternoon, didn't you, Norman? Yes, sir, I did. Good. Now, you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. I was running away from a man. He was chasing me. But you just told us, Norman, that you were on your way home from the store. Oh, no, sir. That was yesterday. But you told us, Ben. Norman, how old are you? That's right. I'm going to be 21. No, that's not right. 21, that's older than I am. Well, when I am 21, I'm going to get a hot rod. Fastest car in the world, 10,000 miles an hour. Sure you will, but how old are you now? Six, but I'm born in, but I'm going to be 21 soon. Well, I remember when I was six years old, Norman, a lot of things I wanted. Electric train. I got one. Well, it must be something you'd like to have. One thing that maybe now that you don't have. Will you give it to me? Well, if I can. What do you want? I'd like your gun. Well, what do you want a gun for? I want to put people in jail like you guys do. Sometimes it takes more than a gun, Norman. What do you mean? Just because you've got a gun doesn't mean you're a cop. Well, what does? Just a minute, son. Here you go, Norman. A good cop uses this more than a gun. Gee. It's a real police badge. It's mine. Official? Official. Can I hold it? Go ahead. It's yours. When I wear this, I'm a real detective. Well, that's part of it. The other part is to tell us what you really saw today. Now, how about it, huh? There were four men, like I said, and they all had machines. No, no, wait a minute, Norman. I thought you said you were a detective now. I am. Well, a good detective has to remember exactly what he sees, not something he makes up. It's not very scary that way. No, it's no use, Joe. He can't get his story straight. Oh, yes, I can. I'm a detective now, and I know what happened. All right, Norman, you tell us, huh? I was on my way home from the stall. I saw this truck stop down the street. What did the truck look like? I don't know. It was a funny kind of truck. Had a wood back. You mean like a dump truck? Kind of, but it was a small truck. Old kind of car. Like he took out the back part and put wood bars like a truck. You mean whoever owned the truck cut the back end out and made it look like a truck, huh? Yeah, yeah, that's the way it looked. Anyway, this truck stopped by this Chinese man, and the man got out, and the man started to hit this man. And the man fell on the sidewalk, and the man kept hitting him and hitting him as hard as anything. Well, what was he hitting him with? With his handkerchief. There he goes again. No, I don't know. How about that, Jess? Good tie-in. Go on, Norman. Well, that's all I saw. No, no, I mean after the man hit him, what'd you do? Oh, well, he grabbed a bunch of stuff from this man's pocket, and he went into the truck and he speeded away. Norman, you're a good detective. I want you to think real hard now. Do you know what a license number is? Yeah. Good. Do you think you could remember the numbers on that truck? If I, if I knew what they were, I could. In school, we're just having numbers now. I only know up to seven, but there were two sevens in it. You're getting all this, Jess? Yeah, keep them. Norman, you've helped us a lot. Can you remember what the man in the truck looked like? He had a big head and he looked mean. All right, just one more thing now. 
Can you remember the color of that truck? It looked black, but the black one had black and white stripes. I don't know how you did it, Joe. Well, what do you think? I'll buy it. Me too. All right, Norman. Your mother's waiting outside for you. You can go home now. You're a real detective. Can I wear my bouch down? You bet you can. Okay. Say. Yes, sir? As soon as I arrest somebody, will you put him in jail? With the help of an outdated police badge, no longer official, we had the statement of a six-year-old boy with a healthy imagination. We had an idea he was telling us the truth, but we had no way of being certain. Since he was the only witness, we had to accept his word and hope that he was putting us on the right track. The quickest way to make sure was to see if some of the details on little Norman Fisher's story would check out. Jess Gonzalez and Manuel Pena took the job of trying to locate a homemade pickup truck with two sevens in the license number. They started by checking all the late 3.8 forms, the vehicle theft and impound reports. The next morning, Ben and I called the general hospital and talked to Dr. Sebastian. He told us that the victim, George Kwan, had improved sufficiently to allow a brief interview. It was 10.14 a.m. when we got to Ward C, General Hospital. Doctor tells us you're a little better this morning, Mr. Kwan. Yes, sir. I shall be all right. Although it is quite painful at times. We're sorry to bother you, Mr. Kwan, but we've got to have a little more information on the robbery. Oh, I will tell you all I can, sir. I should like to recover the missing jade pieces. It is a great loss to me. Did you get any kind of a look at the man who hit you? Oh, he attacked me from behind, knocked me to the pavement. I made an attempt to get to my feet, but he struck me again and again, here at the base of my neck. You didn't see him at all, then? No, sir, I did not. Do you have any idea who could have done this? Unfortunately, no. I, I cannot think of anyone. Well, what was stolen from you? We know it was jade, but can you give us a more detailed description? Well, sir, I lost two thumb rings, very rare, collector's items. Thumb rings? How much were they worth, would you say? Well, I paid 8000 for the two rings. I wonder if you could describe them to us. Well, both rings were relics of the time when the Chinese archer drew his hunting bow with a special thumb ring. Uh -huh. Any particular identifying marks on them? Oh, uh, they both have linings of fine gold to fit them to the fingers of the new owners. Who were the new owners? I had just purchased them yesterday before I was robbed. I was on my way to San Francisco to show them to prospective buyers. Who did you buy the rings from, Mr. Corn? Mrs. Inez Curtis, a very reputable dealer. We have done business for many years. I wonder if we could have her business address. Huh? Uh, she has her office at her home. It is uh, uh, 1957 Harper Annex off Sunset Boulevard in Beverly Hills. Uh, how many people knew that you had the jade on you at that particular time yesterday? Oh, let me see. Uh, there were only two other buyers present beside Mrs. Curtis. I uh, do not recall their names. They were new to me. Mrs. Curtis would know. Mr. Quarren, we know that you're tired. We have just one more question. Certainly. Uh, I wonder if I might trouble you to hand me that tumbler of water with a glass straw. Surely. There you are. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Now, those thumb rings, Mr. Kwan, would there be any practical disposition of them other than selling them as they are? Well, hardly, Sergeant. But to anyone who really knows the value of jade, it would be unheard of to change them in any way. I see. Well, thank you, Mr. Kwan. We'll do our best. You know, Sergeant, we Chinese place a great sentimental value on our jade. We'll do everything we can to recover it. Thank you. Uh, may I tell you my favorite quotation on jade? Yes, sir. It is from the writings of Tong Jung Tso. He wrote, The magic powers of heaven and earth always combine to form perfect results. So the pure essences of healing water become solidified in precious jade. Ben and I drove out to 1957 Harper Annex, the residence of Mrs. Inez Curtis. There was no one at home. We left one of our cars. It was 12.22 p.m. when we got back to Central Division. Here's a phone message for you, Joe. What's it say? Call Jess Gonzalez. He's at Wilshire Division. Okay, thanks, ma'am. Wilshire Detectives, Dillion. Hi, Harry. Gonzalez around? Just a minute. Take on three, Jess. Gonzalez. Friday, Jess. We got the truck and we got the driver. We'll be right out. Something else, Joe? Yeah. The kid was right. There were two sevens in the license number. You are listening to Dragnet, 
for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here is a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes, Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. More and more smokers every day agree Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Wilbur Rasmussen, white, male American, age 31, 5 feet 10 inches, 190 pounds, black hair, brown eyes. He was the driver of the truck. Gonzalez and Pena began by checking through all of the reports of trucks impounded during the past 24 hours. There were 23. Out of those 23, they narrowed it down to four possibilities. The third vehicle that they checked fitted the young witness's description of the holdup truck. We still could not be absolutely certain that the impounded truck was the one we were looking for. The same could be said of the driver, Wilbur Rasmussen. The net result of checking impound reports doesn't always result in the apprehension of a suspect, but in this case, we were lucky. The driver had been picked up for drunk driving. It was 1.30 p.m. when we checked in at the Wilshire Division. Hi, Jeff. Where is he? You're a little late. What do you mean? He's gone, released on bail. Who furnished the bail? The woman he works for, Mrs. Inez Curtis. Well, that doesn't figure, Jess, or does it? Why not? How many people knew Quan had the jade? No, it's not my guess. Quan vouches for her. He's been doing business with her for years. What do you think, Joe? It's your show. I'm just tagging along. Well, one thing's sure. Just a minute. Roger Detective Gonzalez. Uh, yeah, Pena. He did? No, I'll meet me back here. Hmm? Friday and Romero are here. Right. The Fisher kid just identified Rasmussen's picture. The identification of Wilbur Rasmussen by six-year-old Norman Fisher was far from sufficient to take the case to court. We had to have evidence, lots of it. Rasmussen had been given a thorough shakedown, his apartment and the truck. There was no sign of the stolen jade rings. Gonzalez told us that the truck had come from the U-Drive truck rental on Figueroa Street. We checked with Mr. Crockett at U-Drive. Uh, let me have another look at that picture, boys. Yeah, here you are. Mm. What did you say his name was? Rasmussen. Wilbur Rasmussen. You want to know if he rented a truck from Miss Williams? Yesterday. Maybe the day before. No, not this fellow. Never seen him. Before we left U-Drive, we checked over the rental contract on the truck in question. The deposit check for the truck was signed by Mrs. Inez Curtis. The truck was checked out at 6 a.m. The rental contract, the actual release form showing to whom the vehicle had been rented, was signed by a Harry Wilson. Rasmussen's name did not appear on any of the usual rental forms. The manager of U-Drive was positive that he had not rented a truck to Rasmussen. We drove out to 1957 Harper Annex. This time, we found Mrs. Inez Curtis at home. I'm terribly sorry about Mr. Korn. Does he have everything he needs in the hospital? Yes, ma'am. How long did you say this Harry Wilson had been working for you? Oh, six or eight weeks. But I'm sure you're wrong about him. We're not accusing him of anything, Miss Curtis. We just won't talk to him. He certainly came to me well-recommended. He was a nice man. When was the last time you saw him? Day before yesterday. He asked for his check, said he was quitting. I told him I was sorry to see him go. I'm anxious to get that guest house finished. How about Rasmussen, Miss Curtis? How long has he been with you? Wilbur's been with me for about seven months. Good worker, but he drinks too much. I feel sorry for him. You've rented trucks from the new drive coming right along? Oh, yes, from Mr. Crockett. We had to have a truck to haul our building supplies. I'm saving an awful lot of money contracting this myself. It's a great saving. Yes, ma'am. Uh, the deposit on this last rental, did you give that check to Wilson or to Rasmussen? I sent both of them down to pick it up. Like I say, Wilby's been drinking rather heavily lately, and I think Harry's the better driver of the two. Do you know which one of those men was driving the truck about 5.30 in the afternoon day before yesterday? Well, how would I know that, Sergeant? All I know is that I sent both of them down. I told Harry to drive. Yeah. Miss Curtis, were either of those men present the day you sold the jade rings to Mr. Kwan? No. They have nothing to do with my gym business, whatever. Did either of these men know about Mr. Kwan's purchase? Well, that's possible. They knew he was here. I'm sure they saw him come in. It's entirely possible that they might have overheard something. When did Mr. Kwan leave your house? About five o'clock. 
What time did two men go after the truck? Oh, they picked that up early in the morning. Mr. Crockett down at U-Drive says that only Harry Wilson checked out the truck. Says he's never seen wrestling before. That's entirely possible. Like I say, they might well have made other arrangements. Were there any other people present when Mr. Klein bought that jade? Yes, there were. Two other buyers. They were bidding for the thumb rings, too. Mr. Kwan had the high bid, so I sold them to him. What if we could have their names? Well, certainly. I'll write them down for you. Miss Curtis, do you have any idea where we might locate Harry Wilson? Well, he told me he was going to Mexico. Said he had friends down there. Well, thank you, Miss Curtis. You've been very helpful. Are you sure there isn't anything Mr. Kwan needs? Yes, ma'am. Two G8 rings. Mrs. Inez Curtis gave us a detailed description of Harry Wilson. She also gave us the names and addresses of the two other buyers who were present when Mr. George Kwan made his purchase. We checked them out and found them to be equally as reputable as Mrs. Curtis. They could tell us nothing of the robbery. We went back to the office and got out an APB and a radiogram on Harry Wilson from the description given us by Mrs. Curtis. Stakeouts were maintained at Wilbur Rasmussen's apartment and at the home of Mrs. Inez Curtis. It was 4.30 p.m. when we got to the second floor of the old city jail building, the crime lab. Lee Jones had the evidence laid out for us. Funny thing about the handkerchief, boys. What's that, Lee? The blood stains, Old ones along with the new ones. How does that figure? We know how the new ones were made when the handkerchief was filled with buckshot and used on Quan. The old ones, hard to tell. How old would you say they were? Well, the handkerchief has been through the laundry a few times. Stains didn't come out. Laundry marks right here. I don't see them. Man used peerless laundry. Infrared marking system. Let me show you. Infrared lamp, Lee? Yeah. There's your marking. Can you trace it down? Who's it belong to? Man used the name of Harry Wilson. There was nothing to do now but wait for some word on Harry Wilson. The stakeouts continued. We requested Wilbur Rasmussen, and we talked again with Mrs. Curtis and George Kwan. It was Tuesday, December the 8th. We checked in for work at 8 a.m. Morning, Jess. Hi, Joe. Where's Ben? Communications. Getting a mail. Any word on the new chief of detective? No, nothing. What's your guess? Oh, I think Thad Brown. Good man. Maybe. Sloan's a good man, too. When you come in yet? Not yet. Why? Maybe you'd like to take a little airplane trip. What do you got? Yeah, in Wyoming. They picked up Harry Wilson. <laughs> Two days later, Thursday, December the 10th, Harry Wilson was returned to the Los Angeles County Jail and booked on suspicion of robbery. We checked with Lieutenant Frank Cunningham in the record bureau. From Wilson's fingerprints, he ran a make on him. Harry Wilson was an alias. We found out that he had lengthy records of arrests and jail terms for robbery, burglary, and grand larceny. Mr. Crockett at U-Drive identified Wilson's picture. He was a two-time loser. It's up to you, Wilson. It can go hard for you or easy. I'm in the spot, huh? You're in the spot. Lay it out for him, Jess. It's all stacked against you, Wilson. We know you rented the truck. You knew Quan was at Mrs. Curtis' house. Your handkerchief was found at the scene of the crime. You wouldn't believe me if I said I didn't do it? I mean, that kind of evidence, how can we? I didn't. I don't know if I can prove it, but I didn't. If you didn't, we'll help you prove it. First, you got to believe me. And you know why. Yeah. I've had it twice. Once more, and I'm in for life. All right, you got it figured. Now, what do you got to say? Rasmussen did it. He knocked Quan over. Where were you? Find my ticket for Cheyenne. I didn't want any part of it. How do you account for that handkerchief? It was mine, but Rasmussen had it. He got his finger one day in the job. I loaned it to him. None of that checks. Old blood stain, new one. All right, let's pick up Rasmussen. Oh, you're at it. Pick up the Curtis stain. She planned it. Wilbur Rasmussen was picked up and brought in. After intense cross-questioning, we confronted him with Harry Wilson's statement. In the face of this testimony, he broke completely. He gave us a full confession implicating Mrs. Inez Curtis. He admitted beating George Kwan and taking the jade thumb rings. He said he received $200 from Mrs. Curtis for the job. He requested that he be allowed to turn state's evidence. Mrs. Inez Curtis was brought to the interrogation room. Of course, you gentlemen have proof to substantiate all these accusations. Yes, ma'am, we have. It better be good. I have a fine lawyer. We've got signed and recorded confessions of Wilson and Rasmussen, the two men who worked for you. Can we play the recordings for you? That won't be necessary. Miss Curtis, you got $8,000 for those rings. Wasn't that enough? Not when I could make 16, no. Where are the rings now? I'm not going to get life for this, you know. No. Jade doesn't spoil. It'll still be good when I get out. Yeah, but you'll be too old to appreciate it, Miss Curtis. Okay, Penny. Well, that was a funny one. Sure was. How about it? Did you figure it this way, Joe? You don't expect me to answer that, do you? The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 2nd, 1949, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 82, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial.
Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. Yes, more and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself. And give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. Mrs. Inez Curtis was tried and convicted of robbery and conspiracy. She received the maximum sentence as prescribed by law. In consideration for turning state's evidence, Wilbur Rasmussen received a minimum term. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Knoxville, state of Tennessee, and the men who make up the Knoxville Police Department another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Sergeant Joe H. Roberts, director of the Knoxville City School Safety Patrols, who dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Let that merry tune remind you to get him the big Christmas humidor of smooth, sure-fresh velvet pipe and cigarette tobacco. It's a double pleasure to any smoker when you give this generous humidor of velvet. It smokes cool and sweet in both pipe and cigarette. In every way, the gift for him is a Christmas humidor of velvet, America's smoothest smoke. Be sure to listen to Dragnet next week. You're tuned for the stars on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A young woman has been murdered. The body was discovered behind locked doors. The assassin is still at large. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Tuesday, January 9th. It was stormy in Los Angeles. We were working the day watch out of homicide detail. My partner's Ben Romero, and my name's Friday. I was on the way to work, and it was 6.45 a.m. when I got to the steps of the city hall, the Main Street entrance. Hey, Joe, wait up. Morning, Ben. When did they call you? 5 a.m. Donahoe called you. Yeah, miserable out, isn't it? It's pretty wet. My feet are soaking wet. See the clamps for there? Yeah. New chief of detection. Mm-hmm. Wait a minute, I want to get some gum. Back experiment. Well, I heard about the new chief. Bad Brown. Good man. He's gum. Oh, thanks. Well, I wish they'd make up their minds about our ship. Work days, they call you back night. Work nights, they call you back days. Once put in for a desk job. And you never have to call you back. You're here all the time. Maybe you just hired the police. Here we are. Thanks, Egan. 
Good night. Is this a great way to start off as your new chief? Call you back on a rotten morning like this? I'm glad you got the job, Thad. Yeah, well, congratulations, Chief. It's hard to follow a man like Ed Baxter. Gonna need your help. You got it. Here's why I called you back. Laura Barclay. Mm -hmm. The dead body report, nightclub entertainer. My lady found the body an hour ago. Who's covering? Burton and Anderson, they're out there now. Strangled, huh? The lamp cord. Still trying to figure out how the guy got in the house. Doors and windows all locked. Uh, attack. Is that the motive? For now, yeah. I just came from there. I think there's more. Any reason? Her room wasn't prowled. Yeah. Just a hunch. Play it for me. Ben and I left Thad Brown's office, picked up Lieutenant Lee Jones at the crime lab, and drove to the West Adams District, number 16 Imperial Place, where the body of Laura Barkley had been found. It was an ornate frame structure done in Victorian style, at least 30 to 40 years old. Number 16 was on the ground floor. We went in. A narrow hallway led to the bedroom in the rear of the house. Two gas jet mixtures, which had been converted to electricity with the only illumination. This place has seen better day. Anybody else coming out, Lee? I see flash bulbs down there. They must be here already. Lieutenant, Friday, down this way. Hi, Burton. Hi. Photographer's covering the body position. Peterson's dusting for prints. Fred, shoot a couple of overheads. Don't make them all angle shots. Get up high, then move in close. Yeah, Chief was right. Room's in pretty good order. Did you talk to anybody, Burton? Landlady. Lives upstairs. Only two people living in the building. Mm -hmm. Did she tell you anything? Said the Barkley girl paid her rent on time. Good tenant. Plays the organ at the Blue Fox. Cocktail lounge. Mm -hmm. Any idea how the murderer got in here? Not yet. Every door and window in the place is locked. Anything else? That's it so far. We'll give you 15.7 on what we got. Okay, Lord. You and Anderson have another detail? Yeah, I'm working on that Westwood thing. Two uniform men outside if you want anything. Right, thanks. Looks like a tough one, Joe. Whoever did it must have come in through the keyhole. I'll see you later. Slow, Andy. Peterson is dusting for prints. Nothing yet. Only piece of physical evidence so far, the lamp cord she was strangled with. I'll run it through downtown. Not a sign of a struggle. Maybe she wanted to die. Check the bathroom, will you, Ben? Yeah, I'll look around the kitchen. Hey, Pete, have you dusted the lamps yet? Not yet, not yet. Ben, come here a minute, will you? Ben. Yeah? Come in the kitchen, will you? You got a pencil? Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, here you are. That's all right. Take a look at this garbage chute here. Uh, let me see. About eight feet to the ground. Yeah, big enough for a man to get through. Oh, yeah. Yeah, no problem. Lee. I'll be right there. That could be the answer, Joe. Well, he either got in this way or he was in the house when she came home. What do you got? Garbage chute here. What do you think? Could be. Let me grab a kit. Let's see. Aluminum powder. There it is. No. No, nothing on the outside of the lid. Looked pretty clean. Must have just been scrubbed. Abrasions here. Got a pencil? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hold it up there, will you? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There we go. Large prints. Unusually large. Big hands. Can I look inside the shoot a minute, Lee? Go ahead. Watch that lid. Yeah, I will. Uh, looks like it's blocked off upstairs. This thing hasn't been used for garbage for some time. Most of them were condemned a few years back. I'll get Fred to shoot these. Let's go in the living room. That desk been dusted, Lee? Yeah, it's clean. Go ahead. Mm, take a look, Joe. Yeah. Photographs. Hmm. Hundreds of them. All men. Yeah, all different. Lee Jones and the crime lab crew finished up and went back to Central Division. Two uniformed officers remained on duty at the scene of the crime. Thad Brown had men sent out to canvas the neighborhood. Ben and I went upstairs and talked with a landlady, a Mrs. Emma Smith. Yes? Police officers. You, Miss Smith? Yes. You're not the same officers I talked with before. No, ma'am. I wonder if we could ask you a few questions. I told the other officers everything I knew. We have to double-check, Miss Smith. Who was the girl who lived in the apartment below, number 16? 
Laura Barclay. Is that the name she used, the mail she received? Was it addressed that way? Yes, it was. She was a very good tenant, Laura. No trouble with her at all. When did she move here? Oh, about four or five years ago. I have the rent receipts. I always save receipts. Did she always live by herself? Oh, yes. That apartment rents to one person only. Did she have many visitors, friends dropping in? None that I ever saw. Pretty much to herself, Laura. The men came yesterday and took the wagon. What's that, ma'am? The organ. Electric one. Laura rented it from a big downtown firm. Used to practice all the time. My, it was beautiful. Yeah. In the gloaming. She used to play that for me. Mrs. Smith, when did the men come and take the organ away? Yesterday, in the afternoon, about 4.30. Was Miss Barclay at home when they came? No, she wasn't. She left me a note to let them in, so I let them in. I never allow anyone in the apartment without a note. Do you know the name of the company where she rented the organ? The Braziers, it was called, down on South Spring. Well, didn't you think it was unusual that Miss Barclay didn't have any friends? Now, officer, I didn't say Laura didn't have any friends. What I said was that she didn't have any friends who came to see her here. She moved here from a hotel for women. That's the reference she gave me. I see. I wonder if you could give us the address of that hotel, please. I'll write it down for you. Thank you. Uh, Miss Smith, did you hear any unusual sounds in Miss Barclay's flat last night? Anything out of the ordinary? If I had, I would have called the police and we'd have saved a girl's life. No, thank you very much, Miss Smith. Here's a coin. If there's anything you think of after it's gone, don't hesitate to call. Thank you, I will. I hope you get the dirty men who killed Laura. We didn't say it was a man, Miss Smith. Well, isn't it always a man? Before we left Mrs. Emma Smith, we asked her about the garbage chute. She said it had not been in use for the last four years. We showed her the stack of photos. She could identify none of them. We drove back to Central Division. We checked Brazier's music store. The two men who moved the organ were checked out and cleared. We went to the Wynn Hotel for young ladies. They could tell us nothing. Laura Barclay's references were all good. We went back to the office and met with Chief of Detective Stad Brown. You think he got in through the garbage chute? That's where it looks, Chief. Went all over the apartment. If there's another way, we haven't found it. All right, you know how he got in. Who is he? We got out an APB on his M.O., latent fingerprints and making a run on those prints we found. You got an idea about these pictures here. Most of them theatrical still, show people. Frank Latour and his canine circus. To Laura, all my love, Frank. Hey, what you do? Here's a guy I checked with this morning. Bernard Caribbean. Theatrical booking agent, huh? Yeah, Barney's office is down in the Orpheum building, 8th and Hill. He booked her into the Blue Fox. See what he can tell you. All right? You grab the pictures, man, huh? Oh, yeah. Well, you got more than you started with. Those fingerprints. We get a make on them, we'll be close to the guy. So was the Barclay girl. But he got away. <laughs> I wonder if we could see Mr. Carubian. Who's calling, please? Sergeant Romero and Sergeant Friday, police officers. Oh, one moment, please. Yeah, thank you. Two police officers to see you, Mr. Carubian. A Sergeant Friday and Sergeant Romero, is that right? Yes, ma'am. Send them in. Go right in. Thank you. All right, let's go. Uh, when them rosy roses bust through the snow, I'll be coming home on patrol again. When them General Sherman tanks are covered with ice, I'll be home for good. And won't that be nice? Oh, no. It's my stuff is corn. Sit down, fella. Thank you. Can I help you? I understand that you book Laura Barclay. Yeah, that's right. I spoke with her. Got his name right here. Chief Stab Brown? Oh, that's right. He asked me about Laura. Too bad about that. Any clues? We're working on it, Mr. Carubian. What makes a person pull a stunt like that? Laura didn't have no enemies. She had one. Well, I don't know much about her, except I've been booking her for about four years. Good organist. Three for her boys, too. Cut some pictures here. I wonder if you take a look at them. Yeah, sure. Quite a stack. Yeah, old Frankie Latour and the dogs. Great act. I book them. Ricky Rogan, King of the Tap. Gus Sorinoco and that same seal of his. Yeah, yeah, I know all these people. I book them all. Did Laura Barkley work with all these people? One time or another, yeah. During the war, USO camp shows, you know. Do you know whether she was close to any of them? Well, come to think of it, she was. That Frankie Latour, crazy about them dogs he is. No, I mean the men themselves. Anybody that she seemed particularly interested in? Never heard her mention anybody. Pretty girl. Did you know her very well, Mr. Groovy? Only when she came in and out of town on an engagement. 
I'm a married man. Well, then you don't think there's anything to these pictures here of hers, huh? Well, I wouldn't say so. When you're on the road, you always collect photos of the people you work with. Souvenirs. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Caribbean. Here's our card. You betcha. Yeah, uh, sure hope you catch the guy. What do I pick on Laura? Sometimes they don't have a reason. When we left Bernard Caribbean's office, we checked by the Blue Fox Cocktail Lounge. It was still early. The sign said open 5 p.m. It was 3.15. We went to the morgue in the basement of the Hall of Justice and looked at the coroner's report. The autopsy report stated that the cause of death for Laura Barclay was strangulation. We went to the second floor of the old city jail building, the crime lab. Nothing on the lamp cord, standard UL 110 line, bite anywhere, no prints. How about the chute, Lee? Went back there and rechecked. You were right, the guy got in through the garbage chute. Found more of the same prints along with some cloth impressions in the dust. Tell me anything? The guy was wearing some kind of tweed, Donegal, 15 to the inch. How about the size of a man, Lee? How big could he be to clear that chute? It had a 20-inch diameter. Almost any man could squeeze through that. Check the ground level of the chute. Cement, no footprints. Mm. You don't have too much for it. I got one thing for you. What's that? I think I found your motive. And not the one listed on the report. Yeah? Here are the blow-ups of the body. This 36 by 54 here. Hold that in, will you, Dan? No, I haven't. Look through this magnifying glass here. The right hand. Yeah. See where I'm pointing? Uh -huh. Ring finger, yeah. Looked like ring marks. That's right. Pretty wide. Must have been good size ring. Well, they might still be in that room. I called Thad Brown. He had the room rechecked. No sign. And you think we got a burglary motive on our hands? That's my guess. Thad had the boys check with the landlady. She didn't know anything about any rings the Barclay girl might have had. That doesn't help. I think I got something else. Here. Oh, library book. You heard? Her card's in one of the pockets inside, checked out from the L.A. Public Library main branch. Mm -hmm. I think these might be a lead on the missing rings. A librarian sees a person's hands every time they check out a book. That makes sense, Lee. We'll play it that way. What department were the books checked out of? The music room. Well, that's it. I think you've got your motive now and a good set of prints. You're close. Thanks a lot, Lee. Well, let's go to the library, Ben. I'll get it. Crime lab. No, this is Friday. Oh. Thanks, Frank. Well, all we got's a motive. How do you mean? No make on those fingerprints. Nothing. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here is a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of all long cigarettes. Fatima. Give Fatima... For quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Four thirty p.m. Tuesday, January 9th. Heavy rain. Laura Barclay's murderer was still a free man. Ben and I were sure that whoever left their fingerprints on the inside of that garbage chute was the same man who murdered the Barclay girl. He had no previous record. His first crime, as far as we knew, was a killing, and the odds were all in his favor. The fingerprints gave us nothing. All we had left to lead us to the killer were three library books and a stack of old theatrical photos. The solution of most crimes for the working detective is method and persistence. When you have clues, you work with them. When you don't, you work your way to a logical conclusion as best you can. We went to the Los Angeles Public Library, the main branch. The librarians in the music room handled thousands of readers every week. None of them remembered Laura Barclay. We drove over to the Blue Fox Cocktail Lounge. We interviewed the manager, and he knew nothing of her personal life. We talked to Harry Schumann, the organist who had taken Laura Barclay's place. What would you like to hear, fellas? Police officers. I'd like to talk to you, man. About Laura. Huh? Yeah, that's right. All right, if I keep on playing, the manager wants full 15-minute sets. Yeah, go ahead. That's all right. What can I tell you? How long have you known Miss Barclay? Oh, four or five years. Terrible thing. You got to get to whoever did it. Yeah, we're going to try. Can you think of anybody that might have killed her? I know you ask that question of everybody. I don't know. 
Does anybody ever know for sure? Sometimes. But I don't know. When you think of a person, you never think too much about her. Maybe you might know a few things about her that you could fill us in on. I'll try. She go in for jewelry much? Rings, things like that? Funny you should ask that. She was nuts for it. Good things. Rings? Had a couple of beauties. Diamonds they were, big stones. Cost 4000 I know she used to put most of her money into those rings. She'd buy them on time? Yeah. I remember one night she was overjoyed. The night she paid them off. Cost a lot of dough. Can you describe those rings for us? Not too good. I can give you the name of the jeweler she bought them from. That'll do. Do you know anybody else that we might talk to? I don't know any of her friends. She was an only child. No living relatives that I know of. How about her landlady? Yeah. I guess that's it, Harry. Thank you. For what? I wish I could help more. If everybody had your attitude, we'd be out of a job. Before we left the blue box, Harry Schumann gave us the address of Laura Barkley's jeweler. The next morning, we checked with the manager of the store, and he gave us a complete description of the two diamond rings which the dead girl had purchased. They were valued at $4,000. He gave us detailed drawings of the rings. We went back to the office, gave the information to burglary detail. An all-points bulletin was put out describing them. Pawn shops throughout the city and state were alerted to watch for the stolen rings. We had lunch with Chief Thad Brown at Costa's Cafe. Never mind, O'Mara. I'll get it. Mm. Thank you, Chief. I'll get the tip. Stew was good. Mm -hmm. Have some change with the cigarette machine. Thanks. Need any cigarettes, Joe? No, no thanks, thanks. Let's go. What do you think, Sam? The description of the rings and the M.O. should help. If haven't turned up, good chance he's holding on to them. Could be his first job, probably scared. Anybody check back over the neighborhood there? This the afternoon and this morning. A lot of door door salesmen through that district. All been checked out. It's a dead end. Now where? Only those prints are checked out. Well, they didn't. Got a kickback from Brerick's in Sacramento on his M.O. No make. We'll have to get him with what we've got. Here's the car. Sure you picked up all the loose ends? Oh, we've been back over the course three times. Go over it again. Keep going over it until something breaks. For the next ten days, we retraced our steps from the room where the crime was committed throughout the neighborhood to the place where she worked, back to the same dead end. Ben and I checked and double-checked each other to make certain that neither of us had overlooked even the smallest detail of the investigation. We got no place. It was 8 a.m., January 19th. Homicide, Friday. This is Rubles in Burglary, Joe. Yeah, Dick. Got something for you. Job pulled last night. A couple of watches, strand of pearls. How do we figure in it? His M.O. Yeah? The guy got in through the garbage chute. Besides fingerprints and photographs, one other mark by which the unknown criminal is identified is by his method of operation, his M.O. Once a thief finds a successful means of operation, he seldom changes it. In our search for Laura Barkley's murderer, we had checked our files and found no criminals at large whose practice it was to gain entrance through a garbage chute. It was reasonably safe to assume that this was the same man. It was 2 p.m., January 23rd. I was on my way back from the record bureau. Just had a call, Joe. Elmer Radcliffe. Informant? Yeah. It says two days ago he heard about some guy who was making the rounds trying to peddle a couple of diamond rings. Same ones? He's not sure. Doesn't know what the guy looked like. Any idea where the guy is now? Hasn't been around since. Told Elmer to keep his eyes open. That's good. Come in here, you two. What do you got, Thad? This report just came down from burglary. Pawn shop down in North Main took in a watch and a strand of pearls last night. Yeah. Same stuff that Rubles called you about. Yeah, I remember. Where's it dying? Same guy tried to peddle a couple of diamond rings. 10 a.m., January 25th. Thad Brown arranged to have all pawn shop detail calls concerning the suspect put through to us on extension 2521, homicide. Five days passed. No further word. Homicide, Friday. This is George Rose. I run the harbor pawn shop, second in Maine. Yeah, what's the matter? Man in here, trying to turn those diamond rings. Once in the stolen property list. We can't talk now. Stolen, we'll be right down. Come on, Ben, move it. Yeah? The next corner. There it is. Just up the block, pull up. All right, let's go. Hell. Here we are. Hey, fella, look out, Joe. He's got a gun. You all right, Joe? Yeah. Out the back way. Let's get him. There he goes, up alley. Can you hit him? You didn't stop him. Watch it. 
Come on, Joe. He's turning on the spring. He ran into that cafeteria. Come on, let's run. Where'd he go? You see him? Yeah, there he goes. He's headed for the kitchen. Come on. Stop that man. Stop him. Out the back door into the alley. There he goes. Stop him. All right, you, stop. He's not stopping. Stay clear. He's down. All right, come on. All right, get his guns. Yeah. You got him in the leg, Joe. Hit his head when he fell. All right, snap him on. Mm -hmm. Huh. Look on the little finger of his right hand. Two diamond rings. Yeah. Doesn't make sense, does it? What's that? $4,000 worth of diamonds, and he's lying on a pile of garbage. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On April 2nd, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 81, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New Orleans Division. Fatima sales up 300%. Detroit Division. Fatima sales up. 348%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> Lola Barclay's murderer was identified as Martin Eric Swanson. He was tried and convicted of murder in the first degree. His case was fought through the Supreme Court of California and in the United States Supreme Court. In both instances, his conviction was upheld. Last Friday morning, after a delay of five years, Martin Eric Swanson was executed in the lethal gas chamber at the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Youngstown, state of Ohio, and the men who make up the Youngstown Police Department, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief of Police Edward J. Allen, honored as Policeman of the Year, who dedicates his life so that yours might be more secure. <laughs> Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet from Los Angeles. This Christmas, give the gift that makes every pipe smoker happy. A Christmas humidor of mellow Granger. Granger is made just for pipes by the tried and true Wellman method. Rough cut to smoke mild and cool, and humidor packed to stay ever fresh. Yes, make this Christmas a merry Christmas for all the pipe smokers on your list. Give them each a Christmas humidor of Mallow Granger. Listen to Dragnet next week, and be sure to hear Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, the story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes. Best of all long cigarettes brings you Dragnet. You're a detective sergeant. You're assigned to homicide detail. A small boy is reported missing from his home. His age, nine years. Foul play is suspected. Your job, find him. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, 
the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Thursday, December 22nd. It was cold in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of homicide. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way into work, and it was 3.55 p.m. when I got to room 42. Homicide. Hi, Joe. Ben, what's you doing? Oh, pretty quiet. How's your mother? Oh, that cold's still hanging on. Bad cough. Doc says nothing serious. My kid's got the same thing. Must be some kind of a virus going around. Yeah. Is that a new suit you got on? Oh, yeah. Ma figured I needed one. Let me see. Oh, yeah, that's a nice shade of blue. Where'd you get it? Quincy's down South Fig. Look okay? Turn around. Right. Oh, yeah, that's a good fit. Uh, did you get all the reports on the Webster case yet? Yeah, all taken care of. Let me get it. Homicide, Friday. Well, this is Levinson, Unit 113J. Got something for you. Yeah, Harry, what's doing? Doherty and I are out here on Collis Avenue, 4656. I'm trying to track down a nine-year-old boy. What's the story? The kid's missing. Suspicion of foul play. How long has he been gone? About two hours. Looks like a job for homicide. How do you figure? The kid was last seen playing in the backyard of his home. Yeah? We checked over the yard. Find anything? Bloodstains, lots of them. Ben and I left a message for Chief of Detective Thad Brown. Then we went over to the crime lab, picked up Lieutenant Lee Jones, and drove out the Arroyo Seco Freeway to Collis Avenue. It was an average neighborhood. Number 4656 was a one-story green stucco residence situated on the corner of Collis Avenue and Harrison Drive. Beyond the backyard was a tract of undeveloped land covered in scrub oak. Harry Levinson from Highland Park Juvenile was waiting for us in front of the house. Back this way, fellas. I'm coming, Lee. Wait till I get my back. Okay. Who notified you that the boy was missing, Harry? The mother. Said she went out to do some Christmas shopping about 11 this morning, left the boy home. Came back about 2 this afternoon, he was gone. What's the name? Johnstone. Kid's name is Stanley, 9 years old. Mm -hmm. Was this gate open like this when you got here? Oh, yeah, I didn't touch the thing. Uh, here are the stains over here, Lieutenant Jones, uh, along the edge of the walk, see? Yeah, let me see. Quite a few stains, huh? Looks like it might be blood. I'll tie some benzidine on these spots here. Yeah, there we are. See what happens? Where's the kid's mother now, Harry? Yeah, in the house. Doherty's talking to her. Did you talk to any of the neighbors? People next door. Uh, one's on this side. They couldn't tell us anything. There it is, fellas. Yelly? These spots I covered with benzidine. They're trembling blue. Blood stains, all right. Can't say definitely whether it's human or animal blood. Mm -hmm. You have to go back to the lab to run it through? Yeah, biological precipitant test. Hand me one of those glass vials from my bag, will you? Yeah. Okay, here you are. Hey, thanks. Scrape some of these flakes off for a test. Yeah, yeah. How soon can you tap the blood for us, Lee? Precipitant test won't run more than 20 minutes. It'll take three or four hours to run the blood grouping, though. That's it. Anything else you want to check? Levinson, anything else? Oh, uh, right here in my handkerchief. Empty shell. That marker over there by the rose bush, that's where I found it. Mm, from a 22, huh? Yeah. Might tie in, might not. Mark it and dump it in this envelope, will you? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Shell. Yeah. There you go. Did you get out a missing broadcast in the boy here? Uh, Darty did about a half hour ago. Oh, here's a description here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mother know about the bloodstains? No, we didn't tell her. She's worried enough already. And she has no idea what might have happened to her boy? No more than we do. She checked all her friends, relatives. We're covering the neighborhood. No trace so far. Not much to go on. Bloodstains, empty cartridge. Could mean a hundred things. Mm. Any ideas, Frank? Yeah, just one, and I don't like it. 4.30 p.m., Thursday, December 22nd. The neighborhood search for nine-year-old Stanley Johnstone continued. Lee Jones went back to the crime lab to start the precipitant test and the blood grouping. Levinson and his partner, Doherty, from Highland Juvenile, stood by. We called Chief of Detectives Thad Brown, and he ordered up a special detail to aid in the search for the missing boy. Ben and I questioned the boy's mother, Mrs. Ruth Johnstone, a woman in her early 40s. She seemed fairly calm under the circumstances. Miss Johnstone, um, is your boy standing in the habit of wandering off without telling you where he's going? No, he's not in the habit of wandering off, but he has done it before. Well, when was the last time, Miss Johnstone? You don't have any children, do you, Sergeant Friday? No, I'm not married. Well, there comes that time in every young boy's life when he feels that it's time to leave home, to go out on his own. Usually it happens somewhere around 8 to 10. I think I know what you mean. I've got a boy. Well, then you know how it is. My husband and I scolded Stanley one day after school. He was quite put out about it. He thought George and I were unfair. Packed a few of his things and left. How long was he gone? Oh, no time at all. About two hours. 
I was worried about him, but my husband said to leave him alone. Said every boy had to go through that stage. Well, then you think he's run away from home again this time? Yes, I think so. He's been gone about four hours now, and I have a funny feeling about it. Did you and his father have some misunderstanding with the boy recently? Well, that's just it. We haven't. I don't mind telling you now that we're talking about it. I'm, I am getting worried. Any place around that he might like to visit? Hobby shop, playground, where he might be? Yeah, there's um, Jensen's model shop and little Shanna Burroughs, but I've already called him and he hasn't been seen all day. I called all his friends and they have no idea where he is either. We'd like a list of all his friends and the places that he was known to frequent. Oh, yeah, all right, I'll get them to you. Where do you suppose he is? Where's your husband now, Miss Johnstone? Oh, he's at work. George works for the city. He's a fireman. What house is he stationed at? Engine Company 12. He's working the 8th platoon. He'll be home tomorrow morning. I haven't told him that the has gone. Was well, there any chance that the boy might be down at the firehouse with his father? No. No, he seldom goes down there anymore. No, I don't think he's there. I'm awfully worried. May I call my husband? Certainly. Go right ahead. I know George will be worried. Stanley's been gone too long. Hello? May I speak with George Johnstone? This is Mrs. Johnstone. Thank you. I hate to call George at his work. Yes, ma'am. Does your husband own a gun? Yes, he does. What caliber? Do you know? Well, it's a forty-five automatic. He got it. George? This is Ruth. George, is Stanley down there with you by any chance? Oh. No, I can't find him anywhere. He hasn't been here when I came home from my shopping. Uh, there are two policemen here. No, I said there are two policemen here. Oh, no, dear. I'll call you if we don't find him soon. All right, dear. Yes, you too. Goodbye. But I, I didn't think he'd be with George. That forty-five. is that the only gun in the household? Well, yes. Why are you asking about guns? Is, has anything happened that you're not telling me about? No, ma'am. Just routine checking. We'll have to take a look at that forty-five off, if you don't mind. Maybe I should tell you. We, we do have another gun in the house, but it, it's all wrapped up. George bought it for Stanley's Christmas present. May we see it, please? Well, yes. Will, will you have to unwrap it? Yes, I'm afraid so. Well... I think I can reach it. We, we had to hide it. Now, let me see. Here's the paper it was wrapped in. Stanley must have found it. It's gone. See, here's the gift card in the box the gun came in. The rifle. Can I look at that box, ma'am? Thank you. How about it, Jim? 22 caliber. Thursday, December 22nd, 5.15 p.m. It was getting dark. The search for the missing boy continued. We checked the list of Stanley Johnstone's friends. None of them or their parents had any idea of his whereabouts. We talked with Levinson again. He had been in touch with the detail combing the neighborhood. They had found nothing. We went down to Collis Avenue and 10th Street, service station on the corner. One nickel, Joe? No, I got one. You watch for that, huh? Yeah. Two six six seven, please. Two six six seven. Crime lab, Jones. Hi, Lee. Joe Friday. Yeah, Joe. Any sign of the Johnson kid? No, not yet. How are you coming? Finished the precipitant test. It's human blood. Yeah. Working with a blood group now. Do you know what type the Johnson boy had? Well, we didn't want to upset his mother. I thought we'd wait until the last thing. We're still in the neighborhood. I check with the family physician. That way you won't disturb Yeah, we figured on that. Oh, just a minute, Lee. Yeah, Ben. Boss just pulled up. Okay. Uh, Thad Brown's out here now. I'll check you later, Lee, huh? Yeah, right, Joe. All right, goodbye. Gentlemen, how's it going? Just checked with Lee Jones. Yeah, I know. It's human blood. What do you think? We talked with the boy's mother, Miss Johnston. Found a gun missing. Yeah. Caliber's the same as the empty casing that Levinson found. Twenty-two. You said the gun was missing. Yeah, the Johnstones were going to give it to the boy as a Christmas present. They had it hidden. It's gone now. Any idea who took it? Well, they left the Christmas wrapping behind. I think it was the kid. Twenty-two rifle, huh? Nine-year-old boy. When are they going to learn? First, it's carbide cannons on the 4th of July. The city issued ordinance after ordinance, but a few thousand kids around the country had to lose their eyes, fingers, hands before the parents gives us their full cooperation to outlaw them. I know what you mean. Sure you do. Even every other cop in the country became the heaviest trying to clamp down on them. It's always the same story. This time it's guns for Christmas. I know what you're thinking, but we're not sure yet. Listen, Friday, there's a city ordinance against giving a gun to a kid. You know that. Yes, I know that. There's a missing boy and a missing gun. There's blood on the ground and an empty shell. That's enough for me. I'm going to stay with it. Something's got to break. Yeah. I hope it's not the hearts of that kid's parents. Oh, hi, Chief. I've been looking for you, Friday. What do you got, Harry? Found the gun. New twenty-two rifle. Strong smell of cordite. I'd say it's been recently fired. Where'd you find it, Levinson? Uh, back up there in that scrub oak. 
Up behind the Johnston house. Mrs. Johnstone identified it. Buckley took it down to the crime lab. Thanks, Harry. Uh, is Miss Johnston okay? Mm, pretty sick now. Kilby came up with something else. What's that? There's another one missing. An eight-year-old boy. 6.30 p.m. We talked with Officer Killaby about the other missing boy. He told us that his name was Stephen Morheim, eight years old. His family had just moved into the neighborhood, and it seemed that no one besides the Morheim family knew that the boys played together. Mrs. Morheim told us that Stephen told her that he was going out to play and that he'd be home by 6 o'clock for dinner. She told us that he was an unusually prompt boy and almost never overstayed his playtime. We got a description of the Morheim boy and put out a missing broadcast. We called the John Stone's family doctor. He told us that Stanley's blood was type O. At 7 p.m., we talked again with Mrs. John Morheim. Are you sure Mrs. John Stone doesn't know where the boys are? She has no idea, Ms. Morheim. It's terrible. It's just awful. I feel there's more to this thing. Something you're not telling me. Well, there's no use to upset you until we know a few things for sure. Then you are holding back something. Now, please try not to worry, Ms. Morheim. There are certain questions we'll have to ask, routine questions in any kind of investigation. Is there anything else you want to know? Yes, ma'am. What is your boy's blood type? That's a funny question. Do you think anything's happened to him? Have you found him and you're not telling me? No, ma'am, we haven't found him. We don't think anything's happened to him. His blood type? Yes, ma'am. I think I have it written down in Stevie's baby book. Yes, here it is. Type O. Thank you. I wonder if I might use your phone, please. Yes, of course. It's in the hall. I'll be right back, ma'am. Yeah, okay. Two six six seven, please. Two six six seven. Hello, Ray. This is Friday. Lee there. Uh, just a minute, Joe. Take two, Lee. John speaking. Checking back, Lee. Uh, did you get the blood types on the two missing boys? Yeah, both boys type O. So are the stains, Joe. Type O. You are listening to Dragnet for the solution to an actual case from official police files. Now, here's a real solution to many of your Christmas shopping problems. If your friends smoke a long cigarette, give the best of long cigarettes, Fatima. Give Fatima for quality. The name Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. Give Fatima for flavor. Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. Give Fatima. They're extra mild. Yes, Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. Yes, extra mild. So give Fatima for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. It's the long cigarette that has doubled and redoubled its smokers. Yes, more and more smokers every day agree. Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Eight p.m. Thursday, December twenty-second. Still no sign of either of the missing boys. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown went back to headquarters to direct the search from there. He dispatched another detail of fifty men to aid in the hunt for the missing youngsters. Eight thirty p.m. It was getting colder. The citrus growers were warned to expect a freeze. We went up the block to see Mrs. Johnstone. Her husband had quit work early and returned home. We talked with him. He could tell us nothing more than we already knew. We still had not informed either of the families about the blood stains and the empty cartridge casing which had been discovered in the backyard of the Johnstone home. It was more than possible that they had a right to know about our findings, but Ben and I felt that there was no cause to add the, to the distress of the two families at this time. If the two missing boys were found alive and well, then the blood stains and the cartridge case would be of no concern to the relieved parents. At 8.40 p.m., Ben and I left the Johnstone house and went to the home of Mr. and Mrs. John Morheim. Ms. Morheim, you said your husband worked at a market? Yes. He telephoned about 15 minutes ago and said he was closing up right away. He'll be here any minute. I do wish Stevie would call or come home. It's so cold out tonight. All he had on was a thin cotton jacket. Please try not to worry. We're doing everything we can. It's going to be all right. Stevie's father's such a sensitive man. He and the boy are so close. I know he's terribly upset. No, you're sure there's no place you might have forgotten? Some place where the boy might be? No, no place. No. Anything happened to the boy will just kill John. No, no. You sit still. I'll get it, Miss Morgan. Joe. Hi, Harry. The Johnstone kid. He's been found. Oh, 
Oh, he's home, Sergeant. He's come home. Thank God he's all right. Well, where's he been? Did he tell you? No. No, he didn't. He, his clothes were all dirty and he's acting strange. I've never seen him like this. How do you mean, Miss Johnson? Well, he just came in the front door and said, Hello, Mom. And then he sat down in a chair and stared at the floor. He won't talk to his father or me. Do you mind if I talk to him? No, go ahead. I asked him about the little Moorheim boy and he wouldn't tell me a thing. Where is he now? In the living room. Looks all right. Yes. Son, son, this is a police officer. He, he wants to talk to you. Now, don't be afraid, dear. He only wants to ask you some questions. Son. You see, Sergeant? Stanley, come on, look at me, son. Get your head up, youngster. Come on, now, that's better. I had your mother pretty worried, you know that? You want to tell us where you've been? I wish you'd try to get him to eat a little something. Do you hear that, son? Want something to eat? Stanley, there's another little boy up the street who hasn't come home. Do you know where he is? His father and mother are worried about him, too. Just like your folks were. You've got to help us find him, son. I... I killed him. I killed Steve with the twenty-two. We were only playing. <laughs> but I killed him. How do you know you killed him? Maybe he's only hurt. Now, isn't that it? <laughs> No, he's dead. I know he's dead. The gun went off. We forgot we put bullets in there. Where is he, Stanley? I hid him. I was scared. I didn't want anybody to find him. Where did you hide him, son? In a cave up on the hill. I didn't mean it. It was my pal. You want to show us where, son? Yes, I'll show you. Please don't send me to jail. 9.15 p.m., Thursday, December 22nd. Nine-year-old Stanley John Stone led the way up the hill behind the backyard of his home. He showed us the wagon he moved the body in. His father came along with us. About 50 feet from the crest of the hill, the boy pointed to a thicket of scrub oak. There we found a small cave holding the body of Stephen Morheim. There was a single bullet wound in his chest just below his heart. He was dead. We covered the body. Stanley. Stanley, how did it happen? I knew my folks were going to give me the gun for Christmas. I knew where it was, and I got it. There was a box of bullets with it. Were you pointing the gun at Stephen? No, sir. No, sir, I wasn't. It was Steve's turn to play with it. I was chasing him. He tripped over the stump there in our backyard and fell. The gun hit him in the stomach, and it went off. Why do you think you killed him if you're telling us the truth? I'm telling the truth, honest. That's the truth. Well, I believe you, son, but why do you think you killed him? It was my gun. Steve would still be alive if I didn't go and get it. I should have waited till Christmas. It's all my fault. Where have you been all this time? In the cave with Steve. What were you doing in there, son? I was praying. I was praying for God to make him alive again. After a thorough investigation, Ben and I were convinced that the shooting of Stephen Morheim was accidental. Lieutenant Lee Jones' findings substantiated the John Stone boy's story even to the smallest detail. We put in a call to the coroner's office and acquainted him with the facts. He designated a local mortuary to handle the body pending autopsy and granted us permission to remove the body to the Morheim home. Mrs. Morheim collapsed. The family doctor was called. Ben and I sat in the living room to wait for John Morheim, the dead boy's father. Edith! Edith! Mr. Morhan? Yes. Are you the police? Yes, sir. Where's Edith? Where's my wife? Has my boy come home? Have you found him? Yes, sir. Oh, where is he? St Steve! Stevie! Where's Steve? He's hurt, isn't he? Yes, sir. Oh, where is he? I want to see him. He's hurt bad, Mr. Morhan. Oh, where is he? I want to see him. He's in his room. How bad? Pretty bad. He's... He's dead. All right, if I go in? If you want to. Will you go with me? Sure. Don't make it any harder on yourself, Mr. Morheim. I want to see my boy. <laughs> Mr. Morhead. Steve, Steve, Steve. Listen to me, son. 
We've got you a lot of nice things for Christmas. Everything you wanted. I, I got you those three new cars for the train. The, the one with the search lights really works. <laughs> Son, you, you... You got that new switch you wanted to it. A lot more try. You know that, that new baseball that you saw? Well, I got it for you. <laughs> that cowboy outfit you wanted, I got you too. Mr. Moorhead. Come on, Joe. Accident. He was playing with the Johnstone boy at the spruce. Playing with a gun. He went off. What was the other boy's name? Stanley Johnston. It was an accident. Marheim, where are you going? I want to see that boy. We had no idea what the dead boy's father had in mind. We didn't feel that we should try to restrain him. We went along with him up the street to the Johnstone home. I'm Stevie's father. Where's your boy? I'm sorry. Where's your boy? He's right here. Won't you come in? It's all right, Mrs. Johnstone. You... You the boy that was with Stevie? Yes, sir. What's your name? Stanley. Stanley. I know it wasn't your fault, Stanley. I wonder if you'd do something for me. Yes, sir. I've got a lot of nice presents for Stevie. I know he wants you to have them. I want to give them to you. Christmas Eve. Mom? I... I think that would be a fine idea, son. Come on, Ben. Well, what does it all prove, Joe? You don't give a kid a gun for Christmas. <laughs> The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On December 24th, 1948, a coroner's inquest was held in the county morgue, city and county of Los Angeles, state of California. In a moment, the results of that inquest. Now, here are authentic reports from all over the country that tell the story of Fatima's sensational increase in popularity. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up. 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. More and more smokers agree Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. So enjoy Fatima yourself and give extra mild Fatimas for Christmas in the attractive golden yellow carton. Everyone who smokes Fatima says that this great new long cigarette is the best of all long cigarettes. <laughs> At the coroner's inquest, it was officially recorded that Stephen Morheim's death was the result of an accident. Stanley Johnstone, age nine, was absolved of any legal responsibility for his friend's death. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of acting chief of police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors Hennepin County, Minneapolis, state of Minnesota and the men of the Hennepin County Sheriff's Office, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Sheriff Ed Ryan, veteran police officer and department administrator who dedicates his life 
to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. Ladies and gentlemen, for a more authentic presentation, portions of the program you are about to hear were actually recorded on the scene. The story you are about to hear is true. Only the names have been changed to protect the innocent. Fatima Cigarettes, best of all long cigarettes, brings you Dragnet. Detective Sergeant, you're assigned to robbery detail. A gang of holdup men have been running loose in your city. They've committed more than a dozen robberies. They're heavily armed, quick to shoot. Your job, stop them. If you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobaccos superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. And that's why Fatima has a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. That's why Fatima is doubling and redoubling its smokers. So, if you want a long cigarette, smoke the best of all long cigarettes. Smoke Fatima. Dragnet, the documented drama of an actual crime. For the next 30 minutes, in cooperation with the Los Angeles Police Department, you will travel step by step on the side of the law through an actual case from official police files. From beginning to end, from crime to punishment, Dragnet is the story of your police force in action. It was Saturday, July 21st. It was hot in Los Angeles. We were working the night watch out of robbery detail. My partner's Ben Romero. The boss is Thad Brown, chief of detectives. My name's Friday. I was on the way back from the record bureau, and it was 6.55 p.m. when I got to room 27A. Robbery detail. Hi, Joey. Ready? Let's go. Where do I dump this top coat? There. It's too hot out tonight for that. Yeah. The rest of the guys take off already? Yeah, we better hustle. How many men are working this thing tonight? Must be at least 50. Covering every drugstore in the South Central area. Mm-hmm. Which one did we draw? Naomi in South Alameda, Rex Pharmacy. Yeah. Parking lot across the street. We can cover the pharmacy from there. Well, we better check out a Thompson from the business office first, huh? It's a good idea. We might as well be ready. They are. Who got the tip the gang was moving into the south end of town? It's Johnny Powers, one of his informants. Okay, here we are. Business office, Glenn. Yeah, I'll take care of it. Thanks. Hey, Blair, do you want to check out a Thompson for us? Okay, Friday. Have you done it? Yeah, kind of. There's a sign-out book. Thank you. Hey, you might as well give us a shotgun while you're at it, Blair. Okay. Check these out for an hour. Sounds like a busy night for you fellas. <laughs> Maybe. Thompson's okay. Those are shotguns. Want to sign up for the shotgun, too, Joe? Yeah. Okay. One Thompson. Submachine gun. One shotgun. You got those serial numbers there, Blair? Yeah. Uh, Thompson 67811. 67811. Yeah. Shotgun 655-228. Uh-huh. 228. Okay. Signed. Joe Friday. Serial number 2288. Ben Romero. What's your serial number, Ben? 2633. Oh, yeah. 2633. Six shells for the shotgun, 50 shells for the Thompson, okay? All right, I'll sign for him. Okay. Gang's pretty rough, I understand. Gun heavy. Yeah, that's what they tell us. Okay. Here's the book, all signed. Okay. Here you go. A lot of firepower there. Yeah, hope you don't have to clean them when we bring them back. 
We went down to the basement of the city hall, picked up our car, 80K, and drove out to Naomi and South Alameda Street. We located the parking lot and pulled in. There were four other cars parked in the lot so we wouldn't be conspicuous. Ben and I got in the back seat out of the light. From our vantage point, we had a clear view of the entrance to the Rex Pharmacy across the street. We had the shotgun and the submachine gun on the seat beside us. We listened to the calls coming on the radio, and we waited. It's no cooler here than it is in the office. Yeah. Hot and sticky, huh? Yeah. The paper says it's going to be worse tomorrow. Roll down your window, will you, and get some air in here? Oh, yeah, huh? Pharmacy isn't doing much business. Not more than a dozen people in there in the last hour. No soda fountain, I guess. Mm, sure is hot. You have to talk about it. Huh? Hey, hell. What time you got? Ten minutes to ten. No smoke. No, thanks. Yeah, I'll get it. That gang's gonna show up here and wish they can get it over with. Powers might have got a bum tip. Well, the gang hasn't missed a weekend for two months. Mm. I wonder how much time the average cop spends waiting. I don't know. Put it all together and make a fine vacation. Mm-hmm. What do we do? Sit this out till the pharmacy closes? Yeah, 2 a.m. Go is hard. Yeah. Midnight came and passed. The traffic on South Alameda thinned out. Only an occasional customer entered the pharmacy across the street. Ben kept complaining about the heat. We waited. Well, that's it, Joe. There go the lights. Drug store's closed. Yeah, guy's locking the doors. There he goes. We might as well shove off, too. Yeah, let's get in the front seat. There's not much call for this shotgun tonight. Well, there's no use checking it in. Same duty to mine, eh? Mm-hmm. Extension all units and all units in the vicinity of Aiden Hill on the corner of Hill and Geneva Alley. 211 and shooting. Pro 3. Hit the light. Yeah, well, let's roll. Sunday, July 22nd, 2.15 a.m. Ben and I pulled up at the Merchant Security Trust Company on the corner of South Hill and Geneva Alley. Two patrol cars were already on the scene and four uniformed officers were trying to keep back a crowd of people who had gathered at the top of a flight of marble stairs which led off the street down one flight to the bank's night depository. At the bottom of the stairs, an elderly man was sprawled out face down, his right arm twisted under him. The man was dead. Ben counted five bullet wounds in the victim's back. We interviewed the only witness, a young sailor. My name's Basie, Sergeant. Uh, Don Basie, quartermaster, second class. Here's my ID card. You saw the shooting, Mason? I was about a half a block away. I just came out of the bar down the street there, the top hat. Yeah. Had a couple of beers, and I left, and I started walking back to the hotel. When was that? About uh, five after two. Mm-hmm. Go on. Well, before I got to the corner, I saw this man ahead of me. He uh, crossed the street and headed over for the bank. Then this car pulled up, and some guys got out. They ran over to the man, and it looked like they were frisking him. Yeah. All of a sudden, I heard shots. The man ran for the stairs here, and, and it looked like he stumbled and fell. A bunch of guys jumped back in the car and drove away. What'd you do then? Well, I ran up to see what I could do for the old man. He was lying down there where he is now. Nothing I could do for him. I yelled for a cop. Did you get a look at the man in that car? No, I just saw him from a distance. Uh, four of them, maybe five. What about the car? Did you see the license number? The last couple of numbers, that's all. 699. Couldn't see the rest. Mm-hmm. What was it, a coupe or a sedan? A sedan, maroon color. It was a Pontiac, either a 1940 or 41. You sure about that? I used to own one back in Delaware, 1940 model. I sold it to my brother when I went in the Navy. I'm sure all right. And you're sure about the number of men in the car? Oh, yes, sir. Uh, four or five. No more. I see. Thanks. Well, will you drive back to the office with us and give us a full statement? Sure, Sergeant. Anything you say. You can wait in the car, Vasey. We won't be long. Sure. Well, what do you think? No, I don't know. Drugstore gang? Said there were four guys. Could be. No description. Maroon car. Three numbers off the license plate. Pretty thin. Yeah. Looks like a hard summer. We completed our preliminary investigation. The coroner arrived and the body was taken to the county morgue in the basement of the Hall of Justice. The victim was identified as Walter Conroy, the proprietor of the Flowerland Dance Hall on South Hill Street. Together with officers Fremont and Hearst from Homicide, Ben and I spent most of Sunday tracking down employees of the dance hall and interviewing them. We sent a rush teletype to the Department of Motor Vehicles in Sacramento containing the partial license number, plus our scan information on the car, which the suspects drove. Early Monday afternoon, Ben and I, along with Captain Ed Walker of Robbery Detail, met with Chief of Detective Stad Brown. What kind of a motive are you working on? Robbery. I thanks all manager Conroy was on his way to the bank's night depository when this bunch caught up with him. He had the night's receipts with him from the dance hall. How much did he get, Walker? Uh, $350. They missed over 1000 Conroy had in an inside pocket. No idea who uh, pulled the stick-up? Could have been that drugstore gang. Why then? We haven't missed working a weekend night for two months. There's no sign of any other job that they might have pulled Saturday. Just a hunch, Chief. Nothing to go on. We'll have to guess our way for a while. 
Uh, Sacramento checking the description of the car, the uh, numbers off the license plate. Yeah, ought to have an answer this afternoon. Any leads on the drugstore gang at all? Plenty. None of them good. Suspects are loaded down with guns, that's all we know. Excuse me. Brown speaking. Uh, just a minute. Friday, please. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Reach it over here. Friday. Yeah, Ralph. How many? Yeah. Okay, thank you. Well, I got an answer from DMV Sacramento about the hold-up car. What's it say, Joe? Well, they looked up the possible combinations of 1940 or 41 Pontiac sedans with the number 699 on the license plate. Yeah? 123 possibles to check. Not much choice. No car in that description on the hot list. The killer might be the legal owners. All right, and 23. Well, even after we check them, we still might not have the right party. That's right. If we got a better lead, we'll work on it. Nope. Well, then ride this till it falls apart. For the next 13 days, Ben and I, Fremont and Hearst from Homicide, plus a half a dozen other men, hacked away at the list of 123 car registrations, any one of which could have been issued to the hold-up car. The color of the sedan didn't help us much to start with, since California vehicle registrations do not include the colors of the cars. After 14 days of gradual elimination of possibles, the field was narrowed to six, then four, and then two. August 6th, Monday, 5.30 p.m., Ben and I were called to Thad Brown's office. Gentlemen? Uh, check out that last possible yet? About 20 minutes ago. It didn't pan out. What about Hearst and Fremont? They had one left. Right here. This could be the answer. Yeah. 1940 Pontiac sedan, license number 4XY699. Last registration, San Diego. Sounds good. We teletype the San Diego police. They say the car's been sold to a woman out in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. Anyone checked her? That's what I want you two for. San Diego and Santa Monica. Well, it's in the right area. Can't afford to miss now. I hope it's the right one. Well, it's got to be. Check it. Ben and I checked the woman in Santa Monica, Mrs. Fielding. She told us that she had sold the car six months before to a friend who lived in Bakersfield. We contacted her friend. He told us the car had been traded in by him to an auto dealer in Pasadena. We checked the dealer. He said the car had been sold off his used car lot two months before. The new buyer had given his name as Amo Thurston. Two names were given as reference, Lloyd Newton and John Lacombe. We ran a routine check through the record bureau. Ran them through, fellas. It's the packages. Get a make plan? On all three. What'd you find on Thurston? Uh, let's see. Thurston, two time losers, second time up to Q on five counts of armed robbery. On parole from Quentin now. How about the other two? Well, they're calm. Let's see. Preston Reformatory, two terms, went up three years ago, violation of Dyer Act. He's on parole, too. What about Newton? Did you make him? Uh, two terms in Oklahoma. They're looking for him now. Jump parole. Can I look at that just a minute, Frank? Well, sure. I have all three of them. Take a look, Ben. Each one of the mama sheets on these three guys. Yeah. I'm like, right here under General M.O. See? Mm-hmm. Thurston, heavily armed at time of arrest. Yeah. This one, Lacombe. Heavily on. This one on Newton. Same thing. Gun happy. Yeah. Come on. At the time he purchased the car, suspect Emil Thurston listed his home address as 1517 North Hoover Avenue. Previous robbery victims positively identified Thurston and his companions. At 1517 North Hoover, the landlady also identified Thurston and his companions as tenants. She told us they drove a red sedan and they parked the car at a Temple Street garage. An immediate stakeout was placed on the apartment house and we started the canvas of Temple Street garages from Hoover Avenue down to Rampart Boulevard. At 4 p.m., Ben spotted the car in Donnelly's garage on Temple Street near Michigan Drive. The garage attendant told us that the owner of the car had given his name as Emil Thurston. We showed him the mug shop. Yeah, used to park his car in here a while back. Then he came in yesterday morning with these two guys and said he wanted a paint job. Hmm. Doesn't look like he needs a paint job to me. They offered me 20 bucks extra if I do it in a hurry. He wants the car painted green. When's he going to call for the car? About 10 o'clock tonight. These jobs take time. He's not going to like it if the car's not finished. He won't like it if it is. Come on, Ben. You are listening to Dragnet. Authentic stories of your police force in action. Now, 
Here is an authentic report from Fatima Cigarettes. In 1949, Fatima doubled, tripled, and quadrupled its smokers. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. You'll find Fatima extra mild. Because Fatima is the long cigarette which contains the finest Turkish and domestic tobacco superbly blended to make Fatima extra mild. You'll find Fatima tastes much better. Fatima's superb blend gives you a much different, much better flavor and aroma than any other long cigarette. You'll find Fatima tops in cigarette quality. Fatima has always stood for the best in cigarette quality. For a new year of greater smoking enjoyment, buy a Fatima in the appealing gold and yellow package. You'll agree, Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. Seven p.m. Tuesday, August seventh. Chief of Detectives Thad Brown and Captain Ed Walker swung the entire robbery detail into action. The stakeout at the apartment house on North Hoover continued. An additional detail of men was stationed in a vacant store on Temple Street, directly opposite Donnelly's Garage. Donnelly's Garage was a small family outfit, and the only spot from which we could cover it thoroughly without being seen was from a large paint locker set up against the right wall. The garage man cleared enough room so that Ben and I could fit into the locker in a half-stooped position. Two small latches were rigged up so that we could pull the doors closed from the inside. Four ventilation holes at the top and bottom of the doors provided us with peepholes. At 8 o'clock that night, Ben and I took our places inside the locker. The trap was set. We waited. Can you see all right, Joe? Yeah. Come here. Stay there. It's a tight fit. I'm getting a clamp on my shoulder. Yeah. What time did that garage man say he closed? 11 o'clock. Oh, lousy paint smell. <coughs> Stop it, man. They had car pulling in. Can you see the driver? Wait a minute. It's nothing. Somebody getting gas. Mm. Hope they show up. Wouldn't want this to go on another night. Well, don't count on it. Mm. Foot's going to sleep. Why don't you stand still? What time you got? Let me see. Get the light on in here. Ten minutes to nine. Thanks. The popular conception of the working detective rarely includes a glimpse of his everyday run-of-the-mill duties. Filling out forms, conducting interviews, or waiting long, monotonous hours parked in a car or standing half-crouched in a garage paint locker. It's slow, dull, and tedious, and it's 95% of the police officer's job. By 10 o'clock that night, there was still no sign of Thurston and his friends. The cramped locker got more cramped with the passing minutes. The air was thick with paint fumes. We waited. At 10.55, a taxi pulled to a stop in front of the garage. Three men got out. You see him, Joe? Wait till they step into the light. Another guy still in the cab. Here he comes. There's the first guy. Yeah, Thurston. Fourth guy's getting out of the cab. It looks like Newton. Huh? That's him. Yeah, it's Lacombe right behind. Fat guy. Here they come. You sure do look the floor. All right. Unlatch your door, but don't open it. Yeah. Ah, quiet, Ben. What's the matter? That match is stuck. Wait a minute. Did you get it? No, no it's really stuck. All right, tap it with your gun stock. Yeah, well, easy. Yeah, well. There. There he is, this little slit. Can you see where they are now? Yeah, talking to the garage man. Not looking this way. No, they just stay that way, huh? You ready? Okay. Don't tip them off till we're right on top of them. Let them get away from that garage man, huh? Right. All right, let's go. Approximately 25 or 30 yards separated us from the suspects. I glanced across Temple Street at the vacant store where Thad Brown and the other men were staked out. 25 yards is a long way to walk when you're approaching a murderer, and you know that he won't hesitate to kill you in order to escape. Ben flipped the safety off the machine gun. We were almost halfway across the garage, 15 yards away. Thurston turned and saw us. Look out! Joe! Stop spinning! I got one up! They're back behind the car, went up the stairs. Three of them. Come on! Right. 
Stand still. All right, next one. Come on. Clean. All right, look home. Watch him, John. All right, you. Rest of your stand back. Give me a you all right, Joe? Yeah. Two more guns on him. All right, you two. Hold it. Here comes Chief. Yeah. I'll get these guns together here. Lacombe. He's not much of a fighter. Not without a gun. The suspects were booked at different divisions to keep them separated. Emil Thurston and Lloyd Newton were taken to Hollenbeck Park and booked on suspicion of armed robbery and murder. John Lacombe was booked at Highland Park Jail on the same charges. The other suspect, who had been wounded in the escape attempt, was identified as Harold Steves, 19 years old. He was treated for a leg wound at Georgia Street Receiving Hospital and then transferred to the prison ward at the county hospital. During the next two days, each of the suspects was questioned individually. Thurston, Lacombe, Newton would admit nothing. The 19-year-old Steves broke down and agreed to turn state's evidence. We took his statement to Chief of Detective Stad Brown. Gentlemen, what did the boy tell you? Just about everything, boss. They pulled the drugstore holdups and they killed that dance hall owner, Walter Conroy. Which one of them? Well, the kid says Thurston shot him. He says Thurston's the gang leader. Good. You finally got a count on those guns you took off them? Yeah, 12 of them. Each one of them was ready to go, bullet in every chamber. Did you get a complaint from the DA's office yet? They were arraigned. Mm -hmm. Preliminary hearing set for Monday. Fine. You got them in jail, I'll put them in prison. <laughs> The apprehension of the criminal doesn't mean the end of a case for a police officer. He spends just as much time helping to convict the criminal after he's caught. Evidence must be gathered and authenticated and presented to the district attorney's office. If confessions are possible, they must be obtained and put in order. The officer must also help out in formulating the case and in testifying at the trial of the suspect. On October 30th, almost three months after the Thurston gang was apprehended, they were brought to trial in Superior Court. It was a routine affair. Harold Steves took the stand and told the story of the gang's activities. The victims identified the suspects and testified to the robbery. Both Ben and I took the stand and testified to the arrest and possession of guns by the defendant. We received no cross-examination. On the morning of March 2nd, the case went to the jury. Ben and I had lunch with Lieutenant Rombo from robbery in the City Hall cafeteria, and it was five minutes past one when we got back to the office. Well, it sure was good soup today. Yeah, it was a nice lunch. Do you want to check the mail? I didn't, Jan. Oh, I'll get it. Robbery Friday. Yeah? When? Right. Lacombe and Thurston, they just broke jail. Within seven minutes, a dragnet for the escaped criminals had been thrown around the entire city. Chief of Detective Stad Brown directed the operation. At 14 minutes past one, he called us to the photocopy room. The machines were turning out duplicate mug shots of Thurston and Lacombe for distribution at the rate of one every four seconds. You want us to stand by, Chief? Uh, for the moment, yeah. We got all the help we need on the street. How'd they pull the break, anyway? Like the deputy when he brought in their lunch. He used to steal leg from one of the benches in the prisoner's tank. Yeah. And they beat the deputy right in the ground, but he held on to Newton. He didn't get away. Well, how'd Thurston and Lacombe ever get out of the building? It's a real freak. They slugged the elevator man and got down to the basement. Uh -huh. Right then, an ambulance crew was wheeling a body in the morgue. The attendant left the ignition keys in the ambulance. Shouldn't be too rough to track him if they're in an ambulance. It's tougher than you think. How the stop is coming, Frank? Fast as we can make him, Chief. Have another batch for you in a minute. You had any reports at all yet, boss? Couple. They're moving fast. Frank, you want to get that? I can't see in this dark room. Yeah, I'll get it. Yeah? Chief Brown in there? Yeah, it's come on in. Now, Walker, what do you got? Uh, kill that dry one. Oh, yeah. Now, what do you got? Gas station out on Sunset. Lacombe and Thurston just held it up. We picked up our car in the city hall garage and drove out to the service station on the corner of Sunset Boulevard and Lorraine Drive. Detectives Ruiz and Stromwall from robbery were already on the scene. The two escapees had abandoned the ambulance there, robbed the station of $56 in currency, and stolen a 1938 Gray Packard coupe, license number 7 Robert 6336. We left the station and started to cruise the area. It was 1.55 p.m. Get it up, Bill. Yeah. Sunset, the 211 in progress. 6380 North Sunset, a 211 in progress. Post 3. This is the 6100 block. Yeah, come on. 6380. Yeah. Maybe. Push it. Hey, that car pulling out up ahead there. The great coupe. Wait a minute. Seven Robert. That's them. Lights changing. They can't make it. They're going through. They're skidding. They hit the lamp post. Broke it off. All right, pull up. Come on. All right. All right, let's go. 
Lucky if I live through this one. Yeah. All right, come on, help me with this door. Yeah. All right. Oh. All right. Like, can you take him? Yeah. I'll get Lacombe. You look okay? Yeah. Get Thurston out of here. All right. Come on, you. Come on. Yeah. All right, Lacombe, come on. I'll give you a shot, I'll kill you. Oh, sure you will. Come on. All right, don't try to walk. I'll search the fence. Seems okay, a couple of strikes. All right, get on over there. Oh, funny. They don't look very tough. They can't play their part. They haven't got their guns. The story you have just heard was true. Only the names were changed to protect the innocent. On March 3rd, 1947, trial was held in Superior Court, Department 91, City and County of Los Angeles, State of California. In a moment, the results of that trial. It's amazing how many long cigarette smokers are changing to Fatima. Here are the actual figures. New York Division. Fatima sales up 132%. Chicago Division. Fatima sales up 453%. Los Angeles Division. Fatima sales up 545%. Yes, in 1949, more and more smokers discovered that Fatima is the best of all long cigarettes. They found Fatima extra mild. They found Fatima has a much different, much better flavor. They found the name Fatima means the best in cigarette quality. In 1950, enjoy Fatima yourself. Best of all long cigarettes. Amo Thurston, John Lacombe, and Lloyd Newton were convicted of first-degree murder and robbery and sentenced to life terms. For turning state's evidence, 19-year-old Harold Steves received special consideration. As a result of the jailbreak, Thurston and Lacombe were convicted of assault and escape. They are now serving life terms in the state penitentiary. You have just heard Dragnet, a new series of authentic cases from official files. Technical advice for Dragnet comes from the office of Acting Chief of Police, W.A. Wharton, Los Angeles Police Department. Dragnet honors the city of Pasadena, state of California, and the men who make up the Pasadena Police Force, another of America's great law enforcement agencies. One of these men, Chief of Police Clarence H. Morris, traffic specialist, and veteran police administrator dedicates his life to making yours more secure. Fatima Cigarettes, the best of all long cigarettes, has brought you Dragnet, portion transcribed from Los Angeles. Be sure to hear songs by Morton Downey tonight on NBC. NBC.